Nagana bristled. Of course I can't guarantee anything of the kind. Can you guarantee that if we give you all the planes, you would turn the tide? Distracted by a suggestion from Admiral Okar that they all take a break for tea, the antagonists calmed down, but the problem remained unsolved until Sato came up with an ingenious if questionable solution, concentrate production on fighters to the exclusion of bombers. Then an additional 5,000 planes, a total of 50,000 for equal distribution, could be manufactured, only 1,000 shy of the Navy's demand for 26,000 planes. To make up for this deficit, Sato offered 3,500 tons of aluminium. The Navy accepted. The Tempest was over but not the military problems which had aggravated it. The American advance through the Central Pacific continued unchecked. On February 17 Nimitz amphibious force leapfrogged from Kwajalein to the Enidoc Islands at the western limit of the Marshalls, bypassing four atolls where the Japanese had air bases. That same day and the next, American carrier planes also attacked truck in the Carolines, the home of combined fleet, destroying 70 planes on the ground and sinking two auxiliary cruisers, a destroyer, an aircraft ferry, two submarine tenders and 23 merchant ships, 200,000 tons of shipping in all. These successive disasters prompted Sato to give Tojo some more unsolicited advice we should withdraw to the Philippines, and the gamble on the final decisive battle. Is that the opinion of the general staff? Tojo asked grimly. No, it is my personal opinion. Did you consult the general staff? That's just the point, the general staff would certainly oppose such a plan. It's my conviction that we should simply override the military and the first thing to do was abandon the Carolines and the Marianas and fall back to the Philippines. Tojo got red in the face. Last year at an imperial conference we made the Marianas and Carolines our last defense line. Do you mean to say that six months later we should give them up without a single fight? Sato held his ground. There were only seven airfields in that area and they could easily be neutralized by the Americans before any invasion. But in the Philippines there were hundreds of islands that could be used as bases. This should be the last battlefield of the war, since if that battle is lost, we won't be able to fight another. That's why we should concentrate all our efforts on one last struggle, and then start a peace offensive by peace he meant to settle for any conditions that would let Japan retain her honor. Tojo interrupted him. Don't ever again mention the phrase peace offensive. If you or I ever breathed the words were way I, peace, the morale of our troops would deteriorate. Sato left, encouraged by the Prime Minister's sympathetic reaction, but his counsel helped lead to an unexpected consequence. Later that evening Tojo suggested to Chief of Staff Sujiyama that he resign. In this critical situation, Tojo explained, it would be best if he himself concurrently held the posts of War Minister and Chief of Staff. That would be a violation of our long tradition, Sujiyama protested. One man shouldn't be responsible for both political and military decisions. The catastrophe at Stalingrad, he pointed out had resulted from Hitler's concentration of power. Führer Hitler was an enlisted man, said Tojo. I am a general. He assured the marshal that he had been giving as much thought to military affairs as political. You don't have to worry on that score. That's easy to say, but when one man handles two jobs and is torn by a conflict of interest between them, to which does he give the greater importance? Moreover, it would establish a dangerous precedent for the future. In such an unprecedented and widespread war as this, we must take every measure even if it means breaking precedent. Tsujiyama was losing his patience. If you do this, it will be impossible to maintain order in the army. That won't happen was the tight-lipped answer. If anyone complains, we'll replace him. No objections will be allowed. The following day, February 21, Tojo relieved Tsujiyama as Army Chief of Staff and took the post himself, he also replaced Navy Chief of Staff Nagana with Navy Minister Shigetaro Shimada.
the four most important military posts in the nation were now concentrated in the hands of two men. Sato burst into Tojo's office shouting, Mr. Prime Minister, what you have done is tremendous. Tojo was already wearing the braid of the Chief of Staff. Since becoming Prime Minister he had discovered that the independence of the Supreme Command was a big factor in Japan's military reversals. He was obviously pleased by Sato's reaction and permitted himself a brief smile. If some of the young officers cause any disturbance about this, he said sternly, I will not let them get away with it. Jikokua would not be tolerated. Keep an eye on them. For the next few hours Sato was engrossed in plans for the last decisive battle in the Philippines. He was interrupted by a phone call from Tojo, who spoke in his new role as chief of staff. I am going to defend the Marianas and Carolines, he announced curtly. Tojo's arbitrary consolidation of power, which he and Sato regarded as a curb on the autocratic control of the military was interpreted by others as a dangerous step toward military dictatorship. Prince Chikaibu, the eldest of the emperor's three brothers, did not believe the same man should be prime minister, war minister and chief of staff. Like Tsujiyama, he put this question to Tojo, what will you do when the general staff and the war ministry do not agree on the conduct of war? Tojo angrily replied in writing, the most important thing before us at this stage is to achieve victory with all our national resources. So I'll thank you to discuss personal affairs after the war is over. As for the current move, it is only natural that there be much criticism and opposition, since the measure is an unprecedented one. Let us leave it to future historians to determine the right or wrong of this step. Actually, the cooperation between the high command and the government is going very well and there is no trouble at all. My conscience would never let me violate the basic principle of the fundamental character of Japan. If you have any questions on this point, I'll be glad to answer them. If I should ever feel that I am no longer loyal to the emperor, I will offer my sincere apology and commit Harakiri in his presence. The Jushin, the former premiers, shared Prince Chikaibu's concern. To them, moreover, Tojo's leadership was responsible for Japan's plight. They all wanted Tojo removed as Prime Minister, and two of their number, Prince Kono and Admiral Okada, went further, his replacement must be a man who would make immediate peace overtures to the Allies. Kono tried to enlist Marquis Kaido in the cause for peace. The Privy Seal was sympathetic but refused to help, privately he thought it would be precipitous to use his influence on the Emperor. There were even those in the military working for peace, but for different reasons. The most important was Rear Admiral Sokichi Takagi, a brilliant research expert who had been ordered by Admiral Shimada to conduct a thorough study of the mistakes made in the war as reflected in top secret files. His analysis of air and shipping losses led him to the inevitable conclusion that Japan could not win the war. Appalled by the extent of the collapse in the Pacific, he saw as the only solution Tojo's dismissal and an immediate quest for peace no matter what the consequences. Takagi feared that if he submitted this information to Shimada, his own life would be endangered, and the report itself shelved. He met in secret with former Navy Minister Admiral Mitsuma Zayonai and Vice Admiral Shaiji Ashinu, both advocates of peace, and told them what he had uncovered. They encouraged him to share his findings with Admiral Okada and others who were in a better position to act. But weeks passed and Tojo still remained in office. Impatient, Takagi assembled half a dozen Navy men he could trust, commanders and captains, and persuaded them that the nation could not survive unless they assassinated Tojo. But how should it be done? Surreptitious inquiries were made to right-wing organizations, experts on assassination. On the basis of their suggestions and personal investigation of Tojo's daily routine, Takagi concluded that an automobile accident would ensure success with such a prominent target. The assassins, in three cars, would intercept a Tojo motorcade. One vehicle would crash into Tojo's car. Bringing it to a halt, the other two would pull alongside and gun down the Prime Minister with automatic revolvers. 
the conspirators would all wear uniforms. The others would escape to Formosa in a navy plane, but Takagi would remain behind and take all the responsibility. Ironically, Tojo himself had begun the search for peace. Before the fall of Singapore he had been involved in an attempt to negotiate with the Allies. On February 12, 1942, he was summoned to the palace and instructed by the Emperor, at Kaido's prompting, not to miss any opportunity to terminate the war. Tojo sent for the German ambassador, General Eugenet, and made him promise not to reveal what he would hear to anyone but Ribbentrop and Hitler. Tojo suggested that Germany and Japan secretly approach the Allies with an offer of peace, he would fly to Berlin to represent the Empire personally, if Hitler would send a long-range bomber. The reply from Berlin was polite but lukewarm. Hitler could not take the risk of Tojo crashing in a German plane. Tojo was discouraged by the German lack of enthusiasm but was not averse to further efforts in the same direction, although he was naive about how peace might be achieved. On Ambassador Kurosu's return from America later that summer, the Japanese diplomats in Washington were exchanged for Gru and his subordinates, Tojo took him aside at a party given in the diplomat's honor, and in Sujiyama's presence said, please arrange to end the war at an early date. Startled by the Prime Minister's simplicity of mind, Kurosu remarked, it is easier to start a war than end one. Japan's fleet and merchant shipping losses were as catastrophic as Takagi's secret report indicated. Most of this tonnage had been sent to the bottom by marauding American submarines and little was being done in the Imperial Navy to counter this, the gravest of all threats to Japan's supply lines. The unpreparedness on the part of the Navy was the result of a combination of tradition and of reluctance to engage in defensive warfare. British naval officers had helped establish the Imperial Navy, which adopted all things English so readily that the Naval Academy at Etejima became a replica of Dartmouth. Bricks were brought from England, and a lock of Lord Nelson's hair enshrined in Memorial Hall. Imitation extended to the galley, and once a day a Western meal, complete with knives, forks and spoons, was served throughout the Navy. In battle, Japanese captains followed British tradition by going down with their sinking ship. More important, the Japanese inherited the British aversion to wage war on commercial vessels, and their submarines were designed to support the fleet and do battle against enemy warships rather than go after defenseless shipping. But such a policy could succeed only if an enemy shared it. The Germans did not and when their submarines launched devastating raids on British merchantmen in World War I, the British had been forced to retaliate in kind as well as create an efficient anti-submarine service. The Japanese did neither. They were still using their outmoded, outsized submarines almost exclusively against enemy warships and had virtually ignored anti-submarine warfare. It had little appeal to young officers just starting their careers who wanted more dashing duty. By the fall of 1941 there were but two full-time officers on the Navy General Staff assigned to realign defense which included mining, anti-aircraft defense and anti-submarine warfare. Operationally such duty was considered as unimportant as it was undesirable. A single officer, with the derogatory title of Staff Officer for Training, was responsible for protecting all shipping along 600 miles of the Honshu coast, in addition to the vast area between Tokyo Bay and Iwo Jima. Moreover, when hostilities broke out there were no provisions for organizing merchant ships into convoys. Most shipmasters wanted to sail alone, anyway, but within six months American submarines had torpedoed so many solar merchantmen that the first convoy escort fleet was established with headquarters on Formosa. This emergency unit, comprised mostly of overage naval reserve officers, had eight destroyers with which to cover an extensive area. Combined fleet was reluctant to release any more ships, out of sympathy for destroyer commanders, who detested the monotonous task of herding transports. By the end of the first year since Pearl Harbor, U.S. Submarines had sunk 139 cargo vessels, 560,000 gross tons in all, 
and at last Imperial headquarters realized that the war was being lost through an oversight. At home there were pleas for more gasoline, bauxite and other vital production materials. At the front, commanders were begging for food, ammunition and reinforcements. But there weren't enough merchant ships to satisfy anyone's needs, and every week more were going down. It wasn't until March 1943, however, that the second convoy escort fleet was organized, with headquarters on Saipan. The total resources of both convoy fleets were still pitiful, 16 destroyers, 5 coast defense frigates and 5 torpedo boats. These stopgap measures would have been ineffective in any case, but in the meantime the Americans had markedly raised the quality of their own underwater service. Scores of improved submarines were built and manned by well-trained crews, drastically redesigned torpedoes replaced the early, faulty ones, which had occasionally run in a circle and too often had failed to detonate. Accordingly, in September the Japanese suffered a record 172,082 gross ton loss. The time for drastic measures was long since passed but none were taken until mid-November when Grand Escort Command Headquarters was created. Its commander, Admiral Koshiro Oikawa, who had been Navy Minister at the time Tojo took over two years before, was given four escort carriers and the 901st Naval Air Group. Unfortunately, all four of the big ships needed extensive repairs and the airmen had no training in anti-submarine tactics. The convoys continued to run haphazardly, each escort ship commander acting as he thought fit. Losses climbed to 265,068 gross tons in November, but still the government was averse to the adoption of a full-fledged convoy system. Commanders at the front needed supplies too urgently, and small groups of from two to five ships would get the faster. These smaller groups, however, remained easy prey and the heavy losses continued into the first two months of 1944. There was no alternative. The big convoy system, 20 merchant ships, as compared to allied convoys of 70 in the Atlantic, finally went into operation early in March. At first it appeared to have wrought a miracle. In the first month, losses dropped drastically. But the elation at Imperial headquarters was ill-founded. The U.S. Navy was also implementing a new system and had recalled numerous submarines for training. They would soon be sent out again to launch wolf pack raids. 3. Admiral Togo's epic victory at Tsushima had left future Japanese admirals with an unenviable heritage, the concept of the decisive battle, wherein all issues would be settled at one stroke. Unlike his predecessor, the new commander of Combined Fleet, Admiral Minaichi Koga, was cool and conservative, an efficient, plodding officer governed by logic. Yet he too was obsessed by the dream of a battle which would change the course of the war. Being a pragmatist, he was also aware that chances of success were small, but it was Japan's last hope. On March 8 he issued his battle plan, giving it the name of Operation Z once the advancing American fleet broke into the Philippine Sea by way of the Marianas or the Palaus or New Guinea, the combined fleet would sally forth in full strength. In his efficient, methodical way, he set about concentrating the bulk of Japan's surface force, and near the end of the month gave orders to transfer his headquarters from the battleship Musashi, anchored at Palau, to the Philippines. Let us go out and die together, he said to his chief of staff, Admiral Shijiri Fukudome, before they flew south. Yamamoto, he added, had died at exactly the right time and he envied him that fact. At nine o'clock on the last day of March they took off separately in two four-engine Kawanishi flying boats and headed due west for the three-hour flight to Mindanao. But before reaching the Philippines, they encountered a storm and Koga's plane disappeared. The fate of Admiral Koga, like that of Amelia Earhart, remains a mystery. Within a year combined fleet had lost two commanders, both while flying near the front. Fukudome's plane banked to the right to skirt the storm and changed course north toward Manila, 
but strong headwinds continued to impede the flying boat's progress and by two o'clock in the morning it was almost out of fuel. The pilot sent word back to Fuku Dome to prepare for an emergency landing. To the left in the moonlight the Admiral could see a long narrow island, it looked like Cebu. During their descent the moon abruptly disappeared from sight. Below, the sea was lost in blackness. The pilot became disoriented and lost control. Fukudome, an expert flyer himself, groped his way forward, still gripping a briefcase which contained a detailed copy of Operation Z and its cipher system. He reached over the pilot's shoulder and yanked back on the controls to try to bring the bulky flying boat out of its dive. But he pulled too far. The Koenishi stalled. It fell off on one wing and cartwheeled heavily into the sea. Fukudom felt water engulf him. He accepted death. The war was lost, anyway, but then he surfaced, still instinctively clinging to the briefcase. The water was bright with flames. He and ten others were free of the wreckage, but the admiral, weighted down by the briefcase, could not stay afloat. He clutched at a seat cushion and started kicking toward the dim shoreline of Cebu. Hour after hour he struggled against the strong current. By dawn he was alone. The others must be far ahead. In the distance Fukuda made out the silhouette of a tall chimney. He recognized the Asano cement plant, which was only six miles south of Cebu City, Japanese headquarters for the central Philippines. It was fairly safe territory, even though the island was infested by gorillas. He flailed wearily in the water for another hour, close to the limit of his endurance, before he saw several bankers, fishing canoes, approaching. He hesitated. Were they gorillas? He had to chance capture but let the briefcase go. As he was dragged aboard the first banker, one of the fishermen, they had seen the flames caught a glimpse of the slowly sinking briefcase and retrieved it just before it disappeared. The admiral was taken to Ballard along with eight of his comrades, the other two escaped to Japanese headquarters in Cebu City. The captives were delivered to the nearest guerrilla unit, where they told Captain Marcelino Erdiano, who had studied at Tokyo Imperial University for a year, that they were unimportant staff officers from Japan on a routine inspection of the area. Erdiano, however, noticed that one of them, Fukudome, was treated with considerable deference by the others. Perhaps he was a high-ranking general? Moreover, the papers in the briefcase with their red top secret markings were of obvious import. A runner was sent with this information to the commander of all Seppu guerrillas, Lieutenant Colonel James Cushing, an American mining engineer, half Irish, half Mexican. Cushing was an ex-boxer, a hard-drinking, impish individualist. He would have preferred sitting out the war in the mountains with his Filipino wife and child, enjoying life, but the people of Cebu had persuaded him that he alone could unify the quarreling groups of guerrillas on the island. Cushing immediately radioed MacArthur on his little litter foray that ten Japanese, including a high-ranking officer, had been captured along with a whole case of important documents, some of which looked like a cipher system. The message was picked up by Colonel Wendell Fertig, an engineering officer who had become commander of all guerrillas on Mindanao, and he relayed it to Australia. Here it created such a tremendous stir that the Navy offered to divert an operational submarine from its duties as soon as possible and send it to Negros, the island just west of Cebu to pick up the prisoners and the documents. Fukudome, his leg injured in the crash, had to be carried on a litter. It took over a week to reach Cushing's mountain hideout in Tupas, ten miles west of Cebu City, and by the time the Admiral, under incessant questioning by Erdiano, admitted that he was Admiral Kogu and could even speak some English. Shortly after Fukudome was delivered to Cushing, Japanese troops from Cebu City, alerted by the two men who had escaped, launched an attack on Tupas. Their commander, Lieutenant Colonel Sito Anishi, threatened to burn down villages and execute civilians in reprisal unless the prisoners were promptly released to him. 
Cushing retreated farther in the mountains and radioed MacArthur that he could get the documents to Negros but doubted he could deliver Admiral Cogu and the other prisoners. MacArthur replied, enemy prisoners must be held at all costs. It was an impossible order. Cushing had 25 men, and Anishi's troops were closing in. He sent the documents to Negros with two runners but informed MacArthur that he would be forced to release Cogger to avoid continued reprisals. The enraged MacArthur relieved Cushing of command and reduced him to the grade of private. But Private Cushing was still in command, and had to negotiate with Anishi without delay. He asked Cogger to compose a note requesting Colonel Anishi to refrain from further punitive action in exchange for himself and the others. Fukudom signed the note using Cogger's name. It was delivered to Onishi by a civilian, who returned with the colonel's written promise to abide by the proposal. Fukudom was again loaded on a litter. Cushing warmly shook his hand, by now they were friends and even Cushing's fierce mastiff, who bristled at the other Japanese, allowed the admiral to pat him. It was only a moment but it was unique in such a relentless war. An unarmed platoon, led by Lieutenant Pedro Villarreal, escorted the prisoners down the mountain path to their freedom. Fukudome's briefcase found its way to MacArthur via submarine. Its contents were among the most significant enemy documents seized during the war, but Jim Cushing was in disgrace and subject, he imagined with some justification, to worse punishment when MacArthur returned to the Philippines. Section. Kogi was replaced by Admiral Somutoi Oda, formerly commander at Yokosuka Naval Base. A brilliant man, he was noted for being so meticulous and sarcastic that more than one subordinate had suffered nervous breakdown. Moreover, he had been ashore since the start of the war and it was imperative to select for him a chief of staff with broad experience at sea at the highest level. The obvious choice was Admiral Runosu Kuzaka, Negumo's former chief of staff, and now serving under his cousin Admiral Junichi Kuzaku at Rabaul. Before leaving Rabaul, he was given a farewell party, a banquet consisting of two cans of sea eel, two slices of broiled eggplant mixed in bin paste, weed soup, and rice boiled with barley. General Imamura contributed half a dozen bottles of sake. There was one way to get out of Rabaul, by air and risk the fate of Yamamoto and Koga. American fighters patrolled overhead almost constantly. For safety, Kuzaka's plane took off in the dark, its occupants cheered by a final toast, this time Johnny Walker Black Label Whiskey. At four o'clock the bomber swept low over the harbor, its exhausts lengthened to hide the flames. With dawn their fears of discovery were borne out. A flight of enemy fighters flashed by so close that Kuzaka could see the pilots. Inexplicably, the Americans continued on course, without firing a round at Admiral Toyoda's new chief of staff. The Kuzaka plane refueled at truck and went on to Saipan. Here the Admiral held a reunion with Nagumo, who, after Midway and Goodalcanal, had been reduced to commanding a small area fleet. After a bowl with its draconian regime, Kuzaka was appalled by the meager defenses on such a strategic island and recommended that much more be done. The next morning Kuzaka took off for Iwo Jima, where he inspected the little volcanic island during refueling. It was well fortified but lacked sufficient machine guns and artillery. He promised the island commander, Captain Tsunzo Waki the secret agent and assistant naval attaché in Mexico City before Pearl Harbor, that he would send more weapons, and wished him a good fight. Upon arrival at Combined Fleet Shore headquarters outside Tokyo, Kuzaka's immediate problem was to determine once again where and how the next major battle should be fought. Like his predecessors, Kuzaka was imbued with the idea of the decisive battle, and inevitably his plan of operation was similar to Koga's. In March the Navy had been drastically reorganized, and now its main force, Vice Admiral G. Saburo Ozawa's first mobile fleet, was anchored at Linga Roads, off Singapore, close to its fuel supply but far from the critical area of the Philippines. Kuzaka recalled an old Chinese proverb, no matter how strong the bow, 
an arrow in long flight cannot tear the sheerest cloth. It would be necessary to bring the mobile fleet forward in a hop, skip and a jump. The hop would be to Tori Tori, one of the sunmost of the Philippine Islands, the skip the center of the Philippines, and the jump to the Palaus or Saipan. Kuzaka's plan was hand carried to Toy Oda, who was still at Yokosuka. It was approved, and emerged as a go, Operation A. Kuzaka recalled the neglected defenses of Saipan, and since the island's strength was essential to the operation, he hounded army officials who were responsible. Tojo, annoyed by Kuzaka's persistence, wrote him, I personally guarantee with a large seal the defense of Saipan. The messenger, a colonel, added that the army hoped the Americans would land at Saipan, they would be wiped out. By the end of April the technical details of Ego were resolved and a few days later Admiral Toy Oda issued the general orders. The decisive battle area would be the Palaus, and if the Americans headed straight for the Marianas, they would have to be lured south, to save mobile fleet fuel and be closer to land air bases, where a decisive battle with full strength will be opened at a favorable opportunity. The enemy would be attacked and destroyed for the most part in a day assault. But first the 540 land-based naval planes of the 1st Air Fleet would destroy at least one-third of the enemy task force carrier units. On May 10 Kuzaka's hop, skip and jump started, Ozawa's mobile fleet pulled out of Linga Roads and headed for Toy Toy. 4. The next American target was Saipan, the most strategic island of the Marianas, Nimitz would be in command. In the meantime MacArthur had already taken another long step toward his objective, the Philippines, by jumping all the way from eastern New Guinea to Hollandia, an important harbor area near the northwest end of the island, in an ambitious amphibious operation that completely surprised the 11,000 defenders. The roar of Allied naval guns sent most of the Japanese flying, 90% were service troops and the 52,000 invaders had little trouble in clearing the area. At minimal cost MacArthur had secured an excellent air, naval and logistics space. A week after the mobile fleet left Linga Roads he took another stride toward Tokyo, this one a 120-mile lunge farther west to the Sami area, which was served by two excellent airfields, with another under construction. There were 14,000 Japanese on hand but less than half were combat troops and they were caught as unawares as their comrades in Hollandia. They put up little resistance, two Americans were killed on the first day, and MacArthur had another valuable base. His next objective was Bayak, a small island to the west, strategically located in the mouth of New Guinea's largest bay. Bayak was 45 miles long and 20 miles wide, and had three serviceable airstrips which the Japanese considered important enough to defend with 10,000 men. On May 20 the Americans began a week of bombing, but this failed to alert the Japanese commander to the impending invasion, and the 41st Division landed on the island against almost no opposition. The first waves of GIs came ashore at the wrong place but by noon they had established a strong beachhead. On the combined fleet's new flagship, the cruiser Roy Odo, Toy Oda's staff was shaken by the suddenness of the Bayak landing, it had come on the 39th anniversary of Tsushima. Kuzaka, however, saw it as an opportunity. If we take it back, he said, that will draw the Pacific fleet in sufficiently close so that we can have the decisive battle near Palau. His reasoning swayed everyone except the intelligence officer, Commander Chika Takanakajima, who was of the opinion that MacArthur's landing at Bayak was secondary and that the main offensive, completely supported by the Pacific Fleet, would be directed at Saipan. But Kuzaka prevailed, and almost overnight a hasty plan to reinforce Bayak, Operation Con, was devised. Nakajima was, of course, right. The three divisions that would land at Saipan in 19 days, on June 15, had finished arduous training and rehearsed coordinated landings in Hawaii, and a flotilla of 110 naval transport vessels, together with an entire division of Liberty ships, was assembling to transport them, along with 7,000 corps and garrison troops, 
the 3200 miles to the landing area. The Marianas, a chain of tropical volcanic islands, were discovered by Magellan in 1521. He was so impressed by the native boats and their rigging that he named them the Islands of the Latin Sails, but to his less poetic crew they were known as the Islands of the Thieves. In the 17th century they were officially renamed to Onamariana of Austria, widow of Philip IV of Spain, but with the years the Spanish influence waned. America seized Guam, the largest of the islands, during the Spanish-American War. A few months later, in 1899, the Harried Spaniards sold the rest of their holdings in the Carolines, Marshalls and Marianas to Germany for some four million dollars. America could have had the islands, but the McKinley administration thought they weren't worth that much money. During World War I the Japanese occupied all these islands, and being on the winning side, were afterward given the mandate over them by the League of Nations. In 1935 they built Aslito Airfield at the southern end of Saipan, and a little later constructed a seaplane base on the west coast and a fighter strip at the northern tip. Some Americans accused Japan of using the island as a military and naval base contrary to the League of Nations covenant, but there was no more than a handful of troops on the island. All native children, they were chamaros, were required to attend a Japanese school for at least six years, and the brightest boys were encouraged to study at a specialized agricultural training school. Sugarcane was the main crop and production increased under the South Sea Development Company. By the time of Pearl Harbor, Saipan had become a little Tokyo, of its more than 30,000 people, fewer than 4,000 were Chamorros. The island was the length of Manhattan but more than twice its width. Between 1,554 foot Mount Topoch in the center and Mount Marpi at the northern end stretched a jagged ridge pocked with thousands of caves and marked by numerous little peaks and escarpments. This rugged area, as well as the cane fields which covered 70% of the island's 85 square miles, was ideally suited for defensive warfare. During the first two years of the war Saipan was nothing but a supply and staging area. Even after the fall of Tarawa and Kwajalein the garrison continued to be little more than a token force, and except for construction of scattered pillboxes, almost nothing was done to fortify the island that was Nimitz's next target. On the morning of February 23, 1944, his carrier-based bombers attacked the island's airfields. Civilians heard the firing of their own anti-aircraft guns, but where were the Japanese planes? Daily they had flown solo and in such numbers that it was almost impossible to teach school. 74 Japanese planes from Saipan, Tinian and Guam did get into the air, but they couldn't prevent the enemy from destroying 101 planes on the ground. They did manage to shoot down six Americans, but only seven of the 74 returned safely to their bases. On Saipan, quiet life was gone for good. Schools and plants were closed to allow the civilians to build shelters and help construct another airstrip. With work their spirits rose and they regained confidence. But orders came to repatriate old people, women and children to Japan. On March 3 America Maru sailed with 1700 passengers, most of them families of officials of the South Sea Development Company or influential citizens. It never reached the homeland. Three days later torpedoes sent it to the bottom. Troop transports bound for the Marianas were also torpedoed, and survivors, arriving in Saipan dejected and without weapons, brought with them the feeling of doom. In an attempt to stem the succession of American victories in the Central Pacific, Imperial headquarters reorganized the entire command structure of the region and sent Admiral Nagumo to Saipan to command a newly created Central Pacific Area Fleet. Theoretically Nagumo was supreme commander of all forces in the area, army as well as navy, but guidelines from Tokyo were so vague that he was virtually a figurehead. Late in May the 43rd Division, around which the defense of Saipan would be centered, sailed from Japan in two echelons. The first arrived safely, but the second, a convoy which was carrying more than 7,000 troops, 
was subjected to a series of submarine attacks, and five of the seven transports were sunk. The other two crammed their decks with survivors and continued on. About 5,500 finally reached Saipan with many badly burned or wounded. Few had equipment or weapons. The division was so disorganized that one staff officer, Major Takashi Hirokushi, reported that it would be six months before it could conduct any kind of defense. Nor were the positions they would defend yet prepared. Lieutenant General Hideyoshi Obatu of the 31st Army, who commanded all ground troops in the Marianas from headquarters in Saipan, officially warned Admiral Nagumo. Specifically, he wrote, unless the units are supplied with cement, steel reinforcements for cement, barbed wire, lumber, etc., which cannot be obtained in these islands, no matter how many soldiers there are they can do nothing in regard to fortifications but sit around with their arms folded, and the situation is unbearable. The situation now would not improve. Thousands of tons of building materials had already been sunk in transit and no more was on the way. Time had also run out on the 31,629 defenders, 25,469 army, 6,160 navy personnel. A massive armada of American ships, 535, was converging on Saipan. They carried 127,571 troops, two-thirds of them marines. At sea on June 7, they received word of another mighty assault. On one ship filled with marines the loudspeaker voice said, the invasion of France has started. That is all. There was silence. Thank God. Someone finally said. D-Day passed almost unnoticed in Japan. Combined fleet was preoccupied with Operation Con. The first attempt to reinforce Bayek had failed, destroyers and transports were turned back by persistent air attacks. A second attempt by six destroyers was already underway. Near noon of June 8 one of these was sunk by bombers, and the remaining five scuttled back north upon encountering a single American destroyer at midnight. Admiral Ozawa, commander of the mobile fleet, was not as easily intimidated. He radioed combined fleet that the airfields of Bayak were too valuable to lose and reminded his superiors that another attempt to retake the island might draw the American fleet into the anticipated zone of decisive battle and enable us to launch a go. Kizaka needed no urging, it was his own plan, after all, and he persuaded Toy Oda to let Ozawa make a final endeavor in greater force. Con was strengthened with a light cruiser, six destroyers and the two great battleships, Musashi and Yamato. On the afternoon of June 10 this redoubtable force left Toy Toy for the south. While Japanese attention was focused on Bayak, the Americans were approaching their primary target, Saipan, more than 1300 miles to the northeast. At midday, June 11, they launched a strike of 208 fighters and 8 torpedo bombers against Tinian and Saipan. Ignoring inaccurate anti-aircraft fire, they descended on the two islands, which were separated by a narrow channel, strafing and bombing. On Saipan, they left more than a hundred planes smoldering in flames sweeping through the four-foot high savanna grass on the slopes above Garapan, the largest town on the island. The whole purpose of Operation Con was suddenly negated. The Marianas were the main target. Combined fleet suspended Con and ordered its commander to rendezvous with Ozawa in the waters west of Saipan. Before the two forces met, seven American battleships and eleven destroyers began bombarding Saipan and Tinion. It was June 13, two days before the landing. During the day they expended 15,016 and 5-inch shells, but the gun crews had limited experience in shore bombardment, which called for slow, patient adjustment on specific targets, and little damage of military importance was inflicted. Before dawn they were joined by a more practiced fire support group, eight battleships, six heavy cruisers and five light cruisers. This time the aim was deliberate and accurate. In Garapan a young volunteer nurse by the name of Shizuya Komura, a tomboy with a round merry face, 
flinched as the first shells landed. She peered out the window of the first aid station into the dim light. The Americans were bombarding the town again. As the explosions moved closer she helped transfer those wounded in the earlier shelling to a dugout. With daylight came enemy planes and an even more violent barrage from the ships. It is June 14th, Shizuko thought calmly. I have lived for 18 years and my time to die has come. A shell shook the dugout like an earthquake and knocked her to the ground. She staggered outside. The first aid station was obliterated. She saw a piece of red metal, it was shrapnel, and, curious, touched it with her finger. It burnt her. Planes droned overhead but no one was firing at them. Garapan was aflame. The heat was so intense that she could hardly breathe. She started to make her way through the rubbled streets strewn with bodies. Offshore two 96-man underwater demolition teams were boldly exploring the reefs south of Garapan. They found no obstacles but their presence helped convince Lieutenant General Yoshitsuga Saito, commander of the 43rd Division, that the invasion was actually at hand and would come on the west coast. He concentrated his troops to meet the attack shifted his artillery and set up new headquarters on the west coast. Saito was eminently unsuited by nature and training to lead combat troops. He was a stodgy, colorless cavalryman whose previous command had been a horse procurement unit. That his division was chosen as the nucleus of Saipan's defense proved how unimportant the island was considered by Tokyo. Many of the other troops on Saipan were random units salvaged from sinkings. They were poorly organized, lacked leadership and were without weapons. Admiral Negumo was the titular head of this haphazard defense force, but he always deferred to General Abata of 31st Army, and he was away on an inspection trip of the palace, and his chief of staff, Major General Keiji Aigta, was outranked by Saito. This put the tactical command of the island under the hapless Saito. He was saddled with the philosophy that had governed and depleted the defense against every invasion to date. Tokyo had decreed that as usual, Saipan was to be defended primarily on the beaches, not in depth. Transports and LSTs carrying the 2nd and 4th Marine Divisions were drawing close to the west coast of Saipan and would be in position for debarkation the following morning, June 15. On the island they would encounter more than one kind of enemy. As the medical officer of one unit warned, after facing sharks, barracuda, sea snakes, razor sharp coral, poison fish, and giant clams in the surf, they would find worse hazards ashore leprosy, typhus, filariasis, typhoid, and dysentery, as well as snakes and giant lizards. Sir, one private ventured, why don't we let the Japs keep the island? A more ominous admonition came from a graduate of UCLA, an American girl of Japanese descent who had been visiting a sick aunt in Japan when the war broke out. Nicknamed Tokyo Rose by the Americans, she first went on the air as an, short for an answer, and currently called herself often Annie, your favorite enemy. I've got some swell recordings for you, she was broadcasting, just in from the States. You'd better enjoy them while you can, because tomorrow at 0600 you're hitting Saipan. And we're ready for you. So, while you're still alive, let's listen to. The dark ships slowly drew nearer to Saipan, the skies overhead glowing red from burn in buildings, grass, and woods. Marines on deck could barely make out the formidable silhouette of Mount Tapocha through the early morning haze. As the sky lightened, the island, a shadowy purplish land mass, looked like a great monster rising out of the sea. Churan Kanoa emerged detail by detail, the two divisions would land on a four-mile front centering on the little town. Five miles to the north Garapan, too, took form. There a diversionary force would pretend to land. Battleships, cruisers and destroyers began the final bombardment at 5.30. The dug-in defenders along the beaches and on the slopes crouched through the ordeal, prepared to fight to the death. One made a final notation in his diary, 
we are waiting with Molotov cocktails and hand grenades ready for the word to rush forward recklessly into the enemy ranks with our swords in our hands. All that worries me is what will happen to Japan after we die. Twelve minutes later Vice Admiral Richmond Gully Turner, in command of the Joint Expeditionary Force, issued the order, land the landing force. Over loudspeakers boomed the chaplain's last prayers and blessings. On time correspondent Robert Sherrod's ship, Chaplain Cunningham was saying. Most of you will return, but some of you will meet the God who made you. A lieutenant colonel named Tomkins turned to Sherrod and remarked, Perish the thought department. Winches lowered boats, hatches were cleared. At seven o'clock the shelling ceased and thirty-four LSTs churned up to the line of departure, a little over two miles from shore. The huge bow doors of the bulky vessels yawned open and Amphtracks, loaded with marines, crawled out and began circling in the water like great water bugs. Planes, the first of 155, were already bombing the Chiruncano area to keep the beach defenders pinned down, when they left half an hour later the entire shoreline was veiled by clouds of smoke and dust. The bombing was a thrilling sight to Sherrod but he wrote in his notebook, I fear all this smoke and noise does not mean Japs have been killed. Soon after 8 o'clock 719 Amphtracks, filled with 8 battalions of marines, started for sure preceded by gunboats and amphibian tanks. Officers passed out chewing gum and warned their men to be ready to discard their heavy cartridge belts in case they had to swim for it. The four-mile-wide flotilla raked her within 800 yards of the shore before a shower of mortar and artillery shells rained down upon the invaders. Eighteen amphibian tanks clambered like crabs over the barrier reef. Behind them several amphtracks were sunk but the rest followed over the reef and into the shallow blue-green lagoon. Dozens of planes coming in low strafed the beach while warships pounded shore defenses for the last time with their five-inch guns. It was a spectacular sight, organized bedlam. The landing plan was original. The tanks were to crawl up on the beach and cover the inf tracks, which would transport the troops all the way to high ground. The first wave hit the beach at 8.44, and within 20 minutes, more than 8,000 marines had landed. It was soon evident that all the intense pre-invasion bombardment had not silenced the Japanese. Innumerable machine gun nests and mortar emplacements between the beaches and the ridge opened up a withering fire which did not stop until their crews were blasted to bits. While it lasted it was so accurate that most of the Imphtrax had to discharge their load at the edge of the beach. The ones getting through encountered another kind of obstacle, they got bogged down in the sand or were caught in craters and didn't have the power to climb out. The marines fought their way slowly into Chiron Kanoa. It wasn't made of bamboo and paper as they had imagined, but was a complex of concrete one and two story structures covered with bougainvillea in bloom. Each was a little fort. At the center of town they infiltrated past a baseball diamond and grandstand incongruously flanked by a Buddhist temple. From a flimsy 30-foot high observation tower perched on the slopes behind Garapan, Admiral Negumo watched the invasion. He stood transfixed at the sight of the overwhelming number of ships but turned briefly to Yeoman Noda, who had served as a clerk under Yamamoto until his death to note that at least four of the battleships he had sunk at Pearl Harbor were back in action. His tone indicated as much admiration as concern. Not far away, a stray American shell plummeted down on General Saito's staff during an outdoor meeting near the cave that served as his command post. When the smoke cleared, Saito was still sitting unhurt and silent, with his sword stuck in the ground between his spread legs. On both sides men lay sprawled. Half the staff was dead. But he remained optimistic about the battle itself, although marines continued to land, 20,000 during the day, they had suffered 2,000 casualties, and only half of the beachhead had been secured, and radioed Tokyo. After dark this division will launch a night attack in force and expect to annihilate the enemy at one swoop. The men who had to plan the night attack were not as confident. 
with the division scattered and their own casualties mounting, there were only 36 tanks and a thousand infantrymen available to annihilate the enemy at one swoop. The operation went wrong from the beginning. Saito was to meet the attack force on a hill above Churan Kanoa to send them off personally, but the Americans, attracted by all the movement toward the assembly point, scattered the general's staff with accurate artillery fire. The tankers waited hour after hour for Saito, who had become separated from his staff in the confusion and darkness. After midnight word came that he had been burned to death in a sugarcane fire. Major Hirokushi, transformed from public relations officer to commander of the infantry, was relieved of that duty and dispatched to recover the general's body while another officer took charge of the assault. He mounted the first tank, but before it had gone half a mile a shell brought it to a standstill. The remaining tanks clanked down the hill without bothering to wait for the infantrymen. At the bottom they blundered into the swamp east of town and most of them became mired down. The tanks that managed to churn free were finally joined by the panting infantrymen. Officers, swords aloft, led the headlong charge. The Japanese burst into the marine positions with such vigor that it took a cannonade from 5-inch naval guns and intense machine gun and rifle fire to stop them. They regrouped and charged again and again. Almost 700 died and the American lines were still intact. Major Hirokushi nearly lost his own life in his attempt to find Saito's body. Incendiary shells made an inferno of a cane field he was crossing and only his sword saved him. Using it as a scythe, he cut a path through to safety. Exhausted, he reached the division command post an hour before dawn. A solitary figure was sitting outside the cave, chin on chest. It was General Saito. Are you all right, division commander? Hirokushi asked. Saito looked up but made no response. In a cave overlooking Garapan the nurse Shizuyakomura, who had escaped through the burning town the day before, huddled with other civilians. A soldier peered in with word that more Americans were starting to land just below Garapan, and the tank call located near the town was moving out to stop them. Shizuyako scrambled outside. Her elder brother was in one of the tanks. Below, Garapan was still in flames and through the smoky dawn she saw a ship, it was an LST, approach the reef south of town. It's starting. A soldier shouted. Boats, amphtracks, were disgorging from the mother ship. She watched, almost hypnotized, as the strange craft scuttled over the reef. Angry spits of fire winked from woods along the shore. Tanks rolled out of Garapan and started toward the beach. My brother! Shizuko exclaimed. Girl! Get back in the cave where it's safe, a soldier warned her. She ignored him and pushed through a crowd of men to get a better look. The tanks were at the pier. Their guns barked, accompanied by the rattling of machine gun and rifle fire from the woods. Some of the American boats turned back. Two white hospital ships approached the reef. Flames suddenly leapt out of one. There were flashes from the big warships far beyond the reef. Then came a series of distant rumbles that were drowned out by shattering explosions from Garapan. The air trembled from the concussions. Enemy planes swept in strafing the shore. The firing from the woods ceased. More landing craft were swarming toward the reef. Here they stopped, tiny figures leapt out, and holding guns high above their heads, waded across the wide lagoon toward the dock area. Fifteen minutes later they were scrambling up the piers, their faces seemed to be blackened. The tanks were silent. Her brother and all the other tankers must have been killed. To the south, across the water, she could make out the silhouette of Tinian, where she had last seen her mother, father and younger sisters. Had that island too been invaded? Were she and her elder sister, who had evacuated Garapan a week earlier? the only ones in the family alive. Unable to make herself go back to the safety of the cave, she stared vacantly at the death and destruction below. She roused herself with a sudden decision, she would volunteer as a nurse at the main field hospital near Mount Donne on the other side of the island. She took a last look at smoldering Garapan. 
small boats were clustered around the piers and Americans already pushed inland. Brother, goodbye, she said and started resolutely up the ridge. Hey, woman, where do you think you're going? A soldier called to her from the mouth of the cave. Enemy planes. He pointed in the air with his rifle but she hurried on, ignoring the fighters that swooped down. Once over the ridge the war seemed far away. She passed a long line of civilians waiting for hardtack. A young woman broke away from the group and embraced her, it was her older sister. Shizuko told her about their brother's death and that she was going to mount Don a Bakayaro. Her brother-in-law was indignant. You can't go alone to a place where there are only men. Your parents entrusted you to my care. If something happened to you, how could I apologize to them? The rest of the family is dead. She burst out. Do you want to be the only one alive? These fools had not seen the destruction of Garapan, the corpses littering the streets, they still imagined the soldiers would protect them. She reached the hospital on the slopes of Mount Donne as the sun was setting. It was a barren field where a vast gathering of wounded men lay on the ground in rows so close together that she could hardly walk between them. Overcome by the stench, she did not notice a middle-aged captain, a surgeon, surveying her through round, thick glasses. Women can't do anything here, he scolded. Besides, this is the army and we can't permit civilians to remain. Go back down the mountain before it gets too dark. She told him that her father and mother and younger sisters were dead and that she had seen her brother killed in battle at Garapan. The captain walked away but she followed him, pleading. He stopped to talk with another doctor, a young lieutenant, still ignoring her. Finally he motioned to her. All right, he said sternly, from now on you are a nurse. He gave her his red cross armband and the lieutenant clapped a helmet on her head. This is the army, and never act selfishly, said the captain. There were eleven of them to care for all the wounded, three doctors, seven medics and herself. Obey your commander's order at all times. Many painful and sad things are going to take place. Don't give up and do your best. She looked down at the armband with such obvious pride that the lieutenant gave a little laugh. She's young and I'm afraid she may become emotional. Her first duty was holding a flashlight for the little medical team which worked rapidly down a long line of patients. A medic jerked at a protruding piece of shrapnel in one man's back. The patient groaned, fainted. It's easier when they pass out, the medic told her and yanked again, without success. The captain, the chief surgeon, came over and cut away flesh with a scalpel. The aide tried a third time. Shizuko's hand shook, and the light wavered. Steady, said the surgeon as he pulled out a red and black piece of shrapnel as big as a fist. Shizuko felt cold sweat under her arms as the surgeon gave the patient an injection. The medic took a mouthful of water and sprayed it on the man's face. The next patient was wounded in the left foot. The surgeon handed her a pair of scissors. Cut off the trousers, he said. She found a blood-soaked bandage underneath, stuck to the wound as if it were glued. She plucked at it, fearing the man might scream if she pulled too hard. Don't hesitate, nurse, said the surgeon sharply. If you're afraid of a wound and feel so much pity that you can't hurt a patient, you're useless. Here. The patient gritted his teeth. The bandage came free under the surgeon's steady pull and she could see shattered bones. Blood flooded out. The surgeon examined the wound. The foot won't be of any use now. We should cut it off. He pricked the foot with the scissors. Do you feel it? No. It's to be expected. He turned to Shizuko. Nurse, cut off the flesh, and no hesitation. Nauseated. Shizuka began clipping the loose flesh. The soldier trembled with every tentative swish of the blades, and greasy sweat broke out on his forehead. At last she was finished. The surgeon, who had been watching impatiently, turned to a colleague. Shall we operate? He wondered and asked the medic how many anesthetic injections were left. There were but three boxes. We'll treat him later, the surgeon decided. 
over the wound, nurse. With the same bandage. She replaced the old blood-stained bandage and the patient was carried to one side. This time, nurse, do the whole thing by yourself, said the surgeon. What little confidence she had left vanished. She hoped she'd get someone with a slight wound. A new patient was brought in and the stretcher bearers smiled at her. She gritted her teeth and somehow got the bandage off for the surgeon's inspection. Each time it was easier. Concerned about the young soldier with the wounded foot, she finally got up her courage to remind the surgeon that he was supposed to operate. I completely forgot, he said and ordered the patient carried to the operating table. The words themselves made Shizuko's heart beat quickly. The stretcher was placed on two boxes while a medic brought out a plate filled with instruments. First the patient was injected in the back. As soon as the anesthetic took effect the surgeon deftly cut flesh from around the bone with a scalpel that glittered in the light. The medic began hacking with a little saw, scattering the bone in a white powder-like substance. The patient groaned in pain. Cheer up. It'll be over in a minute, the medic who was holding the flashlight encouraged him. Moments later, it seemed like an hour to Shizuko. The bone was severed and the surgeon began trimming away thick pulpy flesh. A stream of red spurted out of the stump. The doctor grabbed at the blood vessel with pincers, but it slipped away and he couldn't find it in the uncertain light. Shizuko could see the blue vessel plainly and pushed forward impatiently, Doctor, I can pick it up. Without a word he handed her the pincers. Quickly she plucked up the spurting vessel. The surgeon took the pincers while she bound it tightly with hemp yarn. All right, said the surgeon. He put in a few stitches, like an expert seamstress, applied some gauze, bandaged the stump and again injected the patient. Thank you very much, said the soldier in a voice as faint as a whisper. The marines had done little that day except buttress lines in preparation for a drive across the island. Most of their artillery was ashore and GIs of the 27th Division were landing. General Saito still had hopes of pushing the Americans back into the sea with the help of tanks and men of a naval special landing force. His first objective was an enemy concentration near the Saipan radio station in the suburbs of Garapan. The attack was set for dusk but the orders were so confusing, the communications so poor and the problems of terrain so difficult that it wasn't until ten hours later that twenty-five tanks and five hundred men funneled down the ravine leading to the radio station. The marines, alerted by the squeak and rattle of armor, called for illumination. Ships lobbed star shells overhead, catching the attackers in the open where they were overwhelmed by a deluge of fire from artillery, mortar, bazooka, rifle and machine gun. Tanks burst into fire silhouetting others which rumbled out of the shadows. Within an hour most of them were either destroyed or abandoned, but the infantry kept fighting until after dawn. It was no use. The Americans were still in place. They would never be driven into the sea. The failure of the counterattack was ignored by Tokyo. The army general staff, in the name of the emperor, radioed 31st Army. Because the fate of the Japanese Empire depends on the result of your operation, inspire the spirit of the officers and men and to the very end continue to destroy the enemy gallantly and persistently, thus assuaging the anxiety of our Emperor. General Igt replied. Have received your honorable imperial words and we are grateful for boundless magnanimity of the imperial favor. By becoming the bulwark of the Pacific with ten thousand deaths, we hope to requite the imperial favor. The Japanese were again committed to a useless fight to the death. With dawn Shizuko could see that the hospital area was surrounded by rocky little peaks. It was like a stadium with no protection from air raids. There were at least a thousand wounded men on the ground, and the little valley resounded with their constant but subdued chorus of agony. If there is a hell, she thought, this is it. With two aides holding a large can she went down the lanes of men doling out water. She put a cup to the lips of an inert corporal. He seemed dead. Another patient shook him. Yoshida, it's water. You wanted it so much. Look, Yoshida, 
it's a nurse from Japan. The corporal slowly opened his eyes and groped for her. She grasped his feeble hand tightly and said, Soldier, I've brought you water. Drink. He mumbled. He's dreaming of home, his friend explained. The word home tightened her throat, then she remembered the admonition about becoming emotional. She bent over another figure. He had nothing on but a loincloth, and kept his face hidden in his hands. His left eye was black, as big as a ping pong ball. It was covered with squirming maggots. The other eye had been gouged out by the worms. Her hands trembled. Let me treat you, soldier. He remained silent as she picked out the maggots one by one with pincers and dropped them into a can. My brother was in the army, she said. He was a tank man. On June 4th he came to Sayapan from Manchuria, and on the 16th, near Garapan, he died fighting the enemy. That's why I can't see a soldier without thinking of him as my brother. Is that why you came here? He said in a toneless voice. She explained why she had become a nurse. Tears flowed out of his terrible left eye. Thank you. She started to speak about her family and he painfully fumbled for something tucked under his loincloth. It was a blood-stained picture of a woman in kimono. Is this your wife? The man, his name was Lieutenant Shinoda, nodded. She's still young. He told her that he had joined the army three days after the wedding. When I was wounded all I could think of was my wife. I wanted to live for her sake. But I shall die. Shizuko couldn't speak. She resumed plucking out maggots, removing all but those tenaciously clinging to the center of the eyes. To kill these she soaked two wads of gauze in mercurochrome and placed them over his eyes. She applied a bandage and told him she would return. Help is surely coming. Hold out until then because your wife is waiting for you. The next day. It was June 18th and the Marines had cut Saipan into just below Mount Donay, Shizuko managed to find him a uniform. She changed his eye bandage but discovered that the mercurochrome had done no good. The gauze itself was alive with maggots. He wanted the picture sent back to his wife when he died. You won't die. I will surely cure you. And we've heard that reinforcements are coming. Then you can return to the homeland. Keep up your spirits. To change the subject she talked about her brother and four sisters. She alone was a tomboy and her mother always told her, Shizuko, behave like a woman. She told Shinoda how lucky he was to have someone waiting back home and how hard the doctors and medics were working to save men like him. Nurse, you're really great, said a lively voice. She looked up at a baby-faced second lieutenant. His right arm was in a sling and he had other wounds, but he was in good spirits. Cheer up. He told his dejected companions. How can you call yourselves soldiers and be so downcast? Reinforcements will come in time. All at once his eyes glistened and he said as if in a dream, I have a sister in Hokkaido who is about as old as you. For the past two days I've been admiring you and it made me wonder what my sister was doing. In the Diet the previous year, Tojo had denied that his regime was a dictatorship, people often refer to this as a dictatorial government, but I should like to make the matter clear. The man called Tojo is no more than a single humble subject. I am just the same as you. The sole difference is that I have been given the responsibility of being Prime Minister. To this extent I am different. It is only when I am exposed to the light of His Majesty that I shine. Were it not for this light, I would be no better than a pebble by the roadside. It is because I enjoy the confidence of His Majesty and occupy my present position that I shine. This puts me in a completely different category from those European rulers who are known as dictators. Another assassination attempt by an elite group of 50 aviation technocrats had already failed. These young men dealt with the research and production of army planes. Just before Pearl Harbor they had sent an appeal to Tojo to delay war for 20 years, until Japan would be properly prepared to engage a major power. Tojo listened to their arguments in a private meeting and promised to give them two decades to build up the Air Force. 
Consequently, when war came they held Tojo personally responsible. Within six months their fears about the issue of the war were confirmed by technical setbacks, for example, machine tools were losing their precision, and defects in plane design would take years to correct. During the battle for good Alcanal, Tojo told these technical experts to devise some way to fly planes without gas, suggesting they use something like air. They laughed aloud until they realized he was serious, then unanimously pledged themselves to a program for peace. They went to Prince Kona with their demands and later to Tojo himself. The subsequent reprimand incited the fifteen most headstrong to vow to assassinate Tojo. One evening their leader, First Lieutenant Hiroshi Sato, after drinking too much sake, quarreled with their commanding officer and blurted out, a man like Tojo should be killed. Kempe investigated the group, but the only one punished was Sato. He was given a week's confinement on a drunk charge. The ringleaders, however, were all sent to the front. There are several theories about Koga's death. One is that he was ambushed, like Yamamoto, U.S. Navy planes shot down his plane and the dying Koga was picked up by an American submarine. There are no available American records of such an ambush or the recovery of the Koga plane. It could have crashed on some island, but it seems far more likely that it was lost at sea, victim of the storm. Section due largely to the efforts of General Courtney Whitney, head of the Allied Intelligence Bureau, Cushing was reinstated. After the war he was awarded a substantial cash bonus for his contributions to victory. It should have been enough money to last Cushing for life in the islands, but he spent it all in a few months on a series of celebrations that ranged across the Pacific to California. He died in the Philippines twenty years later, beloved by the men who had fought with him, but still a confirmed individualist to the end. On Sebuda persists the belief that it was Koga who had been held by Cushing, and that he later committed suicide in Manila. The Japanese commander on Cebu, Colonel Anishi, also believed it was Koga he had rescued and that he subsequently committed Harukiri. Admiral Fukudom is still alive and spoke of his captivity but was reluctant to go into detail. Most of the information about this event came from Cushing and his comrades. These American suspicions helped give rise to sensational stories involving the last flight of Amelia Earhart. Miss Earhart and her navigator, Fred Noonan, took off from Lee, New Guinea, on a July morning in 1937, in a twin-engine Lockheed, and disappeared. After the war, rumors persisted that the two had purposely veered off course to spy on military installations on Saipan and had crashed near the seaplane base. They were supposedly imprisoned and then either died of injuries or were executed. Tony Benaventi, a police official on Saipan, helped two American officials investigate the case. They interviewed some fifteen men and women, later characterized by Mr. Benaventi as reliable witnesses, who identified the pictures of Earhart and Noonan as two American prisoners they had seen in the summer of 1937, and one said he had noticed two blindfolded Caucasians answering descriptions of Earhart and Noonan in the sidecar of a Japanese motorcycle near the seaplane base. A Japanese told him they were American spies who had been picked up offshore. Nevertheless, there is no conclusive evidence as to the fate of Melia Earhart, nor is any confirmation on the subject available from official Japanese sources. 20. Seven Lives to Repay Our Country 1. Word of American landings on Saipan brought to swift reaction from Admiral Somutoi Oda. He radioed Admiral Ozawa to attack the enemy in the Marianas area and annihilate his fleet. Five minutes later Toy Oda sent a second message, which repeated Togo's famous words at Tsushima Bay. The rise and fall of Imperial Japan depends on this one battle. Every man shall do his utmost. As the mobile fleet moved closer to the Marianas, Ozawa and his staff completed plans for the battle. The admiral was tall and stocky. A cool, reticent man, he moved and thought with deliberation. Trained in torpedo warfare, 
he had assiduously studied carrier tactics and was confident he could beat the Americans, even though he was outnumbered two to one in flat ops. His aircraft had longer range and could attack from as far out as 300 miles, almost a hundred miles beyond American capabilities. He could also utilize Guam for refueling and rearming in a sort of shuttle operation. Consequently, he could stay out of range of the enemy while attacking, moreover, he would have support from the 500 planes based in the Marianas. Along with his own 473 planes, that should give him as many as Spruans had. But plans are only as good as the information they are based on and already, unbeknownst to Ozawa, a large portion of the land-based planes had been destroyed by marauding American carrier pilots flying the new Hellcat fighter. It could outclimb and outdive the Zero and was heavily armed. The pilot was protected by heavy armor plating behind, and a thick, bulletproof windshield ahead. I love this airplane so much, said one Navy pilot, that if it could cook I'd marry it. The pilots themselves were better prepared than their predecessors. Each had at least two years training and over 300 flying hours, whereas their antagonists were faint copies of those who had fought at Pearl Harbor and Midway. They had six months training at the most and many had logged few hours in the air and they were called upon to fly a somewhat improved version of the Zero of Pearl Harbor days that was now so outclassed. On the afternoon of June 18 one of Ozawa's search planes discovered an enemy force, including an unknown number of carriers west of Saipan. Forty miles away from this first sighting another search plane reported unknown number of carriers, plus ten other ships. This was Spruance's striking power, Task Force 58, commanded by Vice Admiral Mark Mitcher, who had skippered Hornet in the Doolittle Raid and the Battle of Midway. He was small, taciturn, hard bitten. Usually he sat at the after end of his flag bridge in a steel armchair facing the stern, his bald head covered by a duck billed lobster man's hat. His was a formidable aggregation, almost twice the size of the mobile fleet seven big carriers, eight light ones, seven battleships, eight heavy cruisers, thirteen light cruisers and sixty-nine destroyers. Rear Admiral Suyo Obayashi, commander of the three Japanese carriers nearest Micha, was tempted to attack at once. The basic principle of air battle was to strike first. After informing Ozawa, he ordered an immediate assault. Some of his planes were in the air before a message arrived from Ozawa requesting all ships to retire and prepare for a massive aerial battle the next morning. Obayashi recovered his planes. Let's do it properly tomorrow, he told his staff, but privately he feared that such a golden opportunity would not present itself again. Mitya still had no warning that the mobile fleet was approaching. He had been cautioned by Spruance not to sortie in search of the enemy. The main assignment of Task Force 58 was to cover Saipan, but when direction finding apparatus detected Ozawa in the area he told his chief of staff, Captain Arlie Burke, it might be a hell of a battle for a while, but I think we can win it, and asked permission by voice radio just before midnight to come to a westerly course at 0130 in order to commence treatment of the enemy at 0500. Like Mitcher. Spruance wanted to destroy Ozawa's carriers, yet was bound by definite orders to capture, occupy and defend Saipan, Tinian and Guam. Allowing Micha to be lured away from the Marianas, therefore, would be too much of a gamble, he remembered, moreover, how Admiral Togo had waited at Tsushima Strait for the Imperial Russian fleet to come to him, we had somewhat the same situation, and he answered, change proposed does not appear advisable. End run by other, enemy, carrier groups remains possibility and must not be overlooked. At 4.45 on June 19 Ozawa again launched search planes, but it was a cloudy, squally morning and it wasn't until 7.30 that Task Force 58 was finally discovered southwest of Saipan. On the bridge of the flagship, the newly commissioned 33,000-ton 800-foot-long carrier Taiho, there was no doubt that this would be a historic day for the Imperial Navy, perhaps another Tsushima. 
Before the first wave of 71 planes took off, flight leaders reported to the bridge vowing to avenge the shame of midway. 26 minutes later the second wave, 128 planes, lifted from the decks. A dive bomber pilot, warrant officer Akio Komatsu, noticed a torpedo, it had come from the U.S. submarine Albacore, plowing directly at Taiho. Without hesitation he rammed his stick to the side and forward, and his bomber rocked in a suicide dive at the running torpedo. His plane intercepted it a hundred yards short of the carrier. From the bridges Awa and his staff watched as plane and torpedo were both destroyed in one thundering geyser. Then they saw the track of another fish. The big carrier began a turn but the second torpedo smashed into her starboard side. The damage seemed of slight consequence. What could a single hit do to a ship that was unsinkable? Aboard Oyodo, the flagship of the combined fleet, which was just weighing anchor at Yokosuka Harbor, Vice Admiral Kuzaka was not as confident of the day as Ozawa. He had reservations about the mobile fleet's long range attack, it was like a boxer reaching too far out. But he became infected by the optimism around him. The staff gave Ozawa four out of five chances for victory. He started to call his steward to prepare sake cups for a celebration, but decided not to tempt fate. He could wait until the first wave had contact with the enemy. Two hours passed without a report. Confidence on the bridge was replaced by uneasiness and then doubt. At last a message arrived, Taiho had been somewhat damaged. Toy Oda was silent but the staff exchanged perturbed looks, Kuzaka had a sickening premonition that worse news was coming. At 10 o'clock American radar picked up Ozawa's first wave. Mitcha personally sounded the alarm over the radio with a hey, Rube. The signal for all Hellcats to return to their ships and prepare for battle. By the time the raiders were within 72 miles of his flagship, the new Lexington, fighters began taking off from her flight deck. The first to see the enemy was Lieutenant Commander C.W. Brewer. He rolled over, and followed by his eleven men, streaked toward the enemy. He blew up a Japanese bomber, blasted the wing off another, then shook off a zero and set it to fire, and moments later gunned down another. Now Hellcats from three other carriers joined the fight. They viciously ripped into the oncoming Japanese formation sending at least 25 spinning into the sea. The rest pressed on toward the carriers, but encountered a second wave of Hellcats. Sixteen more tumbled down. A single Japanese penetrated the defense line to hit the battleship South Dakota. The second wave was 60 miles from target when a dozen Hellcats from Essex swept in on them. Fighters from other carriers quickly closed in and in a few minutes had shot down almost 70 planes. Ozawa's third wave, 47 planes, was given the wrong coordinates and only 12 were diverted in time to the battle area. Seven of these were shot down. The 84 planes of the fourth wave were also misdirected. Six finally reached the carriers but did no damage. The main group, after a futile search for American carriers, jettisoned their bombs and headed for Guam. As they were making their final approach on Oatfield, 27 Hellcats on the prowl hurtled down and destroyed 30 planes, those that landed were so badly shot up that they could not be repaired. In a few hours Ozawa had lost 346 planes while shooting down 15. Japanese naval air power had been crippled, and permanently. Although not a single American bomb or torpedo had been launched against the mobile fleet, it too had been dealt a devastating blow. Just before noon the skipper of the submarine Kavler, Commander Herman J. Kessler, raised his periscope to behold a picture too good to be true, Shikaku, a veteran of Pearl Harbor, Coral Sea and Santa Cruz, was recovering planes. But Kessler couldn't make out what kind of flag she was flying, it might be an American ship. He took another look, goddamn. There was the rising sun, big as hell. He moved in and at 1,000 yards loosed a spread of six torpedoes. Three hit, setting off a series of internal detonations. Flames enveloped the carrier. As her bow settled, 
water poured through the number one elevator into the hangar. She turned over heavily and sank just after three o'clock. Taiho, hit by the single torpedo from Albacore at the beginning of the battle, had inadvertently become a floating bomb. A damage control officer had ordered all ventilating ducts opened on the theory that this would clear gasoline fumes. Instead, his action caused the vapors to permeate the ship. Half an hour after Shikaku went down, a shuddering explosion racked Taiho. From her bridge the senior staff officer, Captain Toshikazu Omi, saw the armored flight deck suddenly blossom up like Mount Fuji. The hull on the hangar level blew out and the carrier began to settle rapidly. Ozawa wanted to stay with the ship. He would listen to no one until Omi, who had been his close subordinate for years, said, the battle is still going on and you should remain in command for the final victory. Ozawa silently followed his senior staff officer into a cutter. Fifteen minutes after they had transferred to a cruiser there was a second thunderous detonation. Taiho tilted sharply to port and slid into the water stern first. At Combined Fleet Headquarters, aboard Oyodo, there was no longer any doubt that Ago had failed. The staff debated whether the mobile fleet should be ordered to fall back at once. Kizaka didn't think the decision should be left up to Ozawa. From personal experience at Midway he knew how difficult it was for a commander to retire on his own from a losing battle. He got Toy Oda's approval to dispatch in order to withdraw. Ozawa had already pulled back to the northwest under cover of darkness to refuel in order to resume the battle the next morning. His opponent, Mitcher, had recovered his planes, and with Spruance's concurrence, started after the mobile fleet with three of his four carrier groups. But he headed southwest, the wrong direction, and it wasn't until 3.40 the following afternoon that a search plane finally located Ozawa some 275 miles away. Though dusk would fall in a few hours, Mitch decided to gamble, the target was barely within range of his planes, they would have to strike in the fading light of day, and, finally, try to find their way home in darkness. He turned Task Force 58 into the wind and launched 216 planes. The sun was low as the attackers sighted half a dozen enemy oilers. A few planes peeled off and sank two of these ships while the rest, with orders to concentrate on carriers, fanned out to the northwest. The clouds above the mobile fleet were brilliantly colored in the sunset. Ozawa managed to get 75 planes into the air, and these, with the help of anti-aircraft fire, knocked down 20 Americans but the others broke through the screen. Bombers hit Ozawa's new flagship, Zuikaku, sister ship of Shikaku, the light carrier Chioda, a battleship and a cruiser, but inflicted no serious damage. Then four torpedo planes from Bellwood dropped out of the clouds and swept in low on another carrier, Hio. They were led by Lieutenant, J. G. George Brown, who had vowed at takeoff to get a carrier no matter what. His plane was set on fire but he came in relentlessly and dropped his torpedo. At his machine gun in the stern of Hio, Chief Petty Officer Mitsukuni Oshita heard the cry torpedo coming. He began to count. At twelve he knew the torpedo had missed, and relaxed. An explosion jarred Hio. Oshitu had counted too fast. A second torpedo rocked the carrier. Fires spread from deck to deck and all power went off. Dead in the water, she began listing to port and the word went out to abandon ship. At the extreme stern, Oshitu and a dozen others heard nothing and refused to leave Hio without a definite order. The ship settled rapidly. Water gurgled up to Oshita's machine gun and he, along with his comrades, started for the rail. Wait! Their commander, a young ensign, drew his sword threateningly. Sing a mukaba. They hurried through the traditional song, but the ensign continued to restrain them with his sword. Now sing the naval march, he ordered. The cowed men sang until the water reached their knees, then broke past the officer and over the side. Oshita looked back. Fire belched out of the carrier. Spotlighted in the red glare, the ensign clung to the stern rail, sword in hand, still singing. 
he disappeared as the great bow reared high, and Oshita had to swim desperately to avoid the suction. The ship is going down. Someone shouted. Oshita turned around. Hayo was sticking up like the finger of a giant. She plunged out of sight with a horrible sigh as if, thought Oshita, she was saying, this is the end. The long trip home for Mitch's flyers had turned into a nightmare. Pilot after pilot reported he was running out of gas. I'm going in while I've still got power. So long, called one. Where's somebody? I'm lost, radioed a second. Sending out these men had been a daring decision and Mitch now made another. He ordered the lights on his carriers turned on even though it made them glaring targets for prowling submarines. The effect on the pilots left behind was magnetic, Lieutenant Commander Robert Winston recalled. They stood open-mouthed for the sheer audacity of asking the Japs to come and get us. Then a spontaneous cheer went up. To hell with the Japs around us. Our pilots were not to be expendable. Fortunately for the Americans, there were no enemy submarines in the area, and all but 38 of the returning pilots were saved. The battle was over. Officially it would be known as the Battle of the Philippine Sea, but to Americans who were there it would always be the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot, a name originated by Commander Paul B. of Lexington. They had sunk three heavy carriers and destroyed 92% of Ozawa's carrier planes and 72% of his float planes, as well as 50 Guam-based aircraft, a total of 475 or so, at a cost of two oilers and 130 planes, including 80 which had splashed near or crashed on their carriers. But the victory was marred by acrid criticism of the man who had engineered it for not pursuing Ozawa more aggressively. Admiral J. J. Jocko, Clark, commander of four carriers in the battle, charged that Raymond Spruance had missed the chance of the century, and Admiral A. E. Montgomery, who led four other carriers, officially reported that the results were extremely disappointing to all hands. At Naval Air Headquarters in Pearl Harbor the common complaint was, this is what comes of placing a non-aviator in command over carriers. Spruance made no excuses. It would have been much better and more satisfactory to have gone after Ozawa's carriers, but he had done what Nimitz wanted, protected Saipan, and in doing so forever after changed the course of war in the Pacific. The night after the battle Ozawa dictated a letter of resignation to Admiral Toy Oda but the commander-in-chief of Combined Fleet refused even to read the letter. I am more responsible for this defeat than Admiral Ozawa, he said, and I will not accept his resignation. Admiral Yugaki marked the occasion with another haiku. The battle is ended. But the gloomy sky of the rainy season remains over us. 2. The crushing defeat at sea doomed the defenders of Saipan. On the day Shikaku and Teiha went down, the commander of all American troops on Saipan, Marine General Holland Smith, readied his troops for a final drive up the island. His men had already suffered heavy casualties, particularly from night mortar fire. Marine Captain John A. Gruder watched medics tenderly load corpses into a truck and approached to see if there was anyone he knew. He recognized a youthful, fair-haired replacement and remembered how exuberant he had been upon arrival at the front. A yellow paperback book stuck out of his back pocket, our hearts were young and gay. On June 22 two marine divisions started the offensive to the north while the army division, the 27th, mopped up the remaining Japanese cut-off in the extreme south. The marine lines were so extended, however, that Smith ordered the 27th Division to take over the center, and the next morning the GIs started up the wooded valley running just east of Mount Tapocha. It was a narrow gulch not a thousand yards wide, and the remnants of the 136th Regiment of Saito's Division looked down on them from cliffs and precipitous hills honeycombed with caves. The GIs, commanded by Major General Ralph Smith, advanced cautiously throughout the day to the annoyance of Holland Smith, his nickname was Howlin' Mad. He complained to Major General Sandiford Jarman, the senior army officer on the island, that if it was not an army division, 
and there would be a great cry set up more or less of a political nature, he'd relieve the other Smith on the spot. The leadership of the 27th, he was convinced, stemmed largely from a gentleman's club known as the 7th Regiment, traditionally New York's silk stocking outfit, and likewise a worthy unit, per se, with an impeccable reputation for annual balls, banquets and shipshape summer camps. Ralph Smith acknowledged that his division was not carrying its full share and that he was in no way satisfied with what his regimental commanders had done during the day. He promised Jarman to personally see to it that the division went forward. Even Smith's presence at the front the following morning did little to move the army troops up the gorge, which was already known as Death Valley. Howell and Mad conferred with Admiral Richmond Turner, Terrible Turner, and the two went out to see Spruance on Indianapolis. Ralph Smith has shown that he lacks aggressive spirit, said Smith, and his division is slowing down our advance. He should be relieved. He suggested that Jarman take over the 27th until another commander was appointed, and Spruance concurred. But a change of commanders made no perceptible difference, and the progress up Death Valley remained painfully slow. The Marines on the right were also stalled, but the 2nd Marine Division on the left fought its way to the top of Mount Tapocha where the rest of Hilly Seipan stretched out to the north like some quiescent monster. This rugged terrain was about all that stood between the Americans and victory. By nightfall of June 25 there were less than 1200 able-bodied men and three tanks left of all Japanese Army frontline units, and General Igtu of the 31st Army was compelled to radio his commander in Guam that Saipan could not be held. The fight on Saipan as things stand now is progressing one-sidedly, since along with the tremendous power of his barrages, the enemy holds control of sea and air. In daytime even the deployment of units is very difficult, and at night the enemy can make out our movements with these by using illumination shells. Moreover, our communications are becoming disrupted, and liaison is becoming increasingly difficult. Due to our serious lack of weapons and equipment, activity and control are hindered considerably. Moreover, we are menaced by brazenly low-flying planes and the enemy blasts at U.S. from all sides with fierce naval and artillery crossfire. As a result, even if we remove units from the front lines and send them to the rear, their fighting strength is cut down every day. Also, the enemy attacks with fierce concentration of bombs and artillery. Step by step he comes toward U.S. and concentrates his fire on U.S. as we withdraw, so that wherever we go we are quickly surrounded by fire but there would be no surrender. Dot the positions are to be defended to the bitter end, and unless he has other orders, every soldier must stand his ground. General Saito's report to Tokyo was more emotional. Dot please apologize deeply to the emperor that we cannot do better than we are doing. There is no hope for victory in places where we do not have control of the air and we are still hoping here for aerial reinforcements. Praying for the good health of the Emperor, we all see our Y Banzai. 3. For Tojo the collapse of Saipan was a political as well as military reverse, a direct threat to his position as Prime Minister. His popularity had waned as the war situation worsened. Criticism, most of it covert, came from all sides. Prince Chikaibu referred to him as Emperor Tojo. Signs in some Navy offices read, kill Tojo and Shimada. Our imperial combined fleet is now powerless. Prepare at once to reform the cabinet so we can seek peace. Among army intellectuals he was known as Jotohai, superior private, the rank above PFC, and his administration was labeled government by privates. Substance was given to this name calling by the findings of an investigation just concluded by the army general staff's own conduct of war section. Its chief, Colonel Smatsutani, reported that after an exhaustive study by himself, Colonel Sakotane Mura and a major named Hashimoto, there was now no hope for Japan to reverse the unfavorable war situation. The state of Germany today is about the same as Japan's and grows gradually worse. It is time for us to end the war. 
Matsutani took his report to two influential members on the general staff. The first admitted the validity of the conclusions but forbade Matsutani to release them. The second, equally impressed, refused to allow the colonel to present his case to the prime minister. But Matsutani could not be intimidated and brought his findings to Tojo. The colonel expected Tojo to react violently, but he listened quietly, passively. His sour face, however, belied his polite demeanor, and within a week the outspoken Matsutani was transferred to China. Section. On Saipan General Saito, following orders from 31st Army, once more moved his headquarters, this time to a small cave a mile north of Mount Tapocha. On June 28 all the military leaders, Nagumo, Saito and Aigta, held a joint staff meeting. Aigta took charge. Except for the former public relations officer, Major Hirokushi, Saito's staff had few suggestions to offer. They crouched listlessly on their haunches, one or two tried to sleep. Saito and Negumo sat in silence as Aigto outlined a final line of resistance two-thirds of the way up the island. They would dig in, from Tanapag in the west to the opposite coast. There was little reaction. Wearily Saito said that the proposal sounded all right to him, and a navy commander, speaking for Nagumo, said, we leave it to the army. The question remained as to how to do it. The troops were dispersed across the northern half of Saipan, there were few lines of communication. Able-bodied men were selected to contact all units. Major Hirokushi set out for Mount Done to assemble the remnants of the 136th Regiment. The only soldiers he could find in the area were at the field hospital. He called out for men of the regiment, no one came forward. He reported back to Saito that he could find no troops to build the eastern section of the final line. Aigta said nothing. Shizuko had lost all concept of time. On one of her daily visits to Lieutenant Shinoda, a comrade lying nearby began to berate her, Why didn't you come and see him last night? Poor Lieutenant Shinoda called for you all through the night and died just an hour ago. She crouched beside Shinoda's body. There wasn't a maggot on his face. He looked pale and beautiful. She picked up the photograph of his round-faced wife. Couldn't you hear him calling you? Another soldier said in an accusing voice. She couldn't answer. All through the night she had heard voices continuously calling nurse. But it was like hearing cicadas singing. It was impossible to answer each call. Yet, she should have recognized Shinoda's urgent voice. She reported his death to one of the medics, who said. Poor fellow, he had so many maggots that the other patients kicked him until he found this corner off by himself. Her routine had become a melange of horrors, the crude toilet filling up with maggots, the dead bodies that rotted and gave off a ghastly phosphorescence at night, the piteous groans and cries of patients, the air raids, the shells shrieking overhead. She had to forget she was a woman in the presence of men stripped naked, she had to forget she was a human being as she amputated arms and legs with a surgical saw and then sewed up the ragged flesh. There was no more anesthesia for operations, and patients would scream until they fainted. The fortunate ones remained unconscious until the operation was over. In the past few months Prince Kono had become the confederate of a score of military as well as civilian leaders, among them General Koji Sakai of the General Staff and Admiral Okada, who were disturbed by the course of the war and Tojo's leadership. General Sakai made a clandestine visit to Kono's suburban home. To be on the safe side the general wore civilian clothes. If Tojo learns what I am about to tell you, I'm sure he will retaliate, he warned. He wanted to impress Kono that the war should be ended quickly. Germany still has defensive power, and while the enemy has to fight in both east and west we should take advantage of the situation and enter into negotiations for peace. It will not be to our advantage to wait until Germany is defeated. Tojo could not possibly negotiate such a peace. A new cabinet must be formed. General Sakai was one of the few liberals in the army and Kona wondered if the army leadership could be persuaded to follow this policy. 
at present they don't speak openly but they all think as I do, the general replied. Matsutani's report had been circulated secretly and a number of army leaders wanted the throne informed of its findings. And after that, what? Kona wanted to know. How should the emperor face Tojo with the matter? His majesty should say, despite all efforts by our army and navy, the enemy has succeeded in landing on Seipan. What do you think of future operations, Tojo? He should then ask how they were to meet the requirements of the army and navy regarding munitions, planes, ships and oil, about protecting the population from air aids, and what should be done to repel enemy offensives. General Sakai acknowledged that Tojo could answer these questions in several ways, but hoped they would force him to resign at once. 4. On June 30 the GIs finally broke through Death Valley, no one had any tougher job to do, observed Major General Harry Schmidt, commander of the 4th Marine Division, and the entire 3 Division front was at last connected. At the Donne Field Hospital, a dying game order was received. Medics distributed grenades, one for each eight men. The chief surgeon, the captain, climbed up to a little rise at dusk and shouted that by order of the high command, the field hospital was transferred to a village on the west coast a mile and a half above Tanapagan four miles from the northern tip of Seipan. The vast arena was silent. All ambulatory patients will accompany me. But to my great sorrow, I must abandon you comrades who cannot walk. Men, die an honorable death as Japanese soldiers. Shizuko told the captain. I'm going to stay and kill myself with my patients. You will join us, he said. That is an order. All the soldiers wanted to say goodbye and crowded around her. Even those who couldn't walk, crawled nearer. There was no need to draw words from them. There was only one subject, home. Each man tried to tell her something about his family. She promised over and over to tell what had happened if she got back to Japan. One whose jaw had been shot away got her attention. Slavering, he weakly scrawled Chibaken in the dirt, and then took Ada. I understand, she said. You come from Chiba Prefecture and your name is Takeda. A young officer, his uniform dyed with blood, forced out a few painful words. You know. The song. Of Kidanzaka? Yes, I like it very much. It was a haunting song about an aged mother from the country taking her dead son's medal to the Yasukuni shrine in Kudanzaka. She began to sing. From Wano Station to Kudanzaka. I get impatient, not knowing my way around. It has taken me all day, leaning on my cane. To come and see you, my son, at Kudanzaka. The great Torii, gate, looming up in the sky leads to a magnificent shrine. That enrolls my son among the gods. Your unworthy mother weeps in her joy. I was a black hen who gave birth to a hawk. And such good fortune is more than I deserve. I wanted to show you your order of the golden kite. And have come to see you, my son, at Kudanzaka. She stopped. There was silence except for stifled sobs. We. Two, we'll go to Yasukuni Shrine. The young officer exclaimed. Others joined in, let us all go to Yasukuni Shrine together. The captain started to lead Shizuko away, along with 300 patients. Voices followed them, thank you, nurse, goodbye, nurse, commander, sergeant, nurse, thank you all for your kindness. They reached the end of the field. Shizuko heard a voice cry out, Goodbye, mother. There was a sharp blast, a grenade. She crouched on the ground and flinched as one grenade after another exploded in rapid succession. The American advance up the island, which had begun so laboriously, was now almost unopposed. It had become, as one marine put it, a rabbit hunt. This constant pressure had prevented the Japanese from forming their final defensive line across the island, and by July 5 they had been herded into the northern quarter of Seipan. 
Japanese headquarters was now on a ridge facing the west coast, a few hundred yards from the new field hospital. The cave overlooked a gulch, already nicknamed the Valley of Hell. That afternoon Major Hirokushi left the cave to inspect the front lines. They were non-existent. The men had already retreated on their own before the American drive. Hirokushi's report was greeted by an incredulous silence. Finally General Igta said, tomorrow morning we will begin assembling all remaining troops in the area for the final attack. Let us end this battle. That evening the headquarters group ate the last of their food, a single can of crab meat and a small rice ball apiece. Hirokushi had been saving two cigarettes which Prince Kaya gave him in Japan as a memento. They were passed from man to man, smoked until they were too small to hold. Hirokushi asked if Igtu and Saito would participate in the final assault. Admiral Nagumo, who had said almost nothing during the long retreat, answered for them, we three will commit suicide. Hirokushi wanted to know what would happen to the thousands of civilians who shared the caves with the soldiers and sailors. There is no longer any distinction between civilians and troops, Saito replied. It would be better for them to join in the attack with bamboo spears than be captured. Write out instructions to that effect. Three hundred sets of Saito's order were mimeographed, but before they could be distributed a messenger arrived from the naval communications cave located several miles to the north. Tokyo ordered the defenders to continue the battle to gain time, there was a promise of reinforcements. The Navy staff officers accepted the order, but the army would not abandon the last assault. The arrow has been shot, said one army man. Another accused the Navy of cowardice. The Navy said it was no time to call names, the army was disobeying a direct order from Imperial headquarters. Nagumo, Igto and Saito took no part in the argument, which lasted through the night. At dawn, July 6, the shelling and bombing resumed and a sentry at the mouth of the cave reported that an enemy tank was peering over the edge of the cliff above. Saito, who had been quietly conferring with Nagumo and Agta, beckoned to Hirokushi. He said the three of them had decided to die at ten o'clock. Excuse us for going first. Do you plan to do it here? Yes, here. Hirokushi said it would be better to commit suicide privately in a smaller cave nearby. The major left to prepare the new cave while Saito read aloud a farewell message that he wanted conveyed to all army troops. Dot our comrades have fallen one after another. Despite the bitterness of defeat, we pledge, seven lives to repay our country. Dot whether we attack or whether we stay where we are, there is only death. However, in death there is life. We must utilize this opportunity to exalt true Japanese manhood. I will advance with those who remain to deliver still another blow to the American devils, and leave my bones on Saipan as a bulwark of the Pacific. As it says in the Senjinkan, Battle Ethics, I will never suffer the disgrace of being taken alive, and I will offer up the courage of my soul and calmly rejoice in living by the eternal principle. Here I pray with you for the eternal life of the Emperor and the welfare of the country and I advance to seek out the enemy. Follow me. Hirokushi led the three commanders to the new cave. What means are you going to use? He asked. We will go through the first step of seppuku, cutting open the stomach, said Saito. But seppuku will take too long, so have an officer stand behind each of us and shoot us in the back of the head. Saito selected Hirokushi. Nagumo requested a naval officer, Igda didn't express any preference. Hirokushi returned to their main cave and asked for someone from the navy to assist Admiral Nagumo with his suicide. No one answered. Finally a young army aide said, let me do the job. Another army aide volunteered to shoot Igta, and the three started back to the suicide cave. The commanders, all wearing khaki fatigue uniforms, were sitting cross-legged near the mouth of the cave with the diminutive Nagumo in the middle. Hirokushi turned to find some water to wash their faces when he heard a navy officer call out that his group was heading north alone. Hirokushi started forward to stop them. Behind there were three sharp reports. He spun around. 
the three commanders were lying sprawled on the ground. Behind the bodies stood the two young aides, smoking pistols in hand. The commanders, impatient, had gone ahead without him. All Hirakushi could do now was burn the bodies and regimental flags. He rounded up men to help, but other officers stopped him, smoke would attract the enemy. Hirakushi agreed to wait until after midnight, just before launching the last attack. The ordeal of the past few days finally took its toll. He collapsed on the floor of the command cave into deep sleep. It was dark when he woke up. Soldiers and sailors in nondescript uniforms, and armed with rifles, swords and bamboo spears, were assembling outside. They were haphazardly divided into groups and in the moonlight officers began to shepherd them toward the beach. All along the ridge men were filtering down to the narrow coastal plain. At zero hour they would charge independently toward American positions around Danapag. To Hirakushi the men looked like spiritless sheep being led to the slaughter, and the officers guides to the gates of hell. Before he left, the major ordered two men to burn the regimental flags and the bodies of the three commanders, then silently led his group, a dozen men, down the steep slope. More than 3,000 Japanese, including civilians like Shizuko's brother-in-law, emerged onto the coastal plain. They left the slope behind littered with thousands upon thousands of empty sake and beer bottles. A. Hirakushi and his men reached the shore at four o'clock in the morning on July 7th. He stripped and waded into the tepid water to bathe. Wrapped, he stared out at the barrier reef, a ghostly shimmering line in the moonlight. Overhead a thick cloud reminded him of a Japanese mother in quilted kimono carrying a baby on her back. As the cloud pulled apart, he conjured up in the lightning sky images of his mother, his wife, his friends. He shook himself free of this fantasy and returned to shore to dress. It felt good to be clean. He was ready to die. Distant voices were shouting wah! Wah! exclamation mark a Japanese battle cry. There was a crackle of rifle fire from the ridge. The signal to attack. Without waiting for him, his men took off headlong down the beach toward Danapag. Pistol in one hand, a cho with a clip of six shells, and sword in the other, he started after them. He was enveloped by an explosion and felt as if he were floating right into a huge column of bursting fire. I'm dead, he thought just before the world went black. At Tanapak the 27th Division had been warned by Holland Smith to expect an all-out Banzai attack along the coast before dawn. B the Japanese swarmed on Tanapag. In the lead half a dozen men held aloft a great red flag, like the vanguard in a dramatic pageant. Behind pressed the fighting troops and then, the most incredible sight of all, hundreds of men with bandaged heads, on crutches, scarcely armed, limping and hobbling. They swept down the narrow tracks of the sugarcane railway that skirted the beach and smashed against the 1st and 2nd battalions of the 105th Infantry Regiment like a human tidal wave. It reminded the commander of the 2nd Battalion, Major Edward McCarthy, of a stampede staged in the old Wild West movies. The Japanese just kept coming and didn't stop. If you shot one, five more would take his place. They ran right over the Americans. The commander of the 1st Battalion, another Irishman, Lieutenant Colonel William J. O'Brien, stood his ground, an example to his men, a pistol in each hand. Seriously wounded, he fired until his clips were empty, then manned a .50 caliber machine gun until he was killed. The Japanese surged over the two steadfast battalions of G.I.s the same ones accused of advancing too slowly up Death Valley, killing or wounding more than 650 of them. To their right another group of raiders funneled through a wind in canyon, soon to be known as Harakiri Gulch and hit the 3rd Battalion but these troops were too well emplaced above the gulch and could not be dislodged. Yeoman Noda, who had served both Yamamoto and Nagumoto the end, was with the large group that overran the Americans on the beach. Shrieking and frenzied, this was hardly a military formation. Suddenly Noda felt as if he had been clouted in the hip with a baseball bat, but there was no pain. 
he staggered, tried to keep moving but fell, he had been hit by a machine gun slug. American bodies lay on all sides. C. Noda picked up a GI canteen and drank deeply. He tried to struggle to his feet but his right shoe was like lead. Unable to bend forward to unlace the shoe, he found an American bayonet and wrenched a stick from the grasp of a dead Japanese. He tied the bayonet to the stick and laboriously hacked at his shoelaces until he could push off the shoe. He still couldn't stand and decided his trouser legs were holding him back. He cut them off but remained as helpless as ever. He sank back on the sand, resigned. Now the time has come to die, he told himself. In the light of dawn he saw a pool of blood in the sand. To his amazement, his own blood. A few yards away four wounded Japanese were lying on their backs, smoking calmly, as if it were a beach in Japan. We're about to die, one of them observed casually and flipped Noda a pack of hickories. Noda stretched out on the sand, smoking the cigarette, his mind a blank. He was roused by the soldier who had given him the cigarettes. Hey, Navy man, he said, we are about to die. Will you join us? Noda held up a grenade. I have won. Excuse us for preceding you. Noda huddled to avoid grenade shrapnel and shut his eyes. There was a detonation. He looked up and saw four sprawled bodies. How terrible to die by grenade, he thought and was again attracted by the stream of blood flowing from his own body. He considered a tourniquet but changed his mind. It would be better to bleed to death. He was growing weaker. I'm only 27 and why should I die here? Whether I live or die won't bring about Japanese victory. He began remembering things in the past. His school days, catching dojo, mudfish. He fainted. The next thing he heard was the chirping of a bird. The landscape was devastated, not a palm tree or bush. Only bodies and ugly craters of sand. If there was no tree, how could it be a bird? What was happening? There was a mutter of voices speaking a strange language. He felt a kick in the side. He groaned and two marine corpsmen loaded him onto a stretcher. He saw medics kicking other bodies, Americans as well as Japanese, and just before passing out again he congratulated himself, if I hadn't been wakened by that bird I would be dead. Ahead in Tanapag, Major McCarthy and his surviving officers and non-coms had finally managed to form a perimeter within the village itself. All morning they were pressed slowly back in a vicious house-to-house -house battle until a platoon of medium tanks rumbled in. Other reinforcements arrived and by late afternoon only isolated little groups of Japanese were alive. The last attack was over. Just offshore on a white hospital ship, Major Hirokushi was opening his left eye. All he could see was a clean white wall. I am alive. I have a second life. He was naked, covered with a blanket. It took some time before he realized his left hand was handcuffed to the bed and that he had been wounded in the head and shoulder. He was so exhausted that it didn't occur to him until later that he, an officer, had disgraced himself by surviving the last assault. All he could think was, I am alive. I am alive. At the new field hospital in the Valley of Hell, Shizuko had crouched in her foxhole throughout the night. In the waxing daylight she noticed movement on the heights above. Dark faces peered through the undergrowth. They were negro G eyes. In her panic she imagined they were gorillas coming down the incline. So the fantastic rumor was true. Americans were using them in battle. All around her, wounded men had emerged from their dugouts, and turning north, bowed low toward the Imperial Palace. Suddenly strange. Raucous music blared from an amplifier, she had never before heard such noise. Its wild, disturbing rhythm echoed throughout the entire valley, it was American jazz. The unreality of the scene robbed her of the resolve to kill herself. The chief surgeon ordered her to give herself up by waving a white handkerchief. She hesitated, the Americans would rape her. Save yourself. His assistant, the lieutenant, urged her. As she stood paralyzed at the rim of the foxhole, the Negroes charged forward, lobbing grenades and shouting. 
All Shizuoko could see were their teeth and eyes. The chief surgeon put a pistol to his throat and pulled the trigger. The lieutenant slashed his neck three times with a knife and collapsed over Shizuoko. Warm blood flowed onto her legs. She picked up a hand grenade. She felt cold. Now I am going to die. She tried to cry mother but nothing came out. She pulled the safety pin, wrapped the grenade against a rock to activate it and threw herself on top of it. Shizuko heard voices but could not understand them. Cautiously opening her eyes, she discovered that she was in a house. She tried to rise but a young American officer said in Japanese, You are wounded, don't move. Shizuko couldn't believe Japanese was coming out of an enemy. Why hadn't she died? She asked for water but the young captain told her she couldn't have any. He poured something out of a can. She tried to drink it but had to spit it out. It was tomato juice and she couldn't stand the taste. He ordered her to finish it and she did. It wasn't death that terrified her, but the Americans. She asked what had happened to the men in the valley of hell. All died except you, said the officer, an interpreter. He told her that he had studied at a Japanese university and wanted to help her countrymen. We believe in humanity, even in war. He assured her that many Japanese civilians had survived and were in an internment camp near Chiruncanoa. She didn't believe him. Everybody knew the American devils tore Japanese prisoners apart with tanks. She blurted out that she feared Americans, especially the black ones. He laughed. It was Negroes who saved you. She pleaded with the captain to let her die with her compatriots, and he got permission to take her by truck to Chiruncanoa. As they drove along the coast road in the bright starlight he told her there were many bodies of civilians in the sea. He asked if she wanted to see them. He ordered the vehicle stopped. With the help of two Negroes he carried her to a cliff. Below, floating bodies clustered the water's edge. One woman had two children lashed to her. Almost to himself the young officer asked, why do Japanese kill themselves like this? Tears flowed down his cheeks. Just past midnight they entered Chiruncanoa. To her surprise it was bright with electric lights. Tents sprouted all over. It was a different world. The captain told her this was the camp for Japanese, but she knew it was a trick. She was going to be shot here. Then she saw Japanese children clinging to a wire fence surrounding the tent city. She insisted on getting out, though the captain argued that she should continue to the hospital. Do you have acquaintances out there? Is that it? There's my mother. She lied. She was lifted out of the truck on a stretcher. She insisted on walking and staggered through the gate before she fell. Many friendly hands lifted her up. She was back with her own. On July 9 at 4.15 p.m., Admiral Turner announced that Saipan was officially secured, and attention turned to neighboring Tinian and Guam. Marines who had once glumly predicted Golden Gate in 48 were now saying home alive in 45. The battle on Saipan had ended but there remained the onerous and dangerous job of mopping up several thousand stragglers who were hiding in caves. It means, one cynical Marine commented, that if you get shot now, you were hit in your own rear areas. A different but equally difficult task confronted the Americans at the northern tip of the island. The thousands of civilians had gathered and were committing mass suicide rather than surrender. Interpreters and captured Japanese, using public address systems, pleaded with crowds at Marpy Point, which dropped off spectacularly more than a hundred feet to rocky shallows. The fighting was over, safety and food were waiting. The names of those who had already surrendered were read off. Still men threw their children from the cliff and jumped after them, and mothers with babies on their backs would leap into the boiling surf. There were so many floating bodies that naval small craft were unable to steer a course without running over them. Lieutenant Emery Cleaves of the minesweeper chief saw the corpse of a nude woman, drowned while giving birth. The baby's head had entered this world, but that was all of him. Nearby a small boy of four or five had drowned with his arm firmly clenched round the neck of a Jap soldier, the two bodies rocked crazily in the waves. 
elsewhere on the island families remained hidden from the new conquerors day after day. The Okayamas, father, mother and four children, found a cave. On the morning of July 17 they were sunbathing on the ledge overlooking the rugged northeast coast, when a soldier from a nearby cave shouted enemy, and pointed above them to the top of the cliff. Fourteen-year-old Ryoko Okayama, the eldest child, glanced up at four or five big red-faced Americans in camouflage uniforms. They looked so different from the much smaller Japanese soldiers. The Japanese fired his rifle and the Americans began dropping grenades. The Okayumas braced themselves against a depression, kicking them off the ledge, but when the missiles continued to fall, the father, a tailor, herded his family down to the bottom of the cliff to another cave. Inside they found a sergeant, an exhausted correspondent from the Asahi Shimbun, and an abandoned newborn baby which cried until Mrs. Okayama picked it up. As the loud American voices came nearer and the sound of gunfire intensified, the baby began to scream. Quiet it, the sergeant whispered. Anyway. Mrs. Okayama, an attractive woman of thirty-four, tried to nurse the baby but it kept crying. In desperation she put the hem of her jacket over the baby's mouth, and finally stifled the noise. The baby was dead. The sound of machine gun fire echoed violently in the cave. The voices were just outside. The sergeant handed Okayama a grenade, held another himself. Ryoko looked at her father in farewell. Pale and tense, he nodded slightly. The sergeant removed the safety pin of his grenade, so did Okayama. We are all going to a nice place together, the mother told four-year-old Yoshitada, the youngest child. He smiled as if it were a game. The two men struck the grenades simultaneously against rocks at their feet. As the fuses hissed, Ryoko thought in rapid succession, Am I going to be a Buddha? Do human beings really have souls? Is there really another world? She felt the cave shake, the concussion had thrown her against the rock wall. Dazed, she heard her little brother give a feeble groan, and she fainted. She didn't know how long she had remained unconscious. First she saw a vague brightness of red, and as it came into focus she realized it was the open abdomen of the sergeant who was sitting before her, legs crossed, as if asleep. The huge wound was so neat that it reminded her of the human body exhibit in biology class. The organs, all in place, were beautiful. She herself was covered with blood and raw flesh. Appalled, she moved her arms and legs, no pain. She twisted. Still not much pain. Her nine-year-old brother's shirt was blown off. Pieces of shrapnel were sticking in his bare chest, leaving black, burned spots. He was dead. So were her father, little Yoshitada and her six-year-old sister. The flesh had been blown from her sister's head, revealing a skull the color and texture of a transparent candle. Ryoka had a horrifying feeling of loneliness. She was the only one alive. Then she felt something touch her left shoulder. Mother, you are alive. I'm dying was the calm reply. Her mother's legs were shattered and Ryoka ripped strips from a piece of cloth nearby to make bandages. It won't work, Mrs. Okayama said quietly. I'm going to die. You can't stop the bleeding with something like that but the blood isn't coming out anymore. It has all run out, Mrs. Okayama said. She stared at the bodies of her family. I'm glad they had a clean death. She turned to Ryoko. Only you are alive. Akusen, Akusen, madam. It was the Asahi man. His agonized voice was almost inaudible. Mother and daughter were astonished to find that someone else had survived. Kill me. Akusen, please. I'm dying too, Mrs. Okayama told him. My legs are gone. I can't even move. I can't help you. He looked up slowly, then, writhing in agony, he slammed his head against a jagged rock. He groaned and tried again and again. Finally he was dead. After I die you mustn't stay here, Mrs. Okayama said to her daughter. With darkness she was to leave. 
you must live long and follow the path of righteousness with a strong mind. She had written the same words when Ryoko entered middle school. Mrs. Okiyama painfully unwound a furoshiki from her waist, it was filled with money, and tied it tightly around her daughter. Soon I'll be dead. My vision is getting blurred. I want to lie down. Will you help me? All the while there was a soft smile on her face. For the first time Ryoko realized how gentle her mother was. How could she ever have feared her? My hearing is fading now. Give me your hands. She grasped Ryoko's hands. I can't talk anymore, she said faintly. Mother, don't die. Mrs. Okayama smiled and nodded her head. Her lips moved but no sound issued. She was dead. Almost 22,000 Japanese civilians, two out of three, perished needlessly. And almost the entire garrison, at least 30,000, died. For the victors the battle was also the most costly to date in the Pacific. Of the 71,000 Americans who had landed on Saipan, 14,111 were killed, wounded or missing in action, more than double the losses at Good Alcanal, but the main bastion protecting Japan's homeland had been seized, and the enemy's carrier-based striking power had been crippled. Even more important, the lowlands of southern Saipan offered the Americans the first site from which massive B-29 bombing raids could be launched at the heart of the Japanese Empire, Tokyo. On June 4, 1942, a Zero fighter, piloted by Petty Officer Tadayashi Koga, came in for a forced landing on lonely Akuten Island in the Aleutians. A single enemy machine gun bullet had severed its pressure gauge indicator line. Its wheels caught in the tundra and the plane flipped over, breaking Koga's neck. A month later the practically intact Zero was found, and American engineers designed a fighter to send up against it, the F-6F Hellcat. It is interesting, and sad, to note that two years had gone by since Colonel Claire Chenault furnished the War Department with complete details of the Zero along with suggestions for greater maneuverability of the P-40 against the swift Japanese plane, all of which was filed and forgotten. Many an American pilot's life would surely have been saved in the intervening time, as was later indicated by the Hellcat's superiority over the Zero. When Admiral King landed at Aslito Field shortly after Saipan was secured, his first act was to assure Spruance that he had done exactly the correct thing with the 5th Fleet in the Battle of the Philippine Sea, no matter what anyone else might say, especially since he had to remember that the Japanese had another fleet ready in the inland sea to pounce upon the numerous transports and supply ships that were not yet unloaded. Even before the battle subsided, Lieutenant General Robert C. Richardson, commanding general of all army forces in the Pacific Ocean areas, had appointed an all-army board to investigate the case. It concluded that Holland Smith had authority to relieve Ralph Smith but that the Marine General was not fully informed regarding conditions in the zone of the 27th Infantry Division and the relief of the Army Smith was not justified by the facts. In Washington, Marshall's deputy, Major General Thomas T. Handy, while admitting that there was some justification for criticizing the GIs for lack of aggressiveness in Death Valley, reported that Holland Smith's fitness for this command is open to question because of prejudice against Army personnel and that bad blood had developed between the Marines and the Army on Saipan to a dangerous degree. In my opinion, it would be desirable that both Smiths be ordered out of the Pacific Ocean area. A few days after the battle Richardson inflamed more tempers by flying to Saipan to pass out decorations to army troops without consulting Nimitz and without approval of Holland Smith. He also reportedly told the Marine commander, I want you to know you cannot push the army around the way you have been doing. This was resented not only by Holland Smith but by Spruance and Turner, who vigorously complained to Nimitz of Richardson's high-handed and irregular actions. The feud between the two services was taken up by the press. The San Francisco Examiner, a Hearst paper, charged that marine casualties in places like Saipan were excessive, far greater than MacArthur's, and concluded that the Supreme Command in the Pacific should, 
of course, be logically and efficiently entrusted to him. Time and life, Henry Luce's two influential magazines, retaliated with a vigorous defense of Holland Smith, time asserting that when field commanders hesitate to remove subordinates for fear of inter-service contention, battles and lives will be needlessly lost. Section in China, Matsudani replaced an even more outspoken colonel, Suji, who had just been shipped out to Burma. His forthright views on good alcohol had undoubtedly made him persona non grata in Tokyo, Matsutani never believed there was any connection between his audience with Tojo and his sudden transfer. He had held the China post two years previously and was well qualified for the job. On the other hand, Colonel Tain Mura, who helped with the controversial report and replaced Matsutani as chief of the section, wrote in his imperial headquarters, Army, Diary on July 3, 1944, the reason for his transfer is not clear. However, it is believed that his recent outside activities to bring about termination of the war have somehow reached the ears of his superiors, and roused their age. Government propaganda in Japan, portraying Americans and British as devils, was both widespread and effective. One observer noted in his diary, I rode a train with a volunteer corps the other day. Their leader lectured, Churchill and Roosevelt formed what they called the Atlantic Charter and agreed to kill all Japanese. They made a statement they would kill men and women. We won't let them kill us. It seems the public believes that the enemy are going to remove the testicles of the Japanese so that they won't have children, or that they will be sent to secluded islands. That 25 years later they still covered the ridge. B. The term Banzai attack was never used by the Japanese. C. Sherrod inspected the scene a few hours later. The whole area seemed to be a mass of dead bodies, stinking guts and brains. Part 6. The Decisive Battle. 21. Let no heart be faint. 1. Never before had a modern Japanese leader gathered to himself so much power. To the world Tojo's position seemed unassailable but in reality his rule was at the point of collapse. Ever since Midway, Imperial headquarters had refused to acknowledge the growing power of America and the diminishing power of Japan. Shipping losses continued to mount as the American submarine campaign intensified. To the north the Aleutian outposts had been abandoned, to the south, the Solomons and New Guinea had been overrun and in the Central Pacific the Defense Line, the Marshals, the Gilberts and finally the Marianas, had collapsed. At home, production levels were still maintained, but at the expense of extraordinary sacrifices by the people. Not only had many civilian enterprises been converted to war production and more women brought into industry, but teenagers had been added to the labor force. Classroom time was reduced to a minimum and school buildings transformed into military supply depots. A seven-day work week was established, with the Sundays so cherished by Japanese abolished. Trains had become crowded to such an extent that a number of infants were suffocated, trips of more than 100 kilometers required a police permit, diners and sleepers were discontinued. The people's aggression turned on the trains when they were late, now a common occurrence, they stole seat covers and broke windows to get in and out. Consumer goods of every description were drastically curtailed. Food was rationed, clothing was at a premium, coffins had to be used over and over, and there was little gas or charcoal for heating homes. Newspapers were reduced in size, and publication of afternoon editions was suspended. About 10,000 amusement places, including geisha houses, were shut down. Life in Japan, in short, had become drab and onerous. What kind of a Tokyo has this turned out to be? Lamented comedian Ropaferu Kawa in his diary. Ah, it's no fun being alive anymore. These extreme austerity measures, coupled with the suspicion that the abandonment of territory, culminating with the fall of Saipan, was more serious than the official communiques indicated, fostered unrest which centered around Tojo, the symbol of war and power. The most outrageous rumors were accepted and passed on, Tojo was using tobacco, 
whiskey and other loot from the occupied southern areas to bribe members of the Imperial Household Ministry, the Board of Chamberlains, the Jushin and Privy Councillors. He had even paid off the Emperor's brothers, Chikaibu and Takamatsu, with automobiles. He was ridiculed, behind his back, naturally, for allowing his wife to make public speeches and radio broadcasts and engage in other active efforts to support the war. She was nicknamed Tabaire, a play on the Japanese version of Madame Chiang Kai-shek's name, So Baire. Following the disaster at Saipan, Mrs. Tojo was inundated by anonymous phone calls asking if her husband had committed suicide yet. There were some who were not willing to leave such a final action up to the Prime Minister himself. In addition to Admiral Sokichi Takagi, whose group was planning to ambush Tojo by machine gun, rebels in the army also sought his assassination. A major named Tsunoda, recently transferred from China to Imperial headquarters, together with Tatsukuma Yushijima, president of the Tokyo chapter of To Renmai, East Asia Federation was planning to throw a special hydrocyanic bomb at Tojo's car as it slowed on a curve in the Imperial Palace grounds near the Iweda Bridge. The time was set, the third week of July. But the plot was betrayed by the Emperor's youngest brother, Prince Mikasa, to whom a friend of the conspirators had unintentionally revealed the plan. Instead of giving it his blessing, such action was tantamount to rebellion against the throne, he informed a member of Imperial headquarters. Yushijima and Tsunoda were arrested by the Kempatai and sentenced to death, but as had happened so often in the past, they were given a stay of execution. Confronted with extensive discontent, Tojo sought advice from the man who had proposed him as Prime Minister and given his official support through the past months of crisis the Privy Seal. The counsel Tojo received was as unexpected as it was unwelcome. Kaido, finally roused to action by the fall of Saipan, was critical of the recent fusion of power, the two top positions in the cabinet held by Tojo himself, and the dual role of Admiral Shimada, the Navy Minister come Navy Chief of Staff was regarded by other Navy men as Tojo's Kaban Mochi, briefcase carrier. Everyone is concerned about this, said Kaido, and the Emperor himself is extremely annoyed. Profoundly discomposed, Tojo withdrew without saying a word but returned later in the day. He was willing to reshuffle the cabinet but not to surrender his own posts. Kaido greeted this compromise with a coolness that seemed hostile to Tojo. He shot to his feet. There's no sense in talking to you today. He exclaimed. He marched out of Kaido's office with a slam of the door, but by the time he reached his official residence he had sobered. He told Kenryo Sato, if Kaido has that attitude, it means the Emperor's confidence in me is lost. Therefore I'm giving up the idea of reforming the cabinet, instead I will resign. It's out of the question to resign at the most critical time of the war. Shouted Sato. All he had to do was replace Shimada with Admiral Yonai, it would appease both the Navy and Liberals like Kono. But Tojo found it too distasteful to dismiss Shimada, who had supported him so faithfully. Sato quoted the Chinese saying that in order to attain true justice one should not hesitate to kill one's parents if necessary. You must kill Shimada no matter how painful it may be. Your obligation to Shimada is a personal matter. You started this war and you cannot give up in the middle of it. It was what Tojo himself believed. He summoned Shimada and informed him he would have to resign as Navy Minister. The Admiral was gracious. I who am leaving can do so with lightened shoulders, he said. You who stay must continue to bear great responsibilities. He wished Tojo a good fight in his coming struggle, and as they shook hands the disciplined Tojo broke down. The next day, July 17, Shimada submitted his resignation but contrary to Sato's prediction, the liberals were not appeased. Neither was Kaido, and after prodding from Kono, he promised that though major political questions were outside his province, he would report to the throne the consensus of the Jushin's recommendations in reference to Tojo. Exhilarated, Kono drove to the home of Baron Horonuma 
where he found two other Jushin, Admiral Okada and Baron Jaro Wakatsuki. He told them of Kaido's surprising offer. Now I understand what Kaido has been trying to do, Admiral Okada remarked. By 6.30 all the Jushin had arrived. Conspiracy was in the air, and after months of ineffectual private complaints, they greeted one another with a sense of purpose. I should like to draw your attention to the fact that even if the Tojo cabinet is reformed, Wakatsuki warned, the people will not support it. Admiral Yonai revealed that he had just been earnestly invited to join the cabinet as Shimada's replacement. He had refused, but fully expected Tojo to make a personal appeal and if that failed, go to the throne for backing. I have already made up my mind not to accept the offer even if that last step is taken. Not all the Jushin wanted Tojo's resignation. General Noba Iuki Abe charged that it was irresponsible to talk exclusively of knocking down the cabinet. How can we be sure of getting a better one? Whether the cabinet is overthrown or not or whether the next one is weak or not is not the point, Haranumo interjected. The country had reached a crisis and a change of cabinets had to be made, and quickly. If I were asked, I wouldn't join the cabinet, said Hirota, the diplomat who had headed the cabinet after the 226 incident. They finally worked out a resolution that pleased everyone but Abe. It read. The minds and hearts of the people must be infused with new life if the empire is to survive the great problems facing it. All of us in the nation must cooperate and work together. A partial reorganization of the cabinet will be useless. A powerful new cabinet must be formed that will surge forward unswervingly. Abe wondered if the results of their meeting shouldn't be passed on to Tojo. The answer was unanimous, no. The resolution was hand carried to Kaido's home. The Privy Seal promised to present it to the Emperor the next morning. In his office Prime Minister Tojo and Kenryo Sato were pondering Yonai's refusal to join the cabinet. Sato thought the fault lay with the go-between who had represented Tojo. Your true intentions haven't yet been gotten across to Yonai, he said. Let me speak for you direct. Sato changed to civilian clothes and, unrecognized, slipped by newsman assigned to the Admiral's residence. He pushed his way past the maid, who said her master wasn't in, and fell asleep in the waiting room. An hour later he woke up when Yonai returned from the Jushin meeting. Sato tried to impress Yonai that it was essential to save the cabinet in the middle of war, and his acceptance of a portfolio would accomplish this. Tojo's sole desire was to change the tide of battle. I can see why you object to his cabinet, but that is merely a personal opinion. At this most critical time I beg you to cooperate with the Tojo cabinet to overcome our problems. I am not an expert in politics. Yonai smiled wryly. You can see that from my own cabinet. I'm an admiral, not a politician. And I'd like to die an admiral. If you want to use me, make me an advisor to the navy minister. From Yonai's tone it was clear that he could not be persuaded. Sato started back to Tojo's office. He had tried but failed, and now his final advice would negate everything he had previously said. It was two o'clock in the morning, but Tojo was still working in his shirt sleeves, smoke from his ever-present cigarette curling up to the lampshade above his head. Tojo, looked up. Please resign, said Sato. Tojo let his breath out in a long sigh. I will see the Emperor in the morning, he said. Would you please put in writing what led to my resignation? As Sato sat down and began to write, he knew in his heart that the war was over, and tears dropped onto the paper. In the morning, July 18th, Tojo, skin sallow, eyes lusterless, told his cabinet in a weary voice that he had decided to resign because of the loss of Saipan. He had hesitated so long only because of the Badaglio group in Japan. The responsibility for Japan's defeat, he added caustically, would have to be borne by the Jushin and others who had forced him out of office. His shoulders sagged. It was the hottest day of the year. I must ask you all to resign, he said. The atmosphere was awkward as each man wrote his resignation. 
It was ironic that exactly four years earlier Tojo had been chosen war minister. Stony faced, Tojo delivered the documents to Kaido. The Privy Seal asked whom he would like to succeed him. I won't say whom I want, Tojo replied with sarcasm. I imagine the Jushin have already decided who it will be. Then he started down the long corridor to the Emperor's office to make his last report as Prime Minister. The Jushin had not yet selected his successor but were about to. They met this time in the afternoon, and with Kaido as the dominating presence, in the west room of the palace. Also present were the Grand Chamberlain and President of the Privy Council Yoshimiki Hara. General Abe, who had always supported Tojo, wanted the Navy, in the person of Yonai, to form the new cabinet. I did take part in politics once, the Admiral observed. And I might try again as Navy Minister, but I can't become Prime Minister. Military men had a one-sided education and this made them unsuited for such a role. Politics should be left to politicians. Kono appreciated Yonai's idealism but they had to consider the matter from a practical point of view. Politics today cannot be carried on without the army's participation. Kaido and Kono had long since privately agreed that there should be an interim cabinet before the imperial family became involved. The bolstering of home defense, Kaido retorted, the increase of army strength in the homeland, and that of the military police, force us to choose someone from the army. Wakatsuki acquiesced and so did Yonai. Moments earlier the latter had warned about the dangers of choosing a military man, now he suggested Count Hisaki Teroki, who had been promoted to field marshal the year before. Kono was willing to accept Teroki, but not before he had emphasized two points, first, why did Tojo fall? Of course, it was partially because many unfavorable things were said about him, but also because the army, unlike the navy, interferes with every phase of political as well as economic life. This would have to cease. Second, the nation nowadays seems to be drifting toward a leftist revolution. Everything points in that direction. Losing the war is a dreadful thing, but a revolution is far more dreadful. Once defeated, we may recover in due time, but a leftist revolution would play havoc with the national essence. He wondered if Teroki could control the dissident elements. He is all right, Kaido said, but since he is so far away from here, at the front, it would be difficult to bring him back. We'd better choose someone else. For a second time Yonai nominated a military man, General Yoshijiro Umzu, the commander of the Kwantung army who had just been recalled to replace Tojo as chief of staff. It's not good to remove him so soon from his new post, objected Kaido who privately thought Umzu would be a poor choice. Kono suggested a navy man, the aged Kantaro Suzuki, who had narrowly escaped death in the 226 incident. I was with him in the Privy Council, Hara said, and know him well. He will never accept the offer. Horonuma's motion of Field Marshal Shunroku Hata, commander-in-chief in China, got a lukewarm reception. Again Yonai suggested a general, Kuniaki Koizo. He's a good man, capable and courageous. I knew him well when he was in my cabinet. How does he get along with army men? Kaido asked. Not so badly, I believe, General Abe replied. He's different from Tojo. He's first rate and devoutly religious, Hironuma commented. I have no objections, said Wakatsuki, although I don't know him. Okada thought they were making too hasty a choice, and Kono supported him. This inspired a lengthy and inconclusive dispute, and in the end they were forced to advise the Emperor to choose one of the three army men, Teroki, Hatu or Koizo. It was already eight o'clock. They had debated for four hours and it was with a sense of relief that they passed on the responsibility to His Majesty. Marquis Kaido reported immediately to the Emperor with the suggestion that His Majesty query the army on Teroki's availability before making a choice. The answer came from Tojo, who by chance was at the palace for the installation of his successor, General Umzu. 
Tojo advised against releasing Teruaki from his post at such a critical time. That left only Hatu and Koizo, and the Emperor, after considering Kaido's presentations, selected the latter. During the night Prince Kono began worrying about Koizo. Would he be able to control the leftists and remain independent of the army? Perhaps there should be go premiers, one from the army, one from the navy. A combination of Koizo and Yonai, for example. And since Yonai himself had recommended Koizo, it was obvious the two would get along. The next day he discussed it with Baron Haram Numa, who thought it was a splendid idea. And, more important, so did the Privy Seal. But Yonai remained reluctant. Since he had refused Tojo's invitation to join his cabinet, it would be improper now to accept a much more prominent position. But why not Navy Minister? I'm confident of handling that post. I'm not ashamed to admit that I might prove to be the best possible Navy Minister. Kono was almost as pleased as if Yonai had accepted Go Premiership. With Yonai in the cabinet, strongly supported by Kaido and the Emperor, it would amount to the same thing. General Koizo arrived from Korea the following afternoon. He was taken directly and without explanation to the Wat-Iting room adjoining the Imperial Chamber, nicknamed the Tiger of Korea more for his looks than for his military prowess. He had slanted, cat-like eyes, a flat nose and thin lips. He liked sake parties and was jovial enough to tolerate another nickname, Champion Baldhead of Japan. He knew there was a good chance he might be named Prime Minister and had in his pocket a list of close comrades in Korea for cabinet posts, but his expectations diminished sharply at the entrance of Admiral Yonai. Before he could question Yonai, Kaido appeared to usher the two into His Majesty's presence. Who should go first? asked the general, and Kaido replied, Koizo. But the Emperor treated both of them exactly alike. He said they would have to cooperate in forming a new cabinet and warned them not to antagonize Russia. Yonai was as mystified as Koizo and when the audience was over, he asked Marquis Kaido which one was Prime Minister. Koizo, of course, said the Privy Seal. What a strange conversation. Koizo thought. He turned to Yonai. What office are you going to take? Navy Minister? That's the only post I'm capable of filling, the Admiral replied. Tojo's forced resignation gave his wife a sense of relief. Now, at least, the daily hazard of assassination was over. Coincidentally, Tojo's ally Adolf Hitler had just barely escaped death from a bomb explosion, her reasoning was correct. Admiral Takagi, for instance, cancelled his plan to gun down Tojo who had now joined the distinguished but purely advisory circle of Jushin. 2. Although General MacArthur had been given a target date to invade the Philippines, a preliminary landing at Mindanao to establish airfields, followed three weeks later by a major one at late, the Joint Chiefs had suggested in mid-June that he bypass the other Philippine islands, including Luzon, and leapfrog all the way from late to Formosa. This would, in effect, eliminate MacArthur's cherished role as liberator of the Philippines, and his reply was in keeping with his indignation. The Philippines is American territory where our unsupported forces were destroyed by the enemy. Practically all of the 17 million Filipinos remain loyal to the United States and are undergoing the greatest privation and suffering because we have not been able to support or succor them. We have a great national obligation to discharge. Moreover, if the United States should deliberately bypass the Philippines, leaving our prisoners, nationals, and loyal Filipinos in enemy hands without an effort to retrieve them at earliest moment, we would incur the gravest psychological reaction. We would admit the truth of Japanese propaganda to the effect that we had abandoned the Filipinos and would not shed American blood to redeem them, we would undoubtedly incur the open hostility of that people, we would probably suffer such loss of prestige among all the peoples of the Far East that IT would adversely affect the United States for many years. Marshall replied with a forceful admonition not to let personal feelings and Philippine politics overshadow his primary objective, the winning of the war.
he asserted that bypassing was by no means synonymous with abandonment. MacArthur, however, was offered the opportunity of reviewing the matter directly with the president. The occasion was to be an unprecedented meeting five weeks hence in Hawaii between Roosevelt, MacArthur and Nimitz. Marshall, Arnold and King were not invited, it was an indication to King that the president, with the Democrats holding their national convention in Chicago, wished to emphasize his role as commander-in-chief of the Army and Navy. Roosevelt and his party boarded the heavy cruiser Baltimore at San Diego the day after he was nominated for a fourth term. Early in the afternoon of July 26 the cruiser, presidential flag flapping at the main, passed Diamond Head. MacArthur, whose plane had just landed after the long trip from Brisbane, met the president at the pier. The general was still in his winter uniform. Douglas, chided Admiral Leahy, a friend for almost forty years, why don't you wear the right kind of clothes when you come up here to see us? Well, you haven't been where I came from, and it's cold up there in the sky. The presidential party passed through long lines of soldiers and a cheering crowd to the site of the conference, a palatial private home on Waikiki Beach. There was no longer need to debate priorities of men and materiel, nor was there any question of the success of whatever was to come. After dinner Roosevelt pointed to Mindanao on a map of the Pacific and said, Douglas, where do we go from here? Late, Mr. President, and then Luzon. MacArthur expounded at length on the advisability of seizing Luzon before invading Formosa. Nimitz made no comment. The next morning formal talks began in a large living room whose walls were covered with operational maps. Using a long bamboo pointer, MacArthur again urged the occupation of Luzon. This time Nimitz countered, also aided by the pointer, with his own plan for striking directly at Formosa. Roosevelt leaned back in his wheelchair, relishing the lesson in geography. Tactfully he narrowed down the points of disagreement but his mediation was not necessary. Nimitz, a good listener, finally accepted the validity of MacArthur's argument that national honor and strategy made the liberation of all the Philippines essential before moving on to Formosa. After lunch MacArthur assured Roosevelt there would be no friction between him and Nimitz. We see eye to eye, Mr. President, he said. We understand each other perfectly. Later, as his plane took off for Brisbane, he turned to an aide with a triumphant we've sold it. While the Americans prepared the complex strategy leading up to the late invasion, which was given a definite date, December 20, Imperial headquarters in Tokyo was attempting to guess their intentions. A plan for the conduct of future operations envisaged attacks on four areas, the Philippines, Formosa and Okinawa, the home islands, and the Kuriles in the north. Though it was given the optimistic name S.A. Chogo, Operation Victory, it was a plan born of desperation, a series of last-ditch defenses. It was obvious that the Philippines was the next American objective, S.A. Cho won, and it was agreed that this should be made the scene of the final decisive battle both on land and sea. The question was where and how to meet this challenge and force this confrontation into a genuinely conclusive conflict. It was a problem of geography. The Philippine archipelago, almost 7,100 islands, lay some 500 miles off the mainland of Asia, 230 miles south of Formosa. It extended 1,150 miles from Mindanao due north through the Visayans, the central islands including Cebu and Leyte, to Luzon, the largest and most important island. Only 11 of the islands had an area larger than 1,000 square miles and two of these, Mindanao and Luzon, comprised more than two-thirds of the total land area. Strategically, however, late, one-thirteenth the size of Mindanao, was equally important. It was in the heart of the archipelago, and its spacious gulf was an invitation to an invasion from the sea. Southern Army's operations officer wanted to oppose the Americans wherever they landed first, which would be somewhere in the south, before they had a chance to set up bases. But he was overruled by the Army general staff. It would be impossible to predict exactly where the enemy would first strike. Rather than disperse troops on a number of southern islands, 
the bulk should be concentrate on Luzon, which had the best roads and could be most easily defended. The conquest of the Philippines called for combined sea and land operations of a magnitude never before attempted by the United States. MacArthur would lead the assault, but he would have Nimitz full support. It was the Navy's task to neutralize Japanese air power. The first strike was delivered on September 6 by Vice Admiral Mark Mitcher's Task Force 38. For three days his bombers hit the Palouse, 550 miles due east of Mindanao. Then he shifted the attack to Mindanao itself on September 9 and 10. These aerial raids spurred Japanese preparations for the defense of the Philippines. In Manila, Field Marshal Teroki, whose southern army was charged with the defense of the vast area from New Guinea to Burma, believed with Tokyo that ground-based planes could sink most of the enemy convoys before they beached. But the local commander of ground troops, Lieutenant General Shijinra Ikuroda of the 14th Area Army, argued that the concept was good but you couldn't fight with concept alone. Words will not sink American ships and that becomes clear when you compare our aircraft with theirs. Japanese air power was negligible and the battle would have to be won on land. There was even disagreement on how this kind of battle should be fought. Annihilation at the beachhead had been standard operating procedure in all previous invasions. But opposition to this policy was growing. Beach defenses had proved helpless against naval bombardment followed by a determined assault. Imperial headquarters ordered Teroki to set up resistance in depth. The order was passed on to the officer responsible for the defense of Mindanao and the Visayans, Lieutenant General Sozaku Suzuki, who had once been rudely roused out of bed in Malaya by an indignant Colonel Tsuji. Section he commanded the 35th Army, the equivalent of a U. S. Army Corps, and had headquarters in Cebu City. The general was described by his colleagues as a gentleman of great heart and straight as bamboo. Suzuki not only feared the American invasion would come sooner than his superiors in Tokyo and Manila did, he told his chief of staff to expect a landing about the 1st of October, but predicted correctly that the enemy would concentrate his attack on late. He placed the 30th Division in northern Mindanao so it could quickly be transferred to late. But immediate events made him doubt his own prophecy. On September 10 a message arrived from a naval observation unit that the enemy was landing near Davao on the south coast of Mindanao. Two hours later another report arrived. American Marines using amphibious tanks have landed on southern tip of small island located across the banks from Davao. Suzuki transferred the 30th Division back to the south of Mindanao and alerted Manila. The 4th Air Army began ferrying planes from New Guinea to the Philippines while Combined Fleet alerted its forces for SHO-1. But there had been no enemy landing. Observers on a hill overlooking the bay had mistaken choppy waves for landing craft. Let this mishap be a lesson, Suzuki told his staff. The next time, he trusted, they would not act so precipitously. Two days later Mitchell resumed his attacks which would eventually sweep up through the Philippines all the way to Okinawa. Within 48 hours, 2,400 sorties had been launched at the Visayans. The damage was so complete and the American casualty rate so minimal that Admiral Halsey, who commanded 3rd Fleet, which now included most of the ships in Spruance's old 5th Fleet, asked himself why the late invasion date should not be advanced. He sat in a corner of the bridge of the battleship New Jersey and thought it over. It was really none of his business and might upset a great many apple cuts, possibly all the way up to Mr. Roosevelt and Mr. Churchill, but it might also cut months off the war. Halsey summoned his chief of staff, Robert, Mick, Carney, and his secretary, Harold Stassen, and said, I'm going to stick my neck out. Send an urgent dispatch to Senkpak. It recommended cancellation of preliminary operations on Yap, Maritai and Mindanao, and seizure of late at the earliest possible date. Nimitz forwarded the dispatch to Quebec, where Roosevelt and Churchill were again meeting. The boldness of Halsey's suggestion intrigued them, but they needed MacArthur's blessing. 
the general was aboard Nashville on his way to Muratai, one of the spice islands between New Guinea and Mindanao, the next to the last step on his route to the Philippines. Nashville was under radio silence, and the decision rested on MacArthur's chief of staff, General Sutherland, who had remained in New Guinea. He knew his chief would welcome an earlier liberation of the Philippines, so, in MacArthur's name, he radioed Quebec that the invasion of late could take place on October 20, two months ahead of schedule. On September 15 MacArthur's troops landed unopposed on Muratai while Halsey's were meeting stiff resistance on Belly, one of the Palau Islands. Six days later Mitchell continued his devastating sweeps of the Philippines. Daringly he brought his carriers to within 40 miles of the east coast of Luzon to launch four air strikes at the Manilan area. The strips at Clark and Nichols fields were plowed up, more than 200 planes destroyed and the shipping in Manila Bay ravaged. Only 50 new. S. Aircraft were lost and no Japanese plane was able to break through the screen protecting Task Force 38. 3. Now, even in Tokyo, it was clear that the American invasion of the Philippines was imminent. General Kuroda, who had realistically prophesied that Japanese land-based planes could not thwart American sea power, was relieved of his command on the specious grounds that he was devoting more time to his golf, reading and personal matters than to the execution of his official duties. His replacement as commander of all ground troops in the islands was one of the heroes of the early victories, the conqueror of Singapore. After that campaign, General Tomoki Yamashi too had been sent to Manchuria to train troops. He was not allowed to stop off in Tokyo. This, explained Imperial Headquarters, was to prevent the Russians from learning of his new assignment, but Yamashita, who had been at odds with Tojo for years, was convinced it was just an excuse to get him out of public sight. On his way south Yamashita told his operations officer, Major Shijaru Asada, who like his chief was impatient for action, that he feared the Philippine campaign was going to be another battle of Minitogawa one fought by a commander who knew from the beginning he had no chance of victory. But he hid this pessimism from his new staff, and upon arrival at 14th Area Army headquarters at Fort McKinley near Manila on October 6, told them that the fate of Japan rested on the outcome of the battle. Each officer had a heavy responsibility to fight resolutely, daringly and with determination to win. If we all remember this, the Japanese army must win in the end. Less than 20,000 troops, the 16th Division, were garrisoned on the island that was MacArthur's target, late. This unit had landed on the east coast of Luzon on Christmas Eve, 1941, and after participating in the seizure of Manila, fought on Badan but the majority of its present complement, including its commander, Lieutenant General Shiro Makino, were replacements who had never before been in battle. In the Japanese army their reputation was poor, they were mostly draftees from the Kyoto-Osaka region and were better businessmen than fighters. Late was wedged between two larger islands, Samar directly to the northeast and Mindanao to the south. In shape it resembled a molar with its roots pointing to Mindanao. On the east coast a fertile plain ran along Late Gulf for 35 miles. No reefs protected its open sandy beaches, making it a perfect site for landing operations. But a few miles inland MacArthur's men would have to cross a complex of swamps, streams and rice paddies which were almost impassable except by road during the rainy season, which had already begun. The rest of the island was mountainous and heavily wooded, equally difficult to attack or defend. It was infested with small bands of guerrillas, who were in conflict with one another as often as with the Japanese. Their principal value to MacArthur was the reliable information they radioed him about General Makino's defenses. There were almost a million people on the island, all of them, except for 3,076 Chinese and a sprinkling of Europeans, Americans and Japanese, placid Visayans who lived by farming and fishing. The principal crops were ice, sugar cane, corn and copper. At Holland as well as at Manus, one of the Admiralty Islands 200 miles north of New Guinea, 
a vast armada, including battleships, cruisers, small carriers, destroyers, transport, tankers, amphibious craft, minesweepers, salvage tugs and floating dry docks, was preparing to set sail for late. The ships were manned by 50,000 sailors, and the transports and amphibious craft carried 165,000 troops of MacArthur's Sixth Army. The invasion of late would be by far the greatest operation in the Pacific. For the first time all the forces of MacArthur, Nimitz and the overseas bomber commands would be united. The safe passage of this convoy was still Mitch's concern and to accomplish this he was to range from the Philippine Sea to the East China Sea and back. Task Force 38, which had already practically eliminated Japanese air power in the Philippines, first steamed a thousand miles north to Okinawa, an island the Japanese considered part of the homeland. Mitch's 1,396 sorties on October 10 destroyed a hundred planes and considerable shipping, including four cargo vessels, a submarine tender and a dozen torpedo boats. The Admiral swung back south to bomb northern Luzon the following day. Then he reversed course again and just before sunrise on October 12 launched fighters from his four carrier groups at Formosa. Here he met his first serious opposition. Vice Admiral Shijo Ifukudome, commander of the 6th Base Air Force, sent up 230 fighters to ambush the Americans. Many of his young pilots had learned their combat technology only from films, but they would probably outnumber the enemy at least 3 to 2. From his command post Fukudome saw in the distance enemy planes sweep down to his airfields, high above, tiny specks, zero interceptors began plummeting toward the Americans. There were flashing explosions and long arching trails of smoke. Fukudem excitedly clapped his hands. Well done. Well done. A tremendous success. But the Americans continued to come on in perfect formation. The downed planes were his own. His fighters had been like so many eggs thrown against the stern wall of the indomitable enemy formation. Fukudoma lost a third of his interceptors in the first strike, and the rest in the second. There was nothing to send up against the third. The Americans resumed their aids the following morning and, unopposed, damaged foremost air installations more heavily than the previous day. The Japanese retaliated at dusk. Thirty odd bombers specially designed for night attacks swept out toward Task Force 38 skimming the waves to avoid radar detection. Three dive bombers eluded interceptors and released their bombs at the carrier Franklin. Two bombs went wide, but the third exploded on the deck edge elevator. Fire broke out on the port quarter but was soon extinguished. The heavy cruiser Canberra, named after the Australian cruiser sunk in the Battle of Savo, was not so fortunate. A torpedo slammed into her side, ripping a huge hole. Water cascaded in and she came to a dead stop 90 miles from Formosa. Halsey, on his flagship New Jersey, faced a difficult decision. Should he abandon Canberra or risk another ship in an attempt to tow her at four knots the 1300 miles to Alithi Atoll in the Carolines? Halsey characteristically took the chance and ordered another cruiser to draw Canberra clear. To divert the Japanese he ordered a third and unscheduled series of raids on Formosa. In the morning Mitchell sent out three sweeps against foremost airfields while 109 huge Army Air Force B-29s left their bases deep inside China to hit the Takao area. By dusk, over 500 Japanese planes had been destroyed in the three-day air battle. But the surviving Japanese pilots, whose vision of battle had come from a lake full of models on the Toho film lot, reported the biggest victory in Japanese naval history. And as Halsey's fleet withdrew to strike elsewhere, Admiral Toy Oda, at the time in Formosa on an inspection trip, saw this action as confirmation of American disaster. He ordered Fukudome to go after the remnants of the Third Fleet with every bomber left. The next day, October 15, Fukudome launched three strikes. One group alone found the enemy, and it was repelled. 
The following afternoon a flight of 107 aircraft caught up with the retreating Americans. Only three penetrated the fighter screen and one hit the light cruiser Houston with a torpedo. Over 6,500 tons of water rushed in and she seemed destined to share the fate of the first Houston, destroyed off Java, but damage control parties kept the leaks in check, and like Canberra, she was towed away. Halsey had not lost a single ship in the sweeps extending from Okinawa to Luzon. Facetiously he radioed Nimitz. The Third Fleet's sunken and damaged ships have been salvaged and are retiring at high speed toward the enemy. He was heading south to support the coming invasion of late. In Japan neither Combined Fleet nor Imperial Headquarters had any reason to doubt the reports of momentous victories by returning pilots. An official communique was issued on October 16 announcing that in the former Sun Battle 11 enemy carriers, two battleships, three cruisers and one destroyer or light cruiser had been sunk and almost as many others damaged. In addition, 112 planes had been shot down. It was admitted that 312 Japanese aircraft had not yet returned but this was small price for crippling the Third Fleet. The Emperor called for a celebration in Hibiya Park. To the south a typhoon raged through the Philippines, but by dawn of October 17 the storm had subsided. Through a sea whipped by heavy winds an American attack group, two light cruisers, four destroyers and eight destroyer transport, followed three minesweepers into Lake Gulf. For twenty minutes one of the cruisers, Denver, shelled Sulian, a small island in the mouth of the Gulf. Then the 6th Ranger Infantry Battalion debarked from the transports in a driving rain to land unopposed. The Rangers were looking for mine charts in a lighthouse but found none. They disposed of most of the 32-man Japanese garrison, but not before a lookout sent out a radio warning. He so exaggerated the size of the attack group, he reported that two battleships, two converted aircraft carriers and six destroyers lay off his island, that their presence created a major alert. Admiral Toy Oda, still on Formosa, signaled Admiral Takeo Goraita to bring his formidable first striking force up from Singapore, then ordered Ozawa's mobile fleet to steam out of the inland sea, where it had reorganized after its crushing defeat in the Philippine Sea, and head south toward the Philippines. He also instructed submarines to make for the late area and attack the American fleet. Then he took off for Japan so he could be at Combined Fleet Headquarters once the decisive battle started. But the man in charge of the defense of the Visayans saw the Sulian alert as yet another false report. At Cebu, General Sozaku Suzuki remembered the panic when white caps off Mindanao were reported as landing craft. How could the enemy possibly launch an invasion after suffering a greater naval defeat than at Pearl Harbor? His superiors in Manila were just as skeptical, observation pilots had reported seeing nothing in late gulf through the clouds and rain. On late itself, General Makino alone feared it was a genuine invasion and ordered an alert, against the advice of his staff, who argued that the American shipping in the mouth of late gulf was the remnants of the Formosa battle blown south by the typhoon. October 18 dawned fair and the rangers had no trouble landing on Homanhan, an island next to Little Suluan. One of Makino's staff officers flew over the gulf about this time but saw nothing through the fog, there were no Japanese, no fortifications. Without opposition, here we are with all these goddamn bullets and no Japs, the rangers accomplished their mission, the erection of a navigation light to guide the convoy. Fifteen miles to the south. Other rangers were swarming ashore at Dinagat, a much bigger island guarding the lower approaches to the gulf. It, too, was uninhabited, and a second navigation light was set up at the tip end, desolation point. The convoy would enter the gulf between these two islands. By noon the entrance to late had been secured. Two hours later the battleship Pennsylvania, along with two cruisers and several destroyers, began to bombard late itself along the gulf. Then underwater teams in landing craft moved into scout conditions on the beaches. Japanese dug in along the neat rows of coconut trees lining the beach road opened fire, 
sinking one of the craft. Ignoring the hail of bullets, the other teams went to work and were soon back with a welcome report, the shore was clear of mines and obstacles. Makino's communications, inadequate to begin with, had been almost completely disrupted by the storm, and he knew none of this. Reassured by the officer who had just flown over the gulf and seen nothing of import, he reported to Suzuki that the American ships sighted earlier in the gulf had probably been looking for refuge from the typhoon. In Japan this complacency was not shared by combined fleet. Just before noon Admiral Toy Oda gave the execute to SHO-1, and for the first time his staff revealed to the army at a combined meeting its detailed plan for an exhaustive battle, the navy would attack the landing forces in late gulf with every available ship. This all or nothing attitude distressed General Kenry Osato. If the navy failed, what chance would the army have in its decisive battle? The combined fleet belongs not only to the navy but to the state, Sato pointed out. Its destruction, he used the word self-destruction would leave the homeland open to invasion. Only the existence of the fleet will make the enemy cautious, he said in a choked voice. So please, gentlemen, be prudent. I am very grateful to know, said Rear Admiral Nakazawa, the operations section chief that the combined fleet is so highly regarded by you army men. His words were sincere. He pleaded for a fitting place to die. The Philippines would be the last opportunity. Please give the combined fleet the chance to bloom as flowers of death. His voice faltered. This is the Navy's earnest request. Sato could not withstand the tears or the argument. He acceded gracefully. That afternoon the Emperor gave his blessing to SHO-1. South of the Philippines, scattered over thousands of square miles, the invasion convoy, 420 transports and 157 warships, was steaming steadily toward Late Gulf. In the van were battleships, cruisers and destroyers of the support and bombardment units, and just before dawn on October 19 they entered the Gulf and began shelling the landing beaches. At the same time carrier planes were striking at every air base on the Visayans. They almost completely destroyed the remaining Japanese air power in the area. The stage was at last set for the appearance of the gigantic invasion convoy. At 11 o'clock that evening it rendezvoused 17 miles east of Late Gulf and steamed slowly toward the opening, marked by the navigation lights on the islands of Dinagat and Homonhan. Protestant and Catholic services were piped over public address systems, and more than one man had the sinking feeling that he was listening to his own last rites. Up ahead could be heard the muted boom of destroyers lobbing shells onto the landing areas. In eleven hours the GIs would storm those beaches, and they tried to rest in the stuffy holds. Those who could not sleep counted the slow hours in their bunks or came up on deck in search of fresh air. The ships seemed to be barely moving as they glided through the mouth of the gulf. There was little talk, everyone was too engrossed in his own thoughts and fears. On the left loomed an ominous mass, Dinagat Island, dark except at the tip end, Desolation Point, where a white beacon steadily gleamed. AGI fell overboard. It was reported over the circuit, ships astern keep lookout. Rescue seemed hopeless in the swift running phosphorescent waters, but twenty minutes later a small craft near the end of the formation sighted the soldier and hauled him aboard. In the first grey light of October 20, MacArthur had designated it a day, since D-Day, to the public, meant June 6, 1944, the dim outline of late materialized. The sun rose behind the convoy, illuminating clear skies overhead. In minutes it was uncomfortably hot. The quiet was shattered abruptly as three battleships opened fire. Grey smoke plumes erupted along violet and yellow beaches near Dulag. Twelve minutes later a Japanese observation plane appeared. A kick bursts bloomed on all sides, but the little aircraft moved off unharmed. At about seven o'clock three other battleships joined in the cannonade, their target wide and red beaches to the north just below Taklaban, the capital. 
Within an hour the transports began moving sedately over the glassy water to positions seven miles offshore. The battleships ceased fire to allow cruisers, destroyers and gunboats to move in closer and take up the bombardment. The continuous thunder of guns was suddenly exceeded by an awesome swoosh as thousands of rockets shot up simultaneously from the little gunboats. Seconds later there was a thunderous clap. The entire shoreline was a solid sheet of blinding and exploding flame. When the smoke cleared, those on the transports stared incredulous, where there had been lush jungle growth now lay a barren, tangled, smoking, dust-covered waste. At 9.45, 15 minutes before H hour, the landing craft, which had been jockeying for position as if they were in a sulky race, bored in toward the beaches on a 12-mile front. In the north the 1st Cavalry Division stormed ashore at White Beach. Sharpshooters knocked snipers out of palm trees with carbines and garands, concrete pillboxes were dynamited and cavalrymen swept onto the coastal highway. To their left the 24th Infantry Division also landed without difficulty, two of their men, one a Filipino, planted the American and Philippine flags on Red Beach but they ran into nests of resolute Japanese and it took them several hours to reach the road. Farther south the 96th Infantry Division splashed safely ashore at Orange and Blue Beaches. Fortunately, most of the artillery located at Catman Hill, which dominated the region, had been destroyed by the naval bombardment. They pushed inland for almost a mile before they were slowed by marshes and scattered resistance. To their left at the extreme southern end, Violet and Yellow Beaches, the 7th Infantry Division, which had seen action at Atu and Kwajalein, encountered the stiffest opposition, but Duleg was captured by noon. MacArthur watched the landings intently from the bridge of the cruiser Nashville until lunch. He reappeared on deck a little before two o'clock, wearing a fresh khaki uniform, sunglasses and marshal's cap. He climbed into a barge loaded with officers and newsmen. It headed for the transport John Land, on which Sergio Osmena, the president of the Philippines since Gerson's death three months earlier, waited along with General Carlos Romulo to be picked up. Romulo hadn't seen MacArthur for two years and eagerly clambered down the rope ladder. Carlos, my boy! MacArthur exclaimed. Here we are, home. Osmena's affable greeting to MacArthur belied his true feelings. It had taken a personal plea from President Roosevelt to persuade him to return to the Philippines in the shadow of the general. But the exhilaration of the moment overrode personal differences. They were all talking at once. Where here was repeated over and over. MacArthur slapped Sutherland on the knee. Believe it or not, he said with a grin, we're back. The barge grounded one red beach, some five miles below Tacloban. The ramp flapped down and MacArthur stepped into knee-deep water. He was followed by Osmena, General George Kenny and the others. The diminutive Romulo, who was wearing new shoes, had difficulty keeping up with MacArthur's long strides. The shore was encumbered by four damaged landing craft, one still burning, and occasionally the party heard the rattle of machine gun and rifle fire. Corncob pipe in mouth and armed with an old revolver of his father's which he kept in his back pocket, MacArthur searched to Palm Grove for the 24th Division Commander, Major General Frederick Irving. This is what I dreamed about, Romulo heard him mutter. Prone GIs were concentrating fear on something ahead. Hey, there's General MacArthur, said one. His buddy didn't even bother to look up. Oh yeah? and I suppose he's got Eleanor Roosevelt along with him. After a brief chat with General Irving, MacArthur returned to his party. He motioned to Osmena, put a hand on his shoulder. Mr. President, how does it feel to be home? He asked. They sat down on a fallen tree. As soon as we take Tacloban I am turning the administration over to you. This may be sooner than we planned, things are going so smoothly. I am ready whenever you are, General. They were interrupted by a signal corps officer who extended a hand microphone. The voice of freedom was back on the air. As MacArthur began to talk, his voice charged with emotion and hands trembling, 
A few drops of rain fell. People of the Philippines, I have returned. By the grace of Almighty God our forces stand again on Philippine soil. At my side is your president, Sergio Osmena, worthy successor of that great patriot, Manuel Gerson, with members of his cabinet. In the background, trucks were noisily grinding across the beach, and planes roared overhead. There was an occasional distant boom from ships offshore shelling inland positions. His voice rising, the general called on the people to rally to him in the spirit of Bataan and Corregidor. As the lines of battle roll forward to bring you within the zone of operations, rise and strike. For your homes and hearths, strike. For future generations of your sons and daughters, strike. In the name of your sacred dead, strike. Let no heart be faint. Let every arm be steeled. The guidance of divine God points the way. Follow in his name to the holy grail of righteous victory. Those men took the microphone. The liberation of the islands would be a joint enterprise of the Americans and Filipinos, and he urged the populace to cooperate. We have the word of America that our country, which has been ravaged by war, will be reconstructed and rehabilitated. Steps have already been taken to this end. With the return of normal conditions, law and order will be fully re-established and democratic processes of constitutional government restored. Romulo also praised the Americans. You must continue keeping faith with them. You cannot let America down. Euphoric, MacArthur wandered around the wet grove talking to G.I.s until an officer nervously said, Sir, there are snipers over there, and pointed to nearby trees. MacArthur seemed not to hear. He sat down on a log and stared into the distance, at the land he had sworn to liberate. A few miles to the north, troopers of the 1st Cavalry had reached the outskirts of Tacloban. They dug in, setting up mortars and machine guns in case of a night attack. Instead they were overwhelmed by the liberated. Filipinos crowded past the sentries. There were old people, young mothers with babies. Robert Chaplin of the New Yorker saw an aged, wrinkled-faced woman standing, arms outstretched toward the G.I.s with a beatific smile on her face. She seemed to be in the middle of a dream, too stunned to believe that she was wide awake. The Americans had a substantial beachhead in the middle of the Philippines along with more than 100,000 tons of cargo. The cost was minimal, 49 G.I.s had died. Roosevelt radioed his congratulations to MacArthur, you have the nation's gratitude and the nation's prayers for success as you and your men fight your way back. The invaders' losses had been light because the defense system had been shattered by the three-day bombardment. Their forward positions destroyed, their ranks thinned by shelling and strafing. The Japanese had fallen back, often leaderless. Few of the units were in communication with division headquarters. That night Colonel Kanao Kondo of the 22nd Artillery Regiment accused the commander of the 1st Battalion of retreating without orders. Kondo refused to accept the excuse that almost the entire battalion had been killed or wounded, and their guns destroyed. Why didn't you die? He raged and ordered the survivors to fight to the end where they stood. General Makino had no details of the progress of the fighting. On the eve of the invasion he had hastily evacuated his headquarters in Tacloban and was heading inland when the Americans came ashore. He had not yet been able to report what little he knew to his superiors. At Fort McKinley, Yamashita was trying to evaluate the scanty information from late. Just after ten o'clock his new chief of staff, Lieutenant General Akira Muto, arrived from Sumatra, where he had been exiled by Tojo. He was without baggage and wore a grimy uniform, during a bombing at an airfield he had leapt into a muddy ditch to save himself. Yamashita told him of the invasion. Very interesting was his remark. But where is late? They were joined by Colonel Ikiji Sujita, Yamashita's interpreter at Singapore, who had just flown in from Tokyo with distressing news for both of them. Imperial headquarters ordered the 14th Area Army to fight the decisive battle on late. The next day, October 21st, 
MacArthur's four divisions continued to press forward against little resistance. Delag's airfield was overrun, most of Taklaban was liberated, and a special town meeting was scheduled for the following morning to welcome the victors and to recruit native labor for the Philippine Civil Affairs Unit. Filipinos crowded the marketplace, ignoring occasional bursts of fire in the outskirts. We had to obey the Japanese to save our necks, said Satrino Gonzalez, a member of the provincial board. He spoke to the audience but his words were directed to the Americans, in English. But there was never any doubt, as you know, what our feelings were beneath. I ask you to consider now what the policies of the American government were like before the Japanese came and how they are to be compared to the Japanese administration. You will now understand the famous democratic ways of the United States. The next speaker held up a can of K ration. The crowd got the point and cheered in English, Long live the Americans! Lovely Americans! An American colonel told the crowd that the Philippines were theirs, your Commonwealth government will be set up under your own president, President Osmena. We are going to see that you get food and clothing. We want you to be patient. We need labor. You will get paid for the work you do in Philippine currency and with it you will be able to buy the rice and the other products we will bring. But, by God, you'll do it as free men. The New Yorker man, Shapelin, doubted that the audience understood everything the colonel said but their enthusiasm was such that the next speaker, an ex-governor of late, pledged that they would work for the Americans 365 days a year, and we will work for nothing. The colonel's protests were overridden by cries of lovely Americans. We will work, we will work. In Manila, 340 miles to the northwest. Yamashita was making a final attempt to persuade Field Marshal Teroki to protest Tokyo's order to make late the site of the conclusive land battle of the Philippines. How could reinforcements break through the American air and submarine blockade around the island? Besides, before sufficient troops and supplies reached late the battle would be over. And was it MacArthur's primary target? Perhaps this was merely a feint before the full-scale invasion of Luzon. But his arguments came to naught, Teroki never wavered in his belief that the imminent naval air counterattack would sink the enemy invasion fleet in late Gulf. The Marshal, Muto characterized him as being in extremely high spirits and optimistic, ordered the 14th Area Army to totally destroy the enemy on late. Reluctantly Yamashita passed on the order to Suzuki, and promised to send substantial infantry reinforcements to late. Naval support could be expected to reach the island on the 24th and 25th of October. On late, Makino had been forced to split his 16th Division into the Northern and Southern Late Defense Forces. His orders were couched in aggressive prows, but privately he hoped his troops would not collapse before help arrived. By the next day the Tacloban area was secure enough for the invaders to permit the public appearance of the Allied leaders. Early in the afternoon a Filipino brass band roamed the streets of Tacloban in a weapons carrier, a loudspeaker repeated interminably that MacArthur and Osmeno were coming and there would be ceremonies. Led by the band, an impromptu parade formed and by three o'clock a crowd clustered around the steps of the Capitol building. The MacArthur party disembarked at the old wharf from two PT boats, and with the general in the lead, marched to the Capitol. From the steps of the building MacArthur formally announced the establishment of the Philippine civil government under President Osmena and promised to liberate the rest of the islands. It was a short, unemotional speech, but the fiesta crowd cheered every sentence. A bugler sounded to the colors as American and Philippine flags were raised simultaneously. MacArthur shook hands with Osmena and Romulo. I and my staff will now retire he said and started back to the wharf. There were almost a hundred U.S. fleet and escort carriers in the Pacific by late summer of 1944. These rumors had no basis in fact, but there was some justification for complaints. Tojo did misappropriate power in his utilization of the Kempati to control dissidents. Known pacifists such as Kona were under strict surveillance, 
and many citizens had been jailed and a few tortured to death for espousing Christianity or fomenting political opposition. Sagona Kano, an avowed Nazi, was arrested after making a public speech against Tojo. Soon after his release he committed Harakiri under such mysterious circumstances that it was commonly believed Kempe agents had persuaded him to kill himself. The impression was real and caused widespread public indignation, but the extent of the repression was exaggerated. He was referring to the Marshal Pietro Badaglio government, which had surrendered Italy unconditionally to the Allies the previous summer. Section It was the Ishihara Tsuji clique, the personification of Chikokuo, General Suzuki told a fellow officer, Major Yoshitaka Hori, after leaving Malaya that brought the Japanese army to this deplorable situation. In Malaya, Tsuji's speech and conduct were often insolent, and there was this problem of inhumane treatment of Chinese merchants, so I advised General Yamashita to punish Tsuji severely and then dismiss him. But he feigned ignorance. I tell you, so long as they, Tsuji, Ishihara, and their like, exert influence on the army, it can only lead to ruin. Extermination of these poisonous insects should take precedence over all other problems. Pelli was defended with such determination that it took a statistical average of 1,589 rounds of heavy and light ammunition to kill each Japanese soldier. American casualties were extremely heavy. In one month of bitter combat, 1,121 Marines were killed. The Marines were feuding with their own Navy and Army in equal proportions. Just before disembarking for the assault, Marines on correspondent Tom Lee's transport left this notice on the ship's bulletin board in the ship's officer's wardroom. A message of thanks. From, Marines aboard USS Repulsive. To, Officers and Men aboard USS Repulsive. 1. It gives us great pleasure at this time to extend our sincere thanks to all members of the crew for their kind and considerate treatment of Marines during this cruise. 2. We non-combatants realize that the brave and stalwart members of the crew are winning the war in the Pacific. You Navy people even go within 10 miles of a Japanese island, thereby risking your precious lives. Oh how courageous you are! Oh how our piles bleed for you! 3. Because of your actions during this voyage it is our heartfelt wish that a. The USS Repulsive receives a Jap torpedo immediately after debarkation of all troops. b. The crew of the USS Repulsive is stranded on Beach Orange 3 where marine units which sailed aboard the ship may repay in some measure the good fellowship extended by the crew and officers during the trip. 4. In conclusion we Marines wish to say to all you dear, dear boys in the Navy, bugger you, you bloody bastards. A the Toha Motion Picture Company constructed a lake in Setagaya and filled it with six-foot models of you. S. Warships. Atop a tower a movie camera on a boom took pictures of the vessels from various angles, simulating different speeds of approach. These films were shown as a substitute for flight training in order to save fuel. 22. The Battle of Late Gulf. 1. The mobile fleet and first striking force, the remnants of the combined fleet, were approaching the Philippines from the north and west. Vice Admiral G. Saburo Ozawa commanded the mobile fleet, whose air power had been shattered in the Marianas and whose remaining planes had proved so ineffectual in the three-day air battle off Formosa. Still, it made a formidable appearance, with the large carriers Uikaku, light carriers Zuiho, Shutters and Chioda, and the battleships Ise and Hyuga, remodeled into semi-carriers. But it was a hollow striking force. There were only 116 planes distributed among the six ships. The first striking force, coming from Singapore, was under the command of Vice Admiral Takeo Garaita. He came from a family of scholars, his father had compiled a distinguished history of Japan, but he was a man of action. He had skippered five destroyers and twice commanded torpedo divisions, then a cruiser division. 
he had escorted the troops who were to land on Midway, and after participating in the battles around Guadalcanal, including the bombardment of Henderson Field by Congo and Harana, took over the second fleet in time to participate in the Battle of the Philippine Sea. His new fleet was strictly a surface force but its firepower was truly redoubtable. It included the two largest and most fearsome battleships in the world, Musashi and Yamato, as well as five old but serviceable battleships, among them Harana, so often reported sunk, and her sister ship, Congo, eleven heavy cruisers, two light cruisers and nineteen destroyers. The first striking force could throw more tons of shells than any fleet afloat. It arrived at Brunei, Borneo, on October 20 as the Americans were landing on late. Early the next morning the writer received orders to enter late Gulf at dawn of October 25 and destroy enemy amphibious shipping. Combined fleet suggested a two-pronged attack, one group would work its way through the confining waters of the Visayans, debouch into the Pacific through San Bernardino Strait, turn south past Samar and enter late Gulf from the east, the other group would break into the Gulf from the south through the narrow Zurigo Strait between Mindanao and Leyte. On the long approaches to the battle area, both groups might easily be discovered and ambushed by American submarines and surface units as well as aircraft. Garaitu and his staff were willing to accept these perils. What they objected to was the mission as such. They were eager to die in a battle against carriers, but why risk His Majesty's greatest battleships for transports that would already be unloaded? Combined fleet sympathized with these objections but stood firm. It was too late for any alternative. The writer, however, was given permission to engage carriers if they came within range. The writer decided to bring the major part of his fleet through San Bernardino Strait in order to keep it beyond the range of enemy search planes as long as possible. A detachment of two old battleships and four destroyers under Vice Admiral Teji Nishimura would take the much shorter southern route. Both groups would enter late Gulf at dawn on the 25th and converge on the enemy transports and their covering force. The writer was resigned to the loss of at least half his ships, but so many of his junior officers openly protested this calculated risk that he abandoned his usual reticence to address his division commanders and their staffs on the deck of the flagship, the heavy cruiser Ratago. He told them that the war situation was far more critical than they could possibly know. Would it not be a shame to have the fleet remain intact while our nation perishes? I believe that Imperial Headquarters is giving us a glorious opportunity. You must remember that there are such things as miracles. What man can say that there is no chance for our fleet to turn the tide of war in a decisive battle? The writer's words, calm but forceful, were greeted with cries of Banzai. At 8 a.m. on October 22, the main body of first striking force sorted from Brunei and began steaming northward, followed by the small Anishimura detachment, which turned east at the tip of Borneo and headed toward the south entrance to Late Gulf, Zurigo Strait. The main body continued northeast through the darkness on a zigzag course at 18 knots, skirting the west coast of the long narrow island of Palawan in the 25 mile wide passage formed by uncharted reefs aptly called the dangerous ground, and the island itself. In these swift waters near the reefs, two American picket submarines, Dartra and Dace, patrolled the surface side by side. At 16 minutes past midnight the conning tower of Dartra reported, radar contact, 131 true, 30,000 yards, contact is doubtful, probably rain cloud. Rain cloud hell! thought the captain, Commander David McClintock, who was topside. That's the Jap fleet. The radar operator's report confirmed his guess, and he relayed the information by megaphone to the skipper of Dace, Commander Bladen Cliggett. Let's go get them, Cliggett called back and both submarines gave chase at flank speed with data in the lead. By 4.50 am they had closed the Japanese, and all hands on data were called to battle stations. At 5.10 she reversed course, submerged. Through the periscope, in the faint light of dawn, McClintock made out a grey mass in the distance. 
a Japanese column was coming straight at him. He looked to the southeast and saw another column of battleships, cruisers and destroyers several miles away. The gray vessels bearing down on him grew larger. At 5.25 McClintock identified the lead ship, a heavy cruiser making huge bow waves. It was a beautiful sight and McClintock hoped it was the flagship. All tubes were ready and the range was just under 1,000 yards when the column abruptly zigged to the west, placing the target at a perfect angle. Fire one. Ordered McClintock. A searchlight on the cruiser signaled. Had she detected the spread of six torpedoes? No, she was holding her course. McClintock took a bearing on the next cruiser. His first torpedoes were heading for the flagship, at a go. On the bridge, Garaitu and his chief of staff, Rear Admiral Tomiji Koinagi, suddenly felt four great tremors in succession. The cruiser began to sink. A destroyer was signaled, and Garaitu and his staff swam to it. On days, Cleggett surveyed the scene through his periscope. Good lord, he exclaimed, it looks like the 4th of July out there. One is sinking and another is burning. The Japs are firing all over the place. What a show. Stand by for a setup, here they come. He studied two ships bearing down on him. Let them pass, they are only cruisers. Behind was a bigger target he mistook for a Congo class battleship. Fire one, fire two, fire three, fire four, fire five, fire six, click it ordered, and then, take her deep, Earl. Let's get the hell out of here. They heard the thump of torpedoes striking home and a crackle like cellophane being crumpled close to our ears. The heavy cruise Amaya was breaking up. Even before the writer had reached the perilous waters of the central Philippines, he had lost two heavy cruisers, and a third, Takao, was in such bad shape that she had to turn back to Borneo. Moreover, his course had been discovered, yet there was nothing to do but continue. At noon he received a message from Combined Fleet which told him what he knew better than anyone else. It is very probable that the enemy is aware of the fact that we have concentrated our forces. He will probably act in the following manner, a, concentrate submarines in great strength in the San Bernardino and Zurigo Straits area. b, plan attacks on our surface forces, using large type planes and task forces after tomorrow morning. c, plan decisive action by concentrating his surface strength in the area east of San Bernardino Strait and Tacloban where he is his transport group. As to our operations, a, execute our original plan. 2. By dawn, it was October 24, the writer was aboard a new flagship, the mighty Yamato. His ships were in two circular formations seven miles apart. Yamato and her sister ship, Musashi, were in the center of the first group, and Congo in the middle of the second. A huge pagode-like tower rose above the deck of Yamato. Near the top in the flag bridge was a writer's headquarters. Just below, in the operations room, his staff was trying to assimilate the fragments of information that were slowly coming in. The first striking force went around the southern tip of Mindra and continued on up into the Sibuyan Sea. The most hazardous part of the trip, a daylight passage following a circumscribed course among numerous islets, not only limited maneuver but was a matchless stalking ground for submarines. But there was no other way to get to San Bernardino Strait, the gateway to the Philippine Sea. Goraita had come to doubt the report that the air engagements off Formosa had crippled American carrier power but he did not know that Japanese air power in the Philippines had itself been practically annihilated by Halsey and could give him little if any support. Shortly after 8 a.m. the writer was again discovered, this time by an American search plane. He radioed Manila for fighter protection. Fewer than a dozen zeros could be spared and none of these managed to reach the first striking force. Every other available land-based plane, 180 in all, was sent out to attack Halsey's third fleet, which stretched across the Philippine Sea from mid Luzon to late. Hellcats from Mitch's Task Force 38 knocked down almost all of the Japanese, 
but one bomber broke through the screen to hit the light carrier Princeton with a 550-pound bomb. The blazing hangar deck began exploding torpedoes chain fashion. For hours the crew fought to save the ship, but the conflagration was uncontrollable and she had to be sunk. With the sighting of Goraita's ships in the Sibuyan Sea, Admiral Halsey characteristically took personal charge of the battle. At 8.37 he bypassed Mitcher and ordered three of his task group commanders direct by TBS, talk between ships, strike, repeat, strike, good luck. Within two hours the van of this attack, 12 fighters and the same number of dive bombers and torpedo bombers from Intrepid and Cabot, found a writer. On Musashi, Petty Officer Second Class Shiro Hosoya was precariously perched in an open signal booth attached to the second bridge, about halfway up its huge island structure. He was supervisor of signalmen but during action had little to do but observe. With a mixed feeling of anxiety and awe he watched the Americans break through the tremendous wall of anti-aircraft fire thrown up by every ship in the formation, each battleship had at least 120-25 mm. Guns and the cruisers carried 90. It was like watching a show, until the enemy planes began heading straight for him and for Yamato. Just ahead and to the left, half a dozen huge geysers erupted around Yamato. The great battleship was obscured and a report was relayed that she was sinking. Hosoya refused to believe it, like Musashi, she was unsinkable. He peered apprehensively through the descending waters until he made her out again, steaming along as if on maneuvers. Suddenly a fountain more than 200 feet high rose directly in front of Hosoya and drenched the men on deck below. His booth swayed sickeningly as Musashi shuddered twice, once from a bomb hit, once from a torpedo. But like her sister, she sailed on serenely as if nothing had happened, evidence that she truly was indestructible. Basically the same as Yamato, Musashi was better constructed, had superior quarters and was worthy of her nickname, the palace. She had been Yamamoto's flagship, then Koga's, and the crew wondered a bit resentfully why the writer had not chosen to come aboard her for the last battle of the Japanese Navy. At noon a second attack, 24 torpedo planes, swept in toward the two super battleships. Musashi took three more torpedoes but continued on course, all damage under control. On Yamato, which had not yet been hit, the writer sent another plea for air support, at 1.15 p.m this to his superior, Admiral Ozawa, as well as to Manila. We are being subjected to repeated enemy carrier-based air attacks. Advise immediately of contacts and attacks made by you on the enemy. Fifteen minutes later, twenty-nine planes loomed on the horizon, they were from Lexington and Essex. To a writer, the enemy aircraft converging on Musashi looked as if they were twice that number. On Musashi's second bridge chief gunnery officer Koshino was pleading over the voice tube with the captain, Rear Admiral Toshihiro Inaguchi, to let him fire the main 18.1-inch guns, the biggest in the world, with a special spray shell called Sanshiki Dan. Permission denied, said Inaguchi. A dozen rounds of Sanshiki Dan could damage a gun's bore, he wanted to save the big guns for the surface battle in late Gulf. The attackers turned out to be more aggressive than their predecessors. Dive bombers plunged down, accompanied by fighters strafing the decks. The ship became enveloped by water thrown up by near bomb misses. Then in rapid succession four bombs crashed into Musashi. Fragments like steel popcorn ricocheted off the bridges. The air was acrid with gunpowder fumes. Another torpedo ripped into the hull. At last Musashi was hurt, and perceptibly. She fell several miles behind Yamato, but the executive officer, Captain Kenkichi Kato, who was responsible for damage control, still remained so confident that he didn't think it necessary to report personally to the skipper. The limping ship was, however, affecting the progress of the first striking force. Uraito ordered fleet speed reduced to 22 knots so that Musashi could keep up, then sent out another request for help. 
First striking force is engaged in severe fight in Sibuyan Sea. Enemy air attacks are expected to increase. Request land-based air force and mobile force to make prompt attacks on enemy carrier force estimated to be at Laman Bay. Musashi's increased vulnerability gave Chief Gunner Officer Koshino a chance to renew his pleas to use Sanshikidan in the main guns. Admiral Inaguchi argued that the ship was listing, which made it unsafe to fire the guns, but when the executive officer supported Koshino, Inaguchi yielded. Excitement spread through the ship as the huge guns, the very reason for Musashi's existence, were slowly trained toward the east. Sixty-five planes from Enterprise and Franklin appeared in the distance. The nine guns roared, the first time they had ever been fired at an enemy. The noise was deafening topside, and below decks the ship heaved as if a spread of torpedoes had smashed into her simultaneously. Koshino peered expectantly at the approaching planes but not one was falling into the sea, the formation simply spread out and kept coming. Only six guns were firing now. The forward turret was silent. One of its guns was jammed with a projectile and the other two could not be elevated higher than 45 degrees. Bombers and torpedo planes swarmed over Musashi. From his signal booth Hosoya watched in horror as a line of three torpedoes plowed into the ship's port side, then a bomb exploded into the pagoda structure. Hosoya was knocked to his knees, but almost all those just above him on the command bridge were killed, by chance Inaguchi was at the top of the mast in the observation booth. Seven more torpedoes, bounding like porpoises in the choppy water, smashed one by one into the badly damaged port side. No one seemed to be in charge of the ship until an order finally came over the voice tube, first bridge, all killed. Captain will take command from the second bridge. It was Anaguchi, still in the observation tower, and unharmed. There were five more quick explosions, one overhead. The voice from the observation tower was weak, Captain is wounded. Executive officer, take command. Musashi was listing noticeably to port, and on the second bridge executive officer Kato ordered the ship leveled by water ballast. Then he leaned out to the signal booth and handed Hosoya a message to transmit to Yamato, which was pulling away rapidly. Electric power was out and Hosoya had to use flags, Musashi capable of cruising at 15 knots listing to port about 15 degrees. One bomb hit first bridge, all members killed. Five direct bomb hits and twelve torpedo hits. Captain is alive. But Musashi's ordeal was not yet over. At 3.20 pm the attack was renewed as planes from Intrepid, Cabot and Essex joined with those still remaining from Franklin and Enterprise. Goraita's ships continued to throw up a screen of anti-aircraft fire but nothing could stop the Americans boring in on Musashi for the kill. When they were through. She was left almost helpless, decks awash. The eerie quiet after battle was broken by a shout of Banzai. From the deck. What was that Banzai for? Kato yelled down from the second bridge. The enemy fleet is destroyed? A sailor shouted back. Who told you that? Chief Gunnery Officer Koshino. Kato turned back to the bridge. It was just like Koshina to try to keep up the men's morale. The story spread throughout the ship and the crew's fighting spirit remained high despite the 17 bomb and 19 torpedo hits. But Kato himself was disconsolate. He informed Inaguchi, who had come down from the observation tower, his left arm in a sling, that the ship was in no condition to withstand another attack. Hosoya flagged another message to the disappearing writer. Speed 6 knots, capable of operation. Damage great. What shall we do? Musashi was ordered to quit the battle area with a two destroyer escort. Since leaving Borneo, the first striking force had been deprived of the services of a battleship, four heavy cruisers, Mayoko had just turned back with two damaged shafts, and two destroyers. But the rest of Horita's fleet continued edging toward the narrows that led to San Bernardino Strait. Just before 4 p.m., however, Horita had second thoughts. 
It was still light enough for several more air attacks and it would be impossible to evade them in the channel ahead. They would be trapped. The writer reversed course and sent a lengthy explanation to combined fleet. Dot were we to have forced our way through as scheduled under these circumstances, we would merely make of ourselves meat for the enemy, with very little chance of success to US. IT was therefore concluded that our best course was to retire temporarily beyond range of hostile planes until friendly, land-based, planes could strike a decisive blow against the enemy force. For an hour the writer steamed west, but no American planes appeared. Encouraged, he decided to chance the run to San Bernardino Strait, even though there had been no reply to his request for assistance from land-based planes. At 5.15 the first striking force reversed course again and began cautiously filing in column between the islands of Mazbate and Burias. On Musashi, attempts to level the ship by emergency pumping had failed. Her bow was submerged and she crept along at a few knots. The crew transferred everything movable to the starboard aft section, but the port list grew worse. With the emergency battery-powered signal lamp. Hosoya informed the writer that Musashi was taking on excess water. The answer was. Musashi go forward or backward at top speed and ground on nearest island and become a land battery. Enaguchi tried to comply, but the listing, sinking ship could only move in circles. He told Hosoya to signal the two escorting destroyers to remove the wounded, but neither acknowledged the message. Why don't they come? Executive Officer Kato fretted and irritably slapped Hosoya on the top of the head. Try again. Hosoya repeated the message again and again but there was no reaction. The ship was listing beyond 20 degrees, and as the skies darkened, Enaguchi ordered all men on deck. Ensign Fukujiro Shimoi Ama, in charge of radio operators, emerged from below with his 30 men, all in spanking clean uniforms. They were appalled at the carnage. Bodies, blasted and mutilated, covered the deck. Shimoi Ama's men poured gasoline on several hundred thick code books and set them afire. But they burned too slowly, finally Shimoi Ama had the charred books stowed in canvas bags, weighted with machine guns and tossed her overboard. In the fading light Inaguchi set down his will in a small notebook. It had been a mistake on his part. He wrote, to believe so staunchly in big ships and big guns, and he asked the emperor and the nation to forgive his errors. He assembled his senior officers and a few petty officers on the second bridge and handed the notebook to Kato. Give it to the commander of combined fleet, he said. Kato requested permission to go down with the ship. Damn fool! Enaguchi muttered. My responsibility is so great it can't even be compensated by death and I must share the ship's fate, but the executive officer is responsible for taking the crew to safety and getting them aboard a second and third Musashi to avenge today's battle. He extended his sword to a youthful ensign. Thank you for your service. Signal. Hosoya stepped forward expecting another message but the captain handed him a briefcase containing some money and seven pieces of Dorea sweet bean paste. Thank you for your service. Do your best to the end. His last orders to Carter were to save the emperor's picture, lower the flag and gather all men in the stern for all call. At about 7.15 p.m. Hosoya supervised the lowering of the flag from the mast as a sailor played the national anthem on a trumpet. The huge flag, an orange sun with 16 white, 16 red rays, was reverently tied around the waist of a volunteer, a strong swimmer. By the time Hosoya and his detail had joined the others in the stern, Musashi listed so acutely that ammunition cases and empty shells were clattering down the deck. All crew abandoned ship, Kato shouted. You're on your own. On the high starboard side Ensign Shimoi Arm clutched at a rope rail as he pushed the last bag of code books into the sea. The ship took an abrupt lurch to port and the man next to him embraced him, then another hung on to the second man, and another and another, until there was a human chain of ten. Under all this weight the rope snapped and they all tumbled against a hatchway. A second chain of men to bog and into them, and Shimoi Arma, dazed, 
gave up trying to save himself. Tenno Hikabanzai. He shouted and left the rest to fate. The next thing he knew he was in the water with no life belt. Assistant Paymaster Kayoshi Takahashi, a youthful ensign, held on to the rail with one hand, still clutching shoes and leggings with the other. He could see some men in the water but hesitated to join them. The ship began rolling on her side. He heard a rumble and saw an avalanche of lumber headed his way. He placed shoes and leggings neatly on the deck, as if he were to return for them later, then vaulted over the rail and scrambled over the ship's exposed bottom toward the keel. As Musashi continued to roll he sprinted to keep in place, as if on a treadmill. At last he reached the keel and peered down the other side. It was a long drop to the sea but he was a good swimmer. He leapt, bounced off the hull and was unconscious by the time he tumbled into the water. Hosoya was also running shoeless over razor-sharp barnacles along the bottom of the ship, trying to keep up with her roll. His bare feet were bleeding but he felt no pain. He encountered a gaping black hole. Foaming water rushed in, sucking swimmers back into the bowels of the ship. Torpedo hole. Follow me. He shouted and clambered down the steep decline toward the bow. He slipped onto the barnacles but unaware of the lacerations on his arms and legs, he worked his way to the end of the bow, which was awash. He simply continued on into the water. Shimoi Ama, who had been flung safely overboard, after giving up hope, struggled to keep his head above water. A poor swimmer under ideal conditions, he panicked when he heard a monstrous sucking noise. He flailed around and saw the ship falling toward him. He was pulled into the undertow and moments later, catapulted to the surface. Half choked, he spat out water but swallowed a mouthful of oil. He was in the middle of a huge slick. He clutched desperately at a piece of lumber and retched. The good swimmer, assistant paymaster Takahashi, who had bounced off the hull, regained consciousness deep under water. Above him glowed a hole of light, too far to be reached. Suddenly a boiling vortex heaved him up. He gasped for air and swam frantically from the undertow. At a distance he turned. Musashi was on end, stern in air. In a daze he thought, the ship is standing straight up. He felt the concussion of an underwater explosion. The battleship slid out of sight. All at once there was nothing, not a soul in the strangely calm waters. I am the only survivor. He struggled through the viscous oil, collecting bits of flotsam, then, as if in a dream, he heard distant singing and swam eagerly toward the voices. Hosoya had also seen Musashi sticking up, a black silhouette against the last rays of the sinking sun. Four or five men were clustered at the end of the elevated stern. They seemed to hang on tighter as the great ship plunged. He felt himself being sucked back. There was a gigantic rumble and he flew high in the air. Life seemed to stop as he looked down, almost as if it were happening to someone else, into a great hole in the water far below. He had been gulped and spewed out. Instinctively he rolled into a ball just before splashing back into the sea. Again he was pulled under, into turbulent waters. Still in a fetal-like positron, he tumbled around almost unconcerned, with no thought of breathing. Almost too late he realized what was happening and desperately clawed up. At the surface he drew in wonderful air. The moon lit up the dark sea. There were no voices. He too imagined he was the sole survivor. Someone grabbed him from behind. Hosoya couldn't swim well and purposely sank. The grasping hand let go and when Hosoya surfaced, he was again alone. Then heads began to show up on all sides. He joined a group of men, one was Executive Officer Kato, and they started a search for anything that would float. Hot oil almost a foot deep engulfed them, blackening their faces except for white, swollen mouths and shiny eyes. For an hour Hosoya and Kato clung to the same box. The Executive Officer began to drowse and Hosoya punched him awake. Someone joked about hitting a superior officer. They sang the national anthem naval marches and finally popular songs like Shanghai Gal. After almost four hours, 
searchlights swept the area and the escort destroyers began picking up survivors. One, however, refused to be rescued. Chief Gunnery Officer Koshino swam away into the darkness. 3. More than 300 miles to the north, off Luzon in the Philippine Sea, Ozawa's mobile fleet was steaming south. The Admiral was to have joined Araitu and Nishimura in the combined attack on Lake Gulf, but on his way to the battle he had thought of a more effective way to use his four carriers and two semi-carriers. He doubted that he could inflict serious damage with only 116 planes. The mobile fleet made an impressive appearance, however, and perhaps he could utilize it to draw Halsey's powerful carrier force away from the late area and give Goraito a chance to slip safely through San Bernardino Strait. Ozawa radioed combined fleet of his intentions. The problem had been to make his presence known to Halsey without arousing his suspicions. He did it by launching a strike at Essex, Lexington and Princeton with 76 planes just as Goraito was entering the Sibuyan Sea, moments before the first attack on Musashi. It was a hodgepodge collection of almost 30 types of aircraft, but as they took off, the Z flag was raised as it had been twice before in the war, at Pearl Harbor and Midway. The attackers reported hitting two carriers and overflew to Luzon. They had done no damage at all, and moreover, failed in their primary mission. Halsey assumed they were part of the land-based attack on Princeton and didn't take the bait. Ozawa, therefore, was forced to send his two semi-carriers, Eyes and Hyuga, along with five other ships, farther south as a decoy. At last American search planes sighted this force, and as Ozawa wanted, this led to the discovery at 4.30 p.m. of his main force. He radioed the writer that the enemy carrier force would probably be drawn north to engage him, thus leaving San Bernardino straight unguarded. For some reason, the message was never received. As Ozawa had predicted, this time Halsey fell for the ruse. He knew that the Goraita fleet was steaming toward the gateway to the Philippine Sea, but thought it had been so badly mauled that it could merely hit and run. Anyway, Admiral Kincaid's 7th Fleet, clustered around Lake Gulf, had more than enough a power to destroy a writer. So why just lie off San Bernardino straight like a cat at a mouse hole and wait for the enemy to strike the first blow? The primary target was Ozawa's carriers. If he destroyed them his future operations need fear no threat from the sea. Besides, he had no intention of letting Japan's last carrier force escape free, as Spruan said in the Philippine Sea battle, he would not be accused of being unaggressive. Just before 8 p.m. Halsey pointed on a map at Ozawa's position 300 miles away and told his chief of staff, Robert Carney, here's where we're going. Mick, start them north. All that day Halsey had acted as commander of Task Force 38 as well as commander of the entire Third Fleet. In fact, he was leaving Mark Mitchell a little to do. Rear Admiral Carney wrote dispatches ordering all three of Mitchell's available carrier groups to the north. There was a fourth, recalled from a resupply trip to Alithi, but it was still hundreds of miles to the east. Two of these commanders were troubled by the abrupt order. Rear Admiral G. F. Bogan, alarmed by a report that the long darkened Japanese navigation lights in San Bernardino Strait were lit, personally relayed this disquieting intelligence to one of Halsey's staff officers, who impatiently replied, Yes, yes, we have that information. Rebuffed, Bogan decided not to recommend that he and Vice Admiral W. A. Lee stay behind with their groups to guard the strait. Cheng Li himself was suspicious of Ozawa and cautioned Halsey that the Japanese carrier force might be a decoy to Leelam North. The reply was a curt Roger. A little later Bogan, too, warned Third Fleet that he was sure the writer was coming through the strait and got the same answer. On Lexington, Mark Mitcher took Halsey's latest orders to his three task groups to mean that he had been relieved, in effect, as commander of Task Force 38. Admiral Halsey is in command now, he told his chief of staff, Ali Burke, and started for bed. Commodore Burke was not willing to let it go at this. We'd better see where that fleet is, he said, 
and soon word came back that Baraita was still very much afloat and still moving toward San Bernardino. It was important enough to awaken Mitchell with the suggestion that he urge Halsey to leave two task groups behind to stop Baraita. Does Admiral Halsey have that report? Mitchell asked, and when the answer was affirmative, said, if he wants my advice, he'll ask for it. He rolled over and went back to sleep. Halsey had not altogether ignored the warnings that Baraita was probably coming through San Bernardino Strait that night. He had already sent out a message that four battleships and a score of cruisers and destroyers will be formed as Task Force 34 under Admiral Lee to engage Baraita if he appeared. Halsey intended this merely as a warning, but it was interpreted as an order by Admiral Kincaid, on his flagship Wasatch in Lake Gulf, who by chance intercepted the message. Assured that Halsey had set up a plan to guard San Bernardino, Kincaid no longer worried about Baraita. His concern lay in a different direction. A smaller Japanese surface force, it was Nishimura, was coming up toward him from the south and would probably try to slip through Zuri go straight under cover of darkness and go after the ship's mast in Lake Gulf. Despite the fact that Uraita had been discovered prematurely and already suffered grievous losses, the plan to disrupt MacArthur's invasion at Lake Gulf was proceeding better than Combined Fleet had any right to expect. Ozawa had successfully lured Halsey to the north, leaving the strait unguarded and the American commander of shipping in late Gulf complacent. Goraita could still bring more surface firepower than any other fleet in existence, and in the south Nishimura with his seven ships was approaching Zuri Go Strait on schedule and intact. Goraita, however, would not be able to keep the rendezvous, the air attacks had delayed him half a day. He radioed Nishimura, on his flagship, Yamashiro, to proceed as planned but that he himself would not get to late Gulf until 11 am Nishimura took the news stoically. Like the writer he was close-mouthed, a seagoing admiral who had never served in the ministry. He was determined to break through Zuri go straight at any cost and die a useful death. His only son, Teiji, who had graduated at the top of his class at Tejima, had fallen in the Philippines, in the van, reconnoitering, was the heavy cruiser Mogami, along with three destroyers, they were followed by two old battleships, Fuso and Yamashiro, and the remaining destroyer, Shigyu. Just before 11 pm Shigyu sighted three PT boats. On order from Nishimura she turned into them and hit two of the boats. Nishimura radioed the writer advancing as scheduled while destroying enemy torpedo boats. Nishimura's was not the only Japanese fleet bound for Zurigo Strait and the decisive battle. Thirty miles behind him came the second striking force, commanded by Vice Admiral Kihajima. It was an orphan force, despite its impressive appellation, comprising two heavy cruisers, a light cruiser and four destroyers. Originally trained to be the advance guard for Ozawa, it had arbitrarily been placed under Southwest Area Force, headquartered in Manila, and assigned to escort duty. Shima had resisted the order, it would be ignominious to be left out of the coming battle, and his protest to combined fleet got him back into action, this time he was to join Garaitu in the assault on Lake Gulf. As he approached the Philippines from the north through the South China Sea, he still did not know exactly what role he would play. Off Lingayen Gulf he got a terse order from the commander of Southwest Area Force to charge into Late Gulf, but again there were no details. A little later, however, a message from Boraitu arrived, briefly outlining the joint attack plan. On his own, Shima decided to follow Nishimura into Zurigo Strait, together their two limited forces would be more effective. Nishimura was informed of Shima's decision but knew nothing more. The two admirals were going into battle, and were from different commands, yet had never communicated with each other. And Nishimura was on radio silence. Acting independently, they would need luck to be able to join forces. As Nishimura neared the strait, PT boats struck again but all their torpedoes missed. The admiral finally radioed that he would go through the narrows between the little island of Panaan and Mindanao, 
the southern entry to Zurigo Strait, at 1.30 a.m. Several torpedo boats sighted but enemy situation otherwise unknown. Still intact, Nishimura steamed through the 10-mile portal on schedule and turned into Zurigo Strait itself. Only 50 miles north lay his target, the massed enemy transports. In the lead were two destroyers, and one mile behind came the flagship, Yamashiro, flanked by Shigure and another destroyer. Bringing up the rear, 600 yards apart, were Fuso and Mogami. Three more PT boats darted out through darkness to launch torpedoes at the destroyers, but Nishimura's luck held. All missed and this time one boat was destroyed. The moon had set and no wind stirred, the strait was as calm as a graveyard. It was pleasantly warm on deck, if hot below. Magellan had sailed through these same treacherous waters, now deceptively, smooth as glass, from the other direction on March 16, 1521. As if in ominous warning, there were occasional flashes of lightning. Just ahead, Kincaid's powerful Seventh Fleet, veiled by darkness, was waiting with apprehension mingled with expectation. No one knew for certain how big the converging Japanese forces were. Aboard the cruiser Nashville, General MacArthur refused the captain's request that he disembark. I have never been able to witness a naval engagement and this is the opportunity of a lifetime. Proceed to the battle area when you wish. King Cade invited the general to come aboard his flagship, a transport, but the reply was final, transfer from a combatant ship to a non-combatant ship. Never. The Admiral was forced to keep Nashville out of the fight. Tactical command of the action was under Rear Admiral Jesse Oldendorf, and to stop Nishimura and Shimmer's modest aggregation he had six battleships, four heavy cruisers, four light cruisers and twenty-eight destroyers. Oldendorf was a cheerful man, and reports that his PT boats had scored no hits did not ruffle him. Their main function had been to observe. Soon the Japanese would face destroyers, and then the guns of the cruisers and battleships. At 2.40 a.m. on October 25 the picket destroyer radioed, skunk 184 degrees, 18 miles. Nishimura was advancing single file in battle formation. First came the four destroyers, then the two battleships, Yamashiro and Fuso, and the heavy cruiser Mogami. Fifteen minutes later a lookout on the destroyer Shigure sighted three ships four miles ahead. The flagship shot up flares, illuminating seven enemy destroyers. They closed fast, and just after 3 a.m. fired 27 torpedoes. One hit Fuso and she sheared out to starboard. Five-inch shells were dropping all around the American destroyers, but joined by a second squadron, they came in for another attack. At 3.20 Shiger Inishino, captain of Shigure, saw phosphorescent wakes as bright as day directly ahead. Shigure and the other three destroyers heeled over violently, but their attempted evasion came too late. Nishino heard a series of quick explosions. The destroyer just ahead sank with a loud sizzling sound, like a huge red hot iron plunged into water, another was left helplessly adrift and the third limped off. One of the torpedoes struck a more important target, Yamashiro. Nishino heard a calm voice from the flagship say in the clear, our ship hit by torpedo. All ships attack. From what Nishino could see, Yamashiro, about a mile and a half away, seemed undamaged. He pulled back to join other ships in a formation attack but could find nothing. What had happened to everyone? Admiral Nishimura unaware of the extent of the damage to his fleet, radioed the right to Onshima from his flagship. Urgent Battle Report Number 2. Enemy torpedo boats and destroyers present on both sides of northern entrance to Zurigo Strait. Two of our destroyers torpedoed and drifting. Yamashiro sustained one torpedo hit but no impediment to battle cruising. Eight minutes later, at 3.38 a.m., there was a flash of light to the rear, followed by an awesome rumble. The damaged Fuso, nine miles away, had been blown in half. Both ends remained afloat, burning furiously. Twenty minutes later, 
with the rumble, Machishio, the drifting destroyer, also disintegrated. But Nishimura would not give up. With his remaining three ships, Yamashiro, Mogami and Shigure, he continued north toward Lake Gulf, and into the leveled guns of the Seventh Fleet. Old Endorf had caught his foe coming bow on. He had crossed the T, as Nelson had done at Trafalgar and Togo at Tsushima, where more equal forces were involved. At 3.51 the cruisers opened fire followed by the six battleships, all but one had been hit or sunk at Pearl Harbor. This barrage was the most beautiful sight the commander of the American destroyer screen had ever witnessed. The blinding streams of tracers arching above his head resembled a continued stream of lighted railroad cars going over a hill. Both Mogami and Yamashiro returned fire even as they recoiled from hit after hit. The heavy cruiser loosed torpedoes at 4.01 am and was soon deluged by shells from destroyers which had closed in. Burning and crippled, she turned back south. Yamashiro was also ablaze from stem to stern. At 4.09 the heavy shelling inexplicably stopped. Old Endorf had got word that he was hitting his own destroyers, in the hiatus Yamashiro too reversed course and started south after Mogami, but the flagship was undone. Within ten minutes she capsized and sank, taking with her Nishimura and almost the entire crew. Thin-skinned Shigyu was still alive. One shell had ripped through her stern but hundreds of others had missed, sending up an almost constant wall of water on either side. Nishino, benumbed by the deafening roar of battle and the jarring concussions of near misses that had knocked out every precision instrument, saw a large ship in flames to his left. It looked like a huge hunk of red-hot iron, it must be Fuso. He ordered right rudder, but there was no response. He brought the destroyer to a stop for repairs. To the south, just as the first torpedoes were being launched at Nishimura, Shima's second striking force had entered Zurigo Strait at 28 knots. Almost immediately Shima's column was set upon by PT boats, which damaged the light cruiser Obukima so severely she had to be left behind. The remaining six ships continued north. They were engulfed in a sudden squall but blindly continued to thread their way through the narrows at the same speed. At 3.25 am the squall ended and Shima, who had not received Nishimura's urgent battle report number 2 that his flagship and two destroyers had been torpedoed, ordered the second striking force to go into battle formation with the flagship Naki in the lead, followed by the other heavy cruiser, Ashigara, and the four destroyers. Rain spit spasmodically and visibility was poor, but Shima called for more speed. Everyone on Naki's bridge strained to see ahead. Suddenly there came a blinding blossom of light that seemed to fill the entire strait. Some capital ship had blown up, Shima hoped it was American. It was Fuso. To encourage Nishimura, Shima said by radio telephone, we have arrived at battle site. His column was still bearing down at almost top speed. Ahead, two ships, there were the two sections of Fuso, were blazing intensely like steel mill flames, and Shima deduced that Nishimura's fleet had been smashed. The second striking force passed to the left of the burning sections, hugging the coast to keep out of the glow. Through the stationary telescope Shima watched destroyers dart in and out of a smoke screen. His own ships closed on another destroyer to starboard, dead in the water, a Japanese flag on its mast. It flashed out a blue signal, I am destroyer Shigure. Rudder is damaged and under repair. Naki plunged into the smoke. In the distance came the deep, slow crump of big guns, the remnants of Nishimura must be ahead and still fighting. The column emerged through the smoke screen, only to face another. To the right was a large ship in flames, but Shima couldn't tell if it was American or Japanese. It was Mogami. Shima's radar detected an enemy fleet due north almost six miles. All ships attack. He ordered by a radio telephone. The torpedo officer, Commander Kokichi Mori, suggested that the two heavy cruisers also launch torpedoes from the port. Shima approved, and Niki, followed by Ashigara, 
turned sharply to starboard as the destroyers, which could only fire upon sighting the enemy, spurted straight ahead. Just to the left was Mogami, and she appeared to be dead in the water. Naki launched her eight torpedoes, and moved up to hide behind the glare of Mogami. But as he approached, Shima saw to his surprise that Mogami's prow had awake. She was bearing down at almost eight knots on a collision course. Hard starboard. He shouted, but the blazing Mogami moved straight at Naki and there was a jarring crunch. This is Mogami. Someone called from the bridge through a megaphone captain and executive officer killed. Gunnery officer in charge. Steering destroyed? Steering by engine. Sorry. The two ships drifted slowly as if locked together, then Naki cautiously turned left and the two ships parted, Mogami continuing south. The port side of Naki's prow was gone and engineers reported top speed would be reduced to 20 knots. Shima still wanted to follow his destroyers and attack. Up ahead the enemy must be waiting for us with open arms, Mori objected. Nishimura's force is almost totally destroyed? It is obvious that the second striking force will fall into a trap. We may die any time. Besides, they didn't even know what Uraito was doing. In any case, it's foolish to go ahead now. There were still two hours left of darkness to hide their withdrawal. Shima's immediate task was to collect the remnants of Nishimura's force as well as his own. The fleeing ships were again harassed by PT boats near the south entrance of the strait. The persistent little craft were fought off, but to the rear a pursuing force of two light cruisers and three destroyers picked off the crippled destroyer Asagumo. This ended the surface pursuit, but Shima was not yet out of range of American aircraft. A wave of Avengers found the straggling Mogami, and a bomb in the engine room forced her abandonment. Now only Shigya remained of Nishimura's fleet, within an hour Shima saw a second wave of Avengers on the horizon. In the radio room Lieutenant, J.G. K. Maida, born in Honolulu, adjusted to the enemy cycle and began broadcasting in English, Hello, Charlie 1, Hello Charlie 1. Jap carrier planes attacking us. Abandon your present mission and return to base immediately. On the bridge Shima watched as the oncoming planes abruptly wheeled and headed back north. 4. At almost the same moment that Nishimura prepared to make his foray into Zurigo Strait, a right edged into San Bernardino Strait 200 miles to the north. The passage, narrower than Zurigo Strait, was difficult for a single ship to navigate even in the daytime because of a stiff 8 knot current. Uraita had to bring a 10 mile column of 22 ships through in pitch dark, all the navigation lights had been turned off. As Uraita debouched into the Philippine Sea, he expected to encounter attacks from submarines and a sizable surface force. There was not a ship in sight. Expecting discovery momentarily, he placed his ships in night scouting formation as they skirted the east coast of Samar and headed south for Lake Gulf. At 6.27 a.m. the sun rose in a dreary sky, and the order went out to reform in a circle around Yamato. Clouds hung low, occasional gusts of rain swept the ships, and the water was choppy. High in the observation tower of the cruiser Kimono, Lieutenant, S. G. Shigeo Hirayama was dozing at his battle station. Like everyone else in the first striking force, he had had almost no sleep in 72 hours. He rubbed his eyes hard and searched the horizon. An enemy plane was approaching from the east. It looked like a carrier-based torpedo plane. What was it doing coming straight on? Its pilot, an ensign named Jensen, on anti-submarine patrol, was as surprised as Hirayama. He started down toward the cruiser in a glide bomb approach. Simultaneously observers on Yamato sighted four masts on the horizon 20 miles to the southeast. They were soon identified as the island structures of carriers. God has come to our assistance, thought Koinagi. This was a target worthy of their big guns. The younger officers cheered, their cheeks glistening with tears. It had to be one of Mitch's four powerful carrier groups. 
There was no alternative but to attack and the writer wanted none. His one hope was that this task group was isolated. He closed in, altering his course slightly to 110 degrees, and radioed combined fleet. By heaven sent opportunity, we are dashing to attack enemy carriers. Our first objective is to destroy the flight decks, then the task force. Mitch's big carriers were far to the north, at House's command, chasing the decoy, Ozawa, and what the Japanese saw was one of the 7th Fleet's subsidiary forces, Taffy 3, whose function was to provide air cover for the amphibious shipping at late. Commanded by Rear Admiral Clifton A.F. Sprague, it comprised three destroyers and four destroyer escorts, as well as six escort carriers, nicknamed Baby Flatops or Jeeps, holding no more than 28 planes each and with a top speed of 19 knots. Sprague had been caught by surprise. His radar had just detected the enemy. At 6.58 am the main batteries of Yamato bellowed. For the first time the monstrous 3,220-pound shells were hurled at an enemy surface target from the 70-foot-long barrels. Other ships joined in, as enthusiastic crews, on attack at last, worked their guns in a thundering chorus. Enemy destroyers tried to screen the carriers with smoke, but tiny planes could still be seen taking off from their flight decks like bees. The right to order general attack. Breaking formation, all ships closed at optimum speed, and the chase became an unorganized scramble. Sprague's carriers moved away sluggishly to the east, hastily launching fighters and avengers armed with bombs. Salvos from the oncoming enemy ships fell closer and closer, sending up pink, green, red, yellow and purple geysers, the projectiles had been loaded with various dyes for identification. Their explosions had a kind of horrid beauty for Sprague. At 7.01 am he radioed an appeal in the clear for help. To the south were two similar forces of baby flat tops, Taffy 1 and Taffy 2. Don't be alarmed, shouted the commander of Taffy 2, only 30 miles away. Remember we're back of you. Don't get excited. Don't do anything rash. But these reassurances were meaningless. Sprague knew his ships could not survive another five minutes of the heavy caliber fire being received. Just then Taffy 3 was swallowed by a rain squall. It was a brief respite but it gave Sprague time enough to make a hard decision, he would not scatter his force but pull the enemy out where somebody else could smack him. He turned to the south toward Taffy 2 and its planes, then, at 7.16 am, he ordered his three destroyers, Hole, Heerman and Johnston, to counterattack. Possibly their sacrifice could buy time. Johnston, her captain was a Cherokee, Ernest E. Evans, closed to within 10,000 yards of Kimono and launched 10 torpedoes. One hit the heavy cruiser, slowing her to 20 knots and putting her out of the battle. But Johnston paid for her daring as a trio each of 14 and 6 inch shells tore into her. It was, her senior surviving officer recalled, like a puppy being smacked by a truck. She somehow remained afloat, her decks and bridge covered with dead. Hole was within range of two enemy columns, battleships on the left, cruisers on the right. Her captain, Commander Leon S. Kintberger, started for the big ones. Columns of green dyed water showered whole. A shell smashed into the bridge. But the destroyer kept moving in and at 9,000 yards loosed a spread of torpedoes at the leading battleship. Gintberger swung his ship toward the cruisers, but shells knocked out the main engine and jammed the rudder hard right. He could still maneuver the ship by one engine and worked his way broadside of the cruiser column. At 7.35 am his remaining five torpedoes began churning toward Haguro, the foremost cruiser. In the dense smoke Heerman, the third destroyer, almost rammed a friendly destroyer escort and barely missed swiping hole. Heerman turned north, and while firing seven torpedoes at Haguro, sighted a battleship on the left. It was Congo, which began to concentrate fire on Heerman. So did Haguro as soon as she had evaded the torpedoes. Two more Japanese battleships bore down on the destroyer, but Heerman, 
outdoing David, pressed the attack on still another adversary, the battleship Harana, which was little more than two miles away. She peppered Harana with five inch shells, and after launching her last three torpedoes, scampered away at 803A.M. Miraculously still not hit by anything except shell fragments. But the damaged hull was hemmed in by Congo and several heavy cruisers. Hit at least 40 times, Hull continued to throw some 500 shells at the enemy before her remaining engine was knocked out. At 8.30 am she came to a stop, listing to port with one magazine on fire. Only then did Kintberger give the word to abandon ship. Sprague's six jeep carriers had merged from the squall in circular formation. Ten miles to the north lay the Japanese battleships, and a little closer to the northeast were four enemy cruisers. These blanketed Gambia Bay and Kalanin Bay with heavy fire, but the clumsy little carriers managed to evade every salvo. Kalanin Bay, however, could not escape the battleship's barrage and was hit 15 times. Still, damage control teams working waist deep in oil and water kept her in formation. Fighting back with her single 5 inch gun, Gambia Bay weaved around, managing to escape any damage for almost half an hour, but at last a shell struck the flight deck. Then a salvo plummeted into the water just off the carrier's port. One shell hit below the water line, flooding the forward engine room. Gambia Bay slowed to 11 knots, dropping out of formation. At 8.30 am Commander Evans, the Cherokee skipper of the already battered destroyer Johnston, saw the heavy cruiser Chikama move in for the kill. Commence firing on the cruiser, Hagen, he told his gunnery officer. Draw her fire away from Gambia Bay. Johnston limped at 17 knots to within 6,000 yards of Chikama and pumped five shells into her, but she ignored the destroyer. Heerman, still sound, joined the attack and forced Chikama to turn some of her guns away from Gambia Bay. But it was too late. The carrier began to sink at 8.45 am. Now Evans turns Johnston to face the light cruiser Yahagai and four destroyers which were converging on the remaining carriers. Evans closed in on Yahagai, which was moving into position to torpedo one of the carriers, and discharged such harassing fire with Johnston's five-inch guns, she made a dozen hits, that the light cruiser was forced to launch her torpedoes prematurely. Yahagai's accompanying destroyers followed suit. Not a carrier was hit, but the Japanese jubilantly reported that three enemy carriers and one cruiser were enveloped in black smoke and observed to sink, one after another. Evans, who had pressured the enemy into launching their attack too soon, strutted across the bridge exclaiming, Now I've seen everything. But the Japanese had their measure of revenge. Cruisers and destroyers hemmed in Johnston. Her crew fought back until the ship was dead in the water and Evans reluctantly had to give the order to abandon her. Of the complement of 327, only 141 were picked up alive. The Cherokee skipper was not among them. While Sprague's destroyers, aided by the four equally aggressive destroyer escorts, were blunting the writer's surface attack. Carrier planes from Taffy 2 and 3 hit the first striking force time and again. Three heavy cruisers, Suzunia, Shikama and Chikai, sustained such damage that they were forced to retire. The writer was unaware that his advance force had been so frustrated, Yamato's last two scout planes had been knocked down and her radio telephone was out of order. Moreover, it looked from a distance through the smoke as if the advance guard had lost sight of the enemy. Let's discontinue this chase, Koinagi advised. There's still late gulf to attack. The writer concurred, and at 9.11 am a message was radioed, Rendezvous, my course north, speed 20. On the bridge of Fanshawe Bay, Sprig heard a signal manuel at 9.25 am, goddammit, boys, they're getting away. The surface battle, the last of World War II, was over. Taffy 3 had not only withstood attack from the greatest tray of guns afloat as well as a massive torpedo assault but inflicted serious damage on a superior force. For over an hour all was quiet. Then, at 10.50, 
general quarters was again sounded on the five surviving jeep carriers. Nine enemy planes were approaching at mast level, so low that radar had failed to pick them up. They climbed to several thousand feet as American fighters tried to intercept them. Five Zero fighters with bombs lashed to their wings emerged from the milling mass and slanted down toward the jeeps. They were led by a recently married lieutenant commander, Yukio Seki. One Zero headed for the bridge of Kitkan Bay, its machine guns winking. Onlookers expected it to pull up, instead it drove into the port catwalk, exploded and tumbled on into the sea. Two others roared straight at Fanshawe Bay, also with obvious intent to crash into her, only to disintegrate at the last moment. The final two veered off from the heavy fire thrown up by white planes. One, trailing smoke, banked toward street low in a right turn as if intending to land, but the pilot pushed the little plane over, slamming it into the flight deck. Fires spread throughout the hangar deck setting off a chain of violent internal explosions. After having survived the running battle unscathed, Street Low sank. Her survivors nicknamed the Japanese pilot Devil Diver. He was a kamikaze. The idea for suicide attacks had recently risen spontaneously among groups of Army and Navy flyers, and several isolated efforts had been made before that day. But it was not until Vice Admiral Takijiro Onishi arrived in Luzon, just before the American landing at late, to take command of 5th Base Air Force and learned he had fewer than a hundred operable planes that the Kamikaze Special Attack Corps was officially organized. In my opinion, he told his commanders, there is only one way of channeling our meager strength into maximum efficiency and that is to organize suicide attack units composed of zero fighters equipped with 250 kilogram bombs, with each plane to crash dive into an enemy carrier. Anishi's proposal was explained to the pilots. Their eyes shone feverishly in the dimly lit room, reported one commander named Tamai. Each must have been thinking of this as a chance to avenge comrades who had fallen recently in the fierce Marianas fighting, and at Pala and Yap. Theirs was an enthusiasm that flames naturally in the hearts of youthful men. Anishi's kamikaze group was created specifically to support a writer's raid on Lake Gulf, and the first attack had come earlier that morning. Six suicide planes and four escorts took off from Mindanao at 6.30 a.m. and went north. While Taffy 3 was fighting off the writer, the special attack planes came upon Taffy 1. One Zero crashed into Santi and another into Suani, but both of these jeep carriers were soon back in action. Nevertheless, all those who had seen the Japanese boring in with such fatalism were still shaken by the experience. It was a preview of things to come. 5. It took Garai to almost two hours to collect his scattered forces, reduced from 32 ships to 15 within three days and again head south in ring formation for late gulf. The admiral and most of his staff hadn't slept since leaving Brunei and stayed alert by sheer willpower. Koinagi had difficulty moving around the bridge even with the help of a cane, he had been hit in the thigh by shrapnel the day before. Garita was more certain than ever that he had just encountered one of Halsey's carrier groups, Ozawa's message that he had lured Halsey north never reached first striking force. In addition, a report was intercepted, probably from a land-based plane, that a fleet of enemy carriers lay 113 miles north of the mouth of Lake Gulf. Could these be Halsey's remaining task groups? In any case, the writer would get no help from Nishimura's detached fleet that was supposed to invade Lake Gulf from the south, Nishino, on the destroyer Shigure, had radioed that his was the only ship left afloat. About 11.40 a.m. a lookout reported sighting an enemy battleship and several destroyers on the horizon. Orita gave chase but could find nothing, perhaps the lookout had suffered from a delusion. Then a radio message to the effect that part of Kincaid's force was making a sortie from Late Gulf was intercepted. It appeared likely that most of the transports had escaped. Even those which remained would have had five days to unload. If the writer charged into the narrow confines of the Gulf to sink these transports, his own ships would be at the mercy of enemy land and carrier-based planes. 
the first striking force might be wiped out, and for what? A few practically empty transports. This, Goraita reasoned, would be absurd. He decided instead, and he was seconded by Koinagi and the rest of the staff, to turn north, and with the help of Japanese land-based planes, attack the enemy task force which was located less than a hundred miles away. Section. The entire bridge was electrified by the decision. Forgotten was the ordeal of the past few days, which had left them bone-tired and depressed, it was as if they were going into battle for the first time. At 12.35 p.m. Goraita sent out a fleet order to reverse course and engage in decisive battle with the enemy task force which is in position bearing 5 degrees, distant 113 miles from Suluan Lighthouse. The news was greeted on every ship with shouts of Banzai. The first striking force headed north to wage its final battle. 6. His prey, Task Force 38, was in reality far out of range to the north in its pursuit of Ozawa. Early that morning three American scout planes had discovered the mobile force, and by 8 a.m. 180 dive bombers, fighters and torpedo planes had closed in on Chittas and Zuiho. Only a handful of Japanese fighters came up to intercept. The rest of Ozawa's planes had been sent to the Philippines to save them. Both light carriers were hit by bombs and chitters began to sink. Then a bomb exploded in the forward engine room of the destroyer Akizuki, and a torpedo drove into the flagship, Zuikaku. There were no fighters to oppose the second wave. Through heavy flak the 36 planes converged on the fourth carrier, Chioda. Bombs exploded along her deck and, aflame, she assumed a sharp list. Ozawa's flagship could still navigate at 20 knots, but her rudder was damaged and communications were out. Ozawa, who had had to be dragged off the stricken Teiho at the Battle of the Philippine Sea, abandoned Zuikaku without protest. There was no honor involved. He had accomplished his purpose and given Goraita his chance to destroy the amphibious shipping in Late Gulf. Halsey's arbitrary reactions the day before had left a worried Admiral Kincaid in the Gulf. He tried to confirm his impression that an emergency battle line, the newly created Task Force 34 under Admiral Lee, had been formed in front of San Bernardino Strait, but received no reply for more than two and a half hours. And when Halsey's answer finally arrived it jarred him, Task Force 34 was with the carriers engaging Ozawa. By this time Goraita's fleet had hit Taffy 3, and Kincaid replied with a plea for help, urgently need BBS, battleships, late golf at once. Halsey's reaction was one of annoyance. It wasn't his job to protect the 7th fleet, he was carrying out a more important mission, attacking the main carrier force of the enemy. The best he could do was order Mitch's 4th task group, which was still hundreds of miles to the east to head for late. In the meantime Kincaid, I've had to fight my temper all my life, had sent Halsey another message with details of the powerful force that seemed certain to crush Taffy 3. Request Lee cover later top speed X request fast carriers make immediate strike. This double request irritated Halsey. He had already done as much as he could and was in the middle of his own battle. 22 minutes later Halsey received still another radio from Kincaid. Dot request immediate air strike X also request support by heavy ships X my OBBS, the old battleships which had bombarded Nishimura, low in ammunition. This was a new factor, so astonishing that Halsey found it hard to accept. Why hadn't Kincaid informed him of this earlier? Halsey replied that he was still engaging enemy carriers and had already sent the fourth task group of five carriers and four heavy cruisers to Kincaid's assistance. Little more than half an hour later yet another desperate message came from Kincaid, this one not even in code. Where is Lee X send Lee? In Pearl Harbor, Nimitz was following the trials of Taffy 3, and like Kincaid, he assumed that Task Force 34 had been detached to guard San Bernardino straight the previous night. Now he, too, asked Halsey where that phantom task force was. 
a communications ensign added padding to confuse enemy decoders at the beginning and end of the message. Turkey trots to water GG from Senkpak. X where is RPT, repeat, where is Task Force 34 R are the world wonders. This dispatch reached Elsie's flagship, New Jersey, a moment after Kincaid's message in the clear. The typist, Burton Goldestein, realized that Turkey Trot's to water was padding and omitted it, but the world wonders, despite the RR which set it off, sounded so plausible that he figured it might be a part of the text itself. So did his superior, the lieutenant, and the message was relayed to the bridge. Infuriated by the words the world wonders, as if I had been struck in the face, Halsey slammed his cap to the deck. Carney grabbed him by the arm and said, stop it. What the hell's the matter with you? Pull yourself together. Fuming, Halsey showed him the dispatch. How could Chester Nimitz have sent such an insult? He ordered one of Mitch's carrier groups to head south while the other two continued the attacks on Ozawa. A third strike of more than 200 planes at 1.10 p.m. set both Zuikaku and Zuiho afire. The latter steamed off at full speed, but Zuikaku gradually heeled over until the flight deck was awash. At 2.07 the big ship, which had survived so many battles, slid under. Mitch's fourth wave, small like the second, concentrated on eyes and Zuiho. The rugged converted battleship managed to escape. But Zuiho, mortally wounded, was sent under. It was the end of Ozawa's carriers. Three were at the bottom and the fourth, Chioda, was dead in the water. Ozawa had decoyed Halsey to the north but the shipping in Late Gulf remained intact. His sacrifice had been in vain. Ten minutes after the writer made his decision to turn away from Late Gulf, he was attacked by seventy fighters and avengers from Taffy 3. Tone and Nagato were each hit by bombs but the fleet continued to search for the enemy carriers. Two more air attacks, 147 sorties in all from Mitch's still distant fourth task group, did no damage. But the writer was more certain than ever that his target was close by. All afternoon he pressed the search but found nothing, neither did he hear from Ozawa. By 6 p.m. he had steamed all the way back to San Bernardino Strait. There he patrolled with instructions from combined fleet to engage in a night battle if possible. But the first striking force was low on fuel, and since no reports of enemy carriers had come in, Goraita reluctantly ordered a retirement. At 9.25 pm the remnants of the once mighty fleet found its way through the dark, dangerous waters of San Bernardino Strait. The desperate plan to devastate shipping in Late Gulf had resulted in catastrophic losses, four carriers, three battleships, six heavy cruisers, three light cruisers and ten destroyers. About 300,000 tons of combat shipping had been sunk, more than a quarter of all Japanese losses since Pearl Harbor. Never again would the Imperial Navy play more than a minor role in the defense of the homeland. Halsey later told the author Theodore Taylor, I wish that Spruans had been with Mitcher at Late Gulf and I had been with Mitcher in the Battle of the Philippine Sea. There is no confirmation of this incident from American sources. It was related by Admiral Shima. In 1570 a Mongol emperor set sail for Japan with an invasion fleet. It looked as if Japan would easily be conquered, but a typhoon dispersed the Mongol ships. Convinced that the typhoon had been called up by the gods, the Japanese named it Kamikaze, Divine Wind. The first Navy Kamikaze was Rear Admiral Masafumi Arima. He took off from Clark Field on October 15, during the Formosa battle, intent on crashing his bomber into a carrier, but was shot down before he reached any American ship. The first Kamikaze attack, however, had come a month earlier. On the evening of September 12 a group of army pilots of the 31st Fighter Squadron located on Negros Island decided on their own to launch a suicide attack the following morning. Two were selected, 1st Lieutenant Takashi Kozai and a Sergeant. Captain Tatsumaru Sujiyama, one of the 50 aviation experts who had plotted to assassinate Tojo, was in charge of maintenance. 
he rigged 100 kilogram bombs on two fighter planes, and an hour before dawn the two pilots took off, determined to crash into carriers. They never returned. Apparently they, like Arima, were shot down before reaching a target, since there is no record on September 13th of an enemy plane ramming into an American ship. Section The destruction of enemy carriers was a kind of obsession with me, and I fell victim to it. Garita told Orthama Sanraito in a unique interview after the war. As I consider it now, my judgment does not seem to have been sound. Then the decision seemed right, but my mind was extremely fatigued. It should probably be called a judgment of exhaustion. I did not feel tired at the time, but having been under great strain and without sleep for three days and nights, I was drained both physically and mentally. The Admiral refused to be interviewed for this book but consented to let Admiral Koinagi speak for him. I think now we should have gone into late Gulf, he said. So does Admiral Toraita. Then we thought we were doing the best thing but now, with a cool head, I realize we were obsessed by enemy task forces. Just because we got the report, and it turned out to be false, that there was a fleet of enemy carriers nearby, we shouldn't have set out after them. If Kuraita had continued on to Late Gulf, he would first have encountered Kincaid's Seventh Fleet and then undergone a series of air attacks in confined waters. There was considerable shipping in the Gulf, including 23 LSTs and 28 Liberty ships, but what if all these had been sunk? Most of the supplies had been landed, as Kuraita had guessed, and there was unsure enough for a month's military operations. MacArthur claimed that loss of these ships would have placed in jeopardy the entire invasion. Still aboard were most of the steel landing mats for the airstrips, and without these he could have lost local air superiority temporarily. Also, a naval bombardment on American troops might have wreaked momentary havoc. Nevertheless, it is doubtful that MacArthur's advance would have been delayed more than a week or so. 23. The Battle of Breakneck Ridge 1. Admiral Kuraita's defeat on October 25 meant the virtual isolation of the Philippines but General Sozaku Suzuki, who was in charge of the defense of the Central Islands, had never been more confident. No American had flown over his headquarters island, Cebu, that day, confirmation that enemy air power had been crushed over Formosa. About noon optimistic reports of Kuraita's battle off Samar began coming in, a number of American carriers had been sunk, Yamato and other battleships were raiding Late Gulf. General Tomokika, he told his chief of staff, we are about to step on the center of the stage. There is no greater honor or privilege. We don't even need all the reinforcements they are sending us. Two units were coming from Luzon, the 1st Division would land at Tomok, on Late's west coast while the 26th Division landed at the port of Carigara, in the north. The two forces would merge and retake Tacloban in ten days. Of this Suzuki had no doubt, his concern was that MacArthur might try to surrender only his local forces, as Wainwright had done after the fall of Corregidor. We must demand the capitulation of MacArthur's entire forces, those in New Guinea and other places as well as the troops on late. Suzuki's air superiority would not last long. That night, steel matting for the strips on late was offloaded but the laying on the following day was hampered by air aids and heavy rains. By nightfall every field was a quagmire. The engineers worked doggedly through the night of the 27th, and put down the last section on the Tacloban strip soon after dawn in time to welcome P-38s of the 5th Air Force. One cracked up but the other 33 landed safely. Under persistent attacks by the U.S. 7th Division, the Japanese had retreated across the coastal plain all the way to Dagami. General Makino ordered the rear guard of his 16th Division to hold the town while the main body fell back to the foothills of the mountain range running down the island. To the north the U.S. 24th Division was also driving west steadily. Their goal was Juro like Dagami at the foothills of the mountains. Held up by stiffening resistance and a river, the first GIs finally broke into the town on October 29 and turned up Highway 2, 
a 12-foot wide road with a crushed rock and gravel surface, toward Karigara. Poor communications continued to plague Suzuki. There were only fragmentary reports that the Americans were pushing north. He was, moreover, still ignorant of the debacle at sea. That afternoon Major Shijaru Asada, General Yamashita's operations officer, flew into Cebu from Manila with more good news, the 1st Division would land at Ormoc a few days ahead of schedule, along with a battalion of the 26th Division. Asada did not enlighten Suzuki about the situation confronting him. Suzuki was an able man but too honest and naive, if he thought he was going to win he would fight much better. Asada, therefore, promised Suzuki continued reinforcements that he knew would never be sent, or if sent, could never arrive intact because of America's overwhelming air superiority. Suzuki had no chance to win, but why burden him with the truth? There was a saying, the blind man fears no snake. On the morning of November 1st, 11,000 men of the 1st Division left Manila in a driving rainstorm in four large transports escorted by six destroyers and four coastal defense ships. The 1st, also known as GEM Division, was an elite unit established in 1874 which had seen duty in the Sino-Japanese and Russo-Japanese wars. That summer it had been detached from the Kwantung Army and alerted for duty against the Americans. It had gone from northern Manchuria by rail to Shanghai, where it was trained as an emergency force. En route to late, company commanders explained to their men what lay ahead. On Takatsi Maria Lieutenant Mintoshi Yehiro told his platoon leaders that Americans had landed in force on late and one division was heading for Karigara. Gem division was to stop it. We have long been preparing for this day. The hour has come when we must use all our training and skills. Soon after sunset the throbbing noise of the engines stopped and the troops, jammed snugly in tiers of bunks, heard the clatter of chains as anchors plunged down. They had arrived at Ormoc, on late. Orders were shouted. The men, their filthy uniforms crawling with lice, disentangled themselves and started up steep iron ladders to the upper decks out of stifling holds foul with the stench of bodies. Corporal Kayoshi Kamiko, one of Yehiro's squad leaders, gulped in the fresh tropical air. Overhead, stars were bright pinpoints, the sea was calm. He had been a primary school teacher before being conscripted just after Pearl Harbor. Determined and idealistic, he had enjoyed the years of training in Manchuria, accepting most of the brutalities of non-coms as necessary conditioning. He liked the comradeship of the army, the feeling that each man depended on the next. Like the other men of GEM Division he was eager to prove himself in battle and do his duty for Japan and the Emperor. The frightening but exhilarating rumble of distant guns came over the water. To remember the moment, Kamiko looked at his watch in the starlight. It was 7.30. Rope ladders tumbled over the sides of the transports and the men, each weighed down with ninety pounds of equipment, swung awkwardly over the rail. At a flashlight signal from below, Kamiko leapt clumsily into a gently pitching boat. He landed on his back and finally realized why they had been instructed to remove their heavy ammunition belts. On shore General Tomokiko was anxiously observing the landing. He had preceded Suzuki to late to be greeted by the dismaying report that Makino's entire 16th division was close to collapse. He stepped forward to meet Lieutenant General Tadasuka Toka, commander of GEM division, and his staff. The 1st division, he told them, will proceed with the greatest possible speed along the Ormoc Lime and Karigara Road, Highway 2, and assemble to the area southeast of Karigara and prepare to attack. Being a cavalry officer, Katoka looked for the unexpected. What if they were attacked before they reached Karigara in the mountains near Lyman? Proceed to Karigara, Tomokiko answered. The possibility was ridiculous. There's nothing to worry about. Is that so? Katoka remarked, but without sarcasm. He asked no more questions. Yea Hero Company settled down in a coconut grove, waiting for the rest of their regiment the 57th, to come ashore. 
They began digging Takotsubo, octopus traps, four and a half feet deep. The dugouts had a lateral scoop at the bottom where a man could huddle during a bombardment. In cross-section a Takotsubo looked like a Christmas stocking. Sweat stung their eyes, and their shirts were plastered to their backs, but the warm air was preferable to the harsh winds of Manchuria. To the east the sky bloomed a pinkish glow with the unreal dawn of an exotic travel poster. The war seemed far away. Then came a distant buzzing. Someone shouted take shelter. And the men leapt into their holes. The buzzing became a roar. Bombers approached in relentless formation, seeming invincible even when engulfed in black balls of Akuk explosions. Bombs from the planes, they were B-24s from Muratai, began to tumble toward the transports, which were still disgorging men and materiel. Zero fighters were suddenly all over the bombers, which continued sedately on course. Three zeros burst into flames simultaneously, arching toward the ground like comets. A second wave of bombers followed shortly, their silver wings glinting in the sun. A string of bombs fell in a great parabola toward the transport Notomaru. One bomb disappeared in the smokestack. There was a dulled detonation, followed by a chain of muffled blasts. The ship's whistle began to blow mournfully and without stopping. Helpless, Colonel Yoshio Miki, commander of the 57th Regiment, watched the ship he and his troops had just left. He knelt on the beach and prayed, then wandered aimlessly toward the pier. His trucks, horses and most of his ammunition were on the burning ship. General Tomokika told the dazed colonel to get his men on the road to Karigara as soon as possible. He was to follow a small advance group which had left hours earlier. The division commander, General Katoka, had already started up Highway 2 with two platoons, and Moki, accompanied by an aide, now set out north on foot to regain his composure. His regiment didn't start moving out of Ormok until after midnight. They marched through the night strung out for miles along the narrow highway, unlike their commander, eager for battle. They were unaware of the significance of the sinking of Natomaru. In the dim light of early dawn, it was November 3rd. The advance group, under Major Yoshio Imada, was approaching Karigara. It unexpectedly encountered GIs of the 24th Division coming the other way. There was a brief firefight and Imada retreated into the hills south of Highway 2. General Katoka learned about the skirmish just as he and his two platoons reached the heights north of Lyman, a village of several scorny huts where Highway 2 made a precipitous climb over rugged hills, then circled a commanding ridge to the right before descending again to the coast and Karigara. Katoka ordered Major Imada to attack the advancing Americans. Imada could expect reinforcements, an anti-tank battalion. Then the general sent back word for Colonel Moki to bring up a small field piece on the double. This order made no sense to Moki, but he loaded the gun into a truck and climbed aboard to direct operations. As the truck rumbled over the bumpy dirt road, he wondered what good one small piece of artillery would do. At Lyman he listened politely to Katoko explain how he was going to stem the enemy advance down near Karigara. The small gun was positioned to command the road where it made the sharpest turn around the ridge. All day Moki's 57th Regiment straggled north along the narrow road toward Lyman, harassed by American bombing and strafing attacks. More than 200 men were killed and scores of others were overcome by the intense heat. Darkness when it came offered little relief. Around nine o'clock the men fell out exhausted along the sides of the highway. They were attacked by mosquitoes, those who had not covered their faces before they fell asleep awoke with eyes almost swollen and shut, but their eagerness was undiminished as they resumed their march, this time under dark, lowering clouds. Kamiko's battalion was the first to reach Lyman, and its commander, Captain Sato was ordered by Moki to take positions north of the village near the emplaced gun. On the other side of the mountain range Lieutenant General Walter Kruger, commander of 6th Army, thought his advance division, the 24th, faced encirclement and annihilation. He knew from aerial observation that a large force of Japanese was marching toward Lyman, 
and he feared the enemy might also land a large amphibious force behind the 24th Division at Karigara. Kruger reacted cautiously. Rather than push forward and take the strategic ridge, breaking through the mountain barrier which as yet was lightly defended, he ordered the 24th Division to halt and prepare to fend off a possible sea invasion in cooperation with the 1st Cavalry Division, which was on its heels. At dusk Morky's regiment started up the winding road toward the crest of the ridge. An eerie white figure approached. It was a survivor of the 16th Division, swathed in bandages, driven back all the way from Lake Gulf. He passed silently by. He was followed by more walking wounded, helping one another or hobbling on sticks. Word spread down the ranks that General Makino's division had been annihilated. Just ahead lay the highest point of Highway 2, where the road bent sharply to the east. The jagged hill mass on the right was covered with shoulder-high Kogon grass. It was a natural fortress. Numerous spurs branched off it toward the sea to the northeast and toward the late river valley to the southwest. In between the steep rises were dense woods. Here the march stopped. Whispered instructions were passed along to jettison all unnecessary items. The men stuffed their small battle haversacks with hardtack and five grenades each and piled their backpacks near the road. Kamiko's company was ordered to take the lead, and his squad led the company, that, he thought proudly, made him the spearhead of Gem Division. The sky lightened with dramatic suddenness. With the sun came intolerable heat. The air was acrid with powder smoke. The battlefield must be near but the ridge was silent. A rifle cracked. It was quiet again and then Kamika heard the chirping of birds. The former school teacher's heart beat faster. His chest constricted. He turned to his companions. Their eyes were glittering. They had been preparing to fight for three years and were as expectant as he was. An order came up to turn off the road and climb the ridge. On the other side, GIs were also nearing the top of the ridge. Kruger had ordered the 24th Division to reconnoiter it, the general attack south was to begin in two days. Kamiko pushed through brush and began the ascent toward the crest. Behind, someone shouted, Squad Leader Kamiko. Wrong direction. It was the platoon sergeant. A grenade exploded. The sergeant stumbled, clutching his thigh. Kamiko was showered with debris. A soldier grunted, I'm hit. Blinded, Kamiko tripped over him. He forced himself to be calm, gradually he recovered his vision. Geezers of earth erupted on all sides. Grenades lobbed over the crest by the GIs were bounding down the slope like apples spilled from a barrel. Kamiko squirmed toward the sergeant and touched him. He felt warm, sticky blood. While he was wondering what to do, he heard the hollow thump of mortars, then the deep cough of machine gun. Bullets whipped through the brush, thumping into bodies and bringing cries of surprise and pain. The first squad was being wiped out without a fight. He fought a paralyzing panic and finally forced himself to shout fire. Rifles crackled. Kamiko looked at his watch. It was exactly ten o'clock on November 5th in the 19th year of Shoah. It might be his last moment as a human being. Kamiko fired blindly round after round. He stopped to reload and peered above the brush. There was a thunderous shock, a blinding flash, and darkness. Earth and sand showered him, but he was unhurt. According to the manual, Shells from the same gun never landed in the same spot, so he sprang into the newly made crater. He was immediately joined by two comrades, a light machine gun team. They set up their weapon and were about to open fire when mortar rounds began bursting so close that the operator, Ogura, shouted, It's dangerous here, squad leader! and scrambled out of the hole with his gun. The entire squad moved laterally and frantically dug to cut suburb among the roots of rotting palm trees. The mortar barrage ceased. Kamika held up his helmet on a bayonet, and a hail of bullets battered the helmet like a wind bell. He crouched down again but the firing from the top of the ridge had stopped. He wondered why the G.I.s, 
after pinning them down, had fallen back. Kamiko told his men to eat while they had the chance. They had hard tack but no water. He ordered a man with a slight leg injury to report the situation to the company commander, Lieutenant Yehiro, then crept along the slope to make a personal reconnaissance. The other two squads had been trapped by the mortars and machine guns and only three men in all were alive. If it hadn't been for Ogura, his squad too would have been wiped out. At dusk he gathered his remaining five men and told them they alone held the hill. He ordered them to collect ammunition, arms and supplies from dead comrades. By midnight they were prepared for the attack that was certain to come at dawn, but their thirst had become unbearable. Kamiko remembered seeing coconut trees somewhere near the crest. He removed all clothing except for his loincloth, tied a washcloth around his head and stealthily crawled up the hill. In the moonlight he found a coconut tree and started shinnying up it. Squad leader. The whispered voice startled him and he almost lost his grasp. Get down fast or you'll be shot. It was Ogura, who had followed him. But Kamiko continued until he reached a cluster of coconuts. He yanked one free, dropped it with a heavy thud. He expected a burst of fire but none came. He dropped ten more before rejoining Ogura. Together they carted the coconuts back to the squad. Kamiko chopped off the tops and distributed the milk. It reminded him of a soft drink. During the night they were joined by the fourth squad, headed by the platoon leader himself. Warrant Officer Hakoda. A year younger than Kamiko, he looked like a schoolboy. He apologized for arriving so late. Kamiko roused his own squad before dawn. He was surprised to find that despite the heavy losses, he anticipated battle as eagerly as he had the day before. He surveyed the area. A hundred feet below was Winding Highway 2. Above them loomed the crest of the ridge and he guessed one could see Karigara Bay from there. There were now nineteen men on the strategic hummock, the southeastern spur of the range. At about nine o'clock he heard distant commands in English. Bullets pounded into the earth along the Takatsubo line. Ogura, eyes as big as saucers, began firing his machine gun as if possessed. The fire let up briefly and Kamiko called out the names of his men, Aoki, Shimizu, Otsuka, Ishii. Each shouted high. Yes, from his own hole. If they get close enough, throw grenades, Kamiko instructed them. Enemy fear resumed, augmented this time by the sound of heavy machine guns. Squad leader. It was Oki in the next hole. The brush is burning. Smoke swirled across the slope and the crackle of burning kogon grass rose above the din. Squad leader. Oki again. The enemy is coming. Partially hidden by smoke, the Americans, I Company, 3rd Battalion, 21st Infantry Regiment, 24th Division, had charged over the ridge and were closing in. 3rd Squad, Kamiko shouted, fix bayonets and prepare grenades. He heard the click of bayonets as he fastened his own and armed his grenades. Charge! screamed the baby-faced Hakoda. Kamiko was about to relay the order to his own squad. But it didn't make sense. A charge should always be preceded by some kind of covering barrage. Impulsively he yelled, Third squad, hold. The enemy was still screened by the flaming brush. Target, right oblique. Kamiko shouted. Fire. Ogura turned his machine gun to the right. Tot Sojki. It was Hakoda again urging the fourth squad to charge into the murderous fire. Hakoda fell and his new sergeant was hit. Take command. He called out to Kamiko. The Americans were almost upon them. It was all over. Kamiko shouted desperately, fire everything you have. Suddenly the sky overhead was split with a long screech which was cut off abruptly by an explosion on the slope ahead. Stunned. The infantrymen on both sides stopped shooting. Another big shell landed in front of Kamiko in the midst of advancing Americans. A third shell whined over, plummeting into the enemy's heavy machine gun positions. The three rounds had come from a single big Japanese gun just hauled into position. 
Kamiko jumped to his feet and shouted, it's ours. Several American machine guns resumed their chattering. A fourth shell exploded. There was silence ahead. This time the enemy machine guns remained silent. There was no rifle fire from the Takatsubo on the left and Kamiko crawled over to investigate. She was bent over, head down. What's the matter? Asked Kamiko and took off Ishii's helmet. His eyes were open but there was a hole the size of a bean in the middle of his forehead. The back of his head was like a burst pomegranate. Kamiko ground his teeth in anger. Ishii was his best friend, a university man, full of spirit and compassion. He felt heat on his back and whirled around. The wind was driving the grass fire down the slope. Where was the wounded Hakoda? Kamiko began searching to save him from the flames but all he could find was an officer's leather belt, sabre and pistol. Had the Americans taken Hakoda prisoner? Machine guns sent him tumbling back to his hole, clutching the platoon leader's possessions. Aoki called out to him, enemy approaching. Aoki was about to toss a grenade but Kamiko stopped him. The enemy was too far away. Kamiko crawled forward with his own grenades, followed by Ogura. He crouched, ready to stand up and throw, and die. Again a shell, this from a recently positioned four-gun battery, whistled overhead, exploded up the slope. Hit. Direct hit. Someone shouted excitedly. Five or six were blown up. Then he heard another voice, that of the company commander, Lieutenant Yehiro. The main force of the company had arrived. Kamiko leapt to his feet. Wiping tears away with the back of one hand, he activated a grenade by slamming it on his helmet and heaved it as far up the hill as he could. His men joined him. There were five quick explosions. Charge! Kamiko shouted. He felt as though nothing could stop him as he hurtled up the charred, smoldering field toward the heavy machine gun position with fixed bayonet. Behind pounded his squad. Dead Americans were everywhere, their bodies scorched and swollen, one seemed to be overflowing with yellow grease. Kamiko, followed by eight men, swarmed into the machine gun emplacement. Gunners had been blown apart. Cartridges on their belts were detonating like firecrackers. Every so often one of these explosions set off a grenade. Kamiko was rooted, erect. Amid all this carnage he found himself alive. It was as if he were coming out of a dream. Reality swept over him again. He crouched and once more plunged up toward the crest of the ridge. As he burst over the top he saw spread before him the breathtaking panorama of Karagara Bay. The Americans were scrambling down their side of the ridge, here and there a fleeing figure tumbled haplessly from the fusillade which followed them from the crest. A single platoon, with the help of a dozen artillery shells, had blunted a determined enemy attack and given the strung out regiment time to reach the front and turn the ridge into a fortress of Takatsubo trenches and gun emplacements. Kamiko remembered how the samurai of the Civil War era took the head of an enemy, and reached for an American officer's helmet. The liner was wet with blood and he hesitated, was it proper for a modern man to take booty? But he still had helmet in hand when he reported to his company commander. Lieutenant Ye Hero's face was black with dust and gunpowder, his arm in a sling. He grinned boyishly. Thank you very much for enduring such hardships, he told Kamiko. Their battalion commander, Captain Sato, called for the merits list and wrote on the first page. It was an unimaginable honor for an infantryman, the dream flower. Usually only flyers and sailors were officially commended. Sato was curious about the American helmet. Kamiko apologized for the blood but the battalion commander put it on, waggling his head several times. This is light and feels good. Was there one without a bullet hole? I'm sure I can find one, Kamiko volunteered. If you do, I'll use it. Yay here a grin as he hefted an American carbine. This is light too. I may use it from now on. That night Kamiko was appointed platoon leader in place of Hakoda. He couldn't sleep, 
the corpses of comrades lying out front unattended haunted him. From the darkness he heard someone say, why do American soldiers die on their backs? Another voice answered, the Japanese are well mannered, even after they've died they hide their private parts. Both laughed. Just before dawn Kamiko and the two other platoon leaders were ordered to report to the company commander's dugout. Yei Hiro told them that the rest of their battalion had been ambushed on the way up front and practically wiped out. So their own hammock, it had been renamed Yei Hiro Hill by Sato in honor of the company, had become the spearhead again, and was isolated. Reinforcements are sure to come. When the main force of the division arrives, it will be easy to wipe out the enemy. Until then we must defend this position to the end. I hope that each platoon leader will do his best, with resolution, despite the condition of the men. The Americans who had been forced back resumed their assault on the escarpment, it was nicknamed Breakneck Ridge, with the help of men from the 1st Cavalry Division. This time they attacked on a broader front but still concentrated on the hill where the 80 men of Kamiko's company were waiting, with orders to hold fire. When the GIs were 75 yards away, Lieutenant Ye Hero shouted fire. The fusillade of rifle and machine gun bullets toppled over the enemy like bowling pins. But the onslaught was stemmed only momentarily. Kamiko grudgingly admired the Americans' ability to advance over the bodies of their comrades, throwing grenades like baseballs. The carnage along the defense line was far worse than the day before, and Kamiko doubted that Ye Hero Hill could be held against such determination and firepower. He was impatient with his own single action model 38 rifle, it was accurate, but after every shot the five bullet clip had to be pushed down. He shouted to Ogura to concentrate his machine gun fire to the right where the American advance was slowing. Perhaps they could be panicked. Grenades, tossed by comrades behind him, flew overhead and bounced toward the enemy. The Americans wavered. One or two turned back and the rest followed Belmel down the hill. Yay Hero Company had held again, but only 25 were alive. The survivors were sent back in relays down to a stream on the other side of Highway 2. They washed their faces in the cool water, filled canteens and ate hardtack. This, Kamiko thought, is the pleasure of nothingness. The American failure to seize Breakneck Ridge had immediate repercussions. Major General Franklin C. Seibert, commander of X Corps, which included the 24th Infantry and 1st Cavalry Divisions, came up front at noon, and without waiting to go through channels, summarily relieved a regimental commander and replaced him with his own intelligence officer, Colonel William J. Verbeck. Verbeck quickly proved he was one staff officer who was more aggressive than the average line officer. No sooner had he taken command than he sent a company to flank the ridge. It too was pushed back. Undeterred, Verbeck ordered the 2nd Battalion, with Company L attached, to attack the ridge in force the next morning. November 8 dawned grey. Then the skies darkened dramatically, and rain, whipped by typhoon winds, swept the ridge. Palms bent like boughs, and some snapped, others were uprooted. The Kogon grass lashed like a turbulent sea. Even so, Verbeck's attack began on schedule. It opened with a heavy artillery barrage, the boom of cannons competing with the thunder and screaming wind. Infantry moved out through the beating rain, floundering on the muddy slopes. Their maps were inaccurate and it took hours for some units to get into position. Mortar shells, however, had zeroed in on the crest of the ridge. The effect was so devastating that Ye Hero ordered the company to fall back to their original tickets above near the highway, and they make the final stand. The men skidded and bumped their way down to holes, which were already deep with water but nevertheless offered refuge from the mortar rounds that flew overhead. Fog engulfed the slope, nothing could be seen beyond ten yards. As he waited, soaked and miserable, Kamiko re-evaluated the enemy. First, he was no coward, second, he could throw grenades twice as far as the Japanese, third, and most important, he always seemed to be rested. 
Kamiko's squad was perpetually exhausted, perhaps it was the constant battle without relief, perhaps the lack of food. There were no mortars to lob shells over the ridge at the approaching Americans, so Ye Hero ordered his men to direct steady fire on the crest line of the shrouded ridge. The strategy worked, the display of firepower discouraged the enemy from coming over the top. The defenders regained confidence, but their sense of security was short-lived. To the rear they heard an eerie grinding, thumping noise. An American tank had come around the bend of Highway 2, churning through the morass of mud, its gun spitting out shells. They were surrounded. Two men scrambled down the hill toward the road, carrying a heavy satchel charge. The men in the Tukatsubo turned and watched the little drama as from an amphitheater until they heard shouts in English near the top of the ridge. Use grenades! cried Kamiko and started up the hill followed by his depleted platoon. They tossed grenades over the crest and ran back for more. Three times they scrambled up the slope. With the enemy out of sight, they returned to their holes. But the Americans returned, as they always did. Kamika heard something hissing at the rim of his Tukatsubo. An enemy grenade had rolled down the hill and was caught in a tent stake. He looked at Ogura and both shrugged. It was the end. But the grenade fizzled out. Others bounded over the dugouts but exploded after they were passed. On the crest above, a GI leveled his rifle at Kanmiko. He crouched in his Tukatsubo, then popped up and fired. The GI fell to the ground, but in his excitement Kamiko pumped three more shells into him. A rifle barrel rose and disappeared like a periscope. It belonged to another GI who was trying to rescue his fallen comrade. Kamiko ran up to the crest and shot him, too, then sprinted back to his hole. PFC Seiji Saito in the next hole leapt forward, following Kamiko's example. At the crest he, too, fired. But instead of retreating, he disappeared on the other side. Why had Saito sacrificed himself so needlessly? Kamiko wondered. Then Saito reappeared like a jack-in-the-box. He swore breathlessly as he leapt into Kamiko's hole, I hated him so much I had to kick his head off. Had Saito, a mild youngster who didn't smoke or drink, gone mad? Was this the frenzy of the battlefield Kamika had read about? And yet, hadn't he himself come close to doing the same thing? To the rear the American tank, a medium, still moved freely on the road, raking the Tukatsubo from behind with its machine gun and cannon. The two men with the satchel charge sprang out of the ditch and flung the explosive under the tank's tracks. As they leapt back to safety, there was a dulled detonation and the tank shuddered. It turned laboriously, however, and retreated around the bend. Without the tank the American attack faltered and once more the GIs gave up Ye Hero Hill. Without hesitation the Japanese clambered up the muddy slope to reoccupy their positions along the crest. This time Kamiko felt no sense of victory. The enemy, who made retreat a tactic, would come back again and again. What did the remnants of Ye Hero Company have left to stop them? Several hundred yards to Kamiko's right on the next hill in the ridge, Sergeant Yoshio Noguchi's platoon had been hurt as badly as Kamiko's by the deadly mortar barrage along the crest. He had two 7.7 mm machine guns left, his and the one in the next to Kitsubo, but only a few rounds of ammunition. Crouched in the numbing water up to his waist, Noguchi heard a cry of anguish and the operator of the second gun crawled feebly toward him. Noguchi pulled him in. His right thigh was like a beehive gushing blood. His face was pale, drained. The crawling man had attracted steady enemy machine gun fire. The kogon grass all around Nogushi's Takatsubo was mowed flat. He cautiously checked on both sides. There was no activity. Apparently he was the last one of his platoon. He was a hardy, experienced soldier, a farm boy who had volunteered for service in 1938. Surrender was out of the question. He put the barrel of his pistol to his temple. He pulled the trigger, but the mechanism was jammed from the mud. 
Not 25 yards away, Americans in greenish uniforms were coming down his line of Takatsubo. At each hole they paused with rifles at the ready while two of their number machine gunned the dead or wounded occupants. The firing grew closer and Noguchi again put pistol to head. Jammed. There was a stuttering rattle of fire a few yards away and Noguchi knew he was next. A branch of palm leaves had been blown by a mort round to the edge of his hole. With a stick he deftly pulled the palm over the mouth of the Takatsubo. He pressed flat against the back of his dugout, water up to chin, legs outspread, then pulled the body of the lifeless machine gun operator in front of him. The voices were directly overhead. A shiny barrel poked between the leaves. He thought, how well they take care of their weapons. As he plugged his ears with his middle fingers he prayed the bullets would somehow miss him. He felt the concussion from a deafening series of explosions, and scores of bullets churned the water between his legs. The opposite side of the hole collapsed. Noguchi closed his eyes as mud began covering him up to the neck. The palm branch, cut in two, dropped on his head. The voices moved away and there was a burst of fire in the next hole. Stunned almost beyond thinking, Noguchi felt no pain. Carefully he scraped the mud from his face and opened his eyes. The water in the hole was tinged red. But it was the blood of his human shield. At last the firing stopped. What were the Americans doing now? With infinite caution he pushed his dead comrade aside and looked out, expecting to see them digging foxholes. They were building something he had never seen before, shallow, rectangular rock forts with canvas roofs. Noguchi huddled for hours in the bloody water, afraid to make another move until well after dark. At last he painfully got to his feet. All around him were the strange squat shelters, each glowed from a dim light within. He could hear the Americans joking and eating. Cigarette smoke curled invitingly out of the cozy little structures. What kind of soldiers would have lights in the middle of a battlefield? The lights began going out one by one, and near midnight it started to rain again. Noguchi hoisted himself out of his hole and started crawling away from the one GI he could see was on guard. He came to a wire which seemed to surround the encampment. Some kind of warning device? He crawled under without touching it, and down a steep incline. His legs were so weak and uncoordinated he had to hold on to vines to keep from falling. At the bottom he found a small stream. He drank on all fours, like a dog. Except for rain, it was the first water he had tasted in days. In the gloom he barely made out scores of bodies, comrades, canteen in hand, had met their death looking for water. In the darkness and rain he could not determine where he was. The battalion command post should be two hundred yards away, but he crawled up and down the drawers for more than a mile without finding it. Exhausted, he curled up behind a bush and fell asleep. He was wakened by voices. Through the brush he saw Americans eating breakfast. In the night he had circled around and around the knob only to climb back up to his starting place. Two GIs headed directly for him. He ducked his head, hoping they wouldn't notice him in the underbrush. Then he felt a stream of fluid splashing against his helmet. One of the Americans was urinating on him. When he looked up, the GI was adjusting his trousers as he ran after his comrades who were already marching off. Most of Breakneck Ridge, however, still remained in Japanese hands. That morning, after heavy artillery preparation, two soaked battalions of the 24th Division resumed the attack in the driving rain. They advanced but were thrown back by a fresh Japanese battalion. Rain had become as much of a problem to the Americans as the enemy. Their supperly route, Highway 2, was a swamp, and engineers were carting up loads of heavy gravel to try to make it passable. Already the GIs were suffering from immersion foot, similar to the trench foot of Europe, the skin peeled away, leaving raw sores. The Japanese, too, were afflicted by the endless rain. Using trenching spades, they tried in vain to bail out their Takatsubo. Kamiko remembered that American knapsacks were waterproof and decided to use one as a bucket. 
he crawled over to the enemy side of the ridge, found a dead G.I., as usual lying face up, mouth open, and took his knapsack. He and Ogre scooped out the water in their hole and passed the knapsack to the next to Katsubo. Drenched to the skin and cold, they cut off the rubber tubes of gas masks and set them on fire. The smell was nauseating but there was some heat. Kamiko awoke to another dark dawn, it was November 10th. It was nonsense to try to determine one's own death day, yet he kept doing it. Still he had no fear at all. Mfatsu! He exclaimed, a popular Chinese expression meaning it is fate, similar to Kayseri Sera. There was nothing to do now except enjoy life to its last moment. The rain increased as American shells ploughed into the crest line above them. Under the constant trembling of the earth, the sides of the Tukatsuba began to crumble. It reminded Kamiko of the terrifying earthquake in 1923, which he had never been able to forget. The barrage lifted. First platoon, take positions on the ridge line. Kamiko shouted and charged up the hill, an unrecognizable mass of shell holes. At the top he saw swarms of enemy soldiers halfway up the other side. They seemed numberless, they were two full battalions of the 1st Cavalry Division, and there were only a handful left in Yehiro Company to stop them. He frantically gestured to his men to return to the relative safety of their Takatsubu down below. He called out a warning as he sped by Yehiro's dugout. He leapt into his hole a moment before bullets swept down the slope. Grenades followed, skipping down into their positions. To the right there was shouting in English. Had the second platoon been overrun? Saito yelled, out of ammunition. Me, too. Another man called. Someone tossed them a few clips in an attempt to divide the remaining ammunition, but it was useless. Driven by anger and frustration, Kamiko plunged out of his Tukatsubo, and followed by three men, churned almost to the top of the hill before lobbing a grenade at the crest. Impulsively, perhaps to frighten the enemy, he shouted in English, Charge, charge. The result was startling. An American rushed over the crest with fixed bayonet and found himself facing Kamiko. The two stared open mouthed at each other. Neither fired. Then the G.I., realizing the order had come from the wrong side, dived back over the crest. Company, Tench in. It was the voice of Ye Hero's assistant. The word meant literally turn around and advance and was a euphemism for a treat. Ye Hero himself repeated the word, then shouted as if in apology, We will advance later. The men of the platoon next to Kamiko's, the second, had never heard the expression before, it had been created recently to cope realistically with the changing tide of war, but the urgency of the command forced them out of their holes, ready to launch the last attack. Tench in! Tench in! Ye Hero! American carbine in hand, ran out of his Tukatsubo to turn them around. Kamiko knew the word but had never expected to hear it in battle. Paralyzed, he watched the Americans concentrate their fire on the exposed second platoon. Ye Hero was firing his carbine from the hip. One G.I. fell. Ye Hero picked off another, then was sent spinning to the ground himself. Kamiko helped drag him to a shell hole. Blood spurted from his throat. Company commander. Kamiko pleaded. They held a canteen to Yehiro's mouth. He gulped once, then his head fell lifeless to the side. Now the fate of the few men left in Yehiro company was in Kamiko's hands. Retreat was disgraceful, in all their years of training it had been forbidden. They were going to die anyway and should take as many enemy with them as possible. Throw all the grenades you have left. He shouted and started up toward the crest, with five men right on his heels. Their unexpected attack caught the Americans momentarily off guard. They fell back under the rain of grenades. We could win with one machine gun, thought Kanmiko. The absurdity of that hope jerked him back to reality. He was leading his men to a meaningless death. Follow me, 
he cried and dodged back down the hill toward Highway 2 with the few survivors of the 2nd platoon and his own men. He jumped into the ditch by the road, then looked back. Helmeted heads were poking up all along the crest. There were eleven in the ditch and Kamiko began to lead them down the highway toward Ormok, along the same stretch of road he had so recently led the entire gem division, but the shame of retreat still gnawed at his conscience. Yea Hero had ordered them to fall back, yet this withdrawal was his own responsibility, and he had abandoned the body of his commander. He had valued his own life above honor, and the thought tormented him with every step he took to the rear. Then he began to feel defiant, why die needlessly? It wouldn't help the nation. He began to feel almost light of heart. But his euphoria was shattered by the blast of a grenade. It had come from the west, or valley, side of Highway 2. No one was hurt and they broke into a run. How had the enemy outflanked them so fast in such rough terrain? Perhaps it might not even be possible to rejoin the main force. A few hundred yards down the road they came to a culvert, a stream was running underneath. Mfatsu. Kamiko reminded himself. The only thing was to do one's best and not worry about the future. They were still alive. They stripped off their foul uniforms. With leggings removed, their bare legs were sickly white, like bean curd. As they scrubbed their clothes in the stream they began teasing and pushing one another as if they were back in Manchuria, then, clad only in loincloths, lay down unconcerned and before long were asleep. They were awakened by an ominous staccato. Kamiko jumped up. Above them on the crest of the ridge he could see G.I.'s manning a machine gun. He grabbed his rifle, and while the others snatched up what clothes they could on the run, he emptied his last clips before following them. They were chased by a few mortar rounds which detonated on contact with foliage overhead. Deep within the woods they paused to put on the clothing they had managed to salvage, and circled back to the road. At a regimental supply depot, Kamiko checked in and the young officer in charge congratulated them for the great victory of their battalion. Kamiko stared at him on the ridge they had been waiting day after day for substantial reinforcements while the 3rd Battalion was being annihilated. Didn't anyone back here at regiment know what was going on up front? 2. In Manila, General Yamashita knew at least that Suzuki's troops had encountered stiff opposition at the ridge. He ordered the main thrust diverted from Karagara, instead, Suzuki should turn east off Highway 2 below Lyman and strike overland directly across the island to Tacloban. It was a perfunctory order. General Yamashita still questioned the advisability of waging the decisive battle on late. It was foolhardy to drain off men and supplies that would be needed so desperately in the battle for Luzon. Moreover, he had reason to believe things were not going too well for Suzuki at late. And had American air and naval power really been crippled at Formosa and late? Field Marshal Teroki, however, remained unimpressed by these arguments. We have heard the opinions of 14th Area Army, he said, but the late operation will continue. I fully understand your intention, Yamashita replied. I will carry it out to a successful end. Teroki's confidence came in part from the relative ease with which he had just landed 13,000 men, 12,000 of them from the 26th Division, at Ormok. Moreover, another convoy, carrying 10,000 troops, was approaching late escorted by four destroyers, a minesweeper and a submarine chaser, and screened by three other destroyers. Early the next morning, November 11th, the convoy turned into Ormok Bay. But at this point Yamashita's suspicion that American air and naval power had not been destroyed was dramatically borne out. Almost 200 carrier planes from Task Force 38 caught the creeping convoy before it reached the harbor. This first wave concentrated on the six transports, which were hit again and again. The second wave went after the destroyers, and the third swept in bombing the burning hulks and strafing the men struggling in the water. The slaughter was frightful. At the cost of nine American planes, every transport and four of the destroyers were sunk. 
only a few of the 10,000 troops aboard, almost an entire division, managed to swim ashore through the Crimson Sea. The catastrophe left Teruaki unchanged, at least outwardly, but it strengthened Yamashita's conviction that late was a lost cause. At the same time he was under orders from Teruaki to continue the operation with vigor. His reservations were reflected in a radio message he sent Suzuki on November 15, which came close to predicting the abandonment of late. The 35th Army will endeavor to accomplish the destruction of the enemy on late, setting as ITS minimum objective the disruption of the enemy's use of air bases. In the event that further troop shipments cannot be sent, Luzon will become the main theater of future operations in the Philippines. Suzuki, understandably, was confused. Did it mean that the order to launch the main attack across the mountains toward Tacloban was rescinded? He knew the ridge had to be held or the Americans would pour down Highway 2 toward Ormoc. He therefore ordered Katoka to counterattack. This would hold the ridge line, and moreover, distract American attention from his own drive over the mountains. U.S. Tanks roamed the corkscrew road almost at will. Infantry closed in from three sides, and after bitter hand-to-hand -hand fighting, overran the ridge except for a few spurs at the southeastern end still held by the rearguard of the 57th Regiment of Gem Division. The rest of the regiment withdrew south at night, the weary men keeping together by following the glow of phosphorescent insects rubbed on the back of the man ahead. These men were turned around, and at Suzuki's order, marched back to retake ground they had just abandoned. Kamiko found himself back on the ridge, this time at the southern end. He and Oki had been sent as replacements to Yasuda Company, which was dug in near the top of a rise about the size of Yehiro Hill. Lieutenant Tasui Yasuda was a mild man. I'm glad you arrived up here safely, he said through tight lips. The company has been reduced to less than one-fourth, so getting you two makes us feel we've got a million on our side. Kamiko was given the third squad. We've just dug in and they haven't attacked us yet. But they will come soon. We are glad you are going to die with us. The chattering of birds wakened Kamiko before dawn. For a moment he thought he was back in the mountains of Chiba. Through the dense foliage he saw something red. Was it some gaudy tropic blossom? No. It was a huge plumed bird that belonged in a zoo. But it was also food. He crawled to his commander's dugout and whispered that he wanted to shoot the bird for food. Lieutenant Yasuda shook his head, one shot would reveal their position. They might as well have fired. The bird, flapping its great ungainly wings, rose noisily like a loaded transport plane and instantly attracted mortar shells that continued spasmodically. All day Yasuda company huddled silently in their holes, their food ration was one rice ball for eight men. After dark Yasuda and his three squad leaders crept up to the ridge line. Halfway down the other side a group of Americans was eating out in the open as if it were a picnic grounds. The lieutenant suggested sending down two men to scavenge. Hunger gnawed at them more than fear, and the three squad leaders nodded approval. Two privates were sent on the suicide mission and all night the company waited anxiously. Once they heard the crump of grenades and the rattle of machine gun fire, they were certain their comrades had been killed. But at daybreak the two men returned, leaping into Yasuda's dugout with a poncho full of booty, as excited as schoolboys. They had ambushed an American machine gun position in the dark and scooped up everything they could find. Their plunder turned out to be a few tins of cigarettes and boxes of ammunition that didn't fit their own weapons. Oki lit one of the American cigarettes. Ah, I've forgotten the taste of tobacco, he said after a deep drag. It makes me dizzy. That day while enlarging his tukatsubo, Kamiko caught a lizard. Skinned, it was light pink and reminded him of Megaki, a fish he used to catch in the sea near his home. Oki chopped it up with his dagger, boiled the parts in his hango until they were white. Kamiko found its taste a cross between fish and chicken. He finished full of vigor, almost as if he had been injected with adrenaline. 
At noon Yasuda ordered Kamiko's squad to ascend a strategic knob a hundred yards to the right and relieve the squad holding it. The knob dominated the area and was constantly under fire. Its capture would compromise the regimental position. All through the afternoon the third squad kept the enemy at a distance, but the next morning the Americans pressed in close enough to lob grenades. At the height of the attack, the grenade barrage inexplicably stopped. It was so quiet that Kamiko could hear birds singing, then a strange noise like a blowtorch. A cloud of thick black smoke boiled up in front of him. Flamethrower! He shouted. He began heaving grenades as far and as fast as possible. At last the flame extinguished. He flopped back exhausted, puzzled about the American withdrawal. A shell landed yards ahead but did not detonate, it buried itself deep into the ground. Kamiko thought it was a dud until the earth erupted in front of him like a volcano. It was the most terrifying thing he had ever experienced, it shattered him as had the earthquake of 1923. He turned to Oki, his face pale. They're using some new weapon. It was actually a delayed fuse, the earth rumbled time and again, throwing up tons of dirt. To the left, where two men had been hiding in their Takatsubo, there was now only level ground with three legs protruding. Kamiko felt a hot sting on his arm, then on the foot. They were minor wounds the only wounds he had suffered in seven full days of suicidal combat. Under protest he was sent to the rear. His regiment, reduced to less than 400 men, had disintegrated against relentless American pressure. On November 23, GIs of the 128th Infantry Regiment of the 32nd Division broke through the mountain barrier and into Lyman. The Battle of Breakneck Ridge was over little remained but pockets of resistance. Two days later General Katoku ordered the remnants of GEM Division to regroup below Lyman Ear Highway 2. Kamiko and Oki hobbled south along the highway. They came to a ravine that stank of death. Thousands of swollen, decomposed bodies were scattered all over the road and in both ditches. At first glance the bodies looked as if they were being attacked by snakes, they were tubes from gas masks. This was Death Valley. Here, with deadly accuracy, American artillery had caught Japanese troops moving up to the front. They struck off into the jungle east of the highway. At every stream they found clusters of wounded men lying like corpses, their will to live gone. Kamiko and Oki pushed on but were obsessed by thoughts of suicide. They met seven other stragglers, led by a Sergeant Hirano and learned that the Americans had driven a wedge below Breakneck Ridge almost to Highway 2. They would have to fight through the enemy line to rejoin their division. Hunger drove them to raid the first American position they came upon. They fled, arms loaded with GI rations, chased by a volley of rifle fire. What a difference a little food makes! Kamiko thought as he finished a piece of chocolate. They could tolerate their wounds but the lack of food had sapped their morale. If we could eat as much as the Americans, we'd still be up on the ridge fighting, he mused. Victory in battle was simply a case of supply. How could Japan win against such a rich and powerful foe? They found an American supply parachute and were themselves almost discovered by a column of Negro soldiers carrying boxes. As Kamiko raised his rifle. He was checked by Hirano, who jerked his head. Another column was coming. How black they are! Kamiko whispered, he had never before seen a Negro. We're all human beings, but I wonder why they're so different. I wonder if they think like Americans? They're Americans too, said Hirano. They worked their way over a mountain, force marched all night through a chilling rain, by morning they approached Highway 2 directly behind the enemy front. Kamika halted the little group. He assured them they would break through. They had food and the Japanese soldier could not be beaten at hand-to-hand -hand combat. If you have the bad luck to get shot, commit suicide like a man. They started down toward the highway. 24. Debacle. 1. 
organized resistance on late was at the point of collapse but Yamashita in Manila directed General Sozaku Suzuki to concentrate his remaining striking power into a desperation attack, Operation War, on American airfields. These nearly established bases were a threat to the entire Philippines as well as the supple route between the homeland and the south, Java, Malaya, Sumatra and Borneo. There were three major forces on the island. GEM Division had lost more than three quarters of its effectives and at best could only delay the American advance down Highway 2. Makino's 16th Division, after being pushed across the coastal plain, was splintered. Some units were holding ground in the mountains west of Dagami, but the rest were scattered deep inland with the search of food their main occupation, they had been subsisting on raw insects, snails, frogs, lizards, centipedes, roots, grass, and their own sweaty belts. The third force, the 26th Division, would have to provide the main thrust of Operation War. Already the division, except for a battalion detached to protect Tormok, was moving across the mountain range below Lyman in a general attack toward Late Gulf. Suzuki ordered them to keep moving southeast and together with the remnants of the 16th and paratroopers flown in from Luzon, attack three airfields near Brun, a strategic village ten miles west of Delag, at dawn on December 6. The hastily conceived plan was compromised from the beginning. First the men of the 26th Division found it difficult to maintain the time schedule set up by Manila, Suzuki asked for a delay of two days, which was denied. Then the operation itself was vitiated by a breakdown in communications. On December 3 meteorologists predicted an inclement weather front and Suzuki was ordered to postpone the attack for one day. But the message never reached the survivors of the 16th Division, who descended on the airstrip a mile above Burren as scheduled, just after dawn on December 6. There were now only 300 of them their meager force having been further reduced by desertions. They came upon a group of sleeping American engineers bivouacked in the open, and began bayoneting them. The engineers, most of whom had never fired at an enemy, fled except for one of their cooks who killed five Japanese trying to steal food from his kitchen. The raiders held part of the field for several hours, but with no support they were driven back to the woods in the north where they dug in cursing the paratroopers who had failed to appear. These 700 troopers, they came from the 3rd Parachute Regiment commanded by Lt. Col. Soon Hiro Shirai, were still on Luzon, preparing to board two engine transports. The first wave of 26 transports, with 365 paratroopers aboard, began taking off in mid-afternoon. They grouped and headed south, escorted by fighters. They continued west of late to avoid detection, before circling south of the island and starting up toward Late Gulf. The sun was setting as they turned sharply west just below Delag and followed the Marabang River inland toward Buran. They ran into heavy flak, and four planes were destroyed. The others lowered to 750 feet. At 6.40 the troopers jumped. They were supposed to concentrate at the north field but because of darkness only Colonel Shirai and 60 others landed at the objective. The main body came down on San Pablo, the strip a mile and a half east of Buran. They charged, shouting demoniacally in English, Hello, where are your machine guns? And surrender. Everything is resistless. Stupefied, Americans watched as the Japanese burned parked planes and ignited gasoline and ammunition dumps. At the north field, Shirai's force was too small to be effective. It joined the 16th Division infantrymen still hiding in the woods and waited for the second wave of paratroopers. But there would be no second wave, bad weather closed in late again. Nor would there be any help from the 26th Division. A single battalion was within striking range of Buran, and these exhausted men were intercepted and repulsed by a battalion of the U.S. 11th Airborne Division. The paratroopers at San Pablo had discovered their mistake, however, and after ravaging that field, struck northwest to join up with Shirai at dawn. Now that he had a respectable force, 
almost 500 men, Shirari grouped. By mid-morning he had seized the entire airstrip, and for three days his tenacious men held out against four American battalions. Finally overwhelmed by sheer numbers, the handful of survivors fled into the hills. While Shirai was mounting his dawn assault on the airstrip at Burren, an armada of destroyer transports loaded with an entire American division, the 77th, unexpectedly appeared in Ormoc Bay. The gamble of Wah had not only failed but had diverted Suzuki's best troops, the 26th Division, away from the area which was now the target for MacArthur's next strike. Around 6.40 a dozen U.S. destroyers began bombarding the beaches four miles below Ormoc. Landing craft pushed off from the destroyer transport and shortly after seven o'clock the first wave of men from New York zone landed unopposed. It was a day of sevens, to the south the 7th Division had already crossed the waste of the island over a supposedly impassable mountain road and was coming up the coast toward Ormoc. The infantrymen were opposed only by the single battalion detached from the 26th Division to protect the city. Suzuki had erected no obstacles on the beaches, he felt the west coast was protected by the Japanese naval base in Cebu across the narrow Kamotsu Sea, and was now surrounded. There was little the Japanese could do to cope with the situation. Suzuki instructed the 26th Division, and what was left of the 16th, to about face and join him at Ormok. Yamashi to expedited the convoys already scheduled for late and in addition ordered 500 paratroopers of the 4th Parachute Regiment sent to an airfield 8 miles above Ormok near Highway 2. But they didn't arrive until dawn of December 8 and were dropped in the jungle almost 5 miles north of the target. Corporal Kayoshi Kamiko, whose group had just fought its way through the American lines to reach Highway 2, encountered half a dozen of these paratroopers young, well equipped and eager for battle. Kamiko warned them that they would be outnumbered ten to one, but one youngster exclaimed, my goal is to kill ten before I die, and then blushed. His naivete appalled Kamiko. What right had Imperial headquarters to send such children out on suicide missions? All the frustrations and doubts of the past few weeks crystallized into a decision that would have seemed reasonable on Yehiro Hill he would escape to another island. Why die uselessly? He allowed himself to think of Japan, of its beautiful hills and rivers. He would work his way to the west coast with a few trusted companions and steal a native boat. Perhaps they could escape to Borneo. A deep roll of thunder came from the direction of Ormok. It sounded like enemy artillery. How had the Americans got down there so fast? Major General Andrew D. Bruce's 77th Division was driving steadily up the west coast toward Ormoc against a congeries of assorted, poorly armed service units commanded by a transportation officer, Colonel Mitsui. His force was dug in on the high ground a few miles below the city and he hoped he could hold out until the 26th Division returned. Other reinforcements were on the way by sea and on December 9 the battalion of the 30th Division landed at Palompon, a port on the west side of the little peninsula forming Ormoc Bay. It was only 15 air miles to Ormoc, but 35 miles by a winding mountain road, and Bruce's men were already on the outskirts of the city. The following morning G.I.s broke through Colonel Mitsui's lines into Ormoc, a mass of choking rubble and blazing buildings. A pall of dark smoke hooded the area. That afternoon General Bruce reported his victory to Corps Commander John R. Hodge, reminding him of a promise made by the commander of the 5th Air Force. Dot where is the case of Scotch that was promised by General Whitehead for the capture of Ormoc? I don't drink but I have an assistant division commander and regimental commanders WHO do. A few hours later Bruce sent another message referring to the 7th Division which was coming up the West Coast Road. Have rolled two sevens in Ormoc. Come seven come eleven. There were still two Japanese convoys en route to Ormoc Bay. One carried 3,000 men of the 8th Division and 900 tons of ammunition and supplies. As the five transport, three destroyers and two submarine chasers, 
escorted by about 30 fighters, approached the west coast of late the next morning, they were attacked by Marine Corps saws which sank three transports. The remaining ships tried to pick up survivors as they turned in toward Palompon, but 700 men were drowned. Before the fleeing vessels made port, another transport was sunk by Marine and Army planes. The final convoy, two destroyers and two transports, carried a 400-man naval detachment under Lieutenant Commander Ito, as well as nine amphibious tanks and twenty mortars. It had escaped detection and was still intact as it approached Tormok several hours after midnight. At this point it was sighted by the destroyer Coglin, which opened fire and sank a destroyer. The transports continued, one anchored near the occupied city and attempted to disembark its troops. The first barge was almost swamped by shells from the shore. Don't shoot! The Japanese yelled, unaware that the city was in enemy hands. The other transport luckily made for the opposite side of the bay, where it unloaded the last reinforcements and supplies that Suzuki would get. Considering that nearly 80% of all the vessels dispatched to late had been sunk, it was remarkable that a total of 45,000 troops had made it safely ashore. But their effectiveness was sharply reduced by the fact that little more than 10,000 tons of supplies in all were salvaged. 2. Although late was not yet lost and Luzon was being fortified for its conclusive battle, Imperial headquarters ordered preparations expedited for the evacuation of Allied prisoners of war in the Philippines to the homeland. Though they could be used as laborers and, possibly, hostages. Publicly the Japanese had long decried Allied treatment of prisoners while praising their own. Only a few weeks after three of Doolittle's flyers, Lieutenant Steen Hallmark and William Farrow and Sergeant Harold Spatz, were executed, they had been tortured and then given a peremptory trial, the Nippon Times condemned the British for the inhuman treatment they were meeting out to German prisoners of war. Dot needless to say, the Japanese government, actuated by considerations of humanity, have, up to the present, respected the principles contained in the international law governing the conduct of war and have done everything in their power with regard to the treatment accorded to the numerous British prisoners of war in their hands. Americans were depicted as enjoying life at the various prisoner camps. On Luzon, at Cabanachuan, several survivors of the Bhutan Death March kept secret notebooks whose disclosure would probably have meant summary execution. Colonel James Gillespie, a medical officer, described a new contingent of men marching into the camp. Dot inching their way along the road came a ragged formation of dirty, unkempt, unshaven, ragged, half-naked forms, pale, bloated, lifeless. They staggered and stumbled, some plodded, others uncertain of their balance and strength lay down only to be urged to continue by the attendants who in many instances were only slightly more able than those they were assisting. Limbs grotesquely swollen to double their size. Faces devoid of expression, form or life. Aged incredibly beyond their years. Bare feet on the stony road. Remnants of ragged gunny sacks as loin cloths. Some stark naked. Bloodshot eyes and cracked lips. Smeared with excreta from their bowels. Thus they came. To the end of the road, the strong, young, and alert Americans of the 31st Infantry, the Air Corps and the A.A. The saddest sight indeed it was and may I never see it again. These prisoners had been forced to eat cats, dogs, baby rats and garbage to remain alive, by now, they had lost an average of 55 pounds. In the first year at Cabanachuan, 2,644 of the complement of about 6,500 had died from malaria, dysentery, diphtheria and other diseases. Their deaths, according to Dr. Samuel M. Bloom, a captain, were directly attributed to the neglect of the Japanese, the result of a deliberate policy of starvation and the withholding of medical supplies. Another diarist, Major Roy L. Bodine, a dentist and a veteran of Badan, began keeping his clandestine record the day before MacArthur landed on late. It was a day he would never forget, his group was transferred to Manila by truck to Bilibid prison, 
where they learned they were simply being staged for shipment to Japan. They dreaded the treatment they might receive in the enemy homeland, but their spirits were lifted by the bombing of the Manilan area and the long-awaited news that MacArthur had landed. On October 28, Dr. Bodine wrote, That added to the bombing makes us hope that the Nips won't be able to get us out of here. Every day they have rumors of us leaving in two or three days, but keep putting it off. We hope and pray constantly that they can't. Really sweating it out. Bodine's helps were never realized. On December 12th, all patients were given a cursory examination. The food improved, and soap and toilet paper were issued, sure signs they were about to leave. If MacArthur gets this close and then lets us go, we'll really be mad wrote Bodine. The next morning he and 1,618 other prisoners filed down Gazan Avenue and passed the walled city. Filipinos lined the sidewalks to watch the sad procession, many surreptitiously gave the V sign. Lunata Park was crammed with hastily erected barracks but the Gran Luna section, where Bodine had lived as a boy, his father had been an army dentist, was unchanged. As they approached the dock area he saw the effects of the recent American bombing, and out in the bay were at least 40 hulks. At Pier 7 the prisoners began filing aboard a 15,000 ton luxury liner built just before the war for the tourist trade, or Yakumaru. With grim amusement Major Radrinus J. Van Noerson, who had survived a dozen jungle battles on Batan, watched MacArthur's shiny Packard, hoisted in a cargo net careen against the side of a hold, smashing its fenders. Lieutenant Colonel Curtis Beecher, a Marine, who recalled coming alongside the same pier back in 1929 on his return from duty in China, was herded along with 700 other prisoners into the dungeon-like forward hold, its previous occupants had been horses. In a few minutes the air was dead and hot and their uniforms became soaked with perspiration. The body and group. 300 Army and Navy medics and civilians, was packed amidships, three decks down. Eight buckets of rice and pans of fish were lowered after dark. The liner began to move. It steamed around Bataan into Subic Bay and continued on a northern course. Suddenly, alerted to some danger ahead, it turned back and anchored in the protective waters below Olongapo. The prisoners sat hunched in the dark, their minds churning. A couple of years more in Japan, Bodin thought, or a watery grave from subs and planes. The condition of the 700 men massed in the forehold was already intolerable. The only ventilation came through a small hatch. A few pails had been tossed down to them for human waste. These were quickly filled and the hold reeked from urine and feces scattered on the deck. From the darkness came a shriek, oh, my god. A man urinated into his canteen and drank the liquid. Colonel Beecher thought of the black hole of Calcutta, reading about it had made little impression but now he knew how horrible it must have been. An inhuman noise rose over the sighs and moans, which sounded to Major Van Noerson like the gobbling of turkeys. Suddenly the sound was repeated quite close by, the man next to him began to babble. In the shaft of starlight from the hatch. Van Noerson could see that his neighbor was losing consciousness. His puffed whitish tongue wagged between drooping lips. His eyes were glazed, unseeing. He slumped over. He was dead. In the afterhold the other 600 men were experiencing the same hell. They had been given a skimpy meal of rice and fish but no water. Most of them had unthinkingly emptied their canteens during the hot march through the streets. They began fanning the air in unison with mesquites but it made no difference. The men stripped in the oven like heat. In the darkness they shouted for water. But the guards ignored them, their own comrades had come to the Philippines in the same holds, if not as crowded. The prisoners' exertions slowly exhausted the oxygen from the air. One man, suffocating, toppled over silently with incredible restraint, but others, gasping for breath thrashed about wildly before collapsing. A dozen, crazed by thirst, went berserk, they slashed at the throats and wrists of companions to suck blood. The panic turned the hold into bedlam. To Major Virgil McCullum, 
another veteran of Badan, it was the most horrible experience imaginable and probably unprecedented in the annals of civilization. As the dim light of dawn filtered through the hatch, several score bodies lay lifeless, suffocated or murdered. From topside the men heard excited shouting. There was the bark of anti-aircraft guns, and shards of glass showered through the hatches. Bombs pummeled the ship and machine gun bullets clattered noisily along the decks above. In the afterhold, prisoners clawed up the ladders, terrified lest they be trapped below, but were driven back by guards firing down into their midst. The bombers returned at half-hour intervals. Amidships, Major Bodine and two friends, Captain John Hudgens and Major Bob Nelson, pushed into a little storeroom to escape stray bullets which were ricocheting through the hatch above. It was stifling but a refuge, that is, unless a bomb or torpedo made a direct hit. Bodine was a Catholic, and with death so close he prayed continuously. He said the rosary and repeated all the prayers he knew, and above the deafening clamor of shrapnel and bullets against iron, he heard Hudgens saying over and over, Jesus save us. Packed in the little room they found it impossible to stay awake during the lull between attacks. They jerked from sleep whenever a new raid started and began drowsily mumbling another prayer. Those in the forward hold faced another night of horror. There were shouts of quiet. And at ease. But as the temperature reached 110 degrees, riot again erupted. It was the worst and most brutal period of Colonel Beecher's life. All around him men were going mad. They collided with one another in the dark, slipping and falling in the feces, the sick were trampled, wild, deadly fights erupted. Men dropped to their knees like animals to lap up sewage running in open drains. In the rear, Major McCullum forced his way to the hull and licked the steel plates where a little moisture had condensed. The pandemonium was even worse than the first night. Many men lost their minds, a colonel later wrote in his official report, and crawled about in the absolute darkness armed with knives, attempting to kill people in order to drink their blood or armed with canteens filled with urine and swinging them in the dark. The hold was so crowded and everyone so interlocked with one another that the only movement possible was over the heads and bodies of others. At about four o'clock in the morning an interpreter announced to the prisoners amidships that they were going ashore at dawn and could take along pants, shirt, canteen and mess kit, if they wanted shoes they'd have to carry them. The men crammed as much as possible in their pockets, and in the dark poured through musette bags for their most valuable possessions. Bodine put his wife's rosary around his neck on top of his own, and slung his shoes over his shoulders. At the last moment he remembered his notebook and shoved it inside his shirt. What he most regretted leaving behind was his dental instruments. He had carried them all through the battles on Badan, on the death march and into several camps. Shortly after dawn the first twenty-five men, including five wounded, started up the ladder. The interpreter was back in a few minutes calling for another group of twenty-five. As they started up the ladder the interpreter frenziedly waved them back, many planes, many planes. A bomb crashed into the rear of Oyokumaru. The blast hurled shrapnel through the aft hold. Superstructure tumbled down the hatchway, pinning screaming men. Flames swept through the wreckage. More than a hundred of the trapped prisoners were dead, one hundred and fifty were dying. In the forehold. The strongest scaled the forty-foot ladder and opened the hatch covers. Nearby they discovered sacks of raw sugar and dropped several to those below. Van Oerson wolfed down a handful of sugar. Miraculously he seemed to feel a charge of energy and mounted the ladder, something he was certain he could not have done a moment before. On deck, Japanese killed by the strafing and bombing were shrouded in straw ice sacks and piled in a long row five bodies high. Van Oerson leapt over the side. The cool water was invigorating and he swam toward shore. The exercise, after two cramped days, abruptly loosed his bowels. A guard shouted down to the body in group, all go home, speedo. Topside body in saw a beach a quarter of a mile away, Olongapo. 
hundreds of men, Japanese and Americans, were already in the water, struggling to reach land. There were shouts to those standing indecisively at the rails that the ship was going down. Bodine tossed a piece of 4 by 4 overboard and jumped after it. Halfway, he looked back. The luxury liner looked like a scrap heap. Four American planes came in low. One peeled off as if to strafe, but the men in the water waved frantically and with a waggle of the wings it zoomed off. Bodine decided to swim back to help the others. He noticed a dangling rope ladder and impulsively started to climb up to get the clothes he had discarded on deck. He didn't realize how weak he was until he began pulling himself up. On deck he made a bundle of his shirt, an old Filipino hat and a pair of shoes. He tied it to a three-inch shell crate, which he threw over the side, and jumped again. The 1,300 surviving prisoners were shepherded to a fenced-in tennis court where they huddled on the concrete in the sun. 3. That morning, December 15, MacArthur took a long stride toward Luzon. At 7.32 of his regimental combat teams landed without opposition on Mindora, a few miles below Luzon, and by late afternoon had pushed seven miles inland. General Yamashita had no intention of wasting troops on the defense of Mindora, the garrison numbered only a thousand nor did he intend to dispatch any more reinforcements till late. On December 22 he radioed his decision to Suzuki's headquarters at Seppu City. Redeploy your troops to fight extended holding action in areas of your choice. Select areas such as Bacolod on Negroes which are highly suitable for self-sustaining action. This message relieves you of your assigned mission. The message would not reach Suzuki himself until three days later but he had already ordered the remnants of the 35th Army to assemble near Palompon. Besides Suzuki, the individual most distraught by the abandonment of late was perhaps Prime Minister Kuniaki Koizo. On November 8 he had publicly committed his government to victory on late. In a radio broadcast to the nation he compared late with the Battle of Tenozen in 1582, which had decided the issue of who was to rule Japan. Koizo had in effect guaranteed that if Japan won on late, she would win the war. He learned of the decision to abandon late at a particularly awkward moment, when he was on his way to an audience with the Emperor. His Majesty asked immediately how the Prime Minister was going to explain the loss of late to the people after equating it with the Battle of Tenozen. Unstrung, Koizo mumbled that he would make the best of the situation, but he knew that only some miracle could save his cabinet. Suzuki's order to congregate in the Palompon area was thwarted by a surprise move by General Bruce's force on Christmas morning, which forced Suzuki and his staff to flee up the west coast of late toward the mountains near San Isidro. They evacuated Palompon just before a reinforced battalion of the U.S. 77th Division approached the port itself from the sea in Amphtrax and Delciams, landing craft, mechanized, the area was bombarded by 155 mm. Guns located a dozen miles inland, and a barrage by mortar boats preceded the landing itself. At 7.20 the first wave reached shore without opposition and had seized the town by noon. General Bruce radioed his corps commander. The 77th Infantry Division's Christmas contribution to the late campaign is the capture of Palompon, the last main port of the enemy. We are all grateful to the Almighty on this birthday of the sun and on the season of the Feast of Lights. In the afternoon MacArthur announced that the late campaign was over except for minor mopping up operations. He turned over this last phase to 8th Army so that Kruger's 6th Army could prepare for the invasion of Luzon. On Christmas night Kayoshi Kamiko and three companions reached a beach a few miles from Suzuki's temporary headquarters. As the sounds of battle in Palompon subsided, they heard incongruous peons of peace on earth. Goodwill to men. G.I.s were playing Christmas carols in the hills above. Kamiko and his comrades had fought their way to the coast through marauding bands of guerrillas and over almost impassable terrain, ranging from quicksand and swamps to precipitous ravines. Oki and Sergeant Hirano had become separated from the group 
which at times comprised as many as fifty, more than once their resolve to escape the island had wavered. Only hours earlier, conscience stricken at the thought of desertion, they had left one of their party who was wounded and started down the beach toward Palompon to help defend the city. They were intercepted by a retreating Japanese officer who turned them around and ordered them to follow his unit. As they neared the coconut grove where their wounded comrade, Tokura, lay hidden, Kamiko and his group fell behind, determined once more to escape. In the dark they found a banker and rigged it with a sail they made from a tent. They loaded the little outrigger with rifles, canteens and coconuts, and clambered in. What about Tokura? Someone asked under his breath. Nakamura, a fisherman on whom they depended for navigation, warned that five would be too many, but Kamiko was against abandoning the wounded man. A voice interrupted their whispered argument, group leader. I'm staying here. Tokura was sitting on the beach a few yards away. It's best for me. Group leader, I'm staying too. Nakamura jumped out of the boat. Another man followed. Kamiko wearily beached the stern of the banker and joined the others who were sitting silently with Tokura. Finally Tokura said he was sorry for all the trouble he had caused and hobbled off. The boat is too small even for the four of us. Nakamura muttered. We can't reach another island in this thing. You knew that from the beginning. Kamiko shouted. You say you want to die on land and you don't want to die at sea. It doesn't matter where you die. The question is which choice offers the best chance of survival. The others remained hunched in a tight circle on the sand, staring at the slender banker, which was tossing in the waves. There was a shot. It was Tokura. What a pity, someone said, and another, it's better he did that than drown. This pushed Kamiko over the edge. He grabbed a grenade from his knapsack. Let's follow Tokura. He cried. We can't live until tomorrow. So, as you say, let's die on land. We've lived together, let's all die together. Everybody bring heads close. He activated the grenade. In four seconds it would explode. Nakamura lurched back. I'll go. He shouted. Kamiko tossed the grenade back over his shoulder just before it detonated. He leapt to his feet. Well, let's go. The banker sailed slowly out of the inlet in the moonlight. Nakamura, so reluctant on shore, was a new man as he deftly guided the boat toward Cebu. Abruptly the moonlight was cut off and something cold slapped his cheek. Rain. Dark clouds swirled ominously. Nakamura looked up, then said, let's return. We're at sea, Nakamura, and determined to die, said Kanmiko. So keep going. The fragile outrigger tossed erratically. Nakamura clung stony-faced to the tiller as the others bailed with their canteens. A dark shape materialized in front of them with a roar, it must be a speedboat transporting 35th Army headquarters to Cebu. They shouted and waved but the craft droned past. It was an American PT boat. Just before dawn the rain stopped and the sun rose on a calmed sea. All around them were small, bare rock islets. To the south, out of the morning light, emerged the vague outline of a large island. It had to be Cebu, their first goal. Nakamura changed course, and with the wind behind it, the little banker cut through the water as fast as a bicycle at top speed. Kamiko began to sing his favorite song, one he had taught his pupils. From a far off island whose name I don't know. A coconut comes floating. How many months have you been tossing on the waves? Far from the shores of your native island? I think about tides far away. And wonder when I will return to my native land. 4. General Suzuki had chosen to concentrate the remnants of his forces, more than 10,000 troops, on a rugged, heavily forested 1,200 foot mountain on the west coast between Palompon and San Isidro called Kangipat. Its eastern and western slopes were rocky, making it a natural fortress. 
everyday stragglers from the 1st Division and 68th Brigade arrived exhausted at Mount Kangipat, but those left of the 16th and 26th Divisions were pinned down near Highway 2. Many of these men had no intention of trying to reach Suzuki's position even if they could disengage themselves. Like Kamiko, they could not avoid the logic that it was senseless to die on late in such circumstances. In the mountains north of Ormok between Highway 2 and the West Coast Lieutenant General Shimpei Fukyu, on his own, was planning to escape from the island with his depleted 102nd Division, which had played an insignificant role in the fighting. Already 50 of his men had left by boat. On the night of December 29, Suzuki received the first message from Fukyu in more than a week, the 102nd Division was marching to the coast, where it would set sail in small boats for Cebu. The action was unprecedented in Suzuki's experience and only with difficulty was he dissuaded from court-martialing Fukyu summarily. Instead he ordered the 102nd Division to remain in place. Fukyu himself was to report at once to army headquarters with his chief of staff. But even this direct order was ignored. Fukyu's answer, composed by his chief of staff, a colonel named Wada, was as infuriating as the original decision to desert, we appreciate the efforts of army but at the present time we are very occupied preparing for evacuation. The division commander and chief of staff are consequently unable to report to army headquarters. On New Year's Eve, Fukyu had the effrontery to ask Suzuki to facilitate his insubordination, all boats that were prepared for the retreat were destroyed by American planes on the night of the 30th, thus delaying our departure. Would it be possible for you to send an armored craft to aid the departure of the division commander? Fukyu and his staff, like Kamiko, managed to get across the Kamotes Sea by Banka. In Seppu City the general was relieved of his command by order of Suzuki. He accepted Suzuki's instruction to remain on the island of Seppu, there was nowhere else to go. On late, Mount Kangiput was being prepared for a long siege. Large quantities of provisions were purchased from local farmers and augmented by fern, grass and wild spinach. Salt was separated from sea water. Suzuki's plan as far as late was concerned was to tie up as many enemy troops as possible, but he too was coming to doubt the usefulness of such a sacrifice. Realistically, how long could he expect Mount Kangipat to hold out? One determined assault would overrun it. Almost a hundred men were dying of starvation every day. How was that helping the empire? Moreover, Yamashita had long since given him permission to evacuate. It was a wrenching decision for a samurai, only a week before, he would never have imagined he'd make it. Gem Division would be the first to leave. On the night of January 12, 1945, General Katoku and his headquarters set off in three launches, safely reaching Seppu soon after dawn. In the next week 743 men all that remained of the elite gem division, reached Seppu with four heavy machine guns, eleven light ones and five grenade launchers. But as Lieutenant General Robert E. Chelberger's 8th Army closed in on Suzuki, continued evacuation became almost impossible. Except for sixteen weeks of tedious mopping up, the fighting was over. The 70,000 Japanese who came to defend late against 250,000 well-armed Americans had fought as well as could be expected. They wounded 12,000 GIs and killed 3,500, but only about 5,000, 1 in 13, would live to see Japan. It was a decisive battle, for the Americans. They had destroyed an entire army and permanently crippled Japan's remaining air force and fleet. The homeland itself now lay exposed, except for two island fortresses, Iwo Jima and Okinawa. At the prison camp in nearby Santo Tomas University this information came in an underground news bulletin with the words, better late than never. Seven weeks earlier a 5,000-ton freighter loaded with 1,805 prisoners from the Philippines had been torpedoed in the South China Sea probably by the U.S. Submarine Shark 2. Five Americans survived, 
including Sergeant Calvin Graff and Corporal Donald Meyer, and they only by a remarkable series of coincidences. After hanging on to wreckage all night, they found a lifeboat containing a keg of fresh water. While fixing the rudder, they discovered a small compartment containing a sealed tin of hardtack, a box floated alongside which just happened to hold pulleys and rigging that exactly fitted their boat. Finally, a pole someone had retrieved hours earlier turned out to be their mast. Just as they were about to raise the sail a Japanese destroyer approached her within a hundred yards but for some reason passed by without firing her machine guns. Even so, they probably would not have made it safely to China if fortune had not continued to favor them. After two days of sailing they were picked up by Chinese fishermen in a junk who landed them on the only area along the coast held by Chiang Kai-shek. Part 7. Beyond the Bitter End. 25. Our Golden Opportunity. 1. A relatively unpublicized war was going on in China and Burma that was frustrating and miserable for all sides, there were more than two, as well as the hundreds of millions of civilians trapped in the turmoil. Fought over a tremendous area, it was an ideological and geographical nightmare. The British had been humiliatingly expelled from Burma in early 1942, and their attempts to return had met with limited success. Forays by the Americans and Chinese into the Japanese-occupied territory had been equally inconclusive. But by the end of 1944 insatiable ambition had brought the Japanese to the point of disaster in Burma. Their dream was to topple India, that insecure pedestal of British imperialism, with the help of Chandra Bose's Indian National Army. The initial stepping stone was Imphal, a strategic city 50 miles west of the Burmese border. Not only was it the gateway to India but its occupation would be of inestimable propaganda value and an inspiration to all anti-imperialists. For many months the Japanese military leadership in Burma, champing under orders to remain on the defensive, had been requesting an invasion of India. These appeals, and those of Chandra Bose, were heeded at last. Early in 1944 Imperial Headquarters ordered the 15th Army to invest the vital areas of northeastern India in the vicinity of Imphal. Its commander, Lieutenant General Rinya Mutaguchi, regarded the capture of Imphal as the first in a series of deep thrusts into India. He had been brought to this view by an enemy, Brigadier Lord Charles Wingate, a messianic figure whose chinditz had been harassing the Japanese commanders of Burma in a number of unorthodox stabs far behind the lines. Although opposed to earlier plans to invade India, Mutaguchi had been impressed by Wingate's raids. If an Englishman could bring troops through dense jungle and over mountains, so could he, and in far greater force. But leading a group of specially trained guerrillas over such terrain was one thing, Leading an entire army was another. Colonel Tadashi Katagura, Mutaguchi's operations officer, appreciated the obstacles, there were formidable rivers and rugged mountains to traverse, moreover, 15th Army was not logistically prepared to carry out such a long, arduous campaign with its present shortage of food, ammunition and medical supplies. Katagura forcefully pressed his misgivings, he had lost none of his bluntness since being shot in the neck during the 226 incident for opposing the rebels, but Mutaguchi could not be persuaded to change the plans. On March 8, 1944, three reinforced Japanese divisions and a division of Bose's I.N.A.155,000 troops in all, crossed the Chindwin River and struck out across the mountains separating the two countries. On Indian soil Bose's men fell to their knees to kiss their native earth. Shouting J.I. Hind. J.I. Hind, they pushed ahead toward Kohima, a city 80 miles north of Imphal, astride the British supply route. Though they would turn south and march to Imphal, followed by the 31st Division after it had subdued Kohima. The other two Japanese divisions headed straight for Imphal. The most proficient ground commander in the Far East, Lieutenant General William J. Slim of the British Indian 14th Army, had surmised that Mutaguchi would strike at Imphal, with perhaps a single brigade diverted to Kohima, and awaited the battle in a rather complacent mood. 
His plan was to let the Japanese advance to the edge of the Imphal Plain, and when they were committed in assaults on our prepared positions, to counterattack in full force and destroy them. My heart sank, he later wrote, when he learned that the enemy, two divisions strong, was attacking Kihima. This not only placed an important garrison city in jeopardy but threatened his army's sole supply base and railhead at Dimapa, which lay about 30 miles to the northwest. He ordered immediate reinforcements. As I struggled hard to redress my errors and to speed by rail and air these reinforcements I knew that all depended on the steadfastness of the troops already meeting the first impetus of attack. If they could hold until help arrived, all would be well, if not we were near disaster. What Slim feared above all was that the Japanese would bypass Kihima and move on the railroad. An emergency line was set up on Kihima Ridge to block the road didn't map her? Men were scraped up from the local administrative forces, 500 convalescents were armed and put in the line. But the commander of the 31st Division, Lieutenant General Kotoku Sato, directed all his forces at Kohima, where the defenders resisted so stubbornly, they were driven onto a single hill, that the Indian National Army troops alone turned south toward Imphal. On the steep hillsides south and west of that city, the other two Japanese divisions were already erecting a formidable system of earthen log bunkers, preparatory to launching their combined attack. On April 18 the commander of the Indian force reported the unbelievable news that the road down to Imphal was lightly defended, his advance units were only a stone's throw away from the city itself. Victory was imminent, both had bales of new currency ready for circulation. But his dream was shattered when Sato, who had found more than he had bargained for at Kohima, refused to follow to Imphal. Instead he arbitrarily ordered his men to prepare to return to Burma, he had verbal permission, it was not meant to be taken literally, to withdraw if he weren't resupplied with food and ammunition by mid-April. Bose was furious, without Sato backing their spearhead, the INA troops could never break through to Imphal. He was sure it was a plot of 15th Army and accused the Japanese of purposely depriving Indians of winning the first significant victory in their own country. Mutaguchi was equally furious with Sato, and relieved him of his command, but no explanation satisfied Bose. The Japanese at Imphal were ready to attack, and asked Bose to deliver a radio broadcast on the Emperor's birthday, offering him Imphal as a present. Bose was insulted. Perversely he now opposed any invasion of India that was not led by the INA he argued that the appearance of Indian troops would spark revolts throughout the nation, whereas Japanese invaders would only bring thousands of Indians to the side of the British. The altercation gave General Slim a double advantage, it divided the enemy and provided time for substantial reinforcements to reach the Imphal area by rail and air. The Japanese were converging on the city from six roads but the defenders, with strong air support, held at every point. The debilitating battle continued inconclusively week after week. Both Japanese divisional commanders became convinced it would be impossible to storm Imphal, and one even began withdrawing troops without orders. Vice Chief of the Army General Staff Hikazaburo Hata, accompanied by Colonel Sujaitu and other staff officers, arrived at the front to investigate, they returned to Tokyo with disheartening conclusions for Tojo. There is little probability that the Imphal operation will succeed. Tojo turned on Hata, accusing him of defeatism. The Prime Minister had counted on the success of Operation U to divert the public's attention from the startling loss of the marshals in the Pacific. He was so beside himself with frustration that his sarcasm also seemed to include Prince Mikasa, the emperor's brother, who sat directly in front of Harta, and a chill came over the room. Harta remained silent. If I'd been Harta, Colonel Tainmura wrote in his diary, I'd have ripped off my staff insignia and fought him. On June 5 Mutaguchi met with his superior, General Masakazu Kawab, Burman Area Army Commander. Mutaguchi had already been obliged to dismiss all three of his division commanders, something unheard of in the history of the Japanese army, one for incompetence, one for illness, 
and the third for refusing to obey orders, and it was on the tip of his tongue to declare that the time had come to suspend Operation U but he could not speak. I was hoping, Mutaguchi later recalled, that General Kawab would perceive in silence what was in my heart. Kawab was not that perceptive. The destiny of Subhas Chandra Bose was mine as well as his, he wrote in his memoirs. Therefore I had to assist Mutaguchi by all means in my power. I kept telling myself so. The day following this meeting the British won back Kihima, after 64 days of some of the most bitter fighting of the war. A force of Japanese and Indians still held the road to Imphal, but within two weeks the British had smashed through and started to aid their harassed comrades in Imphal. Mutaguchi's problems were aggravated by the arrival of the monsoon. Ceaseless rains poured down, washing out the jungle trails back to Burma. Only one of his three divisions had brought adequate food supplies. The others had to subsist on grass, potatoes, snails, lizards, snakes, anything they could get their hands on, including monkeys. Mutaguchi still could not bring himself to ask Kawab for permission to withdraw but came close to it by inference. If operations are to be suspended and the army is to go over to the defensive, he wrote, it is advisable that the army be withdrawn to the line running from the high ground on the right bank of the Chindwin River through the high ground to the northwest of Moor Lake to the Didim area. Kawab's reply appeared uncompromising. He expected the 15th Army to do its duty zealously and fight harder. But his senior staff officer was already en route to Manila with a request for Field Marshal Teroki to suspend the operation. Teroki approved but word did not reach Mutaguchi until July 9. Four days later the troops began retreating toward the Chindwin River. On the long trek back over the mountains in the pounding rain, men fought one another for food. Thousands of sick and wounded fell out of the march and killed themselves with grenades. The paths were seas of mud and when a man stumbled he became half buried in slime, shoes were stolen from those struggling feebly to extricate themselves. Light machine guns, rifles, helmets, gas masks, anything useless, littered the trails. Only the will to live propelled the survivors, the men hobbled along with improvised canes, and those who lasted out a day's march huddled together for sleep that rarely came because of the constant downpour. Many drowned, too feeble to raise their heads above the rising water, and the Chindwin River itself, their goal, claimed the lives of hundreds more in its swollen waters. In all, 65,000 men died, more than two and a half times the number lost on Good Alcanal, and about as many as fell on late. Mutaguchi, his chief of staff and senior staff officers were relieved of their posts, as were Kawab and his chief of staff. The command shake-up and the destruction of the 15th Army infected every other unit in Burma, and by the end of the year Japanese rule was at the point of collapse. 2. In China, that tangled, multi-sided war continued to be a source of frustration to everyone concerned except the communists. The Japanese had conquered a vast area in eastern China but were no nearer to a final solution in their agonizingly long war in that enigmatic country. Though they occupied one important city after another, it was like tunneling in the sand, the Nanking puppet government of Wang Qingwai was unable to consolidate the victories after the Japanese troops moved on. The Japanese dominated the coast, rivers, railroads and highways, but in the expanses between, another struggle was going on among the Chinese themselves. Chiang Kai-shek was fighting Mao Zedong's armies for control while the warlords sided with whatever group was winning. China bred dissension. Lieutenant General Joseph W. Vinegar Joe, still well, commander of all American forces in China, remained at incessant odds with old leather-faced Chen Alt, commander of 14th Air Force an outgrowth of the American volunteer group, the Flying Tigers. Their argument most often focused on the policies of the man still well derisively called Peanut Chiang. In a series of vituperative messages to Washington, Stillwell charged that the aid sent to China was being criminally wasted by the Kuomintang. Moreover, 
its armies were expending as little material as possible against the Japanese, since Peanut was bent on saving men and supplies for the post-war confrontation with Mao. This, in large part, was true. Since the Second Cairo Conference, when Chiang felt his vital interests were betrayed by Roosevelt under the influence of Churchill, the nationalist troops had been waging passive warfare against Japan. In some sectors there had been virtual truce between the Kuomintang and the Japanese for over two years. A Chinese officer at an air base in Hubei, for example, defended his refusal to shoot at passing Japanese aircraft with the excuse that if his men did so, the Japs would be angry and would take revenge and return and bomb the city and do a lot of damage. Another of Chiang's officers argued that it was unnecessary for the Chinese to take up an offensive against the Japs because soon the United States will surround Japan and then the Japs will have to retreat without fighting, and so it is better to leave them alone, and get along as best we can as we are. Although Stilwell's indignation was justified, he failed to appreciate the fact that the Kuomintang forces were more than paying for Lend-Lease assistance by tying up almost a million Japanese troops who might otherwise be used against MacArthur and Nimitz. Accordingly, Chiang not only resented Stilwell's attitude but felt he had been taken in by American communist propaganda, which labeled the Generalissimo a fascist and pictured Mao as an agrarian reformer, not a genuine communist. In the mistaken belief that the Chinese communist forces, if placed under his, Stilwell's, command, would obey his orders and wholeheartedly fight the Japanese, Chiang wrote, he assured me that the government could safely re-equip them on the same basis as the government forces and set them free from combat against the Japanese from where they were being held down by the government's blockade. Moreover, the government, he pointed out, could thus also release its forces immobilized on blockade duty for redeployment against the common enemy. Stilwell's subsequent disagreement with me was entirely brought about by the machinations of the communists and their fellow travelers. It almost caused the disruption of Sino-American military cooperation in the China-Burma theater of war. Chen Alt subscribed to this assessment as well as the allegation that Stilwell was spending too much time playing soldier in Burma, where he would disappear in the jungle for weeks, rifle in hand. By now the two American commanders were barely on speaking terms. A staunch advocate of ground warfare, Vinegar Joe thought Chen Alt's idea of fighting the war in China's skies was ridiculous. Wars were won on the ground. For months the two had been battling over supplies to 14th U.S. Air Force. In frustration, Chen Alt wrote personal letters to Roosevelt complaining he had not been given the tools promised him, nevertheless, his B-24s and fighters had provided the only bright spot in China with their effective raids on Japanese shipping and lines of communications. Like Stilwell, though to a lesser degree, Roosevelt was becoming impatient with the nationalists, and like Stilwell, he was primarily concerned with Burma. In early 1944 he urged Chiang and Stilwell to launch a major offensive across the Selween River into Burma. Chiang questioned the priority of such a campaign, he was far more worried about the Japanese in China. His reluctance drew stronger demands for action from Roosevelt, but still without result. The sudden thrust by Mutaguchi across the Indian border toward him flended the debate as far as Roosevelt was concerned. On April 3 he radioed Chiang an implied threat to cut off Lendli aid unless a Kuomintang army attacked down the Burma road in the near future. Dot to me the time is ripe for elements of your 71st army group to advance without further delay and seize the Tengshung Lungaling areas. A shell of a division opposes you on the Selween. Your advance to the west cannot help but succeed. To take advantage of just such an opportunity, we have, during the past year, been equipping and training your yoke force, the Yunnan divisions. If they are not to be used in the common cause our most strenuous and extensive efforts to FLY in equipment and to furnish in structural personnel have not been justified. Chiang Kai-shek did not formally reply to this message but within two weeks War Minister and Chief of Staff, General Ho Ying-chin, approved an assault across the Sailween. Chen Alt, 
who also served as chief of staff of the Chinese Air Force, saw a far greater threat in China itself. He warned Chiang that the Japanese were about to launch an offensive on American air bases lying southeast of the nationalist capital, Nanking. Under the circumstances, therefore, he wrote, it is necessary to inform your excellency that the combined air forces in China, excluding the VLR, B-29, project, may not be able to withstand the expected Japanese air offensive and will certainly be unable to afford air support to the Chinese ground forces over the areas and on the scale desired. In order to put the air forces on a footing to accomplish these missions, Drastic measures to provide them with adequate supplies and adequate strength must be taken. As the Japanese threat appears to be immediate, such measures should be taken without further delay. He sent a similar warning to Stilwell, who replied that the threat to him took precedence in the China Burma India theater and, therefore, Chen Alt's 14th Air Force must accept reductions in supplies, it would simply have to cut its operation. Chen Alt was infuriated. A week earlier he had written still well that he was convinced the security of China as a base for future military operations against Japan was at stake. Dot since the Japanese no longer have the men and material to spare for ice raids or training exercises, it seems to me that they must now mean business. The whole logic of their situation points to this conclusion. They must make ready for eventual abandonment of their more extended commitments in order to try to hold on an interior line. To do this they must somehow neutralize the allied China base on their flank and protect Formosa, the key to their inner defenses. The urgency of doing this has been immeasurably increased by the prospect of B-29 operations against Formosa and the Japanese islands, which alone would be sufficient to provoke a violent reaction. At the same time he made another personal appeal to Roosevelt, an attack in eastern China was imminent and he doubted it could be withstood. I wish I could tell you that I have no fear of the outcome. I expect the Chinese forces to make the strongest resistance they can. We shall do our best to give them, by means of air power, a margin over the Japanese. But owing to the concentration of our resources on fighting in Burma little has been done to strengthen the Chinese armies and for the same reason the 14th Air Force is still operating on a shoestring. If we were even a little stronger I should not be worried. Since men, equipment and supplies are still very short I can say to you that we will fight very hard. I am the more concerned since the shrewdest Chinese leaders I have consulted are convinced that any Japanese success within China will touch off violent new price rises and probably cause political unrest with inevitable effects on the energy of the Chinese resistance. I note a mood of discouragement among the more influential Chinese. Chen Alt's assessment of Japanese intentions were accurate. Tokyo had already ordered the commander of the China Expeditionary Army to occupy the eastern China airfields and the three important railroads in the area. The operation, named Akigo, was divided into two phases. The first would disperse the Chinese forces, particularly the nationalists, between the Yellow River and the Yangtze, and secure rail lines from Peking to Hankou. After that, 11 divisions with several others in reserve would cross the Yangtze and continue southwest, seizing first Changsha, and Hanyang in Hunan province, then Quilin, Luchao and Nanning in Kwangzai province. Capture of this last city would neutralize two important 14th Air Force fields. Ikigo was preceded by an intensive propaganda campaign aimed at alienating China from her Western allies and lowering the morale of the Kuomintang troops. Bales of pamphlets proclaimed that Japan's enemy was the American British force, not Chiang's army, and her objective was the establishment of a new China. If the Chinese offered no resistance they would be treated as friends. Japanese troops, moreover, were given strict orders to cease burning, looting and raping, they were to treat the local inhabitants with kindness and respect. The men were taught a new marching song. Taking loving care of trees and grass. The Japanese troops march through Hunan province. How kind their hearts are. Behold, the clouds there and rivers here. Appear just as they are in our homeland. 
these sights impress our soldiers' manly breasts. With worn shoes they plod onward. Blood streams onto the soil. Let us defend this forest and that mountain with our blood. Our enemies are Anglo-Americans, the white-faced demons. Ikigo began on the night of April 17th. The 37th Division crossed the Yellow River as Mutaguchi's men were investing Kihima. Yet, curiously, there was no coordination or cooperation between the two operations. That same day Stilwell told Chen Alt that his primary mission was the defense of the B-29 fields at Chengtu, even at the expense of shipping strikes and support of the Chinese ground forces. Chen Alt wanted to throw all his planes against the oncoming Japanese. Defending Chengtu, he radioed Stilwell, presented no immediate problem, since it lay west of Chongqing. Confronted with the imminent collapse of eastern China, Stilwell gave Chen Alt permission to use the P-47s assigned to the defense of Chengtu, and ordered B-24s of the 380th Bombardment Group to deliver fuel to the 14th Air Force. But the additional air support hardly slowed the Japanese advance. The Chinese armies in the area had deteriorated after almost four years of inactivity. Chen Alt saw his failure as a predictable result of Stilwell's policies, and reported to him that he had been handicapped by lack of tonnage for aviation supplies and a general disbelief in Japanese offensive plans. Suspecting that Chen Alt was preparing a case against him, Stilwell penned a long, bitter analysis of their old antagonism. Chen Alt has assured the Generalissimo that air power is the answer. He has told him that if the 14th of his supported, he can effectively prevent a Jap invasion. Now he realizes it can't be done, and he is trying to prepare an out for himself by claiming that with a little more, which we won't give him, he can still do it. He tries to duck the consequences of having sold the wrong bill of goods and put the blame on those who pointed out the danger long ago and tried to apply the remedy. He has failed to damage the Jap supply line. He has not caused any Jap withdrawals. On the contrary, our preparations have done exactly what I prophesied, that is, drawn a Jap reaction, which he now acknowledges the ground forces can't handle, even with the total air support he asked for and got. Unimpressed by the attack of 72,000 nationalist troops into Burma in mid-May, Stilwell officially continued his complaints against Chiang. He finally forced the issue in a radio to Marshall. CKS will squeeze out of US everything he can get to make US pay for the privilege of getting at Japan through China. He will do nothing to help unless forced into AIT. No matter how much we may blame any of the Chinese government agencies for obstruction, the ultimate responsibility rests squarely on the shoulders of the GMO. If he is what he claims to be, he must accept the responsibility. So with the Chinese the choice seems to be to get realistic and insist on a quid piaro quo, or else restrict our effort in China to maintaining what American aviation we can. The latter course allows CKS to Welsh on his agreements. IT also lays the ultimate burden of fighting the Jap army on the USA. I contend that ultimately the Jap army must be fought on the mainland of Asia. If you do not believe this, and think that Japan can be defeated by other means, then the proper course may well be to cut our effort here to the ATC and the maintenance of whatever air force you consider suitable in China. I request your decision. Is my mission changed, or shall I go ahead as before? Washington's answer jolted Stilwell, and made official a policy which had been brewing for some time. It had been decided, Marshall replied, that operations in China and Southeast Asia would be determined by the contribution they made to campaigns in the Central and Southwest Pacific. Japan should be defeated without undertaking a major campaign against her on the mainland on Asia if her defeat can be accomplished in this manner. Subsequent operations against the Japanese ground army in Asia should then be in the nature of mopping up operation. Henceforth China would be, primarily, an air base from which to bomb the Japanese mainland with B-29s. The idea for the superfortress had been inspired by fears in 1939 that England would be overwhelmed, 
and there would be no air bases in Europe to attack Germany. It was a monstrous plane, dwarfing the B-17. It was 99 feet long and almost 28 feet high, with a wingspan of more than 141 feet. But it was sleek, its skin flush riveted, and could cruise at more than 350 miles an hour at an altitude of 38,000 feet and carry four tons of bombs for 3,500 miles. From the beginning its builders had been plagued by engine trouble. An experimental model caught fire in the air, crashed and killed the entire crew. It wasn't until the summer of 1943 that the first production model took to the air, and this one, in fact, was full of bugs. The Marianas had been selected as the eventual base for mounting B-29 raids on Japan, but as long as these islands were in Japanese hands, Air Force planners decided to launch the first raids from China in spite of the formidable logistics problem. All fuel and supplies had to be hauled by air from India over the hump, the Himalayas, to the four airfields in Chengtu which were still under construction. Moreover, the 4,000 mile round trip from Chengtu to Tokyo reduced the bomb load capacity. The B-29s were given their first test in combat before leaving India. It was a relatively short mission, but it dramatized the operational difficulties which beset the new bomber. On June 5, 1944, 98 superfortresses took off to bomb Bangkok. One crashed immediately, 14 aborted and several others never reached the target. The remainder approached Bangkok in ragged formation. Two planes crashed on the way home, two ditched into the Bay of Bengal and 42 landed at the wrong bases. But the mission was deemed an operational success, the B-29s were ready for Japan. On June 15, 92 superfortresses left for Chengtu, where they would refuel before the final long leg to Japan. 79 of the planes reached the staging area, but only 68 got back into the air that afternoon. Of those, one crashed on takeoff and four others turned back because of mechanical failure. The first B-29 reached the target, the Imperial Iron and Steel Works at Iwata on the island of Kyushu. Just before midnight, Chinese time. Flak was heavy and several fighters came up to intercept. But of the bombers that made it to Yawata, only six were lightly damaged. The bombing itself was a failure, a single missile hit the Imperial works, but the effect on the Japanese was indelible. The war had at last reached the homeland. In eastern China, Japanese troops were at the gates of Changsha. The fall of this great city three days later created panic in Chongqing. The war ministry ordered the execution of several field commanders. Two Japanese divisions, the 116th and 68th, were already driving down toward Hanyan, a hundred miles farther south. They seized an adjoining airfield on June 26, and two days later assailed the walled city itself. Surrender was expected momentarily when Major General Fong Xian Chue, commander of the Chinese Tenth Army, confounded the Japanese and surprised the Americans by making a determined stand. His troops, supported by Chen Alt's fighters and bombers, which made hazardous night attacks on enemy supply convoys, flung back the Japanese day after day. Low on food and ammunition, the invaders withdrew within a fortnight. At Quilin, which would have been the city next in the path of the Japanese drive, victory celebrations lasted for a week, its streets sacred from the interminable explosions of firecrackers. Merchants inundated American airmen at the Quillin base with ivory, jade, silk and lacquerware. The Japanese were soon back in force, however, with 40,000 fresh troops. General Fong resumed his dog defense of Hanyan, but Chiang Kai-shek no longer supported him. For some reason he distrusted Fong's superior, Marshal Xu Yu. The Generalissimo ordered suspension of all Chinese and American supplies to the besieged city. Chen Ol turned to an old antagonist for help. He radioed Stilwell a request for permission to fly guns and ammunition to Fong. Stilwell's headquarters replied noncommittally that the proposition was being given best treatment in this shop, but took no action. Chen Alt sent another request, for 500 tons. 
this time the answer was definite. In view location Suyo's forces, his mission, rapidly changing situation, Chinese misuse of equipment they have an improper employment of their forces, your proposal to FLY 500 tons of small ARMS and ammunition would be waste of effort. Entire American effort should be continued from the air. Several weeks later Hen Yang fell. But Chen Alt's 14th Air Force continued attacking the Japanese supply lines and forced the enemy to postpone their assault on Quilin for a month. If China, whose role in the war had been diminished, collapsed, it would release 820,000 Japanese troops. Consequently, Roosevelt dispatched a personal representative to Chongqing with orders to keep China in the war by unifying all Chinese military forces, including those of the communists, against Japan. He selected a civilian, elevated to the rank of Major General, Patrick J. Hurley, a successful corporation lawyer who had been Secretary of War under President Herbert Hoover. He was hearty and affable, and had won Roosevelt's confidence by the way he had carried out wartime diplomatic missions to Russia and the Middle East. Hurley was en route to China, via Moscow, when V. M. Molotov, Commissar of Foreign Affairs, told him that Russia wanted to be friends with nationalist China. Hadn't he, Molotov, personally brought about the release of Chiang after the young marshal kidnapped him in 1936? How could China blame Russia for her own internal dissension? The Soviet Union had no interest in the Chinese communists, they were communists in name only. America should try to help the Chinese people improve their economy, and to unify Mao's and Chiang's armies. Hurley, who saw life in simplistic terms, took almost everything Molotov said at face value. In Chongqing he told the Generalissimo that he needn't worry about the Chinese communists being controlled from Russia. Wasn't it obvious that they weren't really communists at all? Chiang was unconvinced, he had read Mao's articles and speeches. Nor could Hurley persuade Chiang to place Stillwell in command of all Chinese armed forces, as Marshall had so long been demanding. On September 25 the Generalissimo sent Hurley an aid memo stating that his recent experiences had clearly shown him that General Stillwell was unfitted for the vast, complex and delicate duties which the new command will entail. Almost from the moment of his arrival in China, he showed his disregard for that mutual confidence and respect which are essential to the successful collaboration of Allied forces. Last October, I intended to ask for his recall. But when General Stillwell solemnly promised that in the future he would unreservedly obey my orders and would give me no further cause for disappointment, I withdrew my request. Unhappily, General Stillwell's solemn promise has never been implemented. Chiang promised to support any qualified replacement. Stillwell radioed Marshall that the aid memo I air was a tissue of false statements and that Chiang had no intention of instituting any real democratic reforms or of forming a united front with the communists. Marshall forwarded this rejoinder to Roosevelt, whose disenchantment with the Generalissimo was evident in the reply he sent to King on October 5. The ground situation in China has so deteriorated since my original proposal that I now am inclined to feel that the United States government should not assume the responsibility involved in placing an American officer in command of your ground forces throughout China. Chiang, in turn, tried to blame Stillwell, and Roosevelt indirectly, for the collapse in eastern China. In another aid memo to Hurley, he charged that the disaster had been occasioned by Stillwell's insistence on an offensive in northern Burma. Dot as I had feared. The Japanese took advantage of the opportunity thus offered to launch an offensive within China attacking first in Honan and then in Hunan. Owing to the Burma campaign, no adequately trained and equipped reinforcements were available for these war areas. The forces brought to bear by the Japanese in their offensive in East China were six times as great as those confronting General Stillwell in North Burma and the consequences of defeat were certain to outweigh in China all results of victory in the North Burma campaign. Yet General Stillwell exhibited complete indifference to the outcome in East China, 
so much so that in the critical days of the East China operations, he consistently refused to release lend-lease munitions already available in Yunnan for use in the East China fighting. In short, we have taken Mayatkeina, Burma, but we have lost almost all East China, and in this general Stillwell cannot be absolved of grave responsibility. He took issue with the president's derogatory refusal to appoint an American commander of Chinese forces. I am wholly confident that if the president replaces General Stillwell with a qualified American officer, we can work together to reverse the present trend and achieve a vital contribution to the final victory. Hurley had hoped he would conciliate Stillwell and Chiang, but now he was certain that this was impossible and that Stillwell must leave China. He radioed Roosevelt. Dot my opinion is that if you sustain Stillwell in this controversy, you will lose Chiang Kai-shek and possibly you will lose China with him. For a week the fate of the China Burma India theater hung in the balance as both Stillwell and Hurley bombarded Washington with conflicting advice. Finally, on October 18, two days before MacArthur landed at late, Roosevelt radioed Chiang that he was recalling Stillwell but would not appoint an American to command the Chinese forces. He did promise to send Major General Albert C. Wedemeyer, to be the Generalissimo's new Chief of Staff and to command all U.S. forces in China. With Stillwell gone, the affable Hurley could devote his full attention to the unique problem of uniting Mao and Chiang. On November 7, against the advice of Chiang, whom he called Mr. Shik, he flew to the communist capital of Yenan, where his idea was already being promoted. Every American official and visiting journalist had been assured by communist spokesmen that what China needed was a coalition government based on democratic principles. The mustachioed Hurley arrived, chest-loaded with medals, impressing the onlookers with his flowing mane of white hair and ramrod carriage. In a booming voice he lectured Mao Zedong, he pronounced it Mu Stung, Chuen Lei and their aides on five points of possible accord with the Kuomintang. The communists were startled by his manner, but responded with nods and smiles. That evening at an elaborate banquet he astounded his sedate hosts. After toasts to Stalin, Roosevelt and Churchill, he stood up and let loose a wild Indian war whoop. John K. Emerson and other foreign service experts tried to explain that it was just a quaint old American custom signifying good wishes to all. Whatever the communists thought, they accepted Hurley's statement with minor revisions. The five points called for unification of all military forces in China for the immediate defeat of Japan and the reconstruction of China. The Chongqing government was to be reorganized into a coalition national government embracing representatives of all anti-Japanese parties and non-partisan political bodies. A new democratic policy providing for reform in military, political, economic and cultural affairs shall be promulgated and made effective. The coalition regime would support the principles of Sun Yat-sen and set up a government of the people, for the people and by the people, which would establish justice, freedom of conscience, freedom of press, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly and association, the right to petition the government for the redress of grievances, the right of writ of habeas corpus and the right of residence. There was nothing in the document that any admirer of the Declaration of Independence would not have approved, including two additional phrases, borrowed from President Roosevelt, freedom from fear and freedom from want. Hurley, now known as Little Whiskers to the Communists, flew back to Tonking with Chuen Lei, imagining that his mission was accomplished. How could anybody possibly object to such innocuous and noble sentiments? Molotov was right. The Chinese Reds were ersatz communists, the Russians would never have reconciled such liberal policies with their own authoritarian practices. Hong King greeted the document with derision, and its sponsor with a new nickname, the Second Big Wind. The communists have sold you a bill of goods, TV soon said to Hurley. Never will the national government grant the communist request. Soon knew his brother-in-law. Chiang told Hurley that the agreement would lead to communist domination of the coalition government. Nor could he accept Hurley's assurance that America would guarantee his position as president and generalissimo. 
the coalition would be regarded by the Chinese as total defeat for the Kuomintang. Hurley persisted in his belief that the most divergent views could be brought together by goodwill and persuaded the Tung King leaders to draw up a counter-proposal. This stipulated that communist forces be accepted into the nationalist army and that the communist party be legalized. Mao, however, was to turn over control of his troops to the National Military Council. It subscribed to Sun Yat-sen's principles and guaranteed the various freedoms and civil liberties, subject only to the specific needs of security in the effective prosecution of the war against Japan. Hurley passed along this proposal to Yenon, hoping it might be acceptable. It was not. Chu Enlai felt betrayed and replied that the communists could find no common basis in Chiang's proposition, the Yenin government would have to be accepted as an equal in a genuine coalition government. On October 31 General Werimaya arrived to replace the controversial Stilwell. The strategic situation in the Pacific had altered with the crushing American naval victories off late, and with the possibility that Stalin would send 60 divisions against Japan three months after Germany was defeated. But it was still important to keep Chiang's armies in the field so they could continue to tie up masses of Japanese troops. Wedimaya radioed marshaled that the military situation was worsening, Kulin and its airfield would soon be lost, and Kunming, the capital of Yunnan province, would undoubtedly be the next target. There had been some changes in the Japanese command as well. In September, General Yasuji Okamura took over the China Expeditionary Army, and although his command was vast, he took personal charge of the 6th Area Army, which was in the midst of Operation Aki. Its aim, however, was by no means as ambitious as Wedimaya feared. Tokyo had no intention of driving as far west as Tongking. The acquisition of more Chinese territory held no attraction, the eastern China air bases did. Their seizure would prevent long-range bombing raids on the last outposts in the Pacific and the homeland. Quillen and Luchao fell. Almost alone Chen Alt put up effective resistance with his B-25s and fighters. To do so, he did not hesitate to use any means to divert supplies from the B-29 project which he derided as the last chance of the bomber radicals to prove the duet theory of unescorted, high-altitude bombing. The results of the B-29 raid seemed to bear out Chen Alt's belief that it was a grandiose and foolish concept. After the first disappointing attack on Japan, the big bombers hit Kyushu four more times, as well as Manchuria and Palembang on Sumatra. Each raid was as ineffective as the first. Replacement of the commander of the China B-29s by Major General Curtis LeMay, an aggressive, resourceful leader whose 3rd Bombardment Division had performed brilliantly against Germany, made little difference. He found he had inherited an utterly impossible situation in China as well as the buggiest damn airplane that ever came down the pike. He set up a new maintenance system, tried to teach the crews to bomb in formation, as the B-17s had done in Europe. Despite his vigorous efforts, a series of raids on Manchuria, Formosa, Rangoon, Singapore and Kyushu accomplished so little that he himself was forced to admit that his super fortresses had not yet made much of a splash in the war. 3. In the Marianas the B-29 program was also experiencing difficulties. Beset by tropical downpours that made Sayapan roads impassable. Engineers had not yet completed the first 8,500-foot strip at Ily, formerly Aslito, field when the first B-29, Jolgen Josie the Pacific Pioneer, piloted by Brigadier General Haywood, Possum, Hansel, touched down on October 12, 1944. The thrill that went through all was almost electric in effect as the great plane rolled to a halt, one witness reported. According to Brief, the magazine for AF personnel in the Pacific, the war just about stopped dead in its tracks the day Jolton Josie arrived. The first of the B-29s had been inspected by every big gear and ogled from afar by every small fry for 5,000 miles. She was a sensation. A few days later Brigadier General Emmett, Rosie, O'Donnell, 
a B-17 veteran of the first frustrating days of war in the Philippines, arrived to open the 73rd Bombardment Wing headquarters and set up intensive unit training. After half a dozen missions over Truk and Iwo Jima, the tiny volcanic island almost halfway to Tokyo, O'Donnell's flyers were ready to strike at the Japanese capital. The plan was an open secret, and on the morning of November 17 hundreds of vehicles converged on Eiley Field. Twenty-four war correspondents and an array of still photographers and newsreel cameramen were on hand. As Rosie O'Donnell climbed into his B-29, dozens of flashbulbs exploded. But rain that persisted for days forced postponements until the morning of November 24. At 6.15 the first plane, Dauntless Dotty, with O'Donnell at the controls, rumbled and roared down the long runway. The wheels of the silver plane hugged the black top to its end, and onto the short coral extension. At the last moment Dauntless Dotty heaved up, just skimming the sea, and made a slow turn toward Tokyo. There were 110 B-29s behind her. En route, 17 were forced back. An undercast almost obscured the target, the Nakajima airplane engine plant at Musashino 10 miles northwest of the Imperial Palace, and as the unescorted planes, swept by a 120 knot tailwind, roared over at about 445 miles an hour, they unloaded their bombs at altitudes of from 27,000 to 32,000 feet. Only 48 bombs, including three duds, hit the plant complex, causing slight damage, the rest blasted dock and crowded urban areas. More than a hundred assorted fighters came up to intercept the super fortresses, one bomber was knocked down, and that by a damaged Zero whose pilot deliberately rammed into its tail. Three days later the 73rd wing returned. This time the engine plant was completely hidden by clouds, and the 62 B-29s had to go after secondary targets. Unsuccessful as these first two strikes were, they chilled Imperial headquarters as well as the public. Important factories would not always be protected by a cloud cover, and there seemed to be no effective defense against the B-29. Already the foundations of Japan's basic industry had been undermined by persistent American submarine and air attacks on shipping. There was little crude oil for the refineries, no coke or ore for the steel mills, and the munitions plants were short of steel and aluminium. The economy could not endure continued B-29 attacks. They would somehow have to be contained. Until such time, emergency measures would have to be taken to protect a ship which had become a source of pride and a symbol of help to the entire nation. Combined fleet ordered Shinano, sister ship of the super battleships Yamato and Musashi, to flee Tokyo Bay for the relative safety of the inland sea. She had been converted into the world's largest carrier, and many Navy Yard workmen were still aboard the recently launched 68,000 ton ship. Driven by 200,000 hour dot p. turbines, she hurriedly got underway in the late afternoon on November 28, and steamed south with her untrained crew, escorted by three destroyers. An armored flight deck, an island, and hangar and storage spaces had been grafted onto the basic structure. Shinano was a seagoing armadillo, encircled at the waterline by an 8-inch main belt of armor, Great armored bulges below the waterline reduced the effectiveness of any torpedo hit. Deadly fumes could not be drawn through the ventilating system, as they had on Taiho. Fire hazard had been further reduced by the elimination of wooden structures, the use of a special fire resistant paint, and the installation of a revolutionary foam extinguisher system. To fend off air attacks, there were 16 5 inch high angle guns, as well as 140 24 mm anti-aircraft machine guns and a dozen multiple rocket launchers. Theoretically, Shinano was the most impregnable carrier ever launched, but there were naval engineers who privately regarded her as an ill-conceived and too hastily constructed monstrosity which was neither battleship nor carrier. A hundred miles south of Tokyo the American submarine Archerfish was looking for a target. Her primary mission was to rescue crews of B-29s forced to ditch in the area, 
but the day's airstrike had been scrubbed and Archerfish was free to leave her assigned station. The most likely hunting ground, decided Skipper Joseph F. and Wright, was off Tokyo Bay. At 8.48 p.m., radar detected a target to the north. Through binoculars in Wright made out in the moonlight a long, low shape nine miles away. It looked like a tanker. Archerfish headed toward the target to make a surface attack from the starboard beam. As they drew closer, Enright identified it as a carrier with three escorts, he decided to try to get ahead of the flat-top, submerge and attack. He ordered course reversed and maximum speed from the four big 16-cylinder engines. Shinano was making 18 knots, the same as Archerfish, but zigzagging reduced her speed enough for the stalker to move up slowly. At midnight, however, Shinano picked up speed and the submarine gradually fell behind. Three hours later the carrier abruptly swung around directly toward Archerfish. Enright waited for a few minutes to make sure it was in fact a base course change. He ordered the bridge cleared and the diving alarm sounded. Archerfish slipped beneath the waves. Up periscope, Enright ordered. He grasped the handles and stared ahead. I see him, he finally said. He asked the distance to the track. 550 yards was the almost instantaneous answer from the executive, Bobo Bobchsinski. Left full rudder. Left to course 090. In right ask plot how much time. He'll be here in two minutes. En right spun the periscope to scan the area. Down scope. He called. Escort passing overhead. The periscope lowered just in time to avoid a destroyer churning above them. Enright raised the periscope again on the bearing generated by the fire control computer. It was perfect, right on the mark. At 3.17 am Enright said fire. The range was 1,400 yards, just forward of the carrier's beam. At 8 second intervals six torpedoes headed toward the target running hot, straight, and normal. Enright watched the first two fish hit, then swung the periscope around to check destroyers. They were converging on archer fish. Take her down, he said. Lookouts on Shinano stared helplessly as these two torpedoes, and two more, ripped into the big carrier. Captain Toshio Abe was not alarmed. Four hits were nothing, Musashi, basically of the same design had taken 19 torpedoes and many bombs before going down. He ordered the ship continued on course at 18 knots. Musashi had indeed taken far more damage, but her veteran crew was responsible for her extended survival. Abe's inexperienced damage control teams, hampered by the rough seas, could not stop the flow of water. Some of the compartments, moreover, lacked watertight doors. Abe could have grounded the ship or made it into port, but he held course and speed throughout the night. By dawn it was apparent even to those with blind faith in Shinano that she was mortally wounded. Abe reduced speed but it was too late. At 10.18 am, November 29, with the huge carrier listing sharply, Abe gave the order to abandon ship. Half an hour later, without having fired a gun or launched a plane, Shinano sank with a deafening rumble, taking with her Abe and 500 shipmates. The following week Japan's constant natural nemesis, the earthquake, struck the Nagoya area on Honshu Island. Its massive tremors left a long section of the rail bed in ruin, crippled a number of munitions plants and obliterated a factory in Toyohashi producing precision instruments. At the same time destruction from the air increased in effectiveness. In December, B-29s from Saipan bombed the Mitsubishi aircraft engine works at Nagoya three times with such accuracy that the Japanese were forced to start moving equipment to underground sites. 4. On January 9, 1945, the same day Super Fortresses returned to Tokyo for the sixth time, and for the sixth time were ineffectual, General Kruger's Sixth Army invaded Luzon. They landed at Lingayen Gulf on the same beaches that Homer had stormed little more than three years earlier. They were expected, 
but there was almost no opposition and it was obvious by nightfall that General Yamashita had no intention of seriously contesting the landing. There was some concern on the part of American intelligence and operations officers that they were being drawn into a trap, but January 10th also proved to be an easy day and by dusk advance units had pushed eight miles inland. Within a week 14 corps on the right had advanced 30 miles, losing 30 men. On the left, I corps was making almost as good progress at the cost of 220 American casualties. That night Yamashita finally launched a counter-attack, a one-division operation designed to give him time to withdraw supplies and men to the north. He would give up the entire Central Plains Manila Bay area and make his stand in the rugged mountains of North Luzon, where the terrain would give the defenders the advantage. It would be a battle of attrition, far from the decisive battle proclaimed so often. The Japanese people, however, were told that the enemy had been lured into just such a battle on Luzon. But the reality of the situation was impossible to ignore completely and on January 21 Prime Minister Koizo was obliged to make a rare admission to the Diet. He acknowledged that the military developments in the Pacific Theater are in a state which does not necessarily admit of optimism. However, the greatly extended supply lines of the enemy on all fronts are exposed to our attacks and in this fact, I believe, is to be found our golden opportunity to grasp victory. Now indeed is the time for us, the 100 million to give vent to our flaming ardor, and following in the footsteps of the valiant men of the Special Attack Corps, demonstrate even more spirit of sure victory in the field of production. Imperial headquarters was still intent on transporting prisoners of war from the Philippines to the homeland despite the sinking of two prison ships. Dr. Bodine, Major Virgil McCullum and the other survivors of Oyokumaru were at sea again en route to Japan. They had left Lingay in Gulf just after Christmas in two groups, a thousand one a large freighter, in Aramaru, and 236, including Bodine, on a smaller ship, Brazil Maru. Major McCullum was aboard the bigger ship, 16 prisoners died in the crowded holds on the way to Takao, Formosa, the first leg of the trip to Japan. For days the two ships remained in the harbor. It was getting cold. The threadbare parts of summer uniforms worn during the swim from the sinking or yokumaru, or thin cotton shirts and trousers issued to many who had reached shore naked, gave little protection. After a week of seemingly endless misery the men from the smaller ship were loaded onto inner Amaru. McCullum and Bodine were in the aft hold with more than 700 others. It was 70 feet wide, 90 feet long. Halfway up one side of the vast chamber stretched a balcony. Here the Americans segregated their sick. Urine and feces dripped down from the balcony onto those below. There was little food and almost no water. The death rate rose to over ten a day. On January 9, as General Kruger's troops came ashore at Lingayen Gulf, the prisoners heard the roar of American bombers sweeping in low. A deafening explosion rocked the ship. Bodine saw sparks fly as fragments burst through the hold. His left arm burned and he knew he was hit. He hunkered down as low as he could. At least fifteen were killed by the blast, and scores wounded. In the forward hold, Marine Colonel Beecher was putting a spoon of rice to his mouth when slugs of metal whistled past him, burying themselves into a nearby stanchion. Heavy wooden hatch covers and steel beams cascaded onto the prisoners. Holes miraculously appeared in the side of the ship, it was like a sieve. Dazed, Beecher shook himself. He felt nothing, then remembered from World War I that one felt no pain at the moment of being wounded. But how could he not be hit? The dead were everywhere. One corner was piled with bodies, mangled and bloody. The carnage was indescribable. More than half of the 500 men in the hold were killed outright. For the wounded, Shrieking in pain, there was no medicine, no dressings. Nor was there any answer from topside to pleas for help. In the darkness, panic and hysteria gripped the survivors. Three of the eight field officers were dead, crushed by a single beam. Van, you and me were not worth living, one officer remarked to Major Van Oersen, 
but Bob Roberts got killed. He had so much to live for and so much to do. For two days, with little water or food, and no medical assistance, the survivors existed in a hell none would ever forget. It was like a scene from Dante's Inferno as wraith-like figures wander dazed in the dark, stinking hull among the piles of corpses. It was not uncommon to find a man sitting on the body as he ate his pitiful meal. Finally a small Japanese medical party descended into the holds. They treated the minor cases but ignored the seriously wounded, who were dying like flies. The dead were removed, some 500 of them, and barged ashore for cremation. On the afternoon of January 13 the prisoners were transferred to Brazil Maru. It sailed at dawn, and the next two weeks seemed to McCullum an eternity of horror. The once-a-day ration barely kept the prisoners alive, if they were lucky, four men got a level mess kit of rice, and six men shared a canteen cup of water. The winter cold, as they proceeded north, added to their misery. They tried to keep warm by lying down spoon fashion under straw mats, hugging each other for BTUs to keep alive. When the position became too painful a man would yell shift, and the group rolled simultaneously to the other hip. Sometimes a neighbor would not turn, he was dead. Snow fell through the open hatches, and scores of men who had survived wounds, dysentery and starvation froze to death. Sometimes life could be bought from the guards, a West Point class ring would bring an empty rice sack as a blanket, but death was becoming commonplace. When the shout roll out you're dead, went up in the morning, often thirty or more bodies were collected. The victims all looked alike, macabre mannequins with teeth. Oki chopped it up with his dagger, boiled the parts in his hango until they were white. Kamiko found its taste a cross between fish and chicken. He finished full of vigor, almost as if he had been injected with adrenaline. At noon Yasuda ordered Kamiko's squad to ascend a strategic knob a hundred yards to the right and relieve the squad holding it. The knob dominated the area and was constantly under fire. Its capture would compromise the regimental position. All through the afternoon the third squad kept the enemy at a distance, but the next morning the Americans pressed in close enough to lob grenades. At the height of the attack, the grenade barrage inexplicably stopped. It was so quiet that Kamiko could hear birds singing, then a strange noise like a blowtorch. A cloud of thick black smoke boiled up in front of him. Flamethrower! He shouted. He began heaving grenades as far and as fast as possible. At last the flame extinguished. He flopped back exhausted, puzzled about the American withdrawal. A shell landed yards ahead but did not detonate, it buried itself deep into the ground. Kamiko thought it was a dud until the earth erupted in front of him like a volcano. It was the most terrifying thing he had ever experienced, it shattered him as had the earthquake of 1923. He turned to Oki, his face pale. They're using some new weapon. It was actually a delayed fuse, the earth rumbled time and again, throwing up tons of dirt. To the left, where two men had been hiding in their Takatsubo, there was now only level ground with three legs protruding. Kamiko felt a hot sting on his arm, then on the foot. They were minor wounds, the only wounds he had suffered in seven full days of suicidal combat. Under protest he was sent to the rear. His regiment, reduced to less than 400 men, had disintegrated against relentless American pressure. On November 23rd, GIs of the 128th Infantry Regiment of the 32nd Division broke through the mountain barrier and into Lyman. The Battle of Breakneck Ridge was over. Little remained but pockets of resistance. Two days later General Katoku ordered the remnants of GEM Division to regroup below Lyman Ear Highway 2. Kamiko and Oki hobbled south along the highway. They came to a ravine that stank of death. Thousands of swollen, decomposed bodies were scattered all over the road and in both ditches. At first glance the bodies looked as if they were being attacked by snakes, they were tubes from gas masks. This was Death Valley. Here, with deadly accuracy, American artillery had caught Japanese troops moving up to the front. 
they struck off into the jungle east of the highway. At every stream they found clusters of wounded men lying like corpses, their will to live gone. Kamiko and Oki pushed on but were obsessed by thoughts of suicide. They met seven other stragglers, led by a Sergeant Hirano, and learned that the Americans had driven a wedge below Breakneck Ridge almost to Highway 2. They would have to fight through the enemy line to rejoin their division. Hunger drove them to raid the first American position they came upon. They fled, arms loaded with GI rations, chased by a volley of rifle fire. What a difference a little food makes. Kamiko thought as he finished a piece of chocolate. They could tolerate their wounds but the lack of food had sapped their morale. If we could eat as much as the Americans, we'd still be up on the ridge fighting, he mused. Victory in battle was simply a case of supply. How could Japan win against such a rich and powerful foe? They found an American supply parachute and were themselves almost discovered by a column of Negro soldiers carrying boxes. As Kamiko raised his rifle, he was checked by Hirano, who jerked his head. Another column was coming. How black they are! Kamiko whispered, he had never before seen a Negro. We're all human beings, but I wonder why they're so different. I wonder if they think like Americans? They're Americans too, said Hirano. They worked their way over a mountain, force marched all night through a chilling rain, by morning they approached Highway 2, directly behind the enemy front. Kamika halted the little group. He assured them they would break through. They had food and the Japanese soldier could not be beaten at hand-to-hand -hand combat. If you have the bad luck to get shot, commit suicide like a man. They started down toward the highway. 24. Debacle. 1. Organized resistance on late was at the point of collapse but Yamashita in Manila directed General Sozaku Suzuki to concentrate his remaining striking power into a desperation attack, Operation War, on American airfields. These nearly established bases were a threat to the entire Philippines as well as the supple route between the homeland and the south. Java, Malaya, Sumatra and Borneo. There were three major forces on the island. Gem Division had lost more than three quarters of its effectives and at best could only delay the American advance down Highway 2. Makino's 16th Division, after being pushed across the coastal plain, was splintered. Some units were holding ground in the mountains west of Dagami but the rest were scattered deep inland with the search of food their main occupation, they had been subsisting on raw insects, snails, frogs, lizards, centipedes, roots, grass, and their own sweaty belts. The third force, the 26th Division, would have to provide the main thrust of Operation War. Already the division, except for a battalion detached to protect Tormok, was moving across the mountain range below Lyman in a general attack toward Lake Gulf. Suzuki ordered them to keep moving southeast, and together with the remnants of the 16th and paratroopers flown in from Luzon, attack three airfields near Brun, a strategic village ten miles west of Delag, at dawn on December 6. The hastily conceived plan was compromised from the beginning. First the men of the 26th Division found it difficult to maintain the time schedule set up by Manila, Suzuki asked for a delay of two days, which was denied. Then the operation itself was vitiated by a breakdown in communications. On December 3 meteorologists predicted an inclement weather front and Suzuki was ordered to postpone the attack for one day. But the message never reached the survivors of the 16th Division who descended on the airstrip a mile above Burren as scheduled, just after dawn on December 6. There were now only 300 of them, their meager force having been further reduced by desertions. They came upon a group of sleeping American engineers bivouacked in the open, and began bayonetting them. The relationship between the President and Churchill remained close, intimate as between two brothers and with the mixed feelings of brothers. Roosevelt had risked his political future to send Lend-Lease aid to Churchill in 1940 when Britain was in mortal peril, but continued to lecture his senior on the immorality of colonialism. 
I believe you are trying to do away with the British Empire, Churchill once told him in private. Of this there was no doubt. The colonial system means war, Roosevelt had confided to his son Elliot. Exploit the resources of an India, a Burma, a Java, take all the wealth out of those countries, but never put anything back into them, things like education, decent standard of living, minimum health requirements, all you're doing is negating the value of a kind of organizational structure for peace before it begins. On February 8 the American chiefs of staff were at last to take up their main concern, the war in the Pacific. They met with the Soviet chiefs of staff at Prince Yusupov's palace, where Rasputin was assassinated, to settle military problems in the Far East and in particular to determine what steps Russia should take once war with Japan was declared. Six miles away at Livadia Palace, Roosevelt's headquarters, the president was cautiously approaching the same question with Stalin in the presence of Foreign Commissar Molotov, Avril Harriman and two interpreters. Levadia, built in Italian Renaissance style during Tsar Nicholas' reign, was an imposing structure of honey-colored plaster trimmed with white marble. It stood more than 150 feet above the Black Sea, looking out on both water and precipitous mountains. Roosevelt remarked that he favored intensive bombing of Japan by B-29s, thus obviating actual invasion of the homeland. Stalin interrupted him. I'd like to discuss, he said without preamble, the political conditions under which the USSR would enter the war against Japan. Roosevelt had a ready answer. There would be no difficulty, he said, regarding Russia's getting the southern half of Sakhalin Island and the Ural Islands as a quid pro quo. As for giving the Soviets a warm water port in the Far East, what about leasing Dern from the Chinese or making it a free port? Stalin was non-committal. Instead he asked for something more, use of the Manchurian railways. Roosevelt could see no harm in that, and suggested that they be leased under Russian operation or under a joint Russian-Chinese commission. This satisfied Stalin but he said a bit threateningly, if these conditions are not met, it would be difficult for me and Molotov to explain to the Soviet people why Russia was entering a war against Japan, a country with which they had no great trouble. I haven't had an opportunity to talk to Marshal Chiang Kai-shek, said Roosevelt. One of the difficulties in speaking with the Chinese is that anything said to them is broadcast to the world in 24 hours. Stalin agreed that it wasn't yet necessary to speak to the Chinese. Regarding the question of a warm water port, we won't be difficult, I won't object to an internationalized free port. They began a candid discussion of China's internal problems. America, said Roosevelt, had been attempting to keep China alive. China will remain alive, Stalin remarked with a little smile but he thought it strange that the Kuomintang and communists could not maintain a united front against the Japanese. Roosevelt replied that Wedemeyer and Hurley were making better progress than their predecessors in uniting Chongqing and Yenon. The blame for the breach lay more with the Kuomintang and Chongqing than with the so-called communists. The talk switched to Korea and Roosevelt confidentially remarked that although he personally felt it wasn't necessary to invite the British to take part in the trusteeship of that country, they might resent not being asked. They most certainly would be offended, said Stalin with his feral grin. In fact, the Prime Minister might kill us. Then to everyone's surprise he said agreeably, I think the British should be invited. The next morning at eleven o'clock the combined chiefs discussed their final military report, agreeing that for planning purposes the earliest date to expect the defeat of Germany was July 1, 1945, and the latest, December 31, 1945. The fall of Japan was set at 18 months after the collapse of Germany. That afternoon Roosevelt, Stalin, Churchill and their principal advisers assembled in the courtyard of Livadia Palace to be photographed. As soon as they returned to the ballroom, the site of all the plenary meetings, the new Secretary of State, Edward Stettinius, Jr., began reading the plan the three foreign ministers had drawn up that morning for dealing with territorial trusteeships in the United Nations. Before he could finish, 
Churchill testily cried out that he hadn't agreed to a single word of the report. I have not been consulted nor heard the subject until now. He was so agitated that his horn-rimmed glasses slipped to the end of his nose. Under no circumstances will I ever consent to the fumbling fingers of forty or fifty nations prying into the life's existence of the British Empire. As long as I am Prime Minister I shall never yield a scrap of Britain's heritage. The following afternoon, February 10, Ambassador Harriman met Molotov at Usabov Palace. The American ambassador was handed an English translation of the USSR's political conditions for going to war with Japan, the status quo was to be preserved in Outer Mongolia, and territory seized by Japan after the war in 1904-5, principally the southern part of Sakhalin Island, Port Arthur and Dairn, must be returned. Stalin also demanded control of the Manchurian railways and the Kuril Islands. In return Russia, besides declaring war on Japan, would conclude a pact of friendship and alliance with Chiang. Harriman thought there were three amendments the president would wish to make before accepting. Den and Port Arthur would have to be free port, and the Manchurian railways operated by a joint Sino-Soviet commission. In addition, I feel sure that the president wouldn't wish to dispose of these two matters in which China is interested, without concurrence of Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek. At Levadia, Harriman showed Roosevelt the draft of Stalin's proposal together with the amendments he himself had brought up. Assured he was acting in the best interests of America, the president approved the amendments, and asked the ambassador to resubmit them to Molotov. The warm relationship between Stalin and Roosevelt, begun at Tehran, continued at Yalta until that afternoon when Churchill announced he had been practically instructed by his government not to mention figures in the matter of reparations, and Roosevelt said he too was afraid the mention of a specific amount, Stalin had brought up the figure of $20 billion, with half going to Russia, would make many Americans think of reparations solely in terms of dollars and cents. It seemed to Stalin that Roosevelt was ganging up with Churchill against him, and he became visibly angry. Though the matter was hastily smoothed over, Stalin was apparently so concerned by his own flair of hostility that he took Harriman aside as soon as they recessed for tea to tell him that he was prepared to meet the president halfway on the agreement to join the war against Japan. I'm entirely willing to have Dan a free port under international control, he said but Port Arthur is different. It's to be a Russian naval base and therefore Russia requires a lease. Why don't you discuss this matter at once with the president? Harriman suggested, and before long Stalin and Roosevelt were huddled together conferring in hushed voices, their brief rift healed. They reached complete agreement. The only question now was how and when to tell Chiang of the accord. The president wondered if Stalin wished to take up these matters with TV soon in Moscow or if he would rather that he, Roosevelt, take them up directly with the Generalissimo. I am an interested party, said Stalin. It would be better if the president did it. When should the subject be discussed with the Generalissimo? Asked Roosevelt, sensitive to the problem of secrecy. I'll let you know when I'm prepared to have this done, said Stalin who wanted to have 25 more divisions in the Far East before informing Chiang Kai-shek. At that point Churchill joined them and they did not continue the discussion. The Prime Minister did not learn of the agreement until the next morning. He was about to sign it when Eden, who was appalled by what he had just read, stopped him. In the presence of Stalin and Roosevelt the Foreign Secretary branded the agreement a discreditable by-product of the conference. Churchill rebuffed him. British prestige in the Orient would suffer if he followed Eden's advice. He defiantly added his signature to the accord. A few hours later the Yalta conference ended. At the final luncheon there was a general feeling of relief that everything had gone so well. Roosevelt was in high spirits. His cherished declaration on liberated Europe, the promise of self-determination for these nations, was accepted and Stalin had agreed in writing to enter the war against Japan two or three months after the fall of Germany. There was an aura of quiet satisfaction among the Americans. To Ambassador Harriman it was a solid diplomatic success. 
Stalin had agreed to support Chiang Kai-shek and recognize the sovereignty of the Chinese nationalist government over Manchuria. Harry Hopkins was sure that this was the dawn of a new day for everyone. The first victory of the peace had been won with the Russians proving they could be reasonable and far-seeing. Some of the British, however, had serious reservations, particularly about the fate of Poland, Roosevelt's health had been an adverse factor of the meetings and had led him into serious errors. But it was he alone who had promoted, in the face of a reluctant Stalin and a dubious Churchill, the most lasting achievement of the conference, formation of the United Nations Organization. The conditions of Stalin's agreement to fight Japan were known only to a few. If they had been circulated there would undoubtedly have been objections over Roosevelt and Churchill's promise that the Soviet claims for territory in the Far East shall be unquestionably fulfilled after Japan has been defeated. Russia had, in effect, been bribed to do something she wanted very much to do. She would run no risk at all and suffer little cost in blood and materiel in attacking a beleaguered Japan once Germany was crushed. Moreover, the spoils of war, in particular the occupation of Manchuria, were a far greater inducement to join the assault than the secret pledges won from the West. A mispronunciation of Chinth, Burmese for lion. It was found in Stillwell's file clipped to a radio message dated May 14, 1944. The U.S. Strategic Bombing Survey later concluded that attacks launched by the B-29s based in China did not warrant diversion of the effort entailed and that the aviation gas and supplies used by B-29s might have been more profitably allocated to expansion of tactical and shipping operations of the 14th Air Force. The 800 tons of bombs they dropped were of insufficient weight and accuracy to produce significant results. Section on March 23, 1955, MacArthur charged that his views had not been sought at the Yalta Conference, and that if they had he would most emphatically have recommended against bringing the Soviet into the Pacific War at that late date. In February 1945 he gave three listeners the opposite impression. After his conversation with MacArthur, Brigadier General George Lincoln reported, concerning overall plan. General MacArthur considers it essential that maximum number of Jap divisions be engaged and pinned down on Asiatic mainland before United States forces strike Japan proper. Colonel Paul L. Freeman, Jr., recorded, he emphatically stated that we must not invade Japan proper unless the Russian army is previously committed to action in Manchuria. And the new Secretary of the Navy, James V. Forrestal, wrote in his diary, he said he felt that our strength should be reserved for use in the Japanese mainland, on the plain of Tokyo, and that this could not be done without the assurance that the Japanese would be heavily engaged by the Russians in Manchuria. Several weeks after the conference, Roosevelt summoned the American journalist and author Edgar Snow to the White House. I got along absolutely splendidly with Stalin this time, said the president. I feel I finally got to know the man and like him. He waved aside Snow's reservations with airy optimism, while admitting that the Russians obviously were going to do things in their own way in areas they occupy. Roosevelt seemed confident that future problems could be settled by mutual compromise. I got the impression, he said, that the Russians are now fully satisfied and that we can work out everything together. I am convinced we are going to get along. 26 like hell with the fire out. 1. Several weeks before the landings at late, the Joint Chiefs of Staff were persuaded, at the urgent request of Raymond Spruance and three army generals, to proceed to Japan by way of Iwo Jima rather than Formosa. The immediate beneficiary was the Air Force. Iwo Jima was 625 miles north of Saipan and 660 miles south of Tokyo, a perfect halfway house for the VLR, very long range, bombing project. Crippled superfortresses could use it in emergencies, and from there the shorter range P 51 Mustangs could escort the B 29s all the way to Japan. Japanese resistance on late forced a postponement of the Iwo Jima invasion, first to February 3rd and then to February 19th. The soft spoken Spruance, veteran of Midway and the Maraianas, was named overall commander, 
while Richmond Gully Turner, who had learned so much at Good Alcanal, was made Joint Expeditionary Force Commander. It was to be an all-marine operation with Howland Mad Smith as commander of expeditionary troops. He in turn selected Major General Harry Schmidt to command the landing force, three divisions. The two assigned to hit the beaches on D-Day, the 4th and 5th, began arduous amphibious exercises in Hawaii, while the 3rd, the reserve, trained on Guam. From the CIO Jima, Sulphur Island, resembled a half-submerged whale but from the air it looked like a fat pork chop. Its most distinctive feature was an extinct volcano at the narrow, southern, end. Only 556 feet in height, it seemed more imposing, jutting as it did straight up from the sea. This was Mount Zuribachi, Japanese for cone-shaped bowl. The island was nearly five miles long and two and a half miles wide, a third the area of Manhattan. Though its volcano was inactive, the entire island seemed to be alive with jets of steam and boiling sulfur pits. The combination of coastal cliffs and rugged Zuribachi gave the appearance of another rock of Gibraltar. Yet habitants had the queasy feeling that the island might disappear any minute into the ocean. The fat northern part of the triangular island was a plateau some 350 feet high with inaccessible rocky shores, but at the narrow end towards Zuribachi there were wide stretches suitable for amphibious landings. The beach to the east was the one selected for the marines to assault, but what looked like black sand was volcanic ash and cinders, so light that a heavy man could sink to his knees. While the sterile soil provided little natural cover on the wind-swept beaches and plateau, the little hills and valleys surrounding the tableland were dense with jungle growth. Io was one in a chain of islands hanging like a loose necklace from the entrance of Tokyo Beta within 300 miles of the Marianas, first the Aze Islands, then the Bonins, and finally the volcanoes, three islets in a north-south line, with Io in the center. The Bonans were first settled in 1830 when two New Englanders, a Genoese and 25 Hawaiians landed at Chichijima, not quite 200 miles north of Io. Twenty-three years later Commodore Perry visited Chichi and took possession of it for the United States, with intent to make it a provisioning station for American naval ships and mail steamers. But President Franklin Pierce repudiated his action, and in 1861 Japan claiming that the Prince of Ogasawara had discovered the Bonins in 1593, annexed them all. An Englishman, go by name, came upon the volcanoes in 1673 and gave Sulphur Island its name. Next to Russian explorer arrived, in 1805, but neither of these men thought the volcanoes were worth colonizing, and it wasn't until eight decades later that the first settlers, they were Japanese landed on Io. Like all the other islands in the chain it was placed under the jurisdiction of the Tokyo prefectural government to be administered as a part of the homeland. By the middle of the 1930s there were almost 1100 colonists, living in flimsy, one-storied Japanese-style homes. The main village, Motoyama, was located a little north of the exact center of the island near the sulfur pits. Vegetables, bananas, pineapples, papayas, sugar cane and grain were grown for local consumption but the economy was based on a sugar mill and a sulfur refinery. The sugar mill did so badly that it was converted into processing medical herbs. There were two schools run by seven teachers, the Taikenin, and a bar serviced by three girls. Six times a year ships brought supplies, visitors, and news from Japan. Of the entire chain, Io alone was suitable for airfields, but for years the Imperial Navy paid little attention to it except for installing radio and weather stations. In 1940 the Mabuchi Construction Company began an airfield with two strips almost a mile long near the foot of Mount Zuribachi. The following spring a Navy lieutenant arrived with 93 men to start erecting gun positions. 2,000 civilian laborers poured onto the island. It was not until early 1944 when the marshals were invaded that the island, along with Formosa, 
received the full attention of Imperial Headquarters. First Commander Tsunzo Waki, the former Assistant Naval Attaché, and Secret Agent, in Mexico, landed with a garrison of more than 5,000 sailors. Then work commenced on a second airfield on the Central Plateau, and by the end of May the Army had a garrison of 5,170, 13 artillery pieces and more than 200 machine guns. The Navy had 14 coast defense guns, a dozen heavy pieces and 150 25mm machine guns for anti-aircraft defense. But there was a feeling of resentment between the services, and when Lt. Gen. Tadame Kitoribayashi arrived in June to set up headquarters for the 109th Division and assume overall command, he found a divided community. The Japanese had divined American intentions long before they were conceived. The entire army and the nation will depend on you for the defense of that key island, Tojo had told the 53-year-old Uribayashi. Japanese estimates of American aims seemed to be confirmed a fortnight after Uribayashi's arrival. 51 carrier planes, intent only on neutralizing the island's air power, knocked down 66 interceptors and then bombed Io almost at will. The raid was sobering to Garibayashi. Nevertheless, he put on a show of confidence to his subordinates. When the enemy comes here, we can contain him, he told a newly arrived Major, Yoshitaka Hori, over whiskey, and then our combined fleet will come to slap his face. That is to say, our role here is a massive containing action. Hori knew more about the Navy than most Navy men, he had worked for a year to try to improve the convoy system. General, he said, there is no longer any combined fleet. Some scattered naval forces remain, but they have no striking power. Haven't you been informed of the results of Ego? He described the devastating defeat of the Marianas ten days earlier. The general accused him of being intoxicated. This island is under the jurisdiction of the city of Tokyo. When I saw this island from the air today, Hori replied, I thought the best thing to do would be to sink it to the bottom of the sea. It could be done with enough explosives. You're drunk, Garibayashi reiterated, but with less conviction. In the morning he took Hori to the beach at the foot of Zuribachi. He threw himself on the black sand as if he had just stormed ashore. This beach is wide, he said and pointed to the adjoining airstrip. Yes, the enemy must land here. They have no alternative. For the next two hours Garibayashi compelled Hori, who had been wounded in China, to fling himself down all over the airfield, a target while the general shot him time and again with a walking stick. Hori thought he had the mind of a squad leader, it was easy to believe the derogatory stories of the general's obsession with details. But Garibayashi must have been impressed with Hori, or at least with the information he seemed to possess. He insisted that the Major come to dinner again. They resumed their drinking, and all of a sudden Hori found himself talking about the disaster at Midway, and the pitiful state of convoy escort operations. Garibayashi, his mind in a turmoil, tried to disparage what Hori said, and called him a walking encyclopedia. But this resistance made Hori more persuasive. The general's face grew pale as the major disclosed the combined fleet's retreat from truck to Palau, and then to the Philippines. The 19th of June, the Marianas Turkey shoot, marked the death of combined fleet and Japan, said the major, his eyes glistening with tears. He tried to clear his throat. If we could each kill ten enemies before dying, the world would realize it was really we who won the war. Ah, sighed Garibayashi, I didn't know any of this. Personally I am reconciled to dying. Hori drew out a packet of potassium cyanide. Sobered, the two men sat in silence. Garibayashi ordered the evacuation of civilians and accelerated the program to build underground defenses in the porous volcanic rocks. He had decided to defend the island in depth rather than concentrate his efforts on annihilating the enemy on the beaches, and by midsummer Io was undermined with tunnels and caves. Reinforcements swelled the army complement to 7,350 men. 
the Navy grew to 2,300 and received a new commander, Rear Admiral Toshi Nosuki Maru, an experienced pilot who still limped from the crash of an experimental plane in 1926. His new combat command had inspired him to poetry. Let me fall like a flower petal. May enemy bombs be directed at me, and enemy shells. Mark me as their target. I go, never to return. Turning my head, I see the majestic mountain, Fuji San. May His Majesty live as long. On August 10, Major Hori, who was now stationed on Chichijima, returned to Io to establish an emergency supply transportation system. He brought with him as gifts for 109th Division headquarters two bottles of water, there wasn't a spring on the island, and some vegetables. Uribayashi was sitting on his porch in a relaxed mood, even though 28 tanks had recently been sunk in transit. Most of the 145th Infantry Regiment had arrived safely, and he was pleased to find them well drained. But at dinner, after several tumblers of whiskey, he complained that he couldn't depend on his staff. There had been a growing resistance to his radical tactical plan of defense. They react slowly to everything, and I can't restrain my impatience. What was the situation on Chichijima? There were many overage officers there. One lieutenant colonel, past sixty, had asked Hori, why dig so many caves? We're all going to die, anyway. Japan has reached the end of the road, Uribayashi reflected and poured the major another glass of whiskey. The general's irritation with his staff embarrassed Hori the next day at the traditional morning ceremony in front of division headquarters. After everyone had turned toward the imperial palace and bowed, the adjutant began reading communiques. Uribayashi interrupted the recital to criticize his chief of staff, Colonel Shizuichi Hori for his bristling moustache. Later that morning Major Hori visited the headquarters of the largest unit in the 109th Division, the 5,000-man 2nd Mixed Brigade, and was buttonholed by its commander, Major General Kotao Osoga, and the colonel with the offending moustache. For twenty minutes the two complained of Uribayashi's arbitrary insistence on leaving the beaches undefended. That meant giving up airfield number one the only airstrip long enough for bombers. Major Hori realized that he was largely to blame for the difference of opinion. Ignorant of the great naval defeat on June 19, these officers were still confident that the combined fleet would steam to their aid once the battle was joined. But he said nothing. It was not safe to tell everyone the truth. Admiral Ikaimaru was equally opposed to Uribayashi's plan and that afternoon he and three other naval officers confronted the general in Hori's presence. Commander Hijari Urabe of the 3rd Air Fleet made it clear that he was conveying the opinions of the Navy general staff, not his own. The Navy wants to build pillboxes around Chidori, airfield number one, and is ready to send about 325mm machine guns as well as the necessary building materials. The enemy can land only near Chidori. Therefore, if we defend it with pillboxes in depth, Iwo Jima will be impregnable. It was the visitor from Chichijima who responded, not Uribayashi. How long did our guns last along the beaches at Saipan and Guam? Will you please show me just how effective the beach pillboxes at Tarawa were? Frontal defense against hundreds of naval guns and aircraft is futile. The lessons we learned at Saipan. Guam and Tinian have taught us beyond any doubt that the best defense is to snipe at the enemy from caves. We must realize we can't defend a beach. Besides, Major Hori added, the enemy's big naval guns could blow up any pillbox. Under the circumstances, how long could we hold out on Iwo Jima? He suggested that Navy guns and materials be utilized to strengthen the defenses of Mount Zuribachi and the Motoy Amo area. I agree with Major Hori, said Garibayashi curtly. Urabe asked the general to reconsider, then turned to Hori with a forced smile. I'm particularly surprised that Major Hori, who has always been considered friendly to the Navy, opposes me. If I hadn't read the battle reports from Guadalcanal, Saipan and Guam, 
I might have agreed with the Navy without hesitation. Now my conscience doesn't permit me to do so. Garibayashi remained opposed to strong defense of the beaches, but he needed the Navy's cooperation as well as their supplies and weapons, particularly dynamite, cement and machine guns. The next morning he suggested a compromise, the Navy could use half of the material for beach pillboxes if the remainder went to the Army. Commander Urabe more than welcomed the suggestion. Yesterday I promised to send you enough building material for 300 pillboxes, he said. As soon as I return to Japan I will make every effort to get enough for 350. Garibayashi summoned all his commanders and formally announced his battle plan, they were neither to fire at landing craft nor to oppose the landing on the beaches without orders. Once the enemy pushed inland 500 yards, automatic weapons near the airfield as well as artillery on Zuribachi and the Motoy Armor Plateau area would open up. General Osuga and Colonel Hori still contravened Garibayashi but he overrode them. Once the enemy invades the island, Garibayashi said, every man will resist until the end, making his position his tomb. Every man will do his best to kill ten enemy soldiers. The garrison of 21,000 troops, 14,000 army, 7,000 navy, was distributed into five sectors with 1,860 men assigned to Mount Zuribachi, where they would fight independently, delaying the enemy as long as possible. Numerous caves had been dug into the slopes facing the beaches, their entrances angled as protection against blasts and flamethrowers. Inside the mountain, Work was almost completed on a vast storied gallery, complete with steam, water, electricity and plastered walls. The rest of the island was studded with thick-walled billboxes. Many had additional protection, 50-foot piles of sand. Big Navy coast guns were sighted to enfilade the beaches, and anti-aircraft guns were emplaced so that it would take a direct hit to destroy them. The northern part of the island was a rabbit warren of natural and man-made caves, they were labyrinths of chambers and connecting tunnels, vented at the top for steam and sulfur fumes to escape. One, brigade headquarters, located near Motoy Armour, could hold 2,000 troops, it was 75 feet deep and had a dozen entrances. The first main line of defense, a network of dug-in positions for artillery, light machine guns and even buried tanks, ran along the southern edge of the plateau between the two airfields. A second line ran just beyond the second airfield through Motoy Amma. Garibayashi wrote home regularly. He chided his wife for visiting so much, and his eldest daughter, Yoko, for poor spelling and penmanship. When Mrs. Garibayashi complained that life in Tokyo was getting unbearable, he pointed out that Iwo Jima was much worse. Dot our sole source of supply is rain water. I have a cup of water to wash my face, actually, my eyes only, then Lieutenant Fujita, his aide, uses the water. After he is through with it, I keep it for toilet purposes. The soldiers, in general, don't even have that much. Every day, after I've inspected defense positions, I dream in vain of drinking a cup of cool water. There are a lot of flies. Also many cockroaches crawl all over us. They are very dirty. Fortunately, there are no snakes or poisonous reptiles. On September 12th he started preparing her for what he knew was coming. Dot the enemy may land on this island soon. Once they do, we must follow the fate of those on Itu and Saipan. Our officers and men know about death very well. I am sorry to end my life here, fighting the United States of America but I want to defend this island as long as possible and to delay the enemy air raids on Tokyo. Ah! You have worked well for a long time as my wife and the mother of my three children. Your life will become harder and more precarious. Watch out for your health and live long. The future of our children will not be easy either. Please take care of them after my death. He also warned Yoko and his only son, Taro, that they both faced a dismal future. Dot the enemy landing on my island is merely a question of time. 
if the defense of this island fails, then Tokyo will be raided day and night. It is beyond words to describe the chaos, terror, heavy damage and confusion of an air raid. Those who live idly in Tokyo can't even imagine what it's like. Therefore, in case of a raid, the most important thing is to keep the family together. Anyone cut off from the family can die on the roadside. This actually happened in the Great Kanto Earthquake of 1923. You must work for your family with your mother as the central figure. Regardless of school regulations, you must protect your home first. You don't have to obey the regulations scrupulously because the situation will be too serious to worry about the safety of a schoolhouse. Suppose you tried to go to your school to save it and your own home was destroyed and your mother killed? What would you do then? You must share the fate of your mother. To begin with, once Tokyo is raided it means that Iojima has been taken by the enemy. It means your father is dead. In other words you, fatherless brother and sister, must depend on your mother. It's pitiful enough to be fatherless children but what happens if you lose your mother? And from now on you must reconcile yourselves to living without a father. A little later he wrote Taro a separate letter underlining his duties as the only son. Dot the life of your father is like a flicker of flame in the wind. It is apparent your father will have the same fate as the commanders of Saipan, Tinian and Guam. There is no possibility of my survival. Therefore, you must be the central figure of our family and help mother. Until now you have been a boy brought up in a hot house. When I was in Tokyo I tried to give you a kind of Spartan training but perhaps you didn't realize it was done with the father's real love. In the future, you may understand. He advised Taro to read, study, quit smoking, avoid drinking, joke at home to keep everyone in good spirits, and use both sides of a page without indentations or spaces when writing future letters. By the end of November the underground fortifications and batteries, some 800 guns in all, were ready for battle. Airfield number 2 was operational and construction was initiated on the third strip, another mile to the north. Garibayashi had also rid himself of dissent within his own staff. He relieved his outspoken chief of staff, the mustachioed Colonel Hori, and the commander of the 2nd Mixed Brigade, General Osoga and sent them both to an underground hospital on the island to regain their health. On January 21, 1945, Duribayashi told his wife to stop praying for his return. He was destined to die on Io. Dot I don't care where my grave is located. My ashes will not be returned home and my soul will remain with you and the children. Live as long as possible and please take care of the children. He also admonished his brother to protect him from publicity. Dot please put a stone on my grave with these simple words, Tomb of Lieutenant General Tadamiki Kuribayashi. Don't let any newspaper men or magazine writers play me up in their stories. I would like my name kept clean even after my death. 2. For six weeks Iwo Jima had been bombed daily by B-24s from the Marianas with occasional help from super fortresses. But the most intensive attacks came from the sea, and by February 15, warships had bombarded the little island with 21,926 shells. Remarkably, there were relatively few casualties, the defenders had moved underground. The following dawn six battleships, Four heavy cruisers and a light cruiser arrived off Mount Zuribachi. Destroyers and destroyer escorts started in front of them, and a dozen jeep carriers, baby flat ops, 50 miles south of the island, sent out combat air and anti-submarine patrols. The correspondent and author John P. Mark Wand, who had not only won a Pulitzer Prize for the late Georgia plea but created a famous oriental detective, Mr. Moto wrote that it would have been hard to mistake Io for anything but a Japanese island, for it had the faint delicate colors of a painting on a scroll of silk. The battleships and cruisers began the initial bombardment. The shelling turned out to be a slow, careful probing for almost invisible targets, with long dull intervals between the firing. 
It reminded Marquand of the weaving and fainting of a fighter watching for an opening early in the first round. To put it another way, our task force was like a group of big game hunters surrounding a slightly wounded but dangerous animal. They were approaching him slowly and respectfully, endeavoring to gauge his strength and at the same time to tempt him into action. Except for a few unauthorized rounds, the Japanese held their fire. Then an overcast settled over the island like a protective cloak, and though the bombardment continued spasmodically until late afternoon, the damage was negligible. To the north, the homeland itself was under attack from the sea. Planes from Mitch's Task Force 58, which had boldly closed to within 60 miles of the mainland, were striking at plants near Tokyo producing aircraft frames and engines. The next morning, February 17, his bombers went after the Musashino plants, already the target of B-29s. Just before noon, however, the weather closed in, and Micha headed back toward Iwo Jima to back up the landing forces, cheered by the results of his foray, particularly the showing against the Japanese air defense, 341 enemy planes had reportedly been shot down and 190 destroyed on the ground at the cost of only 49 aircraft. At Iwo Jima the weather had improved and visibility was good. Minesweepers 750 yards from shore drew scattered fire from the island, and the heavy cruiser Pensacola moved in to help. This target proved too tempting for one battery commander. His guns hit the cruiser six times before she retired with 17 dead and 120 wounded. Destroyers closed in to cover gunboats armed with rockets which were a thousand yards offshore. Speedboats loaded with frogmen passed through this line. The Japanese were shaken, as much by the enemy's nonchalance as by his display of power. Popular music floated across the water, as if from a group of people on an excursion, and they could see American sailors with towels around their necks gawking at the island like tourists. Garibayashi had no longer any doubt that this was the landing. At 10.35 am he ordered several batteries to open up on the gunboats, which retaliated with their rockets. This, in turn, brought on a barrage from big guns hidden at the foot of Mount Zuribachi and at the northern end of Io. Several gunboats were hit, and planes laid a smoke screen while destroyers fired white phosphorus shells. The speedboats which had continued undeterred toward the island, arced sharply near the shoreline, and about a hundred frogmen flopped into the surf. They found no underwater or beach obstacles and a single mine, which was detonated. At airfield number two there were two operable Zero fighters, armed with 60 kilogram bombs, concealed in a concrete revetment. Their pilots had been ordered to ram the largest ship they could reach but one of them balked. You're going to die, anyway, said a friend. The pilot insisted that his head hurt. His commander turned to a group of pilots and asked for a volunteer. One hoisted himself into the plane. The camouflage was whipped off, and the two zeros taxied smartly from the revetment onto the strip. They managed to get into the air, but as they skimmed over Zuribachi both were caught in the artillery fire and tumbled into the sea. The second day of bombardment ended, and Garibayashi, thinking he had repulsed a landing, radioed of his success to Tokyo. Admiral Toy Oda of Combined Fleet sent his congratulations to Admiral Ikaimayu. Despite very powerful enemy bombings and shellings, your unit at Io coolly judged the enemy intentions and foiled the first landing attempt and serenely awaits the next one, determined to hold Io at any cost. I am greatly elated to know that, and I wish you to continue to maintain high morale and repulse the enemy, no matter how intense his attacks, and safeguard the outer defenses of our homeland. The two-day shelling caused few casualties but had uncovered Garibayashi's hidden batteries and the extent of his defenses, enabling the Americans to revise effectively their bombardment pattern for the final day. Fire would be concentrated on the area around the southeast beach, the one the marines would storm. The morning sky was cloudy with bursts of rain. Close beach and get going, 
ordered the commander of the gunfire and covering force at 7.45 a.m. For the first time the shelling was devastating, photos indicated that half the pillboxes and most of the blockhouses on the beach had been torn from their foundations. That evening the marines of the 4th and 5th divisions, who had left Saipan on LSTs and transports on February 15th and 16th, filed their way through the chow lines, checked their gear, packs and weapons. There was no apparent tension or edginess. Everyone looked the same as the day before. In his cabin on the command ship, El Dorado, Howland Mad Smith was reading the Bible. His men would suffer severe casualties when they hit the beach in a few hours. He was a Methodist but he wore a street Christopher's medal blessed by the Pope. Several weeks earlier he had written to Lieutenant General Alexander Van de Grift, who was now a commandant of the Marine Corps, that he felt taking a fortress like Iwo Jima wasn't worth the heavy casualties his men would suffer. Dot on two separate occasions I protested that naval gunfire is insufficient, with the result that it has been increased to some extent, but not enough, in my opinion, to suffice. I can only go so far. We have done all we could to get ready. And I believe it will be successful, but the thought of the probable casualties causes me extreme unhappiness. Would to God that something might happen to cancel the operation altogether. At 3.30 a.m. on D-Day, February 19, the Marines had steak for breakfast. By the time they moved out on deck to the debarkation nets it was light, and through the mist they saw, looking lonely and abandoned, the island of Io. Mount Zuribachi disappeared ominously into a low cloud. John Marquand was atop the air lookout station on his ship. Iwo Jima had never looked more aesthetically ugly. Or more completely Japanese. Its silhouette was like a sea monster with the little dead volcano for the head, and the beach area for the neck, and all the rest of it with its scrubby, brown cliffs for the body. It also had the minute, fussy compactness of those miniature Japanese gardens. Its stones and rocks were like those contorted, wind-scoured, water-worn boulders which the Japanese love to collect as landscape decorations. The transports and landing craft jockeyed over the calm waters toward their disembarkment positions. At 6.40 a.m. seven battleships, Four heavy and four light cruisers began the heaviest pre-HR naval bombardment of the war. Five minutes later nine gunboats, LCIRS, showered the Motoy Armor Plateau with rockets while other gunboats, LCIMS, pumped mortar rounds into the slopes of Zuribachi. At 8.03 the bombardment let up to allow 120 carrier planes to blanket the southeast beach, Zuribachi and Deerfield No. I with rockets, napalm and explosive bombs. They climbed away as abruptly as they had appeared and the shelling resumed. This time ten destroyers joined in. The island seemed to shimmer through the burgeoning pall of dust and smoke. More planes swooped down, hosing the black sands with streams of bullets. It was the most terrifying bombardment the correspondent Robert Sherrod had ever witnessed. Though I've seen this many times. He recorded in his notebook, I can't help thinking, nobody can live through this. But I know better. Huddled in their pillboxes, blockhouses and caves, the Japanese endured the concussions, fingers jammed into their ears. Their final instructions from Kuribayashi had been explicit. Above all else, we shall dedicate ourselves and our entire strength to the defense of this island. We shall grasp grenades charge enemy tanks and destroy them. We shall infiltrate into the midst of the enemy and annihilate them. With every salvo we will, without fail, kill the enemy. Each man will make it his duty to kill ten of the enemy before dying. Until we are destroyed to the last man, we shall harass the enemy by guerrilla tactics. From the mouth of his cave on Zuribachi, PFC Komi Hirokawa, a former government official, watched entranced as the vast flotilla of enemy ships waddled into place. How systematic and beautiful! He thought. It was the massed equipment that awed him, not the enemy himself. He knew all about the American fighting man from propaganda lectures and pamphlets. 
they call themselves brave soldiers, read one such pamphlet entitled The Psychology of the Individual American, yet they have no desire for the glory of their ancestors or posterity, nor for the glory of the family name. They as individuals want to be known as brave and to be given publicity. They are people who love adventure and danger. There are accounts of Americans who tried to go over Niagara Falls in a barrel. They fear death, but being individualists, they do not think much about what will happen hereafter. Rather, when doing something adventurous, they are not afraid to die. They are expert liars. They are taken in by flattery and propaganda. Their desires are very materialistic. They go into battle with no spiritual incentive, and rely on material superiority. The LSDs, loaded with the first five assault waves, moved into final position 5,500 yards offshore. Slogans like too late to worry were scrawled on the ramps. These lowered ponderously, and anthrax began popping out into the sea, it's like all the cats in the world having kittens, Marquand observed to a petty officer, and skittering toward Io. The first wave of 69 Amphtrax, each carrying some 20 men, climbed onto the beach at 9.02 a.m., two hours after H hour, and began to crawl forward. 20 yards inland they encountered a steep terrace 15 feet high in places. The Amphtrax churned vigorously through the black volcanic ash, which was as loose as sugar but only a few breasted the terrace. The others disgorged their occupants at its space, where the heavily laden men sank over their ankles in the black sand. They struggled forward through sporadic rifle fire and desultory rounds of mortar. Perhaps enemy strength had been exaggerated or the massive bombardment had driven the Japanese underground. But once the marines heaved themselves up the collapsing terrace, they were met by machine gun and rifle fire from concealed pillboxes, blockhouses and caves. Mortar shells flew over their heads, crashing around Amphtrax heading toward shore. Marines blown into the sea tried to swim to the beach but their heavy packs pulled them below the surface. The 5th Division, going into action for the first time, was spewing onto the beaches on the left. One regimental combat team, the 28th, moved doggedly toward Mount Zuribachi. Its job was to cut across the 700-yard wide neck of sand to the other side of the island, isolate the volcano and storm up it while another team, the 27th, attacked the southern end of airfield No. 1. On the right flank two regiments of the 4th Division were to help seize the airfield and then the ridge guarding the Motoy Armor Plateau. It was the first battle for Private Alan R. Matthews, a combat correspondent, and on the Amphtrak he felt immortal, indestructible. He could picture himself grieving over the death of a friend, never a friend grieving over him. But as he scrambled onto the beach, mechanically chewing gum, his mind in a turmoil, he told himself, run run run, get off the beach, don't hole up on the beach unless it's absolutely necessary because they're sighting on the beach and they'll get you sure as hell. Get off the beach and run but he couldn't. He staggered under the weight of equipment and sank into the sand. He heard nothing of the thunder of battle, but something compelled him to look to the rear. The sand spouted like a geyser of black water. His mouth was so dry that his chewing gum stuck to his teeth and tongue. He lurched forward trying to spit it out but bits clung to his lip and chin. It was nothing like the attacks he had read about. All around men were running and stumbling in a nightmare silence. They seemed to have no weapons, no uniforms, no faces. Suddenly he heard a noise. Go oh, Orpsman! wailed a voice in pain and terror. Oh, go oh Orpsman! Marines weren't supposed to cry out like that. It came from a man sitting in a shallow depression in the terrace, he was inert, like a statue. On the left, three men were heaped oddly. They had to be dead. Frenzied, Matthews pumped his legs into the soft ash of the sheer terrace, awkwardly holding his rifle aloft to keep sand out of the breach. At last he was on top. He started for a shell crater but wallowed helplessly in the sand. What a fine target I am! He thought. He fell again, and rolled weakly into the hole. 
He swallowed for saliva but his swollen tongue scraped dryly against his palate. He retched and at last saliva flowed. He surveyed the scene. Now he was a veteran, he knew he too might be killed. The first walking wounded were reporting to regimental aid stations. One, his jaw hanging by threads of flesh, suffered himself to be bandaged but refused to be evacuated. He tried to talk, then knelt and wrote something in the volcanic ash. The words filled in immediately. He scuffed the sand disgustedly and allowed himself to be led away. The first tank slumbered ashore at 9.30 a.m. They floundered in the soft ash. Some managed to climb over the terrace, but more were trapped and knocked out systematically by anti-tank guns. The 4th Division in particular had been counting on their support, and its drive toward the airfield was painfully slow. Caught in murderous crossfire from innumerable pillboxes and blockhouses, its troops had to subdue each one with demolitions and flamethrowers. Second Lieutenant Benjamin Rosell, Jr., didn't land until 1 p.m. with his naval gun fire liaison team. Burdened with radio gear, they struggled up the terrace at the extreme right end of the battle line. Roselle's left foot was almost blown off by a mortar round. His men put a tourniquet on his leg while he cracked jokes. Another mortar shell landed on them, killing two of his men and peppering Roselle's good leg with shrapnel. He was left with one man, and the two of them hugged the ground until a third round detonated just above them. Roselle was hit again, this time in the shoulder. The enlisted man's right leg was blown off, and he silently crawled down the terrace, the stump dragging behind him. All by himself now, Roselle could think of nothing but his mother and father in Royal Oak, Michigan. A mortar barrage started walking up from the shoreline toward the terrace. Roselle felt himself lifted, and dropped. He didn't care. He glanced at his watch just as shrapnel ripped through his wrist. The watch was gone, in its place was a gaping red hole. This is what it feels like to be crucified, he thought. To the Americans on the beach the fire seemed intense, but buried by Ashi's gunners were still firing with restraint, and many batteries up the island were not firing at all. Ammunition was husbanded, every round had to count. In his first radio report to Tokyo the general cited the commander of a platoon of anti-tank guns for knocking out more than 20 enemy tanks before succumbing, and requested that he be promoted posthumously to captain. He praised two other anti-tank commanders, an infantry officer and the entire 145th Infantry Regiment. He also reported that company funds totaling 120,000 yen were hereby donated to the national treasury the money had been burned. By dusk 30,000 marines were ashore. 566 had been killed or were dying of wounds. The rest were crowded into a small beachhead, 4,400 yards long and 1,100 yards at its deepest point. They had failed to reach the first day's objectives and were digging in for the expected counterattack. But Uribayashi was as careful of his men as he was of his ammunition. Unlike the commander at Saipan, he was not going to waste troops in futile night charges. He did something far more effective, ordered harassing mortar and artillery fire. Throughout the night marine ammunition dumps were detonated one by one with mystifying accuracy as if there had been an observer within American lines. Finally a marine heard a low clicking sound coming from the hulk of a beached Japanese transport. With a few comrades, the marine crept up to the derelict. He made out a ghostly figure inside, a Japanese with a radio transmitter strapped on his back. Although his death brought a sharp decrease in Japanese artillery accuracy, the beach area was so crowded that casualties continued to be severe. Neither could anything stop the havoc wrought by rockets screaming out of the dark night. They were not conventional missiles. Japanese naval aviation ordnance men had somehow found a way to convert 60 and 250 kilogram bombs into rockets, launching them electrically along slanted wooden ramps. The rocket flew up the 45 degree incline, arched some 2,000 yards in the general direction of enemy positions and exploded on contact. 
The first night on Iwo Jima can only be described as a nightmare in hell, wrote Sherrod. By dawn Ted littered the black sand. Nowhere in the Pacific had he seen such badly mangled bodies, legs and arms lay fifty feet from torsos. A light rain was falling. It was cold. The naval bombardment started at 7.40 a.m., an hour later than on D-Day. After fifty minutes the Marines attacked. On the left, at the base of Zuribachi, the going was arduous. The 28th had made little more than 200 yards by dark even with the help of artillery, half-tracks, and supplementary shelling by destroyers which approached within 250 yards of land. On the right the 4th Division broke through to airfield No. 1, then pivoted north and encountered Garibayashi's first major defense line. Throughout the long day of combat, dogs brought ashore by their marine masters roamed the beach. One named George was already a veteran of two previous landings. Another, a feisty fox terrier, contemptuous of the nerve-shattering explosions on all sides, romped with a live grenade, rolling it around, flinging it in the air. He carried it to a foxhole, scattering its occupants. He trotted after them, refusing orders to drop it. Finally he obeyed, but as soon as a marine reached for the grenade he would playfully snatch it up again. They tempted him with food but he wanted to play. The men threw sticks to distract him, he wouldn't abandon his new toy. Finally someone thought of ignoring him. After a few minutes the fox terrier abandoned the grenade, it was retrieved and the battle against the Japanese resumed. After dark the bomb rockets again hurled into the closely packed marines. During a lull the men crouching in Sherrod's shell hole felt the earth jar under them followed by a weird noise like someone banging on the radiator in the apartment below. It was probably a mild tremor, but no one jeered when a sergeant said, Oh, my God, the Japs are digging underneath us now. 3. On the third day, February 21, the naval bombardment once more commenced at 7.40 a.m., and again the Marines launched attacks 50 minutes later with close support from carrier planes. By early afternoon the 28th Marines had blasted through formidable stone and concrete defenses, almost to the base of Zuribachi. The general attack to the north also started well, particularly on the extreme left, where tanks could maneuver. Here the 5th Division pushed ahead 1,000 yards. On the right, the 4th Division encountered rugged terrain and heavier fire, and made half that distance. At dusk the Japanese struck from the air for the first time. Five kamikaze based near Tokyo broke through the fighter screen round Saratoga, which lay 35 miles off Iwo Jima. The first two suicide planes were set afire but kept boring in. They skipped off the water and into the carrier. The remaining three smashed directly into Saratoga and exploded. Before the blazes were brought under control, five more planes appeared. Four were shot down, but the fifth dropped a bomb that tore a 25-foot hole in the flight deck. The badly damaged Saratoga was compelled to start directly back to America for extensive repairs. A few miles away a single kamikaze started fires on the jeep carrier Bismarck Sea which could not be contained. Blazing from stem to stern, she plunged to the bottom a few minutes after midnight. That evening's Home and Empire broadcast in Tokyo mentioned the landings of enemy soldiers on Iwo Jima, and spoke of their leaders with uncharacteristic admiration. This man Turner is called and known as the Alligator in the American Navy. He is associated with this name because his work is very similar to that of an alligator, which lives both on land and in the water. Also, the true nature of an alligator is that once he bites into something he will not let go. Turner's nature is also like this. Spruance, with a powerful offensive spirit, and Turner, with excellent determinative power, have led their men to a point where they are indeed close to the mainland, but they find themselves in a dilemma, as they are unable to either advance or retreat. This man Turner, who has been responsible for the death of so many of our precious men, shall not return home alive, he must not, and will not.
this is one of the many things we can do to put to rest the many souls of those who have paid the supreme sacrifice. The steady, cold rain continued throughout February 22nd as the Marines tightened their hold on hot rocks, code name for Zuribachi, completely surrounding the volcano except for a 400-yard stretch on the west coast. The Japanese commander, Colonel Kanehiko Atsuji, informed Garibayashi by radio that his casualties were heavy. Now enemy is burning US with flamethrowers. If we remain in our positions we shall be exterminated. We would like to go out for the final attack. Suicidal attacks had dominated Japanese military philosophy since Gwad al -Kanl. To the enemy's advantage. Garibayashi curtly replied. I had assumed Chidori, airfield number one, would be overrun quickly by the enemy but what has happened to make Mount Zuribachi fall within three days? The next morning the marines resumed the assault on the battered volcano, edging up its sheer sides in the face of concentrated fire. Where the defenders ran short of ammunition, they rolled rocks down the steep inclines. Pillboxes and underground galleries were seized. Marines bellied into smaller caves, knives in teeth, to eliminate the enemy in close combat. First Lieutenant Harold Schreer and 40 men neared the summit. He had an American flag and instructions from Lieutenant Colonel Chandler Johnson, his battalion commander, to place it on top of the hill. At about 10.15 a.m. they reached the rim of the crater, which was blanketed with dead Japanese. At the lip they were momentarily pinned down by a burst of fire from a small group on the other side. During this skirmish, somebody found a long piece of pipe. The flag, it was 54 by 28 inches, was secured to one end, and a 1020 Lieutenant Schreer and five men, including an Indian, Louis Charlo, raised the stars and stripes. A photographer from Leatherneck magazine began taking pictures but a 16-year-old, PFC James Robeson, disparaged his entreaty to pose, Hollywood Marines. Two Japanese charged from a cave, one with a grenade, the other with drawn sword. Robeson shot the latter. The other lobbed his grenade at the photographer, who leapt into the crater and tumbled down 50 feet with his camera. It was smashed but the pictures were intact. From the beach area below, the small flag was barely visible. Men in foxholes cheered and punched one another. There were tears. Ships' whistles and horns screeched. Fortuitously James Forrestal, who had become Secretary of the Navy after the death of Frank Knox, was coming ashore with Howland Mad Smith. Holland, Forrestal said gravely, the raising of that flag on Zuribachi means a Marine Corps for the next five hundred years. Colonel Johnson, who had sent up the flag, turned to his adjutant, some son of a bitch is going to want that flag but he's not going to get it. He ordered the original brought down, and another put in its place. A much larger flag from an LSD was attached to the pipe at noon. Joe Rosenthal, who had photographed the landings at Belly and Guam for the Associated Press, had arrived too late for the initial flag raising. He almost missed the second in his frantic efforts to pile up stones so he could get a better vantage point. As the chubby photographer the balanced himself atop his rock heap, six men started to swing up the flagpole. Rosenthal barely had time to get the shot, other photographers began suggesting different poses. One marine stood under the waving flag, then three. Finally twenty were persuaded to yell and brandish their rifles. This was the only picture Rosenthal thought might rate a wire photo, he sent off his film packs to Guam for routine processing. The marines attacking north heard the news from the beach master. Mount Zuribachi is ours. He announced over the loudspeaker used to direct the unloading operations. The American flag has been raised over it by the 5th Marine Division. Fine work, men. The exhausted fighters took time out to turn toward the flag fluttering on top of the volcano. The loudspeaker continued, We have only 2,630 yards to go to Sicily Island. Only, someone grunted, only. That afternoon General Harry Schmidt came ashore, ready to direct the landing force. 
the largest body of marines to fight under a single command, three full divisions. He met with the commanders of the 4th and 5th divisions, it was agreed that the reserve division, the 3rd, which had come ashore, would drive directly up the middle toward airfield number 2, with the 4th on the right and the 5th on the left. Sherrod asked General Schmidt how long the campaign would last. Five more days after today, Schmidt replied. I said last week it would take ten days and I haven't changed my mind. The first line of Japanese defenses was giving way, but more than 25 infiltration teams charged suicidally into the Marine positions, against Garibayashi's orders, and were wiped out to the man. Just to the rear, however, in the center of Io, airfield number two was heavily fortified with hundreds of pillboxes and concealed batteries. For two days it withstood almost constant pounding by ships, planes, artillery and tanks. Now it was up to the infantry of the reserve division, two battalions of the 21st Regiment. We have got to get that field today, the commander of the 3rd Battalion told his men on Saturday, February 24. At 9.30 a.m., behind a rolling artillery barrage, the two battalions launched themselves at the seemingly impregnable positions. It was one of the most resolute charges since pickets at Gettysburg. The Marines flung themselves at pillboxes with grenades and bayonets. When weapons became clogged by volcanic ash, they closed the enemy with rifle butts, picks, even entrenching tools. The Japanese, the remnants of the 145th Regiment, would not retreat, and the carnage on both sides was awesome. In minutes a marine company lost four of its officers, but the two battalions swept onto the airfield. Beyond, the terrain changed from volcanic dunes to a wild, barren stretch of rocky ridges, cut into crags, chasms, and gullies. It reminded Sergeant Alvin Josephy, a combat correspondent, of the badlands of the American West, or, as someone said, like her with the fire out. From one of the ridges a frenzied horde of Japanese poured out, flinging back the marines, who reformed and charged at the ridge again. For an hour and a half the two opponents battled savagely with bayonets and grenades. When it was all over, one third of the island was American. By nightfall on Sunday the marines had rested most of the airfield from the Japanese and pressed on yard by yard toward Motoi Armor Village. Garibayashi radioed Tokyo that after one week of combat, frontline troops had averaged 50% losses, and most of the machine guns and 60% of the big guns had been destroyed. The first picture Rosenthal had taken, the one snapped quickly as the large flag was being hoisted on Zuribachi, would become the most famous picture of the war. It reached the United States in time to make the Sunday papers, where it was featured on the front page including that of the New York Times. Its dramatic composition was unforgettable, symbolizing simultaneously heroism, suffering and accomplishment. On Monday, the Marines went into battle under clear skies for the first time since the landing. But by noon the inevitable rain resumed, and the three-division attack slowly pushed forward until advance units of the 4th Division reached a formidable rise, Hill 382, to the right of Motoy Armor, where they were driven off by rockets and mortar rounds. The 4th pressed on the following morning, five battalions abreast. The vicious hand-to-hand -hand fighting continued, bringing the division's daily casualties up to 792. All along the line Marines suffered heavily, but morale remained high. Humorous signs proliferated in caves and were posted beside foxholes. Zuribachi Heights Realty Company. Ocean View. Cool breezes. Free fireworks nightly. Cook wanted. Ikimoto's INN. Under new management. Soon available to personnel. Of the U.S. Army, we hope. Notice, this foxhole is privately owned and was not constructed. With the help of the Federal Housing Administration not built for comfort but for speed.
The mounting casualties also revived the altercation between the Army and the Marine Corps which had first surfaced in the press during the battle for Saipan. The San Francisco Examiner, a Hearst paper, declared in a front-page editorial on February 27 that there was awesome evidence in the situation that the attacking American forces are paying heavily for the island, perhaps too heavily, and that they were in danger of being worn out before they ever reach the really critical Japanese areas. The editorial went on to praise MacArthur as America's best and most successful strategist. He wins all his objectives. He outwits and outmaneuvers and outguesses and outthinks the Japanese. He saves the lives of his OWN men, not only for the future and vital operations that must be fought before Japan is defeated, but for their own safe return to their families and loved ones in the American homeland after the peace is won. It is our good fortune to have such a strategist as General MacArthur in the Pacific War. Why do we not use him more, and indeed, why do we not give him supreme command in the Pacific War, and utilize to the utmost his rare military genius of winning important battles without the excessive loss of precious American lives? Marine policy was defended the following day by another San Francisco paper, The Chronicle. The recapture of the Philippines remains competent, energetic, and immensely heartening to the American people. We are proud of the job. To slur the United States Marines in one type of operation, however, to draw odious comparisons between theirs and the type of operations conducted by General MacArthur is to raise a sinister fantasy. To hint that the Marines die fast and move slowly on Iwo Jima because Marine and naval leadership in that assault is incompetent is an attempt at a damnable swindle of the American people. The Chronicle does not propose to engage in controversy over the relative merits of our fighting forces in the various theaters of war. But neither does the Chronicle propose to remain mute when the United States Marines, or any force on the world battle line, is butchered at home to make a Roman holiday. The War Department itself was searching for ways to reduce casualties on all fronts. The most controversial had already been suggested to Admiral Nimitz by General Marshall's office, which had previously made similar recommendations for the European theater of operations, the use of poison gas. There were large quantities on hand. Nimitz pondered its employment on Iwo Jima but concluded that the United States should not be the first to violate the Geneva Convention. General Schmidt's prediction that the battle would be over in ten days was clearly over-optimistic. The Japanese still held more than half of the island. By early afternoon of the tenth day, however, the 3rd Division broke through the 2nd Garibayashi line, flooding into the rubble that once was the village of Motoyama. On the right the men of the 4th Division had nearly surrounded Hill 382, but it took them two more days to secure it. That morning, it was Saturday, March 3rd, the first plane set down on airfield No. 1's dirt strip, which CBs had repaired and lengthened to 3,000 feet during the fighting. It was an AVC-47 hospital plane from the Marianas with medical supplies and mail. A woman, Barbara Finch of Reuters, stepped out amid exploding shells. How the hell did you get here? A Marine shouted, and she was pushed in a tent then under a jeep. She was hustled back aboard the plane, which lumbered down the runway on its return to Saipan. The second plane to arrive was a Curtis R-5C carrying two and one-half tons of mortar ammunition. While the battle still raged, one of its primary aims was fulfilled. On Sunday a B-29 in distress heaved in sight, it was dynamite, which had dropped its payload on Tokyo. She was almost out of gas and the fuel selector valve would not switch to the auxiliary tanks. First Lieutenant Fred Marlow dragged the field twice, then brought in the huge craft. She careened down the runway in a huge cloud of dust, shearing off a telephone pole with one wing and slamming to a stop just before she ran out of space. Faulty valve fixed, dynamite lifted off for Saipan, her 11-man crew evangelists for the Marine Corps. Six weeks later Marlow and all but one of the crew would die, some over Kawasaki, Japan, 
and some on a takeoff crash at Tinian, Admiral Spruance was watching with satisfaction from his quarter deck on Indianapolis, it justified his urgent request to occupy the island. That morning Dribayashi relayed a rambling report to the Army Vice Chief of Staff through the radio station at Chichijima. Its length was mute testimony to his fear that it might be his last message. Dot our forces are making every effort to annihilate the enemy. But we have already lost most guns and tanks and two-thirds of officers. We may have some difficulties in future engagements. Since our headquarters and communication center are now exposed to the enemy's front line, we fear we may be cut off from Tokyo. Of course, some strong points may be able to fight delaying battles for several more days. Even if the strong points fall, we hope the survivors will continue to fight to the end. We are sorry indeed we could not have defended the island successfully. Now I, Garibayashi, believe that the enemy will invade Japan proper from this island. I am very sorry because I can imagine the scenes of disaster in our empire. However, I comfort myself a little, seeing my officers and men die without regret after struggling in this inch by inch battle against an overwhelming enemy with many tanks and being exposed to indescribable bombardments. Although my own death approaches, I calmly pray to God for a good future for my motherland. Since there may be a great change in the battle situation and telegraphic communications may be cut, I would like now to apologize to my senior and fellow officers for not being strong enough to stop the enemy invasion. He recalled the glory of ancient days, how the Mongols who took Ek and Tsushima islands were repelled on the shores of Kyushu. Dot believing that my motherland will never go down in ruin, my soul will always assault the dastardly enemy and defend the lands of the empire forever. Please note our battle reports and remarks sent by telegraph. If they help modify future military tactics and training plans I shall be very pleased. Finally I hereby thank my senior and fellow officers again for their kind help during my life. I would like to aid ED that we cooperated well with our navy until the last moment. Goodbye, T. Dribayashi. Japanese resistance continued stronger than the Americans had expected though there was little coordination among Garibayashi's units. Desperate measures were taken to stop American flamethrowing tanks, volunteers strapped explosives on their backs and became living booby traps as they lay concealed in the path of the advancing vehicles. Their situation seemed so hopeless to Major General Sarda Susender, who had replaced the troublesome Osogo as commander of the 2nd Mixed Brigade, that he signaled Garibayashi for permission to launch a final general attack. Garibayashi angrily ordered him to hold his positions, leaving the caves would merely hasten the collapse of Io. But Sender, who had fought against the Russians in Manchuria, proved to be even more mutinous than Osoga. On the evening of March 8 he summoned his officers to his sweltering command cave, a deep labyrinth which reeked of sulphur. There, in the 120 degree heat, he read out instructions for a general attack, a barrage of howitzers, rockets and mortars at 6 o'clock the next evening would proceed a mass assault south toward Mount Zuribachi, the navy would support the attack on both flanks. I will always be at the head of the troops, Sender declared. They passed around a single cup of water, to seal the order with a toast. Sender thanked them. Let us all meet again at Yasukuni Shrine in Tokyo. The transmittal of his order to Navy headquarters, a mile away, was by word of mouth, which led to a misinterpretation, that the attack would take place that night, since Pearl Harbor, the eighth of every month had a special significance. In the darkness almost 1500 Navy men from various units started stealthily toward the line of departure armed with bamboo spears, rifles grenades and a few light machine guns. Lieutenant, S.G., Satoru Amagari, in charge of the former jet propulsion rocket units that had raised such havoc in the first days of fighting, led his 140 men out of their 75-foot deep cave. He had orders to bring them to the Navy Cemetery, between airfields number 2 and number 3, 
where they would consolidate with other units. Harassed by sporadic mortar and artillery fire, and often lost in the unfamiliar terrain, Omagari arrived with fifteen men. In the sandy little valley there was chaos, more than a thousand men, helplessly disorganized, milled around in the dark. At midnight the mob was started south toward the front line positions of the 4th Division. They were to work cautiously through the cratered area, but undisciplined cries of Banzai alerted the enemy. An almost instantaneous display of star shell flares exposed the attackers. Mortar rounds threw up geysers of earth and ash. At least 800 men died. The troops in Omagari's area were pinned down by machine guns. For an hour they crouched in shell holes or behind rocks awaiting the opportunity to steal back into their caves. But Omagari was not ready to give up. With several hundred men he began searching for an army officer to lead them. He found the cave headquarters of an army unit, the 26th Tank Regiment, but no one seemed to know anything about a general attack. The hot-blooded Omagari accused them of shirking, and almost came to blows with the captain. The argument brought out the commander's adjutant, a major. He said there would be no attack. Garibayashi had countermanded Sender's order. The commander himself, Lieutenant Colonel Takeichi Nishi, joined them. He was a baron from a distinguished family, and Japan's best known horseman. In the 1932 Olympics in Los Angeles, he and his horse, Uranus, had won first prize in the individual jumping event. He invited Omagari and his men to stay on as replacements, but Omagari still refused to believe the attack was cancelled. He visualized his navy comrades retaking Zuribachi without him. The battle weary Nishi was tolerant. If one wants to die, he said, he can do it any time. It is only 50 meters to the American positions. Omagari impetuously left the cave. But by the time he had marshaled his men he realized it was too late to join the general attack. Downcast, he returned and offered his men to Nishi. But Omagari rejected cave warfare for himself. He volunteered to make himself a human bomb and throw himself under the treads of an enemy tank. He was promised his turn would come in a few days. The following afternoon a patrol from the 3rd Marine Division reached the northeastern end of the island. The men washed their faces in the sea and cavorted barefoot in the surf. They brought back a canteen of salt water, and as proof that the Japanese forces had been split in two, it was sent to General Schmidt with the inscription for inspection, not consumption. As far as Schmidt was concerned the battle was over, and he informed the Navy that he no longer needed carrier planes for close support. Admiral Turner was already on his way back to Guam. General Garibayashi had prevented the launching of a full-fledged general attack, but Sender, who had initiated the idea, could not be restrained. Gathering all the forces in his immediate area that night, and with a grenade in each hand, he led the charge. Around his forehead was a white band emblazoned with the rising Sunday the attack was as futile as Garibayashi had predicted. Almost every man died, including Sender. By March 11 the Japanese were backed into small areas, one on the northeastern end of the island and the other on the northwest coast, where Garibayashi and Admiral Akaimaru still held out in their deep caves while the remnants of their commands continued a suicidal defense. In the tanker's cave, not far away, Omagari waited for darkness before setting out on his final mission. After midnight he left the cave with a box of dynamite on his back. He found five bodies near a gully, a logical route of advance for American tanks, and worked his way into the stinking pile, smearing his uniform and face with blood, and draping himself with entrails. Who will be using my guts tomorrow? He wondered. All through the day he waited, perspiring in the sun, for the clank of an enemy tank. The smell was nauseating. Huge blue bottle flies hovered overhead like buzzards. Why couldn't the end come at once and cleanly? Scenes from his childhood and treacherous thoughts interrupted his wish for death. Was this what he had been educated and trained for? 
he and his generation had been reared only for war to believe it was beautiful and glorious to die for the emperor. Was lying among the dead covered with stinking guts beautiful? He had revered the forty-seven ronin, under the impression that they exemplified the inherent characteristics of the Japanese. If so, why had he and his comrades been bombarded with propaganda designed to make them seek death in battle? With darkness he crept back to his cave. He tried to clean himself, but the stench of death clung tenaciously. He was irresistibly drawn back to the battlefield, where he spent another day among the corpses, agonizing over the meaning of life as a Japanese. Again no tanks appeared, and by nightfall he returned to the cave robbed of most of his illusions. He was sure of but one thing, never again would he venture out as a human bomb. Across the island in the other pocket, Navy Lieutenant Toshihi Ono and his men had been driven from place to place by the advancing Americans. Ono had commanded an anti-aircraft battery of 54 men, but now only five were left. In some ways Ono, who was six feet tall and slender, was more like a young American officer fresh from OCS than a typical Japanese officer. A recent college graduate, sensitive and gentle of manner, he seemed unsuited to command men, but under fire he had matured. He and his men were huddled in a pillbox about eleven feet square. The entrance was blocked and they had crawled through the gun port. They were sprawled on the concrete floor, sleeping off a feast. They had found two cases of hard tack and candy, three large bags of sugar, and a ten-gallon can half filled with water. A noise awakened Ono. Through the porthole he saw a marine helmet. As he drew his pistol, the helmet disappeared. There was a hissing noise, and a grenade bounded off the floor. Someone leapt in front of Ono and tossed a blanket over the grenade just before it detonated. It exploded upward and no one was hit. Dazed, Ono did not at first comprehend that a bundle of dynamite sticks had just been shoved into the porthole. He snatched the smoldering blanket and used it to force the dynamite to the rear of the porthole. He leapt back, hugged the wall and shouted a warning. Everyone stuck thumbs in ears, middle fingers on noses and last two fingers over mouths. Tenno Hikabanzai. He said to himself and visualized his wife and mother. I'm ready. The pillbox seemed to rise three feet in the air. It was as if his body were being pressed together by some unearthly force. He heard himself cry out, Ah! The pillbox swirled with smoke. Are you all right? He asked his men. All but an enlisted man named Kitagata replied. Through a hole where the ventilator had blown out, a shaft of light illuminated Kitagata. His head was bleeding and sand peppered his skin. He moaned. A shadow interposed the foggy shaft of light, a marine was peering down. Ono clamped a hand over Kitagata's mouth. The shadow withdrew and someone outside shouted, let's go. They were safe for the moment. 4. On March 14 a small group of marine officers and men stood at attention around an incinerated Japanese bunker. A colonel representing Admiral Nimitz read a proclamation. United States forces under my command have occupied this and other of the volcano islands. All powers of government of the Japanese Empire in these islands so occupied are hereby suspended. All powers of government are vested in me as military governor and will be exercised by subordinate commanders under my direction. Three privates atop the bunker attached the flag to an 80-foot pole, and as a bugler sounded colors, raised it. There was little conversation after the ceremony. Howlin' Mad Smith, his eyes glistening, turned to his aide. This was the toughest yet. In the past 24 days, seven Marines had won the Medal of Honor by throwing themselves on grenades to save their comrades. Among the Americans who served on Io Island, Nimitz later wrote, Uncommon valor was a common virtue. Deep underground, not far away, there was another flag ceremony. General Garibayashi ordered the banner of the 145th Regiment burned to prevent it from falling into enemy hands. Two days later the regiment no longer existed, neither did the 2nd Mixed Brigade. 
at 5.35 p.m. Garibayashi Radio Tokyo what he wants more thought would be his farewell message. The battle is approaching its end. Since the enemy's landing, even the gods would weep at the bravery of the officers and men under my command. In particular, I am pleased that our troops with empty hands carried out a series of desperate fights against an enemy possessing overwhelming material superiority on land, sea and air. However, my men died one by one and I regret very much that I have allowed the enemy to occupy a piece of Japanese territory. Now there is no more ammunition, no more water. All the survivors will engage in a general attack. As I think of my debt of gratitude to my country, I have no regrets. Unless this island is retaken, I believe Japan can never be safe. I sincerely hope my soul will spearhead a future attack. Praying to God for the final victory and safety of our motherland, let me say sayonara everlastingly. He ended with three of his poems. Without ammunition. It is sad for me to leave this world. Having failed to achieve my important mission. For the motherland. I could never rot in the fields. Unless my soul took vengeance. May I take up ARMS, EVFN on to the seventh life. I worry over what Japan's future will be when we discover this island. It seemed that Garibayashi was ready, at last, for the general attack. His final order was simple. 1. The battle is approaching its ultimate phase. 2. Our garrison will make a general attack against the enemy tonight. Starting time will be 0001 hours, 18th of March, 1945. 3. Everyone will fight to the death. No man will be concerned about his life. 4. I will always be at the head of our troops. During the day code books and other secret documents were burned in the Navy headquarters cave. Just before dusk Admiral Ikaimaru summoned his able-bodied men, about 60 at the most, to a large chamber 65 yards beneath the surface. To date, he said, you have overcome many and all difficulties, obeyed my orders and fought gallantly against an enemy with overwhelming supplies. The loss of this island means that Yankee military boots will soon tread on our motherland. However, you are warriors of Japan. Don't be too anxious to die. Live in high spirits, kill as many enemies as possible and fight for your seventh life. Thank you. His senior staff officer, Commander Take Chimais, stepped forward and in a loud voice read a letter from the Admiral to President Roosevelt. It charged Roosevelt with vilifying Japan by calling her a yellow peril, a bloodthirsty nation, and a protoplasm of the military clique. America was responsible for starting the war, not Japan. Judging from your actions, the white races, especially you Anglo-Saxons, are monopolizing the frauts of the world at the expense of the colored races. Why is it that you, an already flourishing nation, nip in the bud the movement for freedom of the suppressed nations of the east. All we want is for you to return to the east that which belongs to the east. Nor could the admiral comprehend how Roosevelt dared criticize Hitler's program while cooperating with the Soviet Union, whose principal aim was the socialization of the world. If only brute force decides who rules the world, war will go on endlessly and there will never be universal peace or happiness. When you achieve your barbaric world monopoly, remember the failure of your predecessor, President Wilson, at the height of his power. The letter was placed in the stomach band of the communications officer, and an English version section was entrusted to Lieutenant Commander Kunio Akada. Half an hour before midnight Admiral Akaimaru, leaving almost a hundred wounded behind, went out of the cave with his sixty men. They were immediately overwhelmed by a maelstrom of American artillery, mortar and machine gun fire. Uribayashi left his cave about the same time with almost 500 troops. But most of them had no weapons and he had no intention of leading a final charge. He merely moved a short distance to the north to a safer cave. They were joined just before dawn by a dozen survivors of the futile Navy assault. Among them was Admiral Akaimaru. 
Colonel Nishi had never received the general attack order, nor did he know the assault had never amounted to anything. As far as he was concerned the battle was not over, and the following night he started north to attack Marine's position near a large rock overlooking the beach. He carried a whip, the one he had used in the Olympics, and in his breast pocket was a lock of Uranus mane. At the foot of the rock Nishi and two hundred men, including Omagari, were pinned down by heavy fire. Dawn exposed them to a devastating rain of grenades. In the uproar Omagari heard Nishi call assemble. And crept toward his position with forty others. Nishi said they were in a hornet's nest, and they would have to find refuge in the caves along the beach. On Chichijima, Major Hori had been unable to make radio contact with Io since the night of Hiribayashi's transfer to the new cave. On the morning of March 23rd, after five days, the silence was broken by a flood of messages. The operator on Iwo Jima was inexplicably on the air again with a backlog of terminal reports which came through without pause. Hori read them choked with emotion. Hiribayashi described the fighting, enemy invitations to surrender by loudspeaker, were gripped with derision, they continued the assault despite the fact that they had been out of food and water for five days. Dot, but our fighting spirit still runs high. We are going to fight resolutely to the end. There was silence. It was hurried by Ashi's last dispatch, but just before dusk, after almost twenty minutes silence, the radio crackled again with the operator's final message. This time it was in the clear. All officers and men of Chichijima, farewell. It was all over except for a final Banzai charge three days later by a group of approximately 350 army and navy men, including 40 Bato Tai, a group carrying swords. Out of the rocky gorges on the northwestern tip of the island they crawled half naked, like cavemen, to sweep down in a frenzy over anything in their path. Their wild assault surprised an Air Force and CB encampment. A Marine Pioneer Battalion, hastily summoned, drove into the melee, but it took an entire day of fierce hand-to-hand -hand fighting before two-thirds were slaughtered and the rest dispersed. Early the next morning, March 27, General Hiribayashi, who had been wounded while moving to another refuge, came to the mouth of his cave with a staff officer, Colonel Kane Kane. Hiribayashi faced north toward the imperial palace, knelt and solemnly bowed three times. He stabbed himself in the abdomen and bowed his head. Nakane raised his sword and brought it down on the general's neck. He buried the body with the help of a sergeant and crawled back into the cave to inform Colonel Tadashi Takeshi, Hiribayashi's chief of staff, and Admiral Akaimaru what had happened, then he returned with Takeshi to the scene of Hiribayashi's death. The two men shot themselves. That evening just before 11 o'clock Ikaimaru, followed by ten men, also emerged into the open. A volley of machine gun fire cut down the admiral and two officers behind him. The Battle of Iwo Jima had cost the lives of 4,554 marines and 363 navy men, the greatest American toll in World War II considering the length of the battle and the number of men involved. Of the 21,000 defenders, little more than 3,000 were alive. Of these, 216 had become prisoners of war. The others remained huddled in their sweltering, sulfuric caves like hunted animals, hungry, thirsty, desperate and bewildered. For all but a few, the only prospect ahead was death. Admiral Turner was never nicknamed Alligator. The Japanese apparently got the name from the V-amphibious core shoulder patch. Three of the six marines in the picture were to die on Iwo Jima. The others were brought back to America to help spur the seventh war loan drive. One, an Indian named Ira Hayes, could not cope with the publicity. He was a hell of a good fighting man, but he wasn't the kind of guy you send on a bond tour, wrote Technical Sergeant Keyes Beach, who accompanied the three men on the tour. He was terribly, terribly shy and ill at ease. As a defense against his own insecurity, he drank like a fish whenever he could sneak away. Maybe Hayes would have been a lush without the Bond tour, but the Bond tour helped. 
If we ever get into another war one am going to campaign against bon tours? What we used to ask ourselves, in the few minutes of privacy we had on tour, was why the hell it was necessary for us to go around on a vaudeville act to persuade a bunch of fat cats who had grown rich in the war to invest in a sure thing. During the tour Hayes made one speech from the heart. This was to the National Congress of American Indians. With tears in his eyes he told them that good things were coming out of the war and that white men are going to understand Indians better, and it's gonna be a better world. He died an alcoholic in 1955. Stanley P. Lovell of the Office of Strategic Services was sent to Pearl Harbor in late June 1944 to discuss the matter with Admiral Nimitz. When Lovell returned to Washington he learned that the proposal had been disapproved by the White House, all prior endorsements denied, Franklin D. Roosevelt, Commander-in-Chief. Unexpected opposition had also come from London. The British who had at first recommended the utilization of gas against certain objectives, now resolutely disfavored its use against Germany, they feared Hitler would retaliate against England. The quote from Admiral Nimitz came in an interview shortly before his death. It concluded with a rueful, it lost many fine marines. Section it was found by the Americans and is now in the museum of the U.S. Naval Academy at Annapolis. The complete text is reproduced in the notes. 27. The Flowers of Edo. 1. About a year before Pearl Harbor the Japanese government had ordered the civilian population to form groups of neighborhood societies for the purpose of controlling the rationing and air defense programs. Each unit comprised about a dozen families, and by now the system had routed drastic change in the traditional Japanese family structure. Hardship had forced families to depend more on neighbors than on close relatives, who might live miles away. Everyone, whether high-born or low, took part in community air raid drills, relaying water pails and carrying stretchers, lumber and sand. Democracy extended to food and other rationed necessities, such as clothing, women wore mom pay, loose baggy slacks, and all men the drab khaki national uniform. Children had taken naturally to the idea of sharing everything alike, and grown ups were learning that only through cooperation could they survive. There was a slogan, We are all equals, which took on a new significance late in 1944 when the bombing intensified. Night raids, usually aimed at residential sections, invoked more fear than the daytime attacks. On a food buying trip in the country, Mrs. Sumisi or Mishima could even stop and admire the spectacle of the approaching bees, the popular name for super fortresses. In the eastern sky loomed a flight, another flight, and yet another of B 29s. Trailing white streamers of exhaust gas, they sailed in perfect formation through the blue gold sky. Like shoals of pearly fish riding through the seas of the universe, this aesthetic meditation was quickly shattered when the graceful looking fish dropped their eggs. The process of splashing the earth with showers of incendiary bullets in rhythmic rumbles of ocean breakers, and hurling heavy bombs, each pounding with a fatal thud into the depths of the globe, was repeated by each flight of planes. On almost every raid, it seemed to us, the American planes brought over new kinds of bombs and shells which behaved differently in sound effects from those used the last time. The unaccustomed noises intensified the terrors and thrills of each new invasion. It was an unusually cold winter and some homes had to suffer broken water pipes for months before they were repaired. The novelist Jun Takami noted in his diary that in some homes where the upstairs toilet pipes had burst and the water poured downstairs, the people had to use umbrellas in the house and when the water froze on the floor they were able to ice skate on it. Fear gave birth to new superstitions, if you ate rice balls with scallions inside, and cooked with red beans, you would never be hit by a bomb. Better yet, if you ate only scallions for breakfast you were sure not to be hit, but after a while there was an added Philip, you had to let someone else know about this trick, along the lines of the chain letter principle, otherwise it wouldn't work. Another superstition originated when a couple who miraculously survived a close bomb hit found two dead goldfish nearby. 
they thought the goldfish had died for them, so they put the fish in their family Buddhist shrine and worshipped them. When word of what had happened spread and people found it difficult to obtain live goldfish, porcelain goldfish were manufactured in quantity and sold at exorbitant prices. Although the bombing raids had wrought drastic changes in the lives of the people in the Japanese homeland, their primary purpose, to obliterate all production facilities, had not been achieved. This outfit has been getting a lot of publicity without having really accomplished a hell of a lot in bombing results, Curtis LeMay complained to Lieutenant Colonel Street Claire McElway, his public relations officer, on March 6. LeMay had taken over B-29 operations in the Marianas six weeks earlier. He was glad to be out of China, with its insuperable problem of supply but continued to be plagued by operational failures and mediocre results. The strategic bombing program, principally utilizing high explosives, which had devastated Germany with its concentrated industrial complexes, had done little to slow production in Japan, where two-thirds of the industry was dispersed in homes and small factories manned by 30 workers or less. LeMay hit upon a radical scheme for his planes, to go in low at night stripped of most armament to increase the payload, and scatter incendiary bombs onto the tinderbox targets over a wide area. Two days later, without consulting Washington, he had field orders cut for a strike of B-29s. At briefing the following morning, March 9, the crews were informed they would attack Tokyo that night at low altitudes, from 5,000 to 8,000 feet. Their reaction of protest was audible. All guns except tail cannons would be removed, the announcement shocked the men to silence. It was suicide. At 5.36 p.m. the first B-29 rolled down the runway of North Field on Guam and thundered into the sultry air. Fifty seconds later another was airborne, and another and another. One plane couldn't get up enough speed, its brakes were frozen and couldn't be released. Friction turned the landing gear white hot and the brake fluid burst into flame. When the wheels melted, the gear collapsed. In a shower of sparks the huge craft slithered on its belly, careened off the runway and smashed into the coral beyond with a fearsome explosion. At 6.15 p.m., B-29s from Tinian and Saipan began joining the Elephantine procession in the air. The 333 bombers droned northward. Up ahead against the dark horizon an eruption of explosions appeared, Iwo Jima, where General Sendo was about to lead the remnants of the second mixed brigade and assorted naval units in his futile general attack. The big planes bounced in the low-level turbulence, but as they neared Tokyo the weather improved. The men, like knights getting into armor, pulled on bulky flak suits and heavy steel helmets then peered ahead for the glow of fires to be set momentarily by the pathfinders. Back on Guam, General LeMay paced the floor. If the raid worked the way he hoped, the war could be shortened. He would immediately inaugurate a series of similar raids all over Japan. The slaughter of civilians would be unprecedented, but Japan's industry had to be destroyed. If not, it would take an invasion to end the conflict and that might cost the lives of half a million Americans, perhaps a million. A new moon cast a dim light but stars shone brightly over Tokyo. At midnight the pathfinders located their aiming points and prepared to mark out the heart of Tokyo with napalm-filled M47 bombs. This 3 by 4 mile downtown section was once the gayest, liveliest area in the Orient but now there was little traffic and most of the shops and theaters were boarded up. Nevertheless, 750,000 low-income workers existed in this congested city within a city that was never asleep. Thousands of home factories were in constant operation. With its profusion of wooden buildings Tokyo had continually been victim of massive fires from the time it was called Edo. These conflagrations became such an integral part of city life that they were given the poetic name Flowers of Edo. Despite eventual modernization of the firefighting system, there was no guard against disaster by fire. In 1923, following the Great Earthquake, fire raised most of the city. Two years later Tokyo was devastated again, 
as it was a third time in 1932. There were now 8,100 trained firemen and 1,117 pieces of equipment scattered throughout the city, with static water tanks for emergency use. Still, this army of firefighters was not adequate to cover the 213 square miles of the metropolitan area, particularly in time of war. The downtown section remained the most vulnerable. Few fire lanes had been cut through its crowded buildings, they would be ready in a year or two, city officials had promised. The siren howling around midnight on March 9 sounded just the same as dozens of other alerts. Since previous raids on the city had done little damage, there didn't seem to be any cause for alarm, Radio Tokyo reported that enemy bombers were circling above the seaport of Choshi, 50 miles northeast of the capital, and that there was no immediate danger. The pathfinders had not yet been discovered in their low sweep toward the unwary city at better than 300 miles an hour. The first two planes, crossing paths over the target released their strings of bombs in perfect unison at 12.15 a.m. 100 feet above the ground the M47 missiles split apart, scattering two-foot-long napalm sticks which burst into flame on impact, spreading jellied fire. In minutes a blazing X was etched in downtown Tokyo. Ten more pathfinders roared in to drop their napalm on the X. Then came the main force, three wings, in orderly but random formation at altitudes varying from 4,900 to 9,200 feet. Searchlights spoke frantically at the radars, and puffs of anti-aircraft fire detonated without effect. There was no fighter opposition. Whipped by a stiffening wind, the fires spread rapidly as succeeding bombers fanned out toward the residential areas to unload their thousands of sticks of napalm. Flame fed upon flame creating a sweeping conflagration. Huge balls of fire leapt from building to building with hurricane force, creating an incandescent tidal wave exceeding 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit. Those on the ground were momentarily paralyzed by the awesome sight of the planes blanketing them like huge dragons, greenish from searchlight beams, crimson from the glare below. From the Bunkyoku residential district overlooking the center of the blaze, 17-year-old Suzuma Takahashi watched clusters of bombs, they would soon be nicknamed Molotov bread baskets, flower over Tokyo Imperial University. He was a student at Showa Medical College, and after the air raid alarm he had remained in the house to study for exams while the rest of the family went into the shelter. From the dull red sky, pieces of flaming debris floated down all around Takahashi. A blaze erupted on the roof of the house and he started slapping at it with a fire swatter strips of rags attached to the end of a long pole. The next house exploded into flames like a gas-filled oven. He ran to his room to pick up three books, he was still going to take the exam the next day, then looked for the family memorial tablets at their private Buddhist shrine. They were gone, his mother must have taken them earlier. He grabbed a silver and gold Buddha and carefully selected the best antiques, ivory figures. Out of habit, he pulled the door shut, buried the antiques in the family shelter, it was empty, the others had fled, and started up the street. To the right everything was ablaze. He ran to a main road on the left where a fire engine stood helpless, its hoses slack, surrounded by flaming buildings. There was no water. The only way to safety was a bridge across the Kanda River but it lay beyond a wall of fire. A group of people huddled in the street, staring at the flames as if hypnotized. Charred trees and telephone poles were scattered across the road like matchsticks. The firemen shouted to make for the bridge, or die. Young Takahashi led the way, leaping over tree trunks that burned like logs in a mammoth fireplace. The others followed in single file. He was blinded by the intense light and gasped for breath. He stumbled, at the end of his endurance. Then through the roiling smoke he made out the concrete bridge, crowded with squatting people. He was safe. Takahashi had struggled through the fringe of the conflagration. The Sekimuras lived less than two miles from the center of the fiery X. When they first saw flames near the Tokyo station, 
They bundled up their four children in quilted hooded fire capes and joined a stream of people heading for one of the branches of the Sumida River. Walking through crisply burned debris that was beginning to fall like black snow reminded Mrs. Sekimura of the fires after the Great Earthquake of 1923, when she was twelve. The sight of bombs bursting open overhead like bunches of bananas entranced rather than terrified her. They pushed their way across the bridge to escape the roaring blaze that was pursuing them like a wild animal. A strong wind sucked into the flames swept a stinging storm of pebbles into their faces. They turned, backs to the gale, and plodded slowly away from the conflagration, fascinated at the sight of oil drums rocketing through the roof of a cable factory near the river and exploding into balls of fire a hundred feet in the air. The center of Tokyo was as incandescent as the sun. Billowing clouds of smoke surged up, illuminated below by orange flames. Thousands crouched terrified in their wooden shelters, where they would be roasted alive but most of those in the doomed area tried to flee, to the great Buddhist temple in Asakusa, which became their tomb, or, like the Sekimuras, toward the eleven steel bridges spanning the winding Sumatra River. For a while these were escape routes, but the flames, too, crossed the river and then there was no escape for those lagging behind. The red glow that spread over the southeastern horizon quickly bulged up and filled the entire sky, Mrs. Sumi Mishima observed, so that even where we were, on the opposite edge of the city, an eerie pink light settled on the earth and clearly lit up the deep-lined faces of the awestruck people. The burning seemed to go on all the night. The tremendous thermals of heat buffeted the B-29S overhead, tossing some of them several thousand feet upward in the air. Far above, the plane carrying LeMay's chief of staff, Brigadier General Thomas Powers, cruised back and forth. He photographed the conflagration, and reported to LeMay that Tokyo was an inferno. The crews in the last waves could smell the stench of burnt flesh, some men vomited. Bombing in Europe had seemed antiseptic from the air, here it was a nauseating reality. At dawn young Takahashi looked down on the smoldering city from his vantage point in Tokyo Medical Dental College. The center of the capital was flat wasteland except for stone statues, concrete pillars and walls, steel frames, and a scattering of telephone poles, their ends smoking like tapers. It's gone, he thought. Mrs. Sekimura, baby on her back, set out to try to recover the belongings she had buried in the ground. The bridge was clogged with the bodies of those who had been trapped. The river itself, almost evaporated, was choked with swollen corpses and household possessions. On the other side, heat still radiating from the ground made the brisk March day feel like early summer. The places she had known most of her life had vanished. All she could recognize was the cable factory, it was twisted and deformed like melted candy. There were bodies everywhere. Some were naked, black, a few were oddly upright, crouched as if trying to run, some were clasping hands in prayer, others seated as if in contemplation. One man's head had shrunk to the size of a grapefruit. Dead covered with straw were piled high in schoolyards. The stink of death permeated the air. At last she found the ashes of her home but the ground was too hot to dig. She looked around carefully since it was almost impossible to buy even a piece of paper or a pair of chopsticks, if the loss of a teapot was tragic, the loss of one's possessions meant a reversal to animal life. All she could save was a karma for cooking rice, she picked it up with a stick so it wouldn't scorch her hands. Curiously, the sight of so much death left her untouched. She walked mechanically by the corpses of neighbors, unable to shed a tear. There were the mother and daughter who lived across the street. They were completely black except for white rings around the eyes, and they had always been so neat. Dazed, she passed the hospital and its emergency pool of water. It was filled with layer upon layer of sprawling bodies. A man stopped her and remarked that he had been in that human heap. Everyone else is dead, he said in a toneless voice. Miraculously I didn't even get hurt. People poked at the layers of bodies with long sticks in search of relatives. 
money spilled out of an old woman's obi and stuck to her wet body. Nobody reached for it. Through the gutted wall of a geisha house spilled hundreds of colorful silk kimonos. Mrs. Sekimura lifted the filmy garments tenderly in her hands, they were so expensive. What a shame such material was ruined. Not far away legs protruded awkwardly from the rubble. Everywhere she encountered corpses in agonized positions, mothers trying to shield charred babies, husbands and wives welded together by the heat in a final embrace. Other survivors had returned and in charcoal were scrawling public messages to their loved ones on walls and sidewalks. Sixteen square miles of Tokyo had been burned to the ground and city officials later estimated that there were 130,000 dead, almost the same carnage as at Dresden. The next night LeMay sent 313 bombers with napalm to Nagoya, the empire's third largest city. Massive incendiary raids on Osaka and Kobe followed in rapid succession. Within a week, 45 square miles of crucial industrial areas had been incinerated. There could be no doubt that LeMay's new tactics would soon crush Japan's capacity to wage effective warfare. But more was being destroyed than Japanese military power. In the process a multitude of defenseless civilians had already been killed. Americans' attitude toward bombing had undergone a complete reversal since their sincere revulsion against the indiscriminate murder of civilians in Spanish cities and in China. At the outbreak of war in Europe, Roosevelt, reflecting the humanitarian ethics of his countrymen, dispatched messages to all belligerents urging them to refrain from the inhuman barbarism of bombing civilians. Even after Pearl Harbor, Leaders of American air power emphasized daylight precision bombing, aimed at the destruction of selected military targets. But gradually the efficacy of this program was not borne out, and areas of bombing were enlarged to include the destruction of anything that sustained the enemy's war effort, including, if necessary, the populace itself. It was a policy which went largely unspoken and unrecorded, but it seemed clear that the entire enemy population, at home as well as at the front, would have to be brutalized before it could be forced to surrender. Public opinion accepted this metamorphosis with only an occasional outburst of moral concern. By 1945 almost every American agreed that Japan and Germany deserved every bomb that fell on their countries. Time magazine, for example, described Lamay's fire bombings of Tokyo as a dream come true which proved that properly kindled, Japanese cities will burn like autumn leaves. Americans in particular had little sympathy for an enemy which had attacked Pearl Harbor without warning and perpetrated such atrocities as the Bataan Death March. It was, consequently, the rare voice which spoke out in the name of humanity for the hundreds of thousands of mutilated and cremated civilians. America. The Jesuit Weekly, doubted that mass raids squared either with God's law or the nobility of our cause. An English pamphlet entitled Massacre by Death was distributed in the United States with a special introduction endorsed by 28 prominent American educators and clergymen such as Harry Emerson Fosdick and Oswald Garrison Villard, it urged the readers to examine their hearts regarding their participation in the carnival of death. America, including most of its clergy rejected such exhortations. God has given us the weapons, retorted one clergyman in the letter section of the New York Times, let us use them. What was criminal in Coventry, Rotterdam, Warsaw and London had become heroic in Hamburg, Dresden, Osaka and Tokyo. 2. Japan's last important outposts of resistance in the Philippines and Burma were in jeopardy. On Luzon, MacArthur's men had retaken Bataan and Corregidor. Nothing better illustrated the difference between the two foes than their defenses of the tiny, tadpole-shaped island. The Americans had resisted for twelve hours before Wainwright felt that further fighting was meaningless. Three years later the 5,000 Japanese defenders fought for eleven days against an aggressive, overwhelming parachute and amphibious assault. All except twenty died. Strategically it made little difference whether they had fought for eleven days or eleven hours. MacArthur was in a sentimental mood when he journeyed to the rock by P.T. boat. Gentlemen, he said, 
It has been a long way back. On the shattered remnants of the outpost he gave the order to raise the American flag. Hoist the colors and let no enemy ever haul them down. After the ceremony he inspected the ruins. This is atonement, he said. Unlike Corregidor, Manila was not to have been defended at all. Yamashita moved all except security troops out of the city, but no sooner had they left than Rear Admiral Sanji Iwabuchi reoccupied Manila with 16,000 sailors. Iwabuchi had orders from his superior, Vice Admiral Denshichi Akoki, to destroy all port facilities and naval storehouses. Once there, Iwabuchi commandeered the 3,750 army security troops, and against Yamashita's specific order, turned the city into a battlefield. By the time the Americans secured it on March 4, the capital was rubble and thousands of civilians had died, many as the result of atrocities committed by the Japanese. But the Philippines were far from cleared. Yamashita had 170,000 well fed, well armed troops. Most of them defended the northern redoubt under his direct command, but there were large groups holding out in the mountains east and northeast of Manila and in the Zambals Mountains near Clark Field. Theirs was not to be the long sought decisive battle but rather one of attrition. Yamashita's role was to delay MacArthur, and in the process, kill as many Americans as possible. The GIs incited by the deplorable state of American civilian and military prisoners at the Santo Tomas prison, set out to annihilate Yamashita's men with renewed vehemence. Posters urged them to have no mercy on the yellow bastards. Even without such incitement, the attitude of many American soldiers toward the Japanese led to excesses. In his wartime diaries, Charles Lindbergh, who toured the Pacific, wrote, our men think nothing of shooting a Japanese prisoner or a soldier attempting to surrender. They treat the Jap with less respect than they would give an animal, and these acts are condoned by almost everyone. We claim to be fighting for civilization, but the more I see of this war in the Pacific the less right I think we have to claim to be civilized. In fact, I am not sure that our record in this respect stands so much higher than the Japs. The racial implications extended even to the victims of the Japanese, the Filipino civilians, who were disparagingly referred to as flips or gooks. There would be no battle of attrition in Burma. The British had followed the Japanese survivors of Imphal across the mountains into Burma and across the Chindwin River. On the day MacArthur's troops landed at Lingayen Gulf, January 9, they launched an offensive toward Mandalay in the heart of Burma still drained by the Mphil disaster, the Japanese could do little to impede the British sweep south. Barmore knew the war was lost and he began preparing for the post-war armed struggle to evict the British from his country. He would have to find ways to keep alive the spirit of freedom among the Burmese, coupled with a continuing hatred for the British Raj. He set up a Supreme Defense Council to mobilize war activities among his people. This is the final battle in our long struggle with British imperialism, he told them. We have fought it three times before and lost, and so became a subject race for generations. We must now fight and win this fourth and final round with the help of Japan, for if we lose again we shall be slaves for a very long time more. Barmore was successful in implanting a lasting antagonism toward the British but could not slow their drive. On March 9 they entered Mandalay, capturing the Oba railway station and Mandalay Hill, then continued south toward the capital, Rangoon. Important as the Philippines and Burma once seemed to the Japanese military leaders, they could not escape the inevitable logic that the empire's last hope lay in the successful defense of a relatively small island just 350 miles south of the homeland, Okinawa. Admiral Tomioka, for example, believed the enemy could be beaten there with an all-out effort, and this victory would give Japan six months to negotiate a peace which would guarantee the continuing rule of the emperor. The fall of Leyte and Iwo Jima had left General Koizo's cabinet at the point of collapse. Koizo had purposely been installed as interim premier, and from his first day in office his course had been uncertain. 
with all the prestige of his position but without genuine support from any faction, Koizo exerted almost no influence on the prosecution of the war and none at all on the subterranean efforts for peace. Unlike Tojo, he did not represent the militarists, many of whom regarded him with suspicion. Nor was he privy to the continuous and complex maneuvers of the peace groups. Concern over the future of the nation under such leadership was so acute that the emperor summoned Marquis Kaido and suggested that it might be necessary for him to consult the former prime ministers concerning the deteriorating war situation. Only once before, on the eve of the war itself, had the emperor convened the Jushin to discuss anything except the selection of a new premier. Kaido had the Jushin brought to the emperor's office one at a time lest the military become suspicious if they appeared as a group. It would also make it easier for each man to speak freely. But except for Konos, their advice was vague and poorly thought through, or simply an emotional appeal to continue the fight with determination. Kono's appraisal was a closely reasoned, if misguided, examination of the political and military abyss into which Japan would fall unless peace were concluded shortly. His opinions were expressed in an eight-page memorial to the throne, written in his own hand with Japanese brush and read aloud to the emperor. It is doubtful that any subject other than Kona would have dared present such a frank evaluation directly to his majesty. Like almost everything else concerning Kona it was an anomaly, objective and subjective, practical and impractical. Starting with a courageous pronouncement, regrettable though it is, I believe that Japan has already lost the war, he made a charge based solely on his own growing paranoia toward communism, the greatest danger to maintenance of Japan's imperial system comes not from defeat itself but from the threat of a communist revolution. Then, in an attempt to prove that Japan was about to be seized by native reds, he accurately foresaw the course of Marxism in Eastern Europe and Korea. His next historical assessment, however, was again faulted by his fixed idea, the Manchurian Incident, the China Incident and the Greater East Asian War, too, had been a scheme consciously plotted by army radicals, themselves puppets of right-wing civilian extremists who were simply communists clothed in national essence, secretly intending to bring about a communist revolution. Like so many intellectuals who lean far left in their youth and grow conservative with age, Kono saw the red menace everywhere. He charged that those who were sponsoring the slogan 100 million die together had done so at the instigation of communists who are trying to throw the country into confusion and bring about a revolution. Moreover, some army leaders were so infused with pro-Soviet sentiment that they were urging an alliance with Russia at any cost while others were calling for cooperation with Mao. Yet the conclusion that he drew from these fanciful accusations was inescapable logic, peace could only be negotiated if the militarists, although they know they cannot win the war, I believe they will fight to the death in order to save face, were circumvented. Thus if the tree is severed at the roots, its leaves and branches will wither and die. His recommendation for dealing with the die-hard militarists, however, was unrealistic, though desirable, eliminate them by a coup d'etat, and then negotiate directly with America and Britain. All its inconsistencies notwithstanding, the rambling memorial stimulated both the emperor and his chief advisor. Unlike his fellow Jushin, Kono had uncovered the core of the problem, and while his solution was impractical, it would eventually be transformed into an efficacious plan for peace by the pragmatic Kaido. Prime Minister Koizo's personal desire to end the war favorably was not curbed by the lack of confidence shown in him by the pacifists and militarists. Perversely, he saw peace with Chiang Kai-shek as the key to honorable negotiations with America and Britain. Moreover, his choice for go-between was a man known throughout the Far East as an intriguer, Miao Pin. An official of the Nanking puppet regime, he claimed to be in secret radio communication with the Nanking government. Koizo's own foreign minister and his most knowledgeable advisor on China, Mei Muru Shai Jemitsu, warned that the notorious Miao was merely trying to promote his own ambitions. To believe in his mediatory role, Shai Jemitsu later wrote, was childish naivete and betrayal of ignorance of Chinese politics. 
Koizo would not listen and persuaded his war minister, Field Marshal Sujiyama, to bring me out of Japan on a military plane. At the airport near Tokyo, Miao ignored the Prime Minister, who had invited him, and insisted on being driven directly to a meeting with a member of the royal family, Prince Higashikuni, where he tried to ingratiate himself with the Emperor. But His Majesty found such intrigue as distasteful as had Koizo's cabinet. Miao returned ignominiously to China, subsequently to be executed by Chiang, and with him disappeared Koizo's last hope of remaining in power. The Japan War History Office calculated that 72,489 died. Like General Homer, Yamashita was tried, convicted and executed on MacArthur's orders. The atrocities committed in Manila weighed heavily against him despite the fact that he had ordered the city evacuated by all troops. The trial was conducted as hastily as Homer's. MacArthur radioed from Tokyo that he doubted the need of the defense for more time and urged that the tribunal be concluded with dispatch. There was no question but that the verdict would be guilty, nor could MacArthur find any mitigating circumstances in his review of the case. The proceedings were guided by that rationale of all judicial purpose, to ascertain the full truth unshackled by any artificialities of narrow method or technical arbitrariness. The results are above challenge. But two associate justices of the Supreme Court condemned the findings. Frank Murphy declared that the spirit of revenge and retribution, masked in formal legal procedure for purposes of dealing with a fallen enemy commander, can do more lasting harm than all of the atrocities giving rise to that spirit. Wiley Rutledge said it was no trial in the tradition of the common law and the Constitution, and quoted Thomas Paine. He that would make his own liberty secure must guard even his enemy from oppression, for if he violates this duty he establishes a precedent that will reach himself. President Truman refused to commute the sentence to life imprisonment and Yamashita was hanged on February 23, 1946, in Los Banos, a town 35 miles south of Manila. He was calm and stoical. His last words were, I will pray for the Emperor's long life and his prosperity forever. We have been unjust, hypocritical, and vindictive, said Yamashita's chief counsel, Captain Adolf Freel, Jr. We have defeated our enemies on the battlefield, but we have let their spirit triumph in our hearts. 28. The Last Sortie. 1. Extending south from Japan and curving toward Formosa for 790 miles like a long tail was a chain of some 140 islands, the Ryukyus. In the middle of this archipelago lay the last important bastion guarding the homeland, Okinawa. An elongated island about 60 miles from north to south, and only two miles wide near the middle. It was an ideal staging area for invasion of Japan with its flat waste for airfields and two deep water bays suitable for naval bases. Its climate was subtropical, moderated by the Kurashio, the Gulf Stream of the Pacific, and the Ogasawara Current. Humidity was high all year round, rainfall was heavy and erratic with a single day's downpour occasionally equaling a month's average. From May to November two typhoons a month swept over the island. Okinawa was a crossroads of the Orient, lying almost equidistant from Japan, China and Formosa, and had been influenced by all three as well as by the islands of the South Pacific. In 1372 it was taken over as a tributary by the founder of the Ming Dynasty. Two centuries later Japanese from Kyushu ravaged the island but allowed its inhabitants to continue sending tribute to China. This unique dual subservience existed until 1875, when Hirohito's grandfather dispatched an invasion force which took complete control of the Ryukyus. Four years later Emperor Meiji formally annexed the archipelago, made Japanese the official language and replaced Okinawa's king with a governor. As a colony the 450,000 people of Okinawa, the majority crammed into the southern, more habitable section of the island continued to live as they had for centuries, scratching out a meagre living predominantly as farmers. This neglect notwithstanding, Okinawa had by the outbreak of war with the West become an integral part of the empire, 
and was represented in the Diet as one of Japan's 47 prefectures. Technically its inhabitants were first-class citizens, but most mainlanders did not consider them their social equals. The Okinawans, with their mixed heritage, regarded themselves as Japanese and were as loyal to the emperor as any Tokyo resident, though most of them still practiced Chinese ancestor worship, and their chichi, protective household gods in the form of fantastic lions, were as much Chinese as Japanese. Only in Okinawa did colorful porcelain chichi, in myriad poses and sizes, cling to the tile roofs, ready to strike down any unfriendly intruder. For the first three years of the Pacific War, fewer than 600 troops were stationed in the Ryukyus, and it wasn't until April 1, 1944, that the 32nd Army, three full divisions and a brigade, was activated on Okinawa. At the end of the year it was significantly weakened by the transfer of the elite 9th Division to Formosa, but the Army Commander, Lt. Gen. Mitsuru Yushijima, a quiet and competent officer who had recently been Commandant of the Military Academy, still had a sizable force. The 24th Division from Manchuria comprised 14,000 men, including several thousand Okinawan conscripts, the 62nd Division, 12,000 troops, mainly infantrymen, who had fought in China, and the 5,000 men of the 44th Independent Mixed Brigade. There was also a single tank regiment of 14 medium and 13 light tanks, and various artillery units with a respectable number of 22 mm. Machine cannon, 75 mm. Guns, 150 mm. Howitzers and 81 mm. Mortars as well as 24 huge 320 mm spigot mortars which belched out 675 pound shells. In addition, Yushijima could count on two shipping engineer regiments, a variety of service units and 20,000 members of the Boatai, a home guard unit of Okinawans burning with ardor to serve their emperor. The withdrawal of the 9th Division forced Yushijima to formulate a new defense plan that would utilize his remaining men to the best advantage. He was almost certain that the enemy would land on the west coast just below the waste of the island along the spacious Hagushi beaches, so he concentrated his men in the south. He also began converting as many naval and service troops into frontline soldiers as possible. From sea raiding battalions, formed to man suicide boats, he extracted 5,500 foot soldiers, and though they were poorly trained and equipped, they were eager to fight on land. Another 10,000 naval personnel were organized into a force commanded by an admiral. To free more military personnel for combat, 3,900 Okinawans were temporarily assigned to the 32nd Army as labor troops. 600 students became messengers, orderlies and communication assistants at the various headquarters. One group of enthusiastic high school students was trained to fight, 750 of them were formed into special blood and iron for the emperor duty units and trained to infiltrate enemy lines and carry on guerrilla warfare. Just above Okinawa's two largest cities, Nahanshiri, the terrain was ideal for defense and it was here that Yushijima erected a defense line in depth, a series of concentric fortresses, facing north and extending across the island. Numerous caves, blockhouses, and gun emplacements were carved into the ridges and hills connected by a complex system of tunnels. Even the Chinese lyre-shaped tombs which dotted the countryside were transformed into pillboxes, over the objections of the old Okinawans. As at Iwo Jima, Yushijima would let the enemy land and engage him only from prepared positions. By March more than 100,000 defenders, including the Boatai, were in place. The two most experienced divisions manned the main defense line, while the 3rd Division and the 44th Independent Mixed Brigade were positioned at the southern end of Okinawa as insurance against any landing in that area. The northern half of the island was given mere token defense, two battalions. Yushijima had correctly foreseen American plans. They would come ashore at the Hagushi beaches, although there would be a decoy landing in the south. 
Iceberg was to be a joint Army-Navy operation under the overall command of Admiral Spruance, who had opposed the invasion of Formosa. An Army General, Simon Bolivar Buckner, Jr., another opponent of Formosa, would lead all the ground troops. His father, one of the Confederacy's first generals, had escaped from a Union prison. The son was a Spartan and went to extreme limits to prove it. During the Aleutian campaign he had slept on a thin mattress with a sheet for cover, he trained himself to read without glasses by squinting his eyes. His 10th army was made up of six combat experienced divisions, half army, half marine. The army trained and rehearsed on a Spirito Santo and late, while the marines used Guadalcanal. The task of transporting the assault force of 183,000 troops and 747,000 measurement tons of cargo to the battlefield was formidable. 430 assault transports would have to be loaded at 11 different ports, ranging from Seattle to late. The first step, on March 24, was the capture of the Keramas, a group of small mountainous islands 15 miles west of Naha. There were but 750 defenders to contend with, and they scattered for the hills and caves. It was obvious before dusk that the islands would soon provide a seaplane base and a fleet anchorage. That same day a systematic naval bombardment of Okinawa began. A week later frogmen worked openly along the Higushi beaches, clearing debris and detonating mines, while Japanese onshore watched an admiration mixed with frustration holding fire as instructed. The climax of the bombardment came on March 31st. When it ceased Rear Admiral W. H. P. Blandy, in charge of all preliminary operations, announced that the preparation was sufficient for a successful landing. At this point, 27,226 rounds of 5-inch or larger caliber shells had carpeted Okinawa. The effect appeared devastating but the main line of defense was still almost intact. Just before dawn on April 1st, Easter Sunday, the crash of naval gunfire again wakened Ushijima's men. Those along the west coast peered out of their shelters at an awesome sight, 1,300 ships massed offshore. It was L for Love, Day. At 8 o'clock landing craft packed with helmeted assault troops started for the beaches, LSTs disgorged their armored amphibians and amphibian tractors also loaded with men and equipment. There was almost no opposition as two army and two marine divisions poured ashore during the morning. This is hard to believe, wrote Robert Sherrod. I've already lived longer than I thought I would, remarked one infantryman of the 7th Division as he reached the top of a hill. He spoke for everyone. By night more than 60,000 Americans were ashore in a beachhead not quite three miles long and a mile in depth. Except for the uncontested Guadalcan landing, it was the least costly of any major invasion, 28 dead, 27 missing. We were on Okinawa an hour and a half after H hour, without being shot at, and hadn't even gotten our feet wet, reported the GI's favorite correspondent, Ernie Pyle. Okinawa was a piece of cake. Tenth Army moved swiftly on all fronts, meeting some resistance around the airfields from a Boatai unit, and before the end of the second day the Cadena Strip was not only cleared but repaired for emergency landings. On the third day the Marines, who had swung north, spanned the narrow waste of the island. Okinawa was cut in two. The Army divisions going south continued to meet desultory resistance. At the commanding village of Shimabaku they were confronted by a pair of Japanese, trembling old men who bowed repeatedly. One was the headman, the other was Councilman Shosai Kima, a teacher. Kima had persuaded the 1,300 villagers to remain in their homes rather than flee into the countryside and risk starvation. You American gentlemen! Kima called out. Me Okinawan Christian! The Americans warily covered the two Okinawans with their weapons. There was a tense wait of several minutes until an ISI interpreter, Thomas Heger, arrived. Sensei, teacher. He shouted, seizing Kima's hand. Kima Sensei, don't you remember me? 
My name is Taro Higa. I was one of your pupils in elementary school. All that day the Americans pushed deeper into the island to the north and south. Where was the enemy? Lieutenant Colonel James Brown of the 12th Marine Regiment, sent a note to the divisional supply officer, Colonel, please send us a dead chap. A lot of my men have never seen one. We'll bury him for you. 2. Without support from any quarter, Prime Minister Koizo's regime was doomed. Nevertheless, he continued to make frantic if futile attempts to save his cabinet. He confused the emperor by first suggesting a drastic reorganization of it and a moment later offering to resign, he took the same proposal of reorganization to Kaido, who reacted coolly, downcast, he returned to his majesty, who, embarrassed by Koizo's flounderings, said, study the matter carefully. It was a polite suggestion to step down but Koizo continued to insinuate himself. He told Prince Higashikuni he could properly carry on the war if he were reinstated on the active list, then he could be appointed war minister. He complained that the army had repeatedly turned down his request to replace war minister Sujiyama, and he was going to take the matter direct to the emperor. Again his majesty was non-committal. Koizo had exhausted every means left to save his government. Peaked. He told Kaido on the afternoon of April 4th that he was going to resign the following day. The most important function of the Privy Seal was to select a new Premier. By tradition Kaido would first have convened the Jushin and asked for their opinions before advising the Emperor. This time, however, a preliminary investigation had to be made at once, to ensure the selection of a man who would work for peace, yet be acceptable to the army. It was an exceptional step but one that had the full approval of His Majesty. On April 5th, as Koizo was presenting his formal resignation to the Emperor, Marquis Kaido sounded out each of the four military leaders separately. He suggested that it was perhaps time to form an imperial headquarters or conduct of war cabinet, in which the Prime Minister, necessarily a military man, would control not only the affairs of state but the supreme command. Both Army Chief of Staff Umzu and War Minister Sujiyama were cool to such a cabinet. Umzu acknowledged that the battle on Okinawa was going badly but that Japan must be prepared to fight to the end. Sujiyama was just as pessimistic, yet held out the hope that once Russia defeated Germany she might advise her allies to make peace with Japan. Navy Chief of Staff Koshiro Oikawa was uncertain about the outcome of the war. He doubted that even a victory on Okinawa would end it, the enemy would simply attack again. The testimony of these three indicated to Kaido that the high command had privately come to realize that the war could not be won. As for the fourth man, Navy Minister Yonai's secret advocacy of peace was, of course, well known to the Marquis. Besides, the minister had found a suitable candidate for the premiership, Admiral Kantaro Suzuki. The suggestion seemed ideal to Kaido. The former Grand Chamberlain was a large-scale man, whom His Majesty affectionately called Oi Aji, old man. Later that afternoon, at five o'clock, the Jushin, except Baron Wakatsuki, whose train was late, assembled in the Imperial Chamber to select a Premier. They were joined by Kaido and the new head of the Privy Council, who was fortuitously the Privy Seal's choice for Prime Minister, Admiral Suzuki. In Tojo's first session as a Jushin, he was alert and aggressive, making it obvious from the first that he would reject any peace candidate. His fellow Jushin all opposed him but not overtly. For fear of alerting the militarists, they could not risk an open clash. Koizo's resignation states that the affairs of the state as well as the Supreme Command need revision, Tojo began. What does this mean? It was as much a challenge as a question. Prime Minister Koizo doesn't give any special explanations, Kaido replied. It is not desirable to have many changes of government during the war, Tojo said belligerently. The next cabinet must be the last one. Now, there are two schools of thought in this nation, one that we should fight till the end to secure the future of the country, the other to bring peace speedily even at the expense of unconditional surrender. I believe we must first settle this point. 
The next cabinet must consider a wide variety of subjects, said Admiral Keshiko Kada, who likes Suzuki. His private choice for Prime Minister, had had such a narrow escape during the 226 incident. This is the cabinet on whose shoulders will rest the destiny of our nation until the end, and which will marshal the entire strength of the nation. Questions such as peace and war cannot be determined here. There was an uneasy pause and two of the civilians, Horonuma and Hirota, attempted to placate Tojo. Both asserted, tongue-in-cheek, that the war must be fought to the end. The Jushin began debating the requisites of the future Prime Minister but without naming any one person. At last, after an hour, it was President of the Privy Council Suzuki who suggested that one of the Jushin themselves accept the post. Since the physical strain is so great, I should like to ask Prince Kono, the youngest in the group, to come forward. Kono declined. He was too compromised by the mistakes and commitments of his three past governments. Horonuma agreed that Kono was unacceptable on these grounds, reiterated, for Tojo's benefit, that the war must be prosecuted vigorously, and then proposed the favorite candidate of Kaido and Okada, Admiral Suzuki. The response was enthusiastic. I agree, said Kono. Very good idea, said Wakatsuki who had arrived out of breath and apologetic. We couldn't make a better choice. Suzuki himself objected, he had promised his family he would not accept the post. I think I told Admiral Okada once that if a military man goes into politics, he would only lead the nation to defeat. This is proved by the fall of Rome, the eclipse of the Kaiser and the fate of the Romanifs. Because of this principle, I cannot accept the honor. Besides, I am hard of hearing. Horonuma begged him to reconsider. The public trusts your honest and loyal character. It was difficult even for Tojo to disapprove of Suzuki, he was a devout Taoist, free of ambition, he came from a solid military background, his brother was a respected general, but he lacked one vital qualification. Tojo began by praising the admiral but challenged his tenet that the military should avoid politics. The enemy is getting impatient. He will try a bold strategy, he is likely to attempt landing somewhere on Japan proper. Home defense will then become a vital matter. The government and the high command must be fused into one. Therefore the premier must be a soldier on the active list. He proposed Field Marshal Shunroku Hata. Kaido restrained himself. What is your opinion, Mr. Hirota? We must have someone from the army or navy who can control and lead them. Your opinion, please, Admiral Okada. Okada refused to endorse anyone except Suzuki, who had been summarily rejected by Tojo. I know of no one, he said, so I can say nothing. Kaido acknowledged that the homeland would soon be a battlefield and the new cabinet would need the full confidence of the nation. But there he parted company with Tojo. Personally, he said, I hope that His Excellency Suzuki will rise to the occasion. He turned directly to Tojo. We must look at the situation in a wider perspective than yours. Tojo glared at Kaido. Until now he had curbed his bitterness toward the Privy Seal, whom he blamed for his own downfall. Be very careful, otherwise I'm afraid the army will sopo o Mukyu turn its head away. If it does, the new cabinet will fall. The phrase infuriated rather than intimidated Kaido. It is very serious to have the army turn its head away from us, he said. Do you yourself feel that way? I can't say that I don't. Kaido stood his ground. The atmosphere at this meeting is really quite anti-militaristic. Perhaps the people will turn their heads away from the army. Tojo's threatening posture also provoked Okada to action. At a time as critical as this, he exclaimed indignantly, how dare a man who once accepted the imperial command to be premier say that the army might turn its head away. Tojo realized he had gone too far. I'm sorry, he said. I take back what I just said. I meant to say that the army will find such a choice disagreeable. Tojo was isolated. 
the whole trend of the meeting had turned against him. Keeping all this in mind, Kaido summed up, I will present my views to the emperor and ask for his decision. A few minutes later, at eight o'clock, the meeting was adjourned, and the members filed to a nearby room for dinner. Before they were through, Kaido asked Suzuki to return with him to the conference room. If you form a government, Kaido told him, we would have to ask you to carry out extremely important tasks. Once more Suzuki demurred. He didn't think he was fit for the job and he lacked confidence. Kaido persisted. The times were too perilous to decline on the grounds that a military man should not become involved in politics. It is beyond that, Admiral. We must recommend someone to the Emperor whom he trusts implicitly. Suzuki capitulated. If the Emperor orders me to form a new cabinet, I will do it, he said. There was no emotion, not a trace of reluctance in his voice. At ten o'clock the seventy-eight-year-old Admiral, his back bowed with age, entered the Emperor's study. His Majesty, who was alone except for Grand Chamberlain Hisnerai Fujita, said simply, I order you to form a cabinet. He omitted the traditional admonitions and conditions. I am very pleased to be so honored by His Majesty's offer but I beg to decline as I did at the Jushin meeting held late this afternoon. Within an hour he had changed his mind twice. I am merely His Majesty's humble naval officer and have had no experience in political affairs. Further, I have no political opinions. My motto has been to abide by the adage of Emperor Meiji to the effect that military men should never interfere in politics. Therefore, begging his majesty's pardon, I must refrain from accepting his majesty's offer. The emperor smiled understandingly. I know, Suzuki, what you're trying to say and appreciate your position, but at this critical moment there is no one but you for this task. That is why I have asked you. As he slowly backed away, Suzuki said, with his majesty's permission, I wish to think it over fully but the Emperor's sincerity had already decided him to once more change his mind. As a result of more than seven years' service as Grand Chamberlain, he had also interpreted correctly the unspoken words of His Majesty, to end the conflict as soon as possible. 3. That evening on the inland sea, farewell parties enlivened the super battleship Yamato and nine other ships of the Second Fleet. Its commander, Vice Admiral Seichi Ito, had been ordered by Admiral Somutoi Oda, commander of Combined Fleet, to lead these remnants against enemy vessels anchored off Okinawa. Toi Oda informed all commanders in Combined Fleet of the suicide sortie. The fate of our empire truly rests upon this one action. I have called for the organization of a surface special attack unit for a breakthrough operation of unrivaled bravery so that the power of the Imperial Navy may be felt in this one action in order that the brilliant tradition of the Imperial Navy's surface forces may be exalted and our glory handed down to posterity. Each unit, regardless of whether or not IT is a special attack unit, will harden IT's resolve to fight gloriously to the death to completely destroy the enemy fleet thereby establishing firmly an eternal foundation for the empire. The party rear Admiral Keizo Komura gave for commanding officers of his second destroyer squadron aboard his flagship, the light cruiser Yahagai, was boisterous. Each ship had taken on just enough fuel for a one-way trip, but knowledge of this and the certainty of their death seemed to free the officers from care. Komura and Captain Tamei Chihara, skipper of Yahagai, left their comrades singing the fraternal Doki no Sura and went on an impromptu tour of the ship. In the sailors' quarters they found men sleeping peacefully in their hammocks. In an engine room a machinist's mate sweating diligently over a generator told Hara, I changed watches with my buddy who likes to drink. He wanted to be absolutely sure there would be no power failure at Okinawa. Hara clambered topside, overwhelmed with emotion and alcohol. He felt tremendously happy as he clung to a post for support. Nippon Banzai! He yelled, tears streaming down his cheeks. Yahagai Banzai! Nippon Banzai! Vice Admiral Runosuke Kizaka, Toyoda's Chief of Staff, veteran of Pearl Harbor, 
Midway and the carrier battles off Guadalcanal, had vehemently opposed the suicide sortie of the Second Fleet, Yamato could be used to better advantage in the battle for the mainland. But he was the one selected to fly to the inland sea on the morning of April 6. The fleet would depart that evening for its rendezvous with destiny, to explain personally the significance of the mission. Ito understood, he wanted advice on one matter. What should I do if we are so badly damaged on the way that we can't proceed? Kizaka could not help him. You'll have to decide that for yourself. They drank a last cup of sake? I see, said Ito. Please do not be uneasy about me. My mind is calm. I have no regrets and am leaving willingly. He asked Kizaka to address his senior officers. Kizaka told them it was Combined Fleet's last chance as well as the nation's. They must break through the American naval force off Okinawa and ground their ships on the island. Yamato's big guns, their range was 25 miles, could devastate the enemy positions. There were private doubts but no one voiced them. The captain of Yamato, however, Rear Admiral Kozaku Araiga, was eager. With a perpetual grin, he slapped his stomach every time Kizaka made a point. Captain Hara wrote his family that he was going on a surface attack mission. It is a great responsibility as well as a great honor to be skipper of a ship in this sortie to Okinawa. Know that I am happy and proud of this opportunity. Be proud of me. Farewell. Extra supplies were offloaded from the ships. The sick as well as the midshipmen were compelled to disembark against their will. The sun shone through the mist as the fleet weighed anchor at 3 p.m. Hara's cruiser, Yahagai, got underway first, followed by four destroyers, and finally Yamato with four more destroyers. As the ten ship column slowly proceeded south through the inland sea, the first of ten mass air raids was launched against ships clustered off Okinawa. For almost four hours, 341 bombers dropped their explosives in conventional style while 355 kamikaze plummeted down on the Americans. By dark three destroyers, an LSD and two ammunition ships had been sunk, and ten other ships heavily damaged. On Yamato, Admiral Ito was elated by reports that 30 enemy ships had been seen going down, while another 20 were afire. Overhead Kuzaka followed the column in a float plane as far as his fuel would allow, then waved an arm in farewell as the little plane banked away. That evening Yahagai's thousand-man crew assembled on her deck to hear Captain Hara read a final message from Admiral Toy Oda exhorting them to fight to the end, the fate of the nation rested on this operation. As the shouts of Banzai subsided, Hara added practical strictures of his own which scandalized most of the crew, our mission appears suicidal, and it is. But I wish to emphasize that suicide is not the objective. The objective is victory. You are not sheep whipped to a sacrificial altar. Once this ship is crippled or sunk, do not hesitate to save yourselves for the next fight. There will be other battles. You are not to commit suicide. You are to beat the enemy. This time there were no Banzai. A perturbed lieutenant broke the silence, he had been taught at the academy to die with his ship. Haru understood his concern. In feudal times, he said, lives were wasted cheaply, but we are in the twentieth century. The code of Bushido says that a warrior lives in such a way that he is always prepared to die. But this didn't mean that their lives should be forfeited meaninglessly. We are to win this war and not think of dying. He called on them to turn the tide of battle. There was a spontaneous cheer for the Emperor and Yahagai. At 8 pm, the Second Fleet cautiously picked its way through the mines of Bongo Strait and sorted into the Pacific. Ito ordered a course at 20 knots down the coast of Kyushu. His column had already been sighted by two American submarines, at dawn, the ten ships entered the open sea below the island. They shifted into a ring formation with Yamato in the center, and began zigzagging south toward Okinawa at 24 knots. The last escort planes turned back, and as the coast of Kyushu dropped out of sight, the fleet was alone. 
rain from low leaden clouds swept the Japanese ships at 8 a.m. an hour later one of the destroyers, a Sashimo, dropped out of the ring, signaling that she was having engine trouble but would try to make repairs. Before long she too was out of sight. Slowly the overcast broke and at 11.30 a seaplane appeared about 10 miles to the east. It was American. Then came a warning from an island lookout station ahead that 250 enemy planes were winging south. Admiral Spruance, still in command of 5th Fleet, had told Mark Mitcher, Task Force 58, to let the enemy ships continue south, leaving them to the guns of surface units, but Mitcher wanted this opportunity to demonstrate once and for all that his airmen could sink the most formidable ship afloat. Naval airmen claimed that they had sunk Musashi in the Philippines, but submarines could possibly have done it. The unexpected appearance of Yamato, her sister ship, provided a clean-cut chance to prove, if proof was needed, aircraft superiority. Mitya sent off planes from task groups 58.1 and 58.2, then turned to his chief of staff. Inform Admiral Spruance that I propose to attack the Yamato sortie group at 1200 unless otherwise directed. The message to Spruance read, Will you take them or shall I? Spruance scribbled on his message blank, You take them. On Yahagai's bridge, shortly after noon, Admiral Komura saw the approaching planes first. Here they come! he exclaimed to Captain Hara. Rapidly the ships opened formation as crews scrambled to battle stations. The fleet was abruptly blanketed by a rain squall, but only for ten minutes. A lookout on Yahagai called out, planes on port bow. Ha returned. Planes, more than forty of them, were diving out of a low thick cloud. Yamato's 150 anti-aircraft and machine guns hesitated momentarily. Then the sky erupted with black puffs, crisscrossed by tracers. But the Americans burst through this swall of flak. Two bombs crashed near Yamato's mainmast. A torpedo ripped into the battleship's port side. The 8,500 ton Yahagai heeled sharply in the rain to avoid the resolute assault, but at 12.45 pm she staggered from a bomb. Almost immediately a momentous shudder ran through the ship. A torpedo had plunged into her port side just below the waterline. The cruiser coasted to a stop, helpless and dead in the water, as a second group of attackers dropped out of the clouds. A bomb detonated on the forecastle, another in the stern, a torpedo rammed into the starboard bow. Yahagai vibrated violently, as if, thought Hara, she were made of paper. The planes climbing away through patches of clear sky seemed almost cocky, and in the abrupt, unearthly quiet, Hara surveyed his wrecked cruiser in dismay. Admiral Komura wanted to transfer to one of the destroyers and continue on to Okinawa. The destroyer Isakes was signaled to come alongside to take on survivors, but as she slowly closed, the hapless destroyer was caught by a second wave of planes bursting through a cloud. Yahagai too, was raked by machine gun bullets. Komura refused to escape in a cutter. He would die on Yahagai rather than on some nameless little boat. A few miles away the twisted decks of Yamato were jammed with butcher bodies, a tangle of intestines, limbs, torsos. Blood coursed down the scuppers. The sides of the battleship had buckled and she had slowed to eighteen knots but Admiral Ariga kept her on course to Okinawa. At 1.35 p.m. a third wave, it looked like 150 planes, swept in, concentrating on the damaged port side. Yamato heeled and swerved, but two more torpedoes, the fifth and sixth, drove into the left side while seven or more bombs exploded on the center deck. Machine gun bullets swept the ship like crane annihilating half of the anti-aircraft gun crews. Steering was damaged and the list increased to 15 degrees. At 1.50 the officer supervising water control phoned the bridge, we have reached maximum water level. To prevent further listing we must flood the starboard engine rooms. This meant cutting speed to 9 knots, 
but the commander of air defense had been pleading for half an hour to correct the listing so he could fire his guns. The executive officer, Captain Jiro Nomura, hesitated but a moment. Flood the engine rooms, he said. Slowly the battleship began to level. Then another torpedo hit the port and the listing resumed. At 2 p.m. Yamato took her eighth torpedo, this one on the starboard side. An urgent call came from the emergency steering room, too much water here. We can no longer steer, the steering commander's voice was cut off. Bring the ship north. Admiral Ariga shouted. Traditionally a dead man was faced north, Ariga wanted to do the same for the dying Yamato. But the men in the emergency steering room had drowned at their posts, and the ship began circling slowly to port, out of control, just as the fourth wave appeared. The temporary hospital on the bow was obliterated. Three more torpedoes knifed into the hulk. Listing increased to 18 degrees, speed slowed to 7 knots. The cruiser Yahagai was rapidly settling, her decks already awash. She had absorbed thirteen bombs and seven torpedoes. Everywhere he looked Captain Hara saw destroyers either sinking or in flames. Two seemed unharmed and they were darting protectively around Yamato. Admiral Komura felt water creeping up his legs. He glanced at his watch, it was 2.05. Just then he was sucked under. He knew it was the end of his life but he remained conscious, engulfed in swirling water for what seemed an eternity before he shot to the surface. As he paddled through the oily water he saw a black-faced man. It was Hara. At the crest of a wave Hara got a glimpse of Yamato six odd miles away. Planes swarmed around her like gnats. But she was moving, a beautiful sight. On Yamato's bridge executive officer Nomura noticed red lights flash on the warning board. He approached to see where the danger was. Half a dozen lights glowed, gun turret number one and at least five ammunition storerooms. Were they going to have a chain explosion? Of the 1170 rounds for the big guns, three had been fired. If the remaining shells detonated, the unsinkable Yamato would burst at the seams. A backup warning device began its ominous buzzing, then another, and another and another. He heard Ariga shout at him. Can't we pump water into the ammunition rooms? And his voice seemed to be tearing his throat. It was impossible. The water control command post was destroyed. Namura waited for the explosion that would obliterate them all. He thought with a measure of satisfaction, well, that's all right. It will be a samurai's harakiri. Shortly after 2.15 pm the twelfth torpedo struck the port side, as if, Namura thought, we had received the coup de grace. If the order to abandon ship wasn't given without delay, the crew would be lost. But no instructions came from Admiral Ariga. Namura lurched up the narrow spiral staircase to the second bridge, where he could survey the ship. Normally the top deck was 25 feet above water level, the port side of the deck was awash. It was incongruous to see men sitting at the bow smoking and eating hard deck. Inexplicably, Namura was annoyed at their nonchalance. Towering water columns geezered on either side of the ship. Namura's eyes swept the superstructure. Something was missing. The flag. He took another look, the mast itself was gone. Were the pictures of the Emperor and Empress safe? During a battle they were kept in the main gun command post, the most armored place aboard ship. Namur phoned the gun commander and learned he had locked himself in his cabin with the pictures lest they float away when the ship sank. With the Amato listing more than 30 degrees, Namur phoned Ariga. The end is near, he said. It was time for the entire crew to come topside. Ariga, in turn, informed Admiral Ito over the voice tube that there was no longer any prospect of correcting the list. Fleet Commander, your person is valuable. Please leave the ship with the crew. I alone will remain. Ariga gave orders to assemble on the upper deck, then phoned Namura, who was still on the second bridge. Executive officer, he said hoarsely, 
leave the ship immediately and report the details of the action to combined fleet. Namura's protest was curtly ignored by Araiga. I'm remaining with the ship. Be sure to get home alive. Captain, Namura insisted, I'm staying with you. Executive officer, that is an order. He hung up and told a crewman to lash him to the compass post. Sailors started tying each other to the bridge pinnacle. What are you doing? Araiga shouted angrily. You young men jump in and swim for it. Ito refused to leave the ship too. He shook hands with Chief of Staff Morishita, and while his staff looked on with 10,000 feelings, the Admiral balanced his way along the listing deck, opened the door of a spiral staircase and disappeared. His aide made a move to follow but Morishita shouted, Barker! Young men should live to serve the Emperor. At 2.25 pm the listing increased rapidly until the great ship was rolling on her beam ends. Cries of Banzai! were drowned out by the rush of water. Yamato was on one side, like a found at whale lights blacked out as gun wreckage, ammunition, pieces of bodies slid inexorably into the sea. Men struggled up the almost vertical deck, slipping on their comrades' blood. At the top they clambered over the starboard rail, where they clustered on the side of the ship. Executive Officer Namur felt himself being pulled underwater by a titanic force. In the clear sea he saw other men dancing about in the whirlpool. Below was a bottomless dark blue. The light above diminished. Close to death, he felt his sense of awareness becoming unexpectedly clear. He tumbled deeper and deeper in agony. Bright red flashes shot through the water. A series of concussions slammed him like battering rams. It was as if heaven and earth were blowing up. The ammunition was exploding underwater. Namura was propelled to the surface. Balls of fire arched across the waves. He rolled over on his back and floated. The end of Yamato, he thought, the end of the Imperial Navy. Aboard the destroyer Yukake's its captain, Commander Tokigai Teroki, watched in despair as Yamato, it stood for Japan rolled over and disappeared. He signaled Captain Masayoshi Yoshida, the new senior officer of the fleet who is aboard the destroyer Fuatsuki, recommend we proceed with mission. Pick up survivors and then we will decide course of action was the answer. Yukikaze's torpedo officer wanted to lower a cutter for survivors but Teroki stopped him. This is no ordinary mission, he shouted. This is a suicide attack. Even with Yamato gone we should continue. He signaled Yoshida again, requesting reconsideration then ordered his men to pick up survivors but only those who could be used in the attack. Ignore the wounded. Section. Those in the water faced a double hazard, abandonment and bullets from strafing American planes which systematically stitched a pattern of death across the battle area. Hara watched in wonder as a flying boat skimmed the surface and settled to taxi speed nearby. It churned toward a patch of water dyed green. An American pilot scrambled out of a life raft into the plane, and as it heaved out of the sea like an aged goose, Hara felt envious. It was hours later, near dusk, when Hara himself, along with Admiral Komura and other survivors of Yahagai, was finally picked up by the destroyer Hatsushimo. Komura took time to clean his oily face and put on a borrowed uniform before he wrote out a message for Combined Fleet. We are now heading for Okinawa. His entire fleet consisted of two sound destroyers, two other destroyers had survived and both of them were limping back to Japan. But before Komura's message could be transmitted, Combined Fleet cancelled the entire Okinawa mission. Hatsushima reversed course for home. It was Komura who had sent the first planes over Pearl Harbor, the search planes from Shikama and he had survived the last sortie of the Japanese Navy. He had seen the beginning and the end. I've had enough, he muttered. 4. In Tokyo that night Hajime Suzuki, the only son of the next Prime Minister, could not sleep. His father, who had miraculously survived the 226 incident, the bullet that had pierced his heart was still lodged in his back, undoubtedly faced danger from radical young officers again. 
But Hajim was no longer a child and felt he should become his father's shield. Early the next morning Hajim told Suzuki that he would quit his job at the agriculture ministry and become his personal secretary. Don't accompany me to death, said the admiral. I have come a long way but you still have far to go. Hajim could not be dissuaded, personal aspirations would be meaningless in a defeated Japan. Suzuki summoned Admiral Kejiko Kada to his house and asked him to serve as munitions minister in the new cabinet. Okada was as appalled by the suggestion, he had been retired from the navy for seven years and remained anathema to the radical officers, as he was by the confusion in the Suzuki household. The admiral was surrounded by well-meaning amateurs who could hardly use a telephone properly, let alone help him select a cabinet. Okada phoned his son-in-law, Hisatsunsei Kamizu, who had spirited him out of the prime minister's, Okada's, official residence in 1936. I am now at Admiral Suzuki's, helping him form a cabinet, he began. Sei Kamizu, with his shrewd grasp of both politics and the military, was the only one who could prevent Suzuki from making disastrous mistakes. Within the hour Sei Kamizu left his post at the finance ministry to become cabinet secretary. Suzuki's greatest strength was a conviction that he was best qualified to end the war, but he had not yet made up his mind how to go about it. If he announced such a defeatist policy, even to his cabinet, he would be forced out of office or assassinated. For a while he would have to play Harijai, the stomach game, that is, to dissemble, to support the war while seeking peace. As a result, Kona refused a cabinet post when Suzuki would not give any assurance that he would work for peace. On the other hand, he was quick to promise Marshal Sujiyama that he would carry on the war to its ultimate end, and moreover, told reporters, now is the time for every one of the hundred million people to cast away what holds them down and to become the glorious shields for the defense of the national structure. I, of course, will deal with the national administration and am prepared to fall as the spearhead of you, the people. I ask you, the people, to manifest a new fighting power with the courageous and furious will to drive ahead over my body, and thus to put the imperial mind at ease. At the time, Suzuki did not reveal his stratagem to anyone, but his son, Hajime, intuitively understood his father and informed close friends, in a written announcement, of his true intentions. The cabinet was invested on April 7, though the most significant position, that of foreign minister, had not been filled. The other selections had been based on advice by fellow Jushin and Seikamazu, but after considerable thought Suzuki's preference for the man who would have to engineer peace negotiations was Shijinrai Togo. Investigation indicated that Togo, who had held the post at the time of Pearl Harbor, had opposed going to war and later resigned in opposition to Tojo's dictatorial and high-handed policies. Togo was rusticating in Karuizawa, the favorite resort town of diplomats near the Japanese Alps, when he got a phone call from a go-between, the governor of Nagano Prefecture, transmitting Suzuki's offer. Togo's reply was blunt, not until he had discussed the matter with the new prime minister and reached an agreement of views. He would not return to public life unless he had a free hand. In Tokyo, however, he found Suzuki unwilling to abandon Harijai, even in a confidential conversation with someone who shared his own views. I assume you took office with some definite things in mind, Togo told him in his heavy Kyushu accent, since it will be anything but easy to manage the affairs of state now, with the war effort in its last throes. Suzuki's answer could not have alienated Togo more, I think that we can still carry on the war for another two or three years. Togo declined the post. Even if I felt able to accept the grave responsibility of our diplomacy, the Prime Minister and I would be unable to cooperate effectively so long as we held divergent views on the prospects for the war. But the matter did not end there. Too many others saw Togo as an advocate for peace and each in turn brought pressure upon him. Within 24 hours he was importuned by half a dozen leaders, including two Jushin and the Emperor's chief advisor. Admiral Okada, for instance, argued that Suzuki's policy was not necessarily rigid and Togo could help mold it, 
and Okada's son-in-law, Seikamizu, excused Suzuki, it would have been too hazardous for him to speak of an early peace at their initial meeting. Such language, coming from one in the Prime Minister's position and in those circumstances, might have had undesirable repercussions. Togo could not understand such circuity. If Suzuki had agreed with him about peace, why couldn't he have let him know in their private conversation? If Suzuki did not even trust the man he wanted as foreign minister, how could they possibly cooperate in the critical days ahead? The next appeal came from the office of the Privy Seal. Matsudera, Kaido's chief secretary, revealed that the emperor himself was hoping the war would end. This concerted effort brought Togo a second time to Suzuki, who now realized he must be more candid. So far as the outcome of the war is concerned, he told Togo, your views are quite satisfactory to me. And as to diplomacy, you shall have a free hand. Togo remained reluctant. He demanded assurance that the cabinet would support peace negotiations if a study showed that the war could not be continued for three more years at least. Suzuki dropped all pretense. Without qualification he accepted Togo's condition. To the rest of the world, however, the admiral continued Harijai, pretending to be as dedicated to a fight to the bitter end as a Tojo. 5. After a week on Okinawa, the two American army divisions pressing south had still encountered nothing but enemy outposts and were far ahead of schedule. Admiral Turner was so confident that he radioed Nimitz at noon on April 8. I may be crazy but it looks like the Japs have quit the war, at least in this section. Delete all after crazy was Nimitz's sardonic reply. The army troops were about to encounter the formidable defense system above Shiri. Here the island was four miles wide, a series of rolling limestone hills pocked with natural caves dotted with burial tombs and broken by terraces, escarpments and ravines. Since the hills ran generally from east to west, the Americans faced successive natural lines of defense. That afternoon, persistent enemy fire brought Buckner's east flank to a complete halt while his west flank was delayed by a hill mass extending east for a thousand yards from the coast to Highway 5 a road running through the middle of the defense system all the way down to Shiri. This land elevation was Kakaza Ridge, two hills connected by a saddle. It didn't look like much of an obstacle, for it was neither high nor jagged, merely a squat hump covered with grass, brush and small trees. But this chunky, ugly hill was one of the keys of the Shiri defense, and when the Americans stormed up to its crest on the morning of April 9 they were met by a spirited defense. By late afternoon, out of ammunition and their ranks decimated, they fell back. The next two days were a bloody stalemate as the Americans on both flanks repeatedly attacked and were thrown back. It was the battle Yu Shijima wanted, but being on the defense rankled his impatient subordinates, they had persuaded him, against his better judgment to approve a six-battalion assault the following night, April 12, in conjunction with another mass kamikaze raid. The 22nd Regiment, of the 62nd Division, would attack on the left, and on the evening of the 11th its commander, Lieutenant Colonel Masaru Yoshida, who had been in Okinawa less than a month, assembled his officers to outline the mission. You will be traveling in darkness over bad roads and under heavy shelling, the secrecy of our plans must be maintained to the last. March in a sinuous eel line. Although you are going to an unfamiliar place, do not make any noise when you arrive, but dig to Katsubo in hard ground and camouflage them skillfully by dawn tomorrow. It was raining heavily as the men, toting 110-pound packs, started toward the front on the muddy roads. Early the following morning 185 kamikaze, accompanied by 150 fighters and 45 torpedo planes, began assaulting the ships around Okinawa. Then came eight two-engine bombers, underneath them hung a new weapon, the Okar, Cherry Blossom, bomb. Powered by three boost rockets, this one-way glider looked like a torpedo with small wings and the pilot could dive its ton of trinitroanisole explosives at more than 500 knots. 
The new suicide weapon was nicknamed Barker, stupid, bomb by the Americans, but it didn't lessen the terror it spread instantly throughout the fleet. At about 2.45 p.m. one dropped from the belly of its mother ship and arrowed into the destroyer man at El Abel, which had just been staggered by a kamikaze hit. The ship jackknifed in two and sank almost instantly. Another Oka exploded on the destroyer Stanley. In the meantime, kamikaze and conventional planes sank LCSL-33 and damaged a battleship, three destroyers and eight other ships. The assault on the ground was less successful. It opened with a concentrated artillery and mortar barrage, which lifted at midnight. Japanese infantrymen began infiltrating into the American positions, but the glare of NGF star shells caught them in the open and within an hour the counter-attack faltered. For the first time warrant officer Kane Mai Mai of the 22nd Regiment, the son of a Shinto priest, heard the word retreat from his battalion commander. He repeated it, but his men stood uncomprehending. After me. Called I Mai and started trotting forward as if on the attack. His men followed and so did several other platoons, as he swung back to the rear. In Warm Springs, Georgia, it was still April 12th. After lunch President Roosevelt sat for a watercolor portrait at the clapboard cottage called the Little White House, two miles from the Warm Springs Foundation. At 1.15 p.m. he closed his eyes and said quietly, I have a terrific headache. He slumped over unconscious. Dr. James Poyne, former president of the American Medical Association, arrived, after a two-hour race over back roads, to find the president in a cold sweat, ashy gray and breathing with difficulty. His pulse was barely perceptible and four minutes later his heart sounds disappeared completely. Dr. Poyne gave him an intracardiac dose of adrenaline. The president's heart beat a few times, then stopped forever. It was 3.55 p.m. The Nazis looked upon his death as a last-minute reprieve from defeat. Fate has laid low your greatest enemy. God has not abandoned us, Goebbels feverishly told Hitler over the phone. Twice he has saved you from savage assassins. Death, which the enemy aimed at you in 1939 and 1944, has now struck down our most dangerous enemy. It is a miracle. Japan's new leader, on the other hand, did not rejoice. Prime Minister Suzuki broadcast his condolences to the American people, expressing his profound sympathy over the loss of a man who was responsible for the Americans' advantageous position today. A Japanese propagandist did take advantage of the situation, however, to promote a story that Roosevelt had died in anguish and altered his last words from I have a terrific headache to I have made a terrific mistake. Otherwise little attention was devoted to Roosevelt's death except on editorial pages. It is heaven's punishment, said the Mainichi. As the incarnation of American imperialism, he has had a cursed influence on the whole of mankind. The Asahi Shimbun quoted Admiral Namura, who had worked so hard for peace in Washington, as saying, this may be a foolish thing, but I had a dream four or five days ago. I was at the White House and when I went into Roosevelt's room there was a coffin there. The adjutant pointed to the coffin and told me Roosevelt was in there. This dream has come true. But no matter who dies, the American war drive will undergo no change and we must be determined to fight it out to the finish. The news reached Okinawa at dawn on the 13th. Attention. Attention. All hands. Loudspeakers blasted on American ships. President Roosevelt is dead. Repeat, our Supreme Commander, President Roosevelt, is dead. There was shock amounting to disbelief, and Admiral Turner was compelled to issue official confirmation. Beyond the grief loomed new concerns. Would his death affect the conduct of the war? Would his successor, Harry Truman, also demand unconditional surrender. Japanese army propagandists on Okinawa, taking a cue from the homeland, printed leaflets which linked the president's demise with the fate of the Americans on the island. We must express our deep regret over the death of President Roosevelt. 
The American tragedy is now raised here at Okinawa with his death. You must have seen 70% of your CVs, aircraft carriers, and 73% of your Bs, battleships, sink or be damaged causing 150,000 casualties. Not only the late president but anyone else would die in the excess of worry to hear such an annihilative damage. The dreadful loss that led your late leader to death will make you orphans of this island. The Japanese Special Attack Corps will sink your vessels to the last destroyer. You will witness it realized in the near future. One GI looked up from the leaflet as blasts of gunfire from American ships reverberated from Nakagazaku Bay and exclaimed, where the hell do they think that stuff's coming from? Few Japanese shared Goebbels' illusion that Roosevelt's death presaged a turn in the tide of war. Territories they had conquered in the first months of the conflict had been retaken or were falling. Nowhere was this more evident than in the Philippines. Yamashita still held his northern redoubt, but MacArthur was firmly entrenched on western Mindanao and was preparing a full-scale sweep across the island. General Sozaku Suzuki had been forced to abandon late to join the 743 men who had already been evacuated to Cebu. Almost all of the 12,000 or so left behind, including General Makino of the 16th Division, were fated to die, by starvation, suicide or at the hands of the enemy. Americans had already landed on Cebu by the time Suzuki reached the capital and he decided to chance the perilous trip to Mindanao, where there were almost two full divisions of able-bodied troops as well as 12,000 Japanese civilians. Why not gather all these people in the mountains northwest of Davao? There they would be able to fight off the enemy indefinitely, and moreover, establish a self-sufficient society, intermarrying with the natives. It would be a paradise with absolutely no discrimination. His enthusiasm was shared by General Tomokika, his chief of staff. Between them they drew up a constitution and picked a temporary name for the dream nation the Suzuki Kingdom. In case I die en route, Suzuki told Tomokika just before they embarked in five bankers on April 10, you must take my place as 35th Army Commander and carry on our project. He memorialized the ordeal they faced with a poem. Do not starve to death. Go into the fields. Even though we die bravely. It will not stop the forward advance. For I am the commander. And fortunately I am still able to serve. Give me many glories. It took six days for the little flotilla, often beset by storms, to reach southern Negroes. With dark they set out on the last long lap, across the open water to Mindanao. There was no wind and the tide ran against them, but resolute paddling brought them to the main current. All but Suzuki's boat were swept into the Mindanao Sea, and by ten o'clock they were far ahead out of sight. Exhausted, Suzuki and his companions could no longer best the current, and their banker drifted back toward Negroes. In the morning an American plane discovered them near a lighthouse. Jump! cried the general's aide. First Lieutenant Tokyo Awadano, and leapt over the side. But Suzuki remained in the banker. As bullets ripped up the water toward the dugout, Watano saw his general, sword in hand, lean over as if committing harakiri. It was the end of Suzuki and of his dream kingdom. B. Yoshimikihara had died in 1944. The Emperor was equally sensitive to Suzuki's aims. After the war he told Kaido's chief secretary, Marquis Yasumaza Matsudera, I was aware of Suzuki's sentiments from the very beginning of his appointment as premier, and likewise I was convinced that Suzuki understood my sentiments. Consequently I was in no hurry at the time to express to him my desires for peace. After the war Admiral Toy Oda said, I knew very, well what the fate would be of warships without air cover, and that the probability of success was very slight. Nevertheless, we had to do everything to help our troops at Okinawa. Section Yamato had a crew of 3,332, of whom 269 survived. There were other suicidal measures, but all were relatively unsuccessful. Miniature submarines, 
which received so much publicity, were involved in six verified raids, Pearl Harbor, Sydney Harbor, May 31, 1942, the Guadalcanal area, November 23 and December 7, 1942, off Madagascar, May 31, 1942, and west of the Mindanao Sea, January 5, 1945. 28 submariners died and insignificant damage was inflicted. A new two-man submarine, carrying Sea Dragon, with a range of 250 miles and a payload of two aviation-type torpedoes, was in production. By the end of the war there were 230, but not one was used. Another notable failure was the Caton, turn toward heaven a human torpedo which was brought close to the target on the deck of a conventional submarine. An early model penetrated the Olithi Lagoon and sank the oil and Mrs. Newar carrying 400,000 gallons of aviation gas. This success spurred improvements, and the final Caton model was 54 feet long and carried a warhead of 3,000 pounds of high explosives. Such a charge, the inventors claimed, could sink any warship afloat and a submarine carrying four Caton on its back could approach a U.S. anchorage and sink four large ships in a single attack. That was the prophecy and hope. Hundreds of Caton were launched against Allied vessels but they sent only one more to the bottom, the merchant vessel Canada Victory. The destroyer escort, Underhill, was hit by a Caton, then sunk accidentally by friendly forces. Almost 900 Japanese died in the Caton program. Equally futile was Operation Flying Elephant, an ambitious program to launch thousands of large hydrogen balloons, equipped with incendiary bombs, against the heavily wooded northwest section of the United States. Over Japan the balloons would be caught up in the jet stream at 33,000 feet and travel eastward at 120 miles an hour, reaching Washington. Oregon or Montana in approximately 48 hours. The balloons, which had a lifting power of 300 kilograms at sea level, were manufactured in a number of Tokyo movie theaters and a sumo stadium by a workforce of paper hangers, schoolgirls and women from the Iomaki, red light districts. The balloons were fashioned out of rice paper strengthened with konyaku, devil's tongue root, an important ingredient in sukiyaki. The entire konyaku crop was requisitioned. Each balloon required 600 strips of paper, pasted together to form a sphere. Several million workers were involved in the production of 10,000 balloons. On November 1, 1944, the commanders of the launching sites in Chiba, Ibaraki and Fukushima prefectures were ordered to initiate the attacks on North America. A staff officer was dispatched to the ice shrine to pray for success. In the next six months 9,300 balloons were released into the jet stream. The results were disappointing, a few minor forest fires were started in the Pacific Northwest. A Suzuki's broadcast was not reported in the Japanese press, and even his son knew nothing of it until after the war. B only Tomokika's boat reached Mindanao and shortly the island was dominated by MacArthur. What started as a dream, Tomokika later remarked, ended in a nightmare. 29. The Iron Typhoon. 1. On the day of Roosevelt's death Kantaro Suzuki's cabinet authorized the organization of a volunteer army of men from 15 to 55 and women from 17 to 45 for the mainland battle. Newspapers continued to write confidently of Okinawa, whose fall would necessitate the use of the volunteers. The enemy did the very thing we expected when we were working out the details of our plans for dealing with him, said a retired admiral named Indo. The strategy under which we have allowed the enemy to invade the Okinawan Islands has much in common with the strategy of fighting with our backs to the wall. We could not resort to this strategy unless we were fully conscious of our power to thrust at the enemy's vitals while letting him thrust at our less vital parts. But General Yushijima's 32nd Army had already been dealt a more grievous wound. In two weeks of fighting, almost 7,000 of its best troops had fallen, and although the Shiri Line was holding, Marines had overrun the northern half of the island, 
which was defended by two battalions, except for Motobu Peninsula. On April 16 they seized Yitak, a rugged 1,200-foot peak which dominated the peninsula, after an arduous three-day struggle, virtually ending the campaign in northern Okinawa. A few miles west of the peninsula lay Ishima, an oval-shaped island five miles long, flat except for an extinct volcano which rose dramatically 600 feet near the center where the last Japanese troops in the area were garrisoned. Occupation of the island was assigned to the army, and at 8 o'clock that same morning, after a naval bombardment, GIs clambered over the high dunes toward the airfield, the main objective of the invasion. On their approach to the volcano they encountered a maze of tunnels, bunkers, caves and spider holes. From these positions the outnumbered garrison, buttressed by hundreds of civilian volunteers, gave the 77th Division the toughest opposition yet. Ernie Pyle temporarily left the Marines on Okinawa to be with the GIs, for whom he had a special affinity. On April 18 he was on his way up front in a jeep with a regimental commander when the road was swept by machine gun bullets. Pyle, a frail little man, leapt into a ditch. As he raised his head to get a look, he was hit in the temple. He died instantly and was buried nearby. Back on Okinawa the Marines sat around that evening reciting favorite passages from his columns. It seems a shame such a big guy had to get it on such a lousy little island, said a corporal. They checked his bedroll, which he had left behind. It contained a single personal item, a chain of colored seashells. They wrapped it and forwarded it to Pyle's widow, that girl. North of the Shiri line the army had been readying a general attack on its defense system. It is going to be really tough, predicted Major General John Hodge commander of 24 Corps. There are 65 to 70,000 fighting Japs holed up in the south end of the island, and I see no way to get them out except blast them out yard by yard. The Navy was brought in to help. At 5.40 the next morning six battleships, six cruisers and eight destroyers began bombarding the five-mile defense complex extending across the island. Twenty minutes later, 27 battalions of artillery. 324 pieces in all, sounded off, digging up frontline positions before lifting 500 yards to the rear. At 6.30 the artillery lowered, splattering the front lines for another 10 minutes. It was the greatest single concentration of artillery in Pacific warfare, 19,000 shells. The artillery elevated once more while assault platoons of two divisions the 7th in the east and the 96th in the center, rushed forward. Fifty minutes later another division, the 27th, assaulted Kakaza Ridge on the west end of the line. Incredibly, the unprecedented bombardment left the Japanese relatively intact, and though all three units attacked aggressively, all three were thrown back. Casualties were high, particularly in the 27th division sector where 22 tanks were destroyed in futile charges against formidable Kakaza Ridge. By late afternoon 24 Corps had lost 720 dead, wounded and missing. During the next four days the two divisions on the flanks made negligible gains in slow, grinding advances, but the GIs of the 96th did manage to drive forward more than 1,000 yards, only to face the heart of the Shiri defenses a rugged little escarpment that stuck up like a segment of the Great Wall of China. This was Meda Ridge, which, with its forbidding sheer cliffs, proved to be a fortress in fact as well as in appearance. The GIs were promptly repelled. General Buckner, the 10th Army commander, rejected a proposal to make an amphibious landing behind the Japanese lines. The reefs in the south were too dangerous, the beaches inadequate for supplies and any beachhead could be contained by the multitude of Japanese in the area. Buckner's reasoning was logical, but incorrect. Much as Yushijima feared such a maneuver, it would bring a prompt end to the fighting, he was compelled to transfer his rearguard division north to beef up the Shiri line. These replacements began marching up front at night, and by the evening of April 25 most of them were in position to relieve the casualty-ridden defenders. 
they arrived in time to face the brunt of a renewed American attack on MADA. It too failed. One company of the 96th Division scaled up to the top at a prohibitive cost of 18 casualties in minutes. Another company formed a human chain to breast the ridge, but the three key men at the top were cut down by machine gun bullets. To their left, at the eastern terminus of MADA, GIs gained the tops of two rolling hills and caught more than 500 Japanese out in the open at the very moment when American tanks and armored flamethrowers rolled up Highway 5, which curved around the end of the ridge. The crossfire annihilated the Japanese. Fearing that the enemy might break through in force and come up behind the escarpment, Yushijima sent a curt directive to 62nd Division. The enemy with troops following tanks has been advancing into the southern and eastern sectors of Madas since about 1300. The 62nd Division will dispatch local units. Attack the enemy advancing in the Madas sector with a view to repulsing him decisively. Yushijima also ordered the 24th Division to help its neighbors seal up this hole regardless of the division boundary and to put its main strength northeast of Shuri this evening. Mada had to be held at all costs. On the morning of April 27 American infantry, tanks and flamethrowers, working in close cooperation, again assaulted the remaining Japanese positions at the eastern end of Mada, and before dusk held the two rolling hills. With the entire eastern segment of the escarpment in enemy hands, Yushijima ordered a regiment of the 24th Division to clear the entire ridge at once. The task of seizing the center portion was given to a battalion commanded by one of the youngest captains in the Imperial Army, Tsunio Shimura. Most of his 600 men had never before seen battle. For example, a few weeks early a 19-year-old Shuzen Hokama was still going to the normal school in Shiri, but like so many patriotic Okinawans he volunteered for frontline duty. As the battalion slowly wound through the ancient capital that evening, the men had to pick their way around a hundred bodies tossed like rag dolls in the street opposite a large Christian church, a naval shell had hit a wagon full of ammunition. Hokama saw pieces of flesh sticking to a stone wall, and blood was spluttered over the cobblestones. Leaving the town. The men continued north in two files along a muddy road until shells scattered them into the fields. During a rest each soldier was given a slice of canned pineapple, a final good taste before death. They failed to reach the line of departure until well after midnight, and it was almost three o'clock in the morning by the time Captain Shimura launched a two-company attack. Almost immediately mortar rounds lobbed over the ridge into the ranks. Shimura ordered the men to proceed cautiously through the mortar screen. As soon as they started up the steep incline in the first pasty light of day, tanks appeared to the right on Highway 5 like questing tigers. All their guns opened fire simultaneously, and more than a hundred men were killed in the first moments. The survivors took cover in Chinese tombs and rude air shelters, or behind rocks. Shimura and seven others found safety in a tomb, where they hid for the rest of the day. The tanks finally departed with the last rays of sunlight. Shimura emerged to find one third of his men dead, but regiment still insisted that he take the cliffs that night. He marked his back with white strips and led his men forward along a dry stream. Halfway up the incline he stumbled across a camouflaged opening. Crouched inside the cave were fifty men, the remnants of the Kaya detachment. Armed only with a few rifles, they had been driven off the escarpment. Shimura's entrance was greeted with exclamations and tears. Colonel Kaya embraced Shimura with relief. From now on I'm leaving everything up to you, he said. He wouldn't discuss the battle or what he knew of the enemy's positions, instead he proffered a cup of sake, which the captain refused. Shimura left the cave in disgust and brought his men to the lip of the crest. They remained hidden until dawn, when they suddenly launched grenades, and under cover of fire from light machine guns burst over the edge, screeching and brandishing their glistening bayonets. Their momentum carried them to the summit of the ridge, a jutting piece of limestone that resembled a castle turret, it had already been nicknamed Needle Rock by the G.I.s. 
here they overran the handful of Americans at the center of the escarpment, and then spread out along a front of 200 yards, positioning themselves behind rocks or in small caves. Their quick success was due as much to their elan as to the debilitating struggle that had seesawed along the ridge for four days. The American units facing them had been reduced to about 40% combat efficiency, and some platoons were down to half a dozen men. The fighting near the west coast was not as fierce as that on the escarpment but had been almost as costly to both sides. The next day, April 30th, the 1st Marine Division began relieving the 27th Infantry Division, which had suffered 2,661 casualties in less than two weeks. Down the line of Marines slouching ahead the word was passed, doggies coming back. The Marines straightened up and smartly raised weapons to their shoulders. But the GIs, to one Marine they looked dirty and dispirited, turned into zombies, ignored their parading replacements. A passing Marine made a sarcastic remark but was silenced by his comrades, perhaps they would come out the same way, those who survived. Fresh army troops were also moved up to Meadow Ridge. Time and again GIs, carrying satchel charges, scaled the heights with ropes and grapnels but were repeatedly driven back by the Japanese, who emerged from an intricate network of caves. Shimura held his positions near Needle Rock against a dozen resolute assaults, and his defense was so impressive that regiment ordered him to go on the attack himself. That night he was to retake the first rolling hummock to his right, called Satan Hill by the Japanese. He sent the 5th Company. The men reached the hill soon after midnight and sent up flares to signal that they had taken the objective. But since they could not dig to Katsubo in the rocky soil, they were caught unprotected at first light and were annihilated to the last man. The enemy soldiers had been on the island for a month and their number had grown to 170,000. Okinawa had been transformed into a little America. Roads had been widened and improved, to accommodate the tens of thousands of vehicles that swarmed ashore, supply dumps set up, anti-aircraft guns in place, and phone service established linking all army and navy installations. The Japanese who had been taught to despise the Americans, were impressed by their rational way of fighting. They were dressed sensibly, had endless quantities of ammunition and food, and seemed to turn war into an adventure. Even the enemy's tattoos intrigued the Japanese. In a cave a hundred feet beneath the ancient Shuri Castle, where Commodore Perry had been received in state by the King of Okinawa almost a century before, Yushijima's chief of staff, Lieutenant General Isamu Cho, vociferously demanded another all-out counter-attack. He was a hearty man who smoked and drank to excess. His army career, like that of Tsuji, had been studded with acts of Chikokuo. He had participated in the abortive brocade flag revolution of 1931. Afterward he was transferred to Manchuria, where his punch on for intrigue prolonged the border fighting with Russia at Chengyifing in 1938. His temper was short, and it was not unusual for him to slap his orderly, his aide or a junior officer in a line unit. Now arguing with Yushijima, he brandished his long cigarette holder as if it were a weapon. Yushijima listened politely. He often exhibited such deference that it made those around him uneasy, with the exception of Cho, whose present belligerence had been aggravated by the sake they had all consumed in the past hour. Yushijima's reservations were supported only by his operations officer, who alone debated Cho's repeated demands for a decisive strike. Colonel Hiromaki Yahara, a grim-faced man with the nickname Sobersides refused to be intimidated. To take the offensive with inferior forces against overwhelmingly superior enemy forces is reckless and will lead to early defeat. Moreover, he went on, they would have to attack an enemy which held commanding ground. The sensible course was to continue current operations. He thought annihilation was inevitable, but invaluable time could be won for Imperial headquarters by a strategic holding action. A counterattack would at best inflict light casualties on the enemy, and thousands of His Majesty's troops would be sacrificed in vain. 
but the Japanese instinct to attack when cornered was irrepressible. The commander of the 62nd Division sprang to his feet and aggressively backed Cho, as did the other division and brigade commanders who had been frustrated by the defensive tactics forced upon them. With misgivings, Yushijima ordered the offensive to begin in two days. It was a complicated and ambitious plan, coordinated with another massive kamikaze attack on shipping and supported by tactical bombers, to drive a wedge five miles north into the American lines. Two regiments, their way cleared by a heavy artillery barrage, would start the assault east of Highway 5 while a third stormed down from Meadow Ridge, and with considerable tank support press on along the highway to the heights beyond. The 44th Independent Mixed Brigade would follow for half a mile before turning left toward the west coast. To mislead the enemy there would also be two amphibious landings behind the American lines, one on the west coast and the other on the east coast. At dusk on May 3rd, artillery began to pound enemy front-line positions, and kamikaze planes struck at you. S. Shipping sinking the destroyer Little and LSM-195, and damaging four other ships. Just after midnight an attack by 60 conventional bombers on 10th Army's rear areas coincided with the two amphibious forces advance up the coasts in barges. The western unit mistakenly landed near a marine company. Alerted by shouts of Banzai. The Marines turned on the surprised Japanese a murderous mortar barrage and concentrated machine gun and rifle fire. The few who escaped were hunted down and killed. The sole captive was a carrier pigeon. It was released carrying a typical Marine taunt, we are returning your pigeon. Sorry we cannot return your demolition engineers. The amphibious force plowing up the east coast was sighted by a naval patrol which illuminated the area with star shells. Most of the barges were destroyed, and the score of men who made it to shore were eliminated. An hour before dawn the Japanese artillery barrage reached a deafening climax which continued for half an hour. Then two red flares shot up, the signal to attack. Japanese infantrymen surged forward bell-mell. On the right, 2,000 were soon caught in the open terrain by American artillery. Those who survived tried to forge ahead but were systematically picked off on the exposed flatland. The successful outcome of the assault in the center was dependent on armored support. But since accurate enemy artillery fire had immobilized all the medium tanks, no more than nine light ones managed to pull behind the spearhead, Captain Koichi Ito's 600-man battalion. Ito's troops pierced the American lines in the pre-dawn gloom but were pinned down by automatic weapons fire. The nine tanks tried to close up but artillery found their range one by one. Ito decided to go on without tank support and led his scattered battalion toward the first objective, a hill mass one mile northeast of Madden near the town of Tanabaru. Fragmentary reports reaching 32nd Army headquarters later in the morning claimed impressive victories and touched off celebrations in the cave under the wreckage of Shuri Castle. However, no one but Ito had made a substantial breakthrough, and he was ordered to assault the hill above Danabara that night. With his men he pushed ahead along either side of Highway 5 until they were blocked by enemy shells. Since Ito now had armored support, the tanks had come up under cover of darkness, he was able to continue. Six tanks were destroyed during the fierce firefights that followed, but Ito and his men covered the long, arduous mile through the American lines to Tanabaru. He mined the road running through town and by dawn had set up a perimeter defense on the slope of the hill. Then he radioed in the clear, his code men were dead, that he and almost 450 of his troops had reached the objective. He was ordered to stay in place. By noon of May 5 it was obvious even to the blustery Cho that the counter-attack, which he had fathered, had failed. Now he saw no hope at all for Okinawa, defeat was certain. Ito was still lodged above Tanabaru but he was under constant pressure from all sides. During the day a hundred more of his detachment had been killed by flamethrowers, mortars and grenades. The next morning the American assaults continued and were repulsed by sacrificial measures. 
There were now fewer than 150 of the 600 men who had started the offensive, and Ito was preparing himself for death when a message wrapped around a rock hurtled into his Takatsubo. It was from his radioman, an order had just been received to fall back. On taking leave of the wounded, he distributed grenades among them before he assembled his able-bodied men at the foot of the hill. At midnight they moved south in the darkness but the one mile of enemy territory took its toll. Only Ito and a dozen others broke through. The Japanese had struck with every resource they could muster but were easily crushed by Hodge's 24 Corps. The success coincided with a much more significant achievement. At high noon on May 8 every American artillery piece and naval gun fired three volleys, Germany had surrendered. Defeating the Japanese in an open, wasteful charge was one thing, but dislodging them from dug-in defenses was devastating. Madridge had turned into a bloody version of King of the Hill, with first one side holding the crest and then the other. One GI battalion, the first of the 307th Infantry Regiment, lost more than half its men in eight days, including eight company commanders in a 36-hour period. The Japanese losses were far more grievous. Young Captain Shimura, for example, had once had 600 men on the ridge line, now there were fewer than 150 left and most of them were severely wounded. Still he refused to withdraw on order, he wanted to die where most of his men had been killed. Regiment insisted that he was to fall back, and a staff officer of the 24th Division sent a personal message in code with the argument that he would find other suitable battlefields to die on. Shimura told his men of the order but he was going to remain as a guerrilla. Those who wish to stay with me, can. We'll stick it out here on this ridge until we die. Some of the men went underground and the rest withdrew, leaving Madridge to the Americans. With the fall of Mada, the American offensive slowly ground forward all across the island. Two full marine divisions, three amphibious corps, now held a western flank, after an arduous battle the 6th had seized Sugarloaf Hill, the western anchor of the entire defense line, less than a mile from Shuri, and the 1st Division, which had been in battle since Goodalcanal, advanced through one a draw, a narrow, rocky passage leading to the center of the former capital. Farther east, all the way to the coast, the three divisions of 24 Corps, advancing slowly, captured Chocolate Drop, Flattop and other hills just east of Shuri. By dusk on May 21st the city itself was invested from three sides but as darkness overtook the fighting, so did torrential rains. One a draw became a swamp. Tanks and amphibian tractors churned helplessly in mud. All along the front, foxholes carved out of the clay slopes began to disintegrate, and those on lower ground had to be bailed constantly like leaky boats. For almost a full week the downpour continued. Little food could be brought up front, sleep in the constant deluge was impossible, the dead could not be buried and were left to decompose. The respite granted him by the rain notwithstanding, General Yushijima decided to abandon Shuri. More than 60,000 of his troops had been killed in the bloody defense of the city. The 62nd and 24th Divisions and the 44th Independent Mixed Brigade, the heart of his army, had been shattered by relentless enemy naval gun fire, artillery fire and bombings, as well as infantry and tank assaults. He overrode protests against any retreat, however localized, on the grounds that an attempt to make a stand at Shuri would accelerate the fall of Okinawa. 2. In the May issue of the commercial magazine Jitsujiyo no Nippon, Rear Admiral Etsuzo Urihara wrote. Some people favor the method of letting the enemy cut our skin while we cut the enemy's body, and of letting him cut our body while we cut his bone. I am opposed to such a calculating strategy. Rather, I am in favor of letting the enemy cut our bone while we cut the enemy's bone. Each Japanese can do this, 